p.m. Eastern War Time. Your dial is set at 660, WEAF, New York. Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. to Transcontinental Flight 17. Municipal Tower to Transcontinental Flight 17. Over. That's us, Tom. Check it. Check. Transcontinental Flight 17 and Municipal Tower. Flight 17 to Municipal Power. Over. Police instructions. Check and see if you have male passenger occupying seat 24. Passenger occupying seat 24. Wanted by police. Over. I'm just checking my list, Joe. Yep, we got a man in 24. I'll tell him. Municipal Tower. We have a man in seat 24. The name he's traveling under is John J. Jones. John J. Jones. Maybe that's his right name, but the police want him. They know him as Boston Blackie. Maybe you've met Boston Blackie before on your local movie screen. In case some of you haven't, I think you'll soon be fast friends of his. And maybe you've already tried new Soapy Rich Rinso, too. In which case, you don't need me to tell you how good it is. But if you aren't using Rinso now, I can't think of a better time for you to start. Now when summer is here, you certainly don't want to spend hours on wash day scrubbing and boiling clothes. Well, just keep in mind that Rinso gets out the dirt without hard scrubbing or boiling. A short soaking in Rinso's lively suds, a few quick finger rubs, and you'll be ready to hang out a Rinso whitewash. Try this on your clothesline and see if you don't start whistling while you wash. And now, meet Boston Blackie. Outside the law is no strange territory to Blackie, but never does he stray for personal reward, although the police, and notably Inspector Faraday, find no solace in his motives and only bewilderment in his ability to remain out of their reach. Meet Chester Morris as Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, Friend to those who have no friend. You Chicago police have been very cooperative. Thanks a million. Glad to help you, Inspector Faraday. When we send a man to New York, you can return the favor. Glad to. Anytime, Captain. There's the plane now, Inspector. See it? Blackie has got to be on it. We know he was on the plane when it left Detroit, and it hasn't made any stops. Well, Blackie's liable to get out of anything any time. I remember once I had him in two sets of handcuffs. And the next minute... No handcuffs. No, Blackie. Chances are I couldn't have made the charge stick anyhow. Never have been able to tie anything on him in six years. You'll be able to arrest him now, won't you, Inspector? You're sure Blackie's the man, are you, Miss Moray? Oh, of course I'm sure. I was with my grandfather when he was robbed and the money stolen. The thief wore no mask, and I recognized him from the picture of Boston Blackie that was in the paper last year. Mm. Oh, I'm sure it was Blackie. Mm -hmm. Why do you keep asking me if I'm sure? I just wanted to be certain, that's all. I've been waiting to get a witness to make a positive identification for a long time. Oh, here comes the plane now. Do you think he'll have the money with him? I can't wait until I get my hands on it. There's lots of money in this world, Miss Moray. What I can't wait to get my hands on is Boston Blackie. Go ahead in, Miss Moray. I've been keeping Blackie in my hotel room here until our plane leaves for New York. Talk to him yourself. Mm-hmm. I can't get anything out of him. Go ahead now. Monahan's in there guarding him, and I'll be right here outside the door. All right, Inspector Faraday. Blackie always was a soft touch for a girl. Here's hoping you get something out of him. Oh, Inspector, you'll never know how important it is to me that I do. Uh, hello? Uh, he won't say a word, miss. Just sits there like he did all the time the inspector was questioning him. Oh, I'll try. Blackie? Boston Blackie, would you talk to me? About business or pleasure? Maybe a little of both. Detective Monaghan, could Mr. Blackie and I go over in the corner and talk? Oh, sure. I don't know why not. I'll stroll over to the window. Would you please come over here with me, Blackie? Why, sure. I've been waiting for a chance like this to have a little chat with you, Miss Moray. You identified me as the man who stole $10,000 from your grandfather. Yes, yes, I did. 
You know, you never saw me before in your life, Miss Moray. I wish I had. Then I wouldn't be in such desperate trouble now. You're in trouble. You had me arrested because you're in trouble? What is this, a new switch on the share the wealth plan? Oh, please let me explain. From what I've heard of you, Blackie, you're the only man living who can help me. But I had no idea of where or how I could reach you. Oh, so you made up the story of my stealing your grandfather's money, huh? Yes, I did. I knew the police could trace your movements where I couldn't. And I knew you could get away from Inspector Faraday once I'd seen you. (laughs) Well, thanks for the confidence. (sighs) The very worst, I could have said I was mistaken in the identification, and then they would have had to let you go. Only by then it would be too late. Say, look, uh, let's get organized. Uh, Too late for what? To recover the diamond that was stolen from me. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, you've got the wrong boy, lady. If a diamond was stolen from you, let the police get it back. They're in that business. But that diamond, Blackie, the rest of my life depends on it. I I must have it back by tomorrow night. Oh, please, please help me. Well, with these handcuffs on and two New York detectives guarding me, I couldn't be of very much help to anybody. But those handcuffs, haven't I heard that you can get out of them whenever you want to? Yes, but I've got to want to first. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm more than sorry. I'm miserable. I knew I had to reach you, and I I just messed up everything. No, I'll never... Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Miss Moray. We'll figure some way out. Here, uh, wipe your eyes with this handkerchief. Thanks. Put your hand. You got all the handcuffs. Okay, now. There, your eyes are nice and dry. Now blow. (laughs) You feel better now? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then. Let me have your bad time story. (laughs) I don't know how I can laugh. Oh, it's easy. You you just open your mouth and close your eyes and think of Inspector Faraday. <laughs> Never fails. Come on, Miss Moray. Tell me the whole story before Faraday gets restless. Well, I'm engaged to George Atwater. Yes? We're to be married soon, and yesterday he brought me something to look at. The Jonathan Diamond. The Jonathan, huh? Oh, that's worth a fortune. Well, George's father has millions. Yeah, Miss Moray, you all right over there? Oh, oh yes, officer. Thank you. I, I won't be a minute now. Blackie, the diamond belonged to George's father. George brought it over to show me, and then he had a little too much to drink, and I thought it safer if he left it with me. He agreed. And sometime during the night, it must have been stolen from my apartment. I get it. If you don't produce the diamond, there'll be a mess. Uh, The police don't know anything about the diamond? No. That's why I made up the story about my grandfather and the stolen money. Well, when do you have to produce the Jonathan, Miss Moray? Tomorrow night. George gets back from a trip then. He'll want it, and... Oh, Blackie. Tomorrow night. It doesn't give me much time to work, but I'll try. Uh, call the detective over here. All right, but why? Shh, don't ask questions. Just get him over. All right. Officer. Officer, would you come over here a minute, please? Sure, Miss Fletcher. Well, did he tell you anything? No, but I've got something to tell you, Monaghan. Indeed, and what's that? This. You shouldn't have done that, Blackie. You shouldn't have hit the officer. <laughs> you sure would have disappointed me if you hadn't said that. Now, listen, I'm going out the window and down the fire escape. As soon as I get moving, you scream for Faraday. Tell him what happened, that I socked Monaghan and put the handcuffs on you. Here, I'd better do that now. Faraday's got the key. He'll open them later. There. Uh, Now, remember, you finally worked this handkerchief from around your mouth and screamed. Have you got that? Yes. Oh, Blackie, please remember that getting back that diamond means my marriage and my whole life's happiness. Okay. Well, I'm going to New York, and I'll do my best. If I get back the diamond, you get married. (laughs) You know, I wouldn't be surprised if instead of Boston Blackie, from now on I'm known as Chicago Cupid. Shorty, listen. When a piece of ice like the Jonathan Diamond is lifted, somebody's got to know something about it. Look, Blackie, I've been out all night on it. Nobody knows nothing. All I could pick up was that a fellow named Matt War owns it. None of the boys would touch it. That is, except Duke Walton. I'm telling you, this is Hollis a pistol, but Duke's been bragging that he'll grab it one of these days. Yeah? Well, where can I find him? Well, I, I checked that, too. He's out of town. That's definite. Yeah, he's been gone a week. Now, look, boss, why don't you lay off? Shorty, I promised to get that diamond back. I chartered a plane out of Chicago last night after breaking out of that hotel room. Young Atwater isn't due back in town till tonight, so I still have a little time. I'm going to waste some of it on a visit to the Atwater house. Ain't you a little out of your class up there, Blackie? <laughs> You know, they got an awful lot of dough, those Atwaters. <laughs> you know something, Shorty? After the way that Moray girl smiled at me in Chicago, <laughs> I kind of feel like a million dollars myself. Hmm. 
Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see Mr. Atwater. Who shall I say is calling, please? Uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. John J. Jones. Uh, Mr. Atwater doesn't know me, but you can say it's about his son. About Mr. George Atwater, Jr.? That's right. Uh, he's in, sir. Would you like to see him? George is in? Well, I certainly would like to see him. When did he get back? A little while ago, sir. He returned earlier than we expected. Uh, come this way. He's in the library right here. Shall I announce you? No, no, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll go right in. Very good, sir. Hello there. Uh, Mr. Atwater? Yes, I'm George Atwater. Who are you? Well, my name is Jones, Mr. Atwater. John J. Jones. I'm a friend of your fiancé's. Oh, a friend of Lee's? That's right. And if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure, go ahead. Well, the night before last, when you left, Miss Moray, you were a little, uh... <laughs> Oh, what do you mean a little? I was uh, a lot. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean to be personal, but did you stop off anywhere on your way home? No, I got a cab and came right home. Uh, Mr. Atwater, where do you usually keep the Jonathan Diamond? I don't know what you're driving at, Mr. Jones, uh, but, well, we keep it here in the library, in this wall safe. Only it's not here now. Would you open the safe for me, please? Well, now, Mr. Jones, you're a perfect stranger to me, even though you are a friend of Miss Moray's. Well, you could hardly expect... Oh. So, so, this is a holdup. I'm sorry I had to pull this gun on you, Mr. Atwater, but I want to see that safe. You don't mind if I lock the library door, do you? I do mind, but I don't suppose that matters. <laughs> Not a bit. There we are. So the Jonathan was kept in the safe, huh? combination, Mr. Atwater, and keep your hands where I can see them. Sorry, Mr. Jones. I seem to have forgotten the combination. Well, I haven't time to make you remember it. Oh, the safe doesn't look too tough. Come over here where I can watch you while I go to work on it. All right. There's nothing inside the safe, but go ahead and open it. Quiet. Take that watch off your wrist and put it in your pocket. It's making too much noise. I can't hear the tumblers drop. Come on, come on, take it off. All right. I think I've got the first number. Now for the second one. (laughs) This box of yours is pretty simple, Mr. Atwater. In fact, it's about the most unsafe safe I ever saw. There, that's the second number, all right. Do you want to be a good boy and tell me the last number? No. Okay, be a bad boy and watch me find it out for myself. There. Now, that ought to do it. I'll try the handle now. Well, made it. My compliments. Save them. Let's take a look in this jewelry box. Oh, so the Jonathan Diamond wasn't in the safe, huh? Well, what's this, then? That, uh, that's the Jonathan, all oh. right. I, I meant to leave it at Miss Moray's apartment, but, uh, but I changed my mind. Open this door! Open it up! Open the door, Mr. Atwater! We're the police! Open up! Faraday, he must have had Shorty watched and trail me here. You don't mind if I close this safe door, do you, Mr. Jones? I want you to be caught with that diamond still in your hand. Well, this seems to be my day for unexpected visitors. Now keep away from that door, Atwater. You don't scare me. I'm going to open it. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going. You'll have to hurry. He's going through the window. Quick. He's got the Jonathan diamond. He must still be in the garden. I've got two men out there. Maybe I can spot him from here. Come on, Monahan. Blackie! Blackie, Stop! <laughs> And he's got the Jonathan Diamond. Uh, At last, Boston Blackie caught red-handed. Well, it does look as though Blackie is in for it now. But I have a hunch there's still plenty of action coming up. And uh, shifting from Blackie to Whitey, that is Rinso White... I'd like to tell you about a completely different kind of action, the kind you get with Rinso Suds in your washer. Yes, those Rinso Suds are so peppy and lively, they get your clothes sparkling white and bright with as little as a five-minute run per load. And when I say sparkling white, of course I really mean... (whistles) Exactly, Rinso White. And there's no better way than that whistle to describe the special kind of white Rinso gets your clothes. That's because Rinso gets out more dirt. Simple, isn't it? No wonder Rinso is the only soap recommended by the makers of 33 leading washers. And, of course, a short run is not only easy on your washer, it's easy on your clothes. Keeps them new looking longer. So next wash day, do yourself a big favor. Whistle up a Rinso white, Rinso bright wash. And now, back to the adventures of Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. (laughs) 
How do you like our cells, Blanky? <laughs> Air conditioning between the bars and everything. Comfortable enough for you? Oh, sure. This one's wonderful. I wish you'd try sleeping on that mattress they have in here. <laughs> I gave up in the middle of the night and slept on the stone floor. It was mm. softer. Oh, come on, Faraday. How about a couple of pillows? Oh, huh? poor Blanky. Too bad I didn't hear you. I've suddenly gotten very deaf. Isn't that terrible? You've suddenly gotten very deaf, and you've always been very dumb. Oh, very funny, Blanky. Yes, I know. New gag writer. Last one have to go back to kindergarten? Yes, and he told me how much all the other children miss you since you stopped going, Faraday. <clears throat> Blanky, we had to grab you on that Moray girl's charge. All right, so you grabbed me. A $10,000 stick-up, Blanky. That isn't important now. We'll talk about that later, but where's the Jonathan Diamond? Jonathan Diamond? What's that? Listen, Blackie, you've had that diamond in your hand. Now you had it when we broke in. Atwater saw it there. Where is it now? Now, you listen, Faraday. You've got to get me out of here in a couple of hours. You haven't a thing to hold me on. No? Breaking into the Atwater house? I broke out of the house, not into it. Now, see if that's a crime, Inspector. You opened the safe in the library and you stole the Jonathan diamond. How about that? You sure I did? Hmm. Does that safe look forced? Did you find the diamond on me? Uh, No, 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 no to all those things. But we've got George Atwater as a witness. A witness to what? I was calling on him at the suggestion of a mutual friend, Inspector. Hmm. We were having a chat when somebody started to pound on the door. I got scared and jumped through the window. You know, things like that happen, Inspector. People get scared and they jump. Blackie, I'm telling you this man to man, we've got a case against you. Atwater's word against yours that you robbed his safe. And slugging Monaghan in Chicago. The Moray girl's testimony that you robbed a grandfather. That'll add up to ten years at least. Go ahead, Inspector. Uh, all right, I'll be honest, Blackie. Young Atwater screaming about his diamond. Says you had it one minute, we grabbed you the next minute, so it can't be missing. Only it, it is. All right, you tell us where you hid it, and I'll get him to drop all charges. I'll even talk to the Moray girl to get her to go easy if you return her dough. Now, how's that? I don't know. Oh, you must have it stashed somewhere. Give me your word of honor to deliver it back to me today, and I'll let you out. Your word's always been good with me, Blackie. Now, come on. Don't you want to get out of jail? Well, I don't know now, Faraday. It's kind oh. of a nice jail. You know, air conditioning between the black Blackie, and... Blackie, be a good guy. Okay, Faraday. As a favor to you, I'll come out. And you'll have your diamond back two hours after I leave here. But I'm not to be bothered during that time by the cops. You understand? Bothered? You'll be protected. And thanks a million, Blackie. <laughs> That's all right, Faraday. I'll get plenty of satisfaction every time I remember you begging me to get out of jail. <laughs> Miss Moray, this is Blackie. Can you talk? Oh, yes, of course. Nobody's here. Did you... Did I get the diamond? Well, yes and no, Miss Moray. Nobody ever stole it from your apartment. What? Atwater says he took it with him when he left you the other night. But that's impossible. He didn't. I know he didn't. I even looked at it after he left. Mm, well, Miss Moray, will you meet me by the shrubbery alongside the library window of the Atwater house in exactly a half an hour? Well, all right, but what are we going to do? We're going to rob a safe, Miss Moray, with police protection. <laughs> Keep that flashlight steady, Miss Moray, please. Mm-hmm. If we're lucky, the safe won't be locked. Why not? Because nobody knows I put the diamond back in it when the police pounded on the door. And it was only slammed shut by young Atwater. Well, here it is. There, you see? It was open. And here's the box that holds the Jonathan diamond. Uh, put your flashlight on it. We'll take a quick look. All right. There. The box is empty. Uh-oh. Atwater must have seen me put it back and grabbed it. But why is he telling the police that I have it? And see that I'm not disturbed. Uh, quick, that's that water now. Put out that flash and get back of these drapes. Hurry. All right. Seven. Six. Nine. What are you doing, Black? I'm counting the clicks on the dial. Seven. Three. Four. Two. Got it. Hello. This is George Atwater. I got your message, but why did you call me here after I... Well, I don't care about that. We made a deal. I don't owe you a dime anymore, and you've got what you wanted. Well, you have to expect it to be hot for a while. And look, remember this. I'm washed up with you and that crooked roulette wheel of yours. We're all square. And if you call me here again, I'll turn you over to the police. Yes, yes. If I hear of anybody who wants to buy it, I'll let you know. You'll what? Don't be foolish. Who'd believe that? Goodbye. I think I understand everything now, Miss Moray, but I've got to find the man Atwater just called. How can you? He didn't mention any names. No, but I counted the clicks as he was dialing that number. If my ears hadn't let me down, I can call that number, too. Anyhow, I'm going to try. You think that man has a Jonathan Diamond? Yes, I think so. 
But you don't have to worry about it from now on. You won't be blamed because it was missing from your apartment. But you're in a mess now, aren't you? Well, yes, kind of. You see, I promised Faraday that he'd have his diamond back in two hours, and I can't keep that promise. Well, I hope the OPA hasn't put a ceiling on tempers, because if they have, he'll hit it. Hello? Police headquarters. Inspector Faraday, please. Just a minute. Faraday speaking. This is Blackie, Faraday. Your time's up, Blackie. Have you got the Jonathan Diamond? Well, no, Inspector, I haven't. You're stalling. Now, Blackie, you've crossed me for the last time. I'm going to have a dragnet out that'll have you down here before you know it, and you're going to stay in jail this time. Yeah, but, Inspector, listen, I... He wouldn't listen, Shorty. I've got to work extra fast now. Gee, Blackie, look, if there's anything... Hold it, Shorty. Do... I'm going to try that number Atwater called. Hello, um, Atwater told me to call you. Yeah? Who's this? I've got cash I'd like to trade in for something you've got. Atwater says that... Atwater the... says, huh? Okay. I'm in an old house, 632 West 100th Street. First door on the right as you come in. Get here fast and we'll talk business. Okay. Bye. Worked, eh, Bucky? I don't know. It was a little too easy. Come on, Shorty. We're going up there to get Faraday his diamond. Unless his dragnet gets me first. Duck down. Duck down this hallway. Okay, what is it, Shorty? Prowl car, just oh. coming this way. I never saw so many cops as we passed on the way up here. Never mind, Shorty. Stay flattened out against this door until it's time for what I told you to do. Yeah, okay, Blackie. But uh, who really stole the Jonathan Diamond? Nobody stole it, Shorty. Atwater left the stone at Lee Moray's apartment and then returned later that night and lifted it so that Miss Moray could report it stolen to the police. Ixnay, Ixnay, boss. Coppers. Okay, now... Uh, look, boss, why did Atwater want the Dane report it? So he wouldn't be involved. This guy I called up, the one who lives in this building, has something on Atwater and wanted the diamond as his price for clamming up. Atwater had to get it for him, see? Oh, yeah, I get it. He stashed it in his own safe until he could reach this guy and turn it over to him. Only you opened the safe before he could do it. And he had to figure out a new story, huh, boss? Sure. All he had to tell the cops then is that he was afraid that Jonathan wouldn't be safe at the girl's apartment and that he went back in to get it. Oh. Huh. I thought it was pretty cute when I put the diamond back in the safe. But Atwater must have seen me. Well, wish me luck, Shorty. And don't forget what I told you to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, boss. Uh, quick. Come on, it's okay now. So long. Yeah? Who is it? I called you a little while ago. Okay. Open up. Okay. Well, Duke Walton. <laughs> put that gun down, Duke. You and I can make a deal. Think so? Sure. Lucky you're not as cute as you thought. I called that water back and found your call was a phony. Too bad for you. Now I gotta bump you. Wait a minute, Duke. I'm gonna wait a couple of minutes, Blackie. Some friends of mine are coming over with a car to take you on a little trip. <laughs> now sit down in that chair and put your arms behind your back. Go on, I ain't the patient type. Okay, Duke. How's that? Ah, that's better. Now I'm gonna tie you up nice and pretty like that. How do you like it? Too tight for your pretty hands to be tied. Well, yes, if you really want to know. I don't. I'll give it an extra yank just to make sure. Hey, Duke. Huh? Duke, look under the door. Huh? That's smoke. Where? Hey, that's right. Well, that makes things easier. This joint's a fire trap. I'll scram out of here and leave you tied up, Blackie. <laughs> Blackie, I guess I was just born under a lucky star. Eh? Maybe. But don't forget, Duke, sometimes stars have a habit of falling. Yeah, okay, so I'm ducking right out of here. Fire! Fire! The whole building's on fire! Come on, get out! That does it. So long, Blackie. Me and the Jonathan Diamond are getting out of here, and both of us are nice and safe, which is more than I can say for you, pal. Uh, wait a minute, Duke. I've got a proposition. Sure, but I got a date. No use trying to bust him ropes, boy. Maybe the fire will burn him through for you, huh? <laughs> hey, you did it. How'd you get out of them ropes? Never mind, it ain't gonna do you any good. Oh, yes, it is, Duke. This place is on fire. Go on, try and get out. I don't have to try. I'm getting. Take a look at the door, Duke. It's locked. Sure, it's locked, and I'm gonna open it right now. Hey, where'd the key go to? I've got a Duke right here. I locked the door and removed the key when I had my back huh? to the door after you got the drop on me. Come on, give it to me, give it to me. We'll both be burned to death. Sure, Duke, here it is. Catch. Hey, hey, don't, don't throw it like... Hey, where'd it go? i got to get it. Sure, you're going to get it, but good. <laughs> you missed me, sucker. I'll, I'll sucker you. I'll get you for this bloody if it's a... Take that million. Oh, oh. 
Hey, hey, you're breaking my wrist. Drop oh. that gun. Okay. Now, where's the diamond? I might a diamond blacky to fire where both be trapped. Well, there's no fire, sucker. Huh? My pal Shorty burned some papers in the hall and pounded on the door. But you... Now, give her that diamond. You must have it on you. When you thought there was a fire, you'd have never left without it. I ain't got it, Blackie. When I found your phone call was a phony, I give it to a guy to hold for You're phone. lying, Duke. I'm going to search you. Now, turn around with your back to me and keep your hands in the air. Yeah, okay, but I tell you, I ain't got it on me. Well, we'll see. It's not here. Not here. It's not here. Yeah. It's me, boss. Everything all right? Okay, Shorty, I'll let you in. Well, I pick up the key. Now, don't move, you. Well, it worked, huh, boss? Yeah, it worked, but... Do you recognize this guy, Shorty? Sure, sure. That's Duke Walton, the guy I was telling you about. Who was bragged he'd have the Jonathan Diamond. Well, he hasn't got it. I've searched him. He's clean, Shorty. Ah, uh, he's holding out the dirty heel. Yes, the dirty... Heel. Heel, huh? <laughs> you know, Shorty, I think I've got something there. It's the one place I didn't look. Take off your shoes, Duke. Come on, take them off. Yeah. There you went, Blackie. The ice is in my right shoe. There's a slide in the heel. The diamond's inside. Now, that's being very sensible, Duke. Yeah. I'll just take the diamond out of that slot it's in and at the same time pull myself and Inspector Faraday out of a great big hole. Well, it's, it's bargain day, Faraday. You've got your diamond and I've got Miss Moray. Right, honey? Well, for a while, Blackie. Then I've got to go back home to Wisconsin. Oh, well, can we go now, Inspector? Okay, Blackie. Go ahead, beat it. You're in the clear. Only remember this. You make one slip, Blackie, and as sure as my name is Faraday, I'll be on your neck. You'll be on my neck, mm. huh? Okay, Inspector, but before Miss Moray leaves for Wisconsin, I... I hope I'll have her there for a little while first. <laughs> Oh, say, uh, one more thing about Rinso. That same Rinso that's such a big help on wash day. I'd just like to add that it's also a mighty big help three times every day at dishwashing time. Even your greasiest roaster is a cinch to wash in those rich Rinso suds. And, of course, Rinso's grand for all the soap and water jobs around the house. Walls, floors, woodwork, windows, tiles. They all come sparkling bright and clean with Rinso on the job. So get Rinso tomorrow for dishwashing, for housework, and for a wash that's... And now a glimpse at next week's adventure of Boston Blackie. I won't do it, I tell you. I, I can't do it. But Mr. Manletter, it's the only way your business can be saved. I don't care about that. The only way it can be saved is by risking the life of my friend Boston Blackie. Well, I'd rather it were lost. I won't ask Blackie to keep that appointment. I don't even want to know about it. All right, Mr. Manletter, if that's the way you want it. I'm going out and try to raise the money. You'll hear from me later, and remember, I don't want Blackie to hear about this. Hello, Mary. Get me Boston Blackie. <laughs> Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris with Richard Lane as Inspector Faraday. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Original music for this program by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Rinso and wishing you all a very pleasant good night. And don't forget, tomorrow, when you ask your grocer for the new Rinso, buy a cake of Life Boy at the same time. Life Boy's rich, purifying lather goes right after dirt and perspiration, leaves you feeling extra clean. So use Life Boy daily in your bath or shower. Remember, it's the only soap specially made to stop... This is the National Broadcasting Company. Rinse 
Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Hello? Is Mr. Manletter there? Why, no, I'm sorry, he's not. This is his secretary, Miss Rochelle. Can I help you? Yes, you can deliver a message for me. I've been trying to reach him all day. This is John Partridge, president of the Morton National Bank. Mr. Partridge? But, well, Arthur Borden is president of the Morton Bank, isn't he? Not since yesterday, he's not. Give this message to Mr. Manletter, please. Tell him that his notes to the bank were due and payable on Monday of this week, and we must have our money. But, Mr. Partridge, we... We showed our books to Mr. Borden only last week, and he agreed to extend the notes until our accounts receivable came in. Our business is in fine shape, Mr. Partridge. Our books prove it. Please tell Mr. Manletter that we'll accept our money in the morning, Miss Rochelle. But it's $100,000. We can't possibly raise that money overnight. I'm sorry. That's Mr. Manletter's problem. Goodbye. $100,000. Hello, Jean. Mr. Manletter, the bank just called. There's a new president and they... And they want to foreclose on my notes. How did you know? Read this letter I got at the house this morning. Here, read it. If you want to know how to prevent the bank from foreclosing on your note, have your friend Boston Blackie visit a house at 50 Hunter Street at 7 o'clock this evening. Signed a friend. Mr. Manletter, what does that mean? I don't know. I can't see any connection between the bank and Blackie. But I do know I won't ask him to go to Hunter Street. Well, can we raise $100,000 for the notes overnight? Uh, I don't think so, but I'll try. Only there isn't much hope. Then you must call your friend Blackie. No, it can only mean trouble for Blackie. I don't know how or why, but it must be trouble for him if I'm being forced to ask him to go there. But Blackie thrives on trouble, Mr. Manletter, and it'll save your business. No, I won't call Blackie. I'm going out to try to raise the money. You'll hear from me later. All right, sir. Alice... Will you call a number for me, please? Get me Boston Blackie. Get me Boston Blackie. Four words that the weak use to call their champion. You know, some expressions seem so natural and right, we use them all the time without even thinking, like ruby red and sky blue and so on. Well, what I get a particular kick out of is the fact that we've added a new one to the nation's vocabulary. Yes, I hear tell that nowadays you ladies say rinse white when you want to talk about really white clothes. Of course, there's a mighty good reason why Rinso gets your clothes so white. Rinso's soapy rich suds won't take no for an answer from dirt. They pitch right in in your tub or washer and go to town. Yes, Rinso gets out more dirt. And that's why you ladies are able to turn out those beautiful Rinso White, Rinso Bright washes. So next wash day, whistle for the kind of wash you're proud to hang on your line. Like this. And remember, it stands for Rinso White. Now, meet Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. Uh, tell me, Blackie, which one of these girls do you like best? So, come on, take a look at their pictures. Come on, will you? <laughs> All right, Shorty. I'll judge your personal beauty contest for you. Now, this blonde here... Yeah. Hold it, Shorty. I'll get the phone. Hello? Blackie? Yes. Blackie, this is Jean. I had to call you. Mr. Manletter's in terrible trouble. Hey, come on, will you, Blackie? Come on, get off that phone. I gotta know about this redhead. Lay off, Shorty. Uh, what is it, Jean? What's the matter with Arthur? The bank called an hour ago. I've been trying since then to reach you. They're going to take over the business if Arthur doesn't redeem his notes for $100,000 by tomorrow morning. Well, they, they, they can't do that, Jean. Yes, they can. The notes are overdue. Hey, boss, what about this brunette? Now, come on, come on, will you? Quiet. Uh, not you, Jean. Uh, look, honey, I haven't anywhere near 100000 and I wouldn't know where to go to get it by tomorrow morning. I didn't expect you would, Blackie, but Mr. Manletter received a message saying that if you come to 50 Hunter Street at, 12, at 7 o'clock tonight, the notes will be renewed. If I go to 50 Hunter Street, well, what does that mean? I don't know, Blackie. But if I show up, they'll renew? That's what the note says. Mr. Manletter knew you'd be in some kind of danger if you went, and he wouldn't ask you. Oh, don't worry, chick. You'll hear from me. Bye. So you finally got done. Now, come on, help me. Look at it. See, I got 50 pictures here. Pick out the one I should pin up on my I wall. I can't huh? do anything about your pin-up problem now, Shorty. Oh. 
I've got something at 50 Hunter Street that I've got to pin down. Come in, Blackie. Come in, Blackie. Come in, Blackie. Hey, Come what in, is Blackie. this? Sounds like a record. Hey, you behind that desk. You in the mask. What is this? Come on, talk. First of all, Boston Blackie, don't try anything foolish. There's one of my men behind you with a gun. And now that you've turned around to see, <laughs> let me tell you that you are listening to this recording which I made because I don't want you to know what my voice sounds like in person. A record, huh? Well, personally, I prefer Harry James. Blackie, I want you to listen carefully to what follows. Have you anything to say? Sure I have. I hope you're... Okay, boss. Take the record off. He's out cold. I uh, hope I didn't hit him too hard, boss. There's no sense killing him. The law is going to do that for us very soon. Gee, Blanky, where you been? I've been having pups. Well, I hope they look like their mother. Well, I'm back, Shorty, only I'm not the same guy. You should have had your head examined for going down to that Hunter Street joint. Yes, I, I had it cracked. That's worse. Take a look at this, Shorty. A bullet hole? Yeah. In your coat pocket. Who'd you shoot, Blackie? I didn't shoot anybody, Shorty. Somebody slugged me, and when I woke up, my gun was gone, and this hole was in my pocket. I must have been out for hours. It's, uh, it's almost 11 o'clock. I called Jean, and she told me the bank renewed man letters notes the minute I showed up at the Hunter Street place. Somebody sure took an awful crack at you, hey, Blackie? Yeah, it's more than that, Shorty. Only how much more and exactly what, I don't know. Uh, get my robe, will you please? Yeah, yeah, sure, boss. Uh, give me your coat and I'll hang it over this here chair. Well, here it is. Blanky, uh, what do you make of this business this afternoon? Uh, I don't make it. It's got me stumped. Yeah, me too. Well, here's your robe. Thanks. I think I'll lie down and relax for half an hour. Uh, would you mind fixing me some coffee, oh, Shorty? Sure, sure. Have it for you in just a minute, boss. Thanks. Hello, Blanky. Glad to see me? Well, Inspector Faraday, of course I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Which goes to prove how easy I am to please. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. Now, Blackie, I think you overdid it this afternoon. Well, my head sure feels like I did. That isn't what I mean. Did you ever hear of a private detective named Fred Visual? That crooked Jamis? Yeah. Oh, sure, I've heard of him. And he's heard of me, too, Faraday. I got the guy's license suspended when he tried to blackmail me. Uh, old couple of friends of mine, you know, last year. That's the guy. He didn't like you, Blackie. You know, I'd feel a whole lot worse if you said Rita Hayworth didn't like me. You didn't like him either. I hate rats, Faraday. Come on, what's all this about? Nothing, only Visual was found shot to death an hour ago. What? I'm taking you in for his murder, Blackie. Now, let's get going. Now, look, Faraday, you've done ridiculous things every day of your life. <laughs> but right now, you're borrowing from next week. What makes you think I bumped off Visual? I don't think it, I know it. We've got your gun and it's got your fingerprints on it. Oh. We found it near Visual's body. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't that a bullet hole in the pocket of this coat of yours on the chair? You fired from your pocket. Well, maybe I burned the hole with a cigarette. Uh, no cigarette ever burned a hole like that. Now, come on, let's get going, Blackie. Get dressed and hurry up. Take off that robe, put a coat on. You're coming with me. Come on, take that robe off. All right, all right. Pretty robe, isn't it? Too bad you won't be allowed to wear it in jail. You like this robe, Inspector? Mm -hmm. Well, here, take a good look at Lovely. it. Lovely. Take a good look at it. Right over your head. <laughs> Shorty. Shorty. Yeah, yeah, I'm right here, boss. I was waiting for a signal from him before I caught Well, him. help me tie him up, Shorty. We'll use the cord from the rope. Now, quiet, Inspector, quiet. Don't you know it's impolite to talk with your mouth full? Uh -huh. You'll be tied up like a chicken in just a little minute now. Uh, well, I know what the score is now, Shorty. Somebody's fixed it to look like I knocked off Fred Visual. Yeah, I heard. In a very pretty picture, is it, boss? I'm not worried about the picture, Shorty. I'm worried about the frame. <laughs> Who's there? Let me in, Jean. Hurry. It's Blackie. Blackie? Oh, thanks. Hi. I'm sorry about coming to your apartment at this hour, Jean, but I couldn't reach you on the telephone. Well, they closed the downstairs switchboard at midnight. Oh. What is it, Blackie? What's wrong? I need information, Jean. I need all you know or can remember. There's some connection between a private detective named Fred Visual and somebody at the Morton National Bank. Now... Who was it that spoke to you on the telephone? The new president. Oh. His name is John Partridge. Well, that's the man I'm going to see. Faraday's on my trail again, Jean, and I've got to clear myself. Oh, you'll never be able to get into the bank to see Partridge, especially if Faraday has a dragnet out for you. As soon as you show up, they'll throw you in jail. Oh, don't worry. I'll figure out a way to get in to see him. 
But if I don't get anywhere with Partridge, I'm a dead duck. Good morning, Mr. Partridge. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Partridge. Good morning. Oh, I left you a mail on your desk, Mr. Partridge. Thank you. I'll be in my office if anyone wants me. Don't open your mouth, Partridge, or this gun will shut it permanently. Why? What? What do you want? Aren't you one of the special police that protects the bank? Oh, well, don't let this uniform fool you. I wore it just to get in here. And keep away from your desk. You know, I'm allergic to the sudden pushing of buttons. Ah, that's better. Now, do you know who I am? No. I'm Boston Blackie. That doesn't mean a thing to me. Oh, I think it does. You called Arthur Manletter's office and told him the bank wouldn't renew his notes. But he received a letter saying that if I were to go to 50 Hunter Street, the bank would renew. Maybe you know what you're talking about, but I don't. You've got to be the man behind a pretty shrewd frame-up, Partridge. Unless you're acting on somebody's instructions. Now, which is it? You know that if I raised my voice, you'd be shot dead by the bank guards before you could go through the front door? Well, I'd have company, Partridge. Believe me, you. Inspector Faraday thinks I killed a man. They don't hang you twice for double killing. Why was I framed for the murder of Fred Visible? I don't know any Fred Visible, and I don't know anything about any telephone call that was supposed to be made by me to Arthur Manletter. No, you don't, huh? How about the renewal of Manletter's note? There never was any question about renewing Manletter's note. His credit is excellent. The note was renewed by me personally at 10 o'clock yesterday morning with a notary attesting to the time. And that was certainly long before my alleged phone call. Oh, you played it cozy, huh? You knew Manletter would call me, so you bluffed him. How long are you going to make me stand here? Can't you see there's nothing I know that can help you? Why don't you go? I will. I've got another stop to make. But the minute I leave this office, you'll call for help, of course. Of course. Oh, but you're not going to. You know, the only way you can do any calling, Partridge, is to talk in your sleep. Mr. Borden? Yes? I'm sorry to disturb you at your home. My name is Boston Blackie. How do you do, Mr. Blackie? I, uh, I came up here to see you, Mr. Borden, uh, about your bank. You mean about what used to be my bank? I'm sorry. Uh, who decided to replace you as president? The board of directors. Oh, well, and was it done suddenly? Yes, very. Uh-huh, and uh, where did John Partridge come from? I don't know. He'd been on our board of directors only a short while. Oh. I'm an old man, Blackie. The loss of my bank was a blow to me. Everything came so suddenly, I haven't gotten used to not being there anymore. Will you forgive me if I'd rather not talk about it? Oh, I understand, Mr. Borden. I, I'm going to try to get your bank back for you, but I need some help. Now, here's an address where I can be reached. Oh, you must have some loyal employee at the bank you can depend on, and would you call him and get him to find out something about Partridge? And if you get any information, send me a message. And uh, send that ring you're wearing with it so I know it's from you. I'll send you a message if I get it. But with just a paper clip on it, I haven't been able to get this ring off in years. The paper clip will identify my messenger, if I hear anything. Good. Give me a little help. I'll turn a murder over to Inspector Faraday, get rid of the charge against myself, and give you a bank right in your side pocket. We've got to stay down here at my waterfront hideout during the day, Shorty. Every cop in town is on our tail, and Faraday's sworn he won't sleep till he brings me in. It's okay with me, Blackie. Uh, And go ahead, it's your deal. You got me, let me see, you got me 60 to 17 and two boxes. Go ahead, it's your deal. (laughs) You know one thing about gin rummy, it sure passes the time away. Yeah, it passes my dough away, too. (laughs) Okay, you two, hoist them. Come on, Patsy. Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Now, look, Blackie, stand up and don't try no, no, nothing foolish. I, I know all about you and your trucks. Well, I wasn't exactly going to ask you to pick a card. Who are you? A guy who ain't going to be outsmarted by you. Oh? Tie the little guy up, Patsy. Yeah, yeah, I'll tie him up. Good, too. Don't talk. Tie. Why, I'm tying him. He ain't going to go nowhere for a while. Okay. Suppose we start moving, Blackie. You ready, Patsy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready, Mug. Well, of course, don't anybody ask me. You're ready, Blackie. But you don't know for what. Now, start moving. Oh, this is a ride, huh? Okay. One way? Oh, I wouldn't say that, Blackie. We're coming back, Patsy and me. But we got orders to get you. Orders to get me, huh? Dealing in the Blackie market? 
You'll strain an arm reaching for jokes like that, Bucky. I thought that was rather clever, isn't But it? you might as well know something. Yeah? We ain't taking you on any gang ride. We're turning you over to the cops. Yeah, I'll bet. A couple of hoods like you wouldn't go within two miles of headquarters. I guarantee Faraday's got charges hanging over both of you guys. Maybe. Only he'll be so glad to see you, he won't be able to think straight. All right, let's get moving, Blackie. And remember, I'm the guy that's got the gun on you. Okay, Mug. But take my word for it, someday you're going to beg me to forget that. Blackie, there's something natural about the way you look behind bars. Yeah. They look good on you. Oh, thanks. You've got no idea how nice it is to see you sitting so sweetly in that cell. Now, Faraday, listen, I didn't knock off Fizzwell. No kidding. Oh, of course not. And you didn't throw your bathrobe over my head and tie me up either, did you, Blackie? Well, yes, I did do that, mm -hmm. Faraday. You know I did. <laughs> but I did it to help you. Oh, this is going to be good. Now, tell me how. Well, somebody knocked off Fred Fizzwell. Uh -huh. Your job is to catch murderers, Faraday. I, I had to be free to help you, see? Blackie, you should have been a lawyer. Thanks. Only you're overlooking a slight something. Your gun. Your pretty little gun. With your fingerprints on it. And a slug from it in Viswell's head and the bullet hole in your coat pocket. Nobody else killed Viswell, Blackie. You've got no alibi. You hated the guy and your gun did the job. Looks like kind of a perfect job to me. This is a frame-up, Faraday. Now, you've got to do something you've never done before. Oh, what? Use your head. Look, you're in jail, Blackie, and you tell me to use my head. Don't you think this is a spot where you should use your... Well, it seems as though Inspector Faraday is about to realize a lifelong ambition and has finally found a charge against Boston Blackie that will stick. However, that remains to be seen, of course. You know, you ladies really have it all over the men, folks, when it comes to being sensible about clothes. Come summertime, for instance, you know that one of the tricks of keeping cool is to look cool. And what could look cooler, crisper, and prettier than those bright cotton washables you wear? It's important, though, to remember to keep them bright and crisp. And that's where our soapy rich Rinso comes in. No point in working your head off in summertime, boiling and scrubbing clothes. And you don't have to with Rinso. A short soaking in Rinso suds, often as little as ten minutes, is enough. Then a few quick finger rubs on extra soiled places, and your clothes are ready to rinse. And believe you me, you'll be mighty proud of how your wash looks, too. Your lovely colored washable cottons will stay fresh and bright, week after week, wash after wash. And your white clothes, well, it goes without saying, they'll be... <whistles> yes, Rinso White. So get Rinso next wash day for a Rinso White, Rinso Bright wash. <laughs> And now back to Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Blackie is in jail. Inspector Faraday knows that it was Blackie's gun that killed Fred Viswell, and Blackie can't clear himself while he's in prison. Into the cell block where Blackie is being kept walks a young lady. The policeman at the end of the corridor said I could come in and talk to all the other policemen in the whole jail, and you're the other policeman, so I thought I'd come over and talk to you. All right, miss. But about what? About the ball, of course. Everybody knows about the ball. What ball? The ball we're giving. But I'm selling tickets only to policemen. Well, now I've heard everything. Selling tickets to policemen for a civilian's ball. How much are they? A dollar. But the policeman at the end of the corridor said that if Look, I came up... Look, uh, here's a dollar and keep the ticket. Uh -huh. And the next policeman is right down past this row of cells. Go bother him, will you, please? Yes. And uh, don't tell me that bag you're carrying is full of tickets. There aren't that many policemen. Oh, you're so silly. Of course not. I always carry a bag. It makes me look as if I'm always about ready to go someplace. Well, uh, you can go right now. I'll unlock the door. You can walk down the corridor till you find another cop at the end of it. Uh, his name's Murphy. Isn't every policeman? Oh, I don't know. All right, go. Go on, miss. Right down the corridor. Don't mind them mugs in the cells. Blackie. Jean, what are you doing here? This isn't visiting day. Blackie, listen. I've got to keep walking when the guard looks this way. Oh, oh don't be silly. Come in. The door's open. The cell door's open? Sure. Try it. It is. Blackie, how did you do that? Close the door. You know, I could open the cell door all right, Jean. That was a cinch. But I haven't figured out yet how to get past the guards at both ends of the guard. Well, stop figuring it, Blackie. Here, look at this bag I brought. It's an outfit that matches the one I'm wearing, only it's a couple of sizes larger. Put it on, quick. What, and leave you in the cell? Oh, nothing doing, honey. Oh, I'll go out the door I came in, Blackie, and you go out the other one. Only hurry. The guard might get curious. Okay. Well, it won't take me a second. Now, first roll my trousers up, and then on with the dress. <laughs> oh, oh, you brought a wig, too, huh? You think of everything. Can, uh, can I get into these shoes? Sure, you can. And hurry, Blackie. Yeah. Don't forget your hat. 
Say, it's a cute one. All right, zip me up, will you? And I'm all set. <laughs> there. Oh. I just walk out, Blackie, and tell a cop at the end of the corridor. His name's Murphy. Tell him he ran out of tickets. Uh, can you talk like a girl? Who, me? Of course I oh, can. Oh, you better not talk. Bye, Blackie, <laughs> and luck. Meet me back in my apartment. Oh, thanks, Jean. You're wonderful. Mm, see you later, Blackie. You look awful cute in that outfit. Watch out for the wolves. Oh, not me. For once, I want to be on the receiving end of a... This is the house, Shorty. 50 Hunter Street. I don't know what I'd expect to find here, but let's go in. Why, boss? Well, maybe I can pick up something inside that'll give me a clue to that masked man. Uh, you see any lights? No. Nope, there ain't any but. Okay, now don't hit your flashlight till we close the street door. Oh, what kind of a lock is this? I don't know. But if you're working on it, it's an easy lock. I'll guarantee that. No, Shorty, it's an open lock. Come on in. Shh, quiet. Hit your flash, Shorty. Right. Yeah, this is the room where I got conked. The masked guy sat right over there facing me with his hands folded on that table, and he... Shorty. What? Well, what happened? I know now who the masked guy was, Shorty. Yeah? I'm going to straighten out this whole mess. Wait till I look up a number in this phone book. Let's see. Yeah, who are you calling, Blackie? I'm calling the murderer of Fred Biswell. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. So well, now let's hope I sound like the mug. Hey, boss, this is a mug. Come right down to Hunter Street House. I got Blackie here. He's Hoyt. Oh, you want to talk to him? Okay. Talk to the boss, Blackie, or you get it again. Here, take the phone. So you're the boss, huh? Well, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Applaud? Hey, give me that phone, Blackie. Okay, boss. Yeah. Yeah, that sure is Blackie, huh? Well, oh, you'll be right down? It worked, eh? Good. Yeah. What a swell. Okay, Shorty, now you beat it. I'm staying right here, and I'm handling this alone. But I have a job for you when you get outside. Okay, boss. It may decide who dies for the murder of Fred Biswell. And just between us, I'd rather it wasn't me. Mug, Mug, are you in here? Mug, turn on the light. It's dark. I can't see you. Turn on the light. Here's a light, Mr. Borden. Right in your face. Boston Blackie. That's right, Boston Blackie. <laughs> you had a very nice frame-up all fixed for me, but I think you're going down to explain it all to Inspector Faraday now. Do you? Well, I don't. So the phone call to me was a gag, eh? I might have known it was one of your tricks, Blackie, but I didn't. No harm done, though. I'll just leave. Oh, just like that, eh? Mm-hmm. Huh? And don't think you can threaten me, Blackie. As long as I'm alive, I'm a potential alibi for you. Only you and I know you didn't kill Fred Biswell and that I did. And you've got to let me live in the hope that someday I'll confess. Mm, yes, yes, I guess maybe I do. Oh, you're a pretty smart man, Borden. You'd have to be to have me in this kind of a jam. What did Biswell ever do to you? He thought he could outsmart me, the fool. Some private investors had him checking the books at the bank. Found that I'd taken quite a bit of money that didn't belong to me. And he thought he'd try a bit of blackmail. He didn't get very far. Pretty thorough, aren't you? I think so. How did you know I was the masked man, Blackie? Well, two ways, Borden. Yes? One was the fact that I gave you the address of my waterfront hideout, and later your hoods paid me a visit down there. You were the only one that had that address. The other was that ring you're wearing. Uh, you know, the one you told me you couldn't take off. When I came in tonight, I remembered the masked man was wearing that ring. You know, putting John Partridge in your place as president of the bank sounds like a wonderfully smart idea. It was. I was tired of working, and I can throw Partridge in jail any time I like for a little embezzlement job he did. So he must do as I say. And now, Boston Blackie, let's go visit Inspector Faraday. Well, no, Mr. Borden. I, I don't think I care to see the inspector tonight. No? Perhaps this gun will make you change your mind. I happen to know that Faraday has your gun... You're still under suspicion of murder, you know. And if you try to escape, Blackie, I'll think nothing of killing you in cold blood. You know, I believe you would, Borden. All right. All right, I'll go with you. I guess I'd rather be a live prisoner than a dead suspect. Here's Inspector Faraday's office, Blackie. Walk right in. Go on. Okay, if you say so, Borden. 
Hello, Inspector. Say, look, don't you ever sleep? Hello, Blackie. I've been expecting you. You're a little late. Would you mind telling this gentleman in back of me to get rid of his gun, please, Inspector? He doesn't realize that it's impolite to point. His name is Arthur Borden. Okay, Mr. Borden, I'll take that gun. Certainly. Here you are. Well, looks like I've got a first-rate murder suspect right here in this room. <laughs> it certainly does, Inspector. <laughs> Better lock him up. In just a minute. In fact, I might as well do it very legal and proper. Arthur Borden, you're under arrest for the murder of Fred Viswell. What? Me? Why, I... David, I wish it was Blackie. Only it isn't. <laughs> We've got your confession in your own voice, right on a dictograph record. A dictograph planted in my Hunter Street house? Right. That's impossible. Nobody could have put a dictograph in there. You tell him, Blackie, you figured this thing out. Well, before you came into the Hunter Street house tonight, Mr. Borden, I dialed the inspector's private number on the telephone and left the receiver off the hook, you see. I had Shorty call him before and tell him to expect his private telephone to ring. All the while you were telling me how perfectly you would frame me... The inspector was listening on this end. Yeah, not only listening, but having the whole thing taken down on a record. <laughs> uh, say, Inspector, I did you a favor, didn't I, by turning up Viswell's murderer? You did yourself a bigger favor, but what's on your mind? Well, I'll tell you, Inspector. Shorty told me you have Jean Rochelle booked here. You said it, Blackie. She helped you escape from jail. Well, maybe she did, but uh, if she did, I brought you in a murderer, so you certainly owe her a favor, too, right? Well, maybe. What do you expect me to do, let her go? Sure. You've held her long enough. Now it's my turn. You've heard about making mountains out of molehills, but here's how to make mountains of dishes go right down to nothing in a hurry. You put some rinso in your dishpan, and up go the suds. Plenty of thick suds from surprisingly little rinso. And down goes that stack of dishes in practically no time. Yes, dishwashing is a mighty easy, simple job, with rinso helping out. China, silver, glassware, they're all shining brightly in a jiffy with Rinso's soapy rich suds on the job. Why, even your pots and pans come clean easily when Rinso gets to work. Use Rinso, too, for all the soap and water jobs around the house. It's swell. Now a glimpse at next week's adventure of Boston Blackie. All right, Monahan, give me a little more juice in that light. No, no, don't do that. I can't stand it. That's better. Now, listen, Shorty, you say you don't remember what happened. I, I don't. I keep telling you I don't. All right, maybe you don't remember. You were slug. Now, we don't want to know anything except one thing. Now, think hard, Shorty. Who was the last person you saw or talked to before you were slug? Now, that's all we want to know. I'm thinking, Inspector Honest. I'm dizzy trying to think. I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, hey, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, I remember now. The last person I talked to before I got conk was, uh... Well, was Boston Blackie. Be sure to listen in at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris with Richard Lane as Inspector Faraday. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Original music for the program was by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for the makers of Rinso and wishing you all a very pleasant good night. Warm weather's ahead, and that means greater danger from perspiration. Protect yourself. Use Life Boy in your daily bath. You know, of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And its rich, purifying Life Boy lather agrees with your skin. And don't forget, Life Boy is the only soap especially made to stop. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. (laughs) 
<laughs> what are you reading, Chief, little Abner? No, listen to this, Matthews. Special feature of the great gems exhibit at the famous Godet Jewelers will be the incomparable star of the Nile, Emerald. One of the most precious gems in the world. So precious that George Stevens, vice president of Godet's, is personally bringing the star to Chicago from Chicago to New York. <laughs> I don't get the joke, Chief. <laughs> sure you don't, because you don't know that Boston Blackie's on the same train with George Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> Chief, I don't get it. Well, if I know my Boston Blackie, and to my great sorrow I do, he won't be able to resist a little gadget worth a cool 200 grand. I still don't see what's funny. <laughs> Besides, Blackie hasn't gone after sparklers in a long time. I know that, but I also know one thing that sparkles that's right up Blackie's alley. Yeah, what's that? Dame. Sure, Chief, but the star of the Nile ain't a dame. Yeah, but Helen Crew is. Helen Crew? Yeah, something's bound to happen on a train when it's carrying those three. George Stevens, Helen Carew, and Boston Black. Well, nobody has to lead Blackie to adventure because somehow adventure always seems to seek him out. In just a moment, we'll hear more about Blackie and the star of the Nile. You know, you can lead a soap to water, but you can't always make it give thick, rich suds. Not if it's hard water, and not if you're using one of those lazy bar or skimpy suds package soaps. No, ma'am, that's when you want Rinso. Soapy Rich Rinso on the job. You see, Rinso bubbles up in a mountains of suds, practically at the touch of water. Suds that go right to town on your clothes. Suds that get out more dirt to give you that Rinso white, Rinso bright wash. And no hard scrubbing or boiling to ruin your wash day disposition. A short soaking in Rinso suds, a few quick finger rubs on extra soiled places, and your clothes are ready to rinse. So, next wash day, whistle up a Rinso wash. A wash that's <whistles> Rinso white and Rinso bright. And now, Chester Morris and the adventures of Boston Blackie. It's obvious that an international bank should be established for reconstruction. At the United Nations Monetary and Financial Conference held at Bretton Woods, certain preliminary steps were taken. However, it is only the beginning. Oh, I says, When right. you realize that the International Monetary Fund will total around $8,500,000,000. Million, million. <laughs> but that's only the beginning. Yes, well, a small beginning. You know, I get kind of mixed up when I start counting over 850. <laughs> oh, young man, we'll all have to learn how to count in millions and billions in the post-war world. Well, that's very interesting. Oh, uh, here you are, Stuart. I'd like some dessert. Can you take this seed, miss? Oh, thank you. Never mind the dessert, Stuart. Well, I'm finished. Uh, wouldn't you rather have this chair by the window? Thank you. And uh, good day to you, young man. Thanks for your company. Well, thanks to you for the tip on the international monetary situation. <laughs> I can't wait to use it. Um, very interesting man. Mm, and very distinguished looking, too. Mm. Who is he? I don't know, but he's awfully good at counting. Is, um, is it all right if we talk? Why not? You see, my mother never told me not to talk to strangers on a train. <laughs> I like your mother. <laughs> very intelligent woman. <laughs> well, I'm no isolationist. But to make it proper, my name is Helen Carew. Oh, and mine is Boston Blackie. Mm, I've heard that name somewhere. Are you a baseball player? <laughs> no, why? Do you like baseball? No, not particularly. Well, uh, why did you bring up the subject? Oh, just to make conversation. Fine. Uh, let's talk about you. All right, let's. I'm a very pleased young lady on a train between Chicago and New York. Why are you pleased? Because I didn't expect conversation with my dinner. Well, do you realize that the International Monetary Fund will total about $8,500,000,000 this year? No. Yes. <laughs> you see? Uh-oh, uh it's back again. Excuse me, I've lost something. It can't be that $8,500,000,000. No, it was a chamois pouch. I don't see it. Uh, wait. Oh, uh... I'd better get out of the way. It isn't here. Oh, pardon me, sir. What did you lose? Well, this is terrible. Terrible. Waiter. Waiter. Oh, it sounds important. Young man, you have no idea how important. That pouch was worth $200,000. That's a lot of money to be carrying around. It wasn't money. It was an emerald. One of the most valuable gems in the world. The star of the Nile. What a pretty name. <laughs> I tell you, Inspector, I've been robbed. It was sometime during the dinner hour. The star of the Nile is missing. Okay, Mr. Stevens, I got that much from the telegram the conductor sent. Now, we'll search every passenger on the train if we have to, so calm down. 
Now, you say you thought you left it in the diner. Were you alone? Uh, no, a young man joined me for dinner, and then later, just before I left, a young lady was seated at our table. Mm-hmm. Friends of yours? Oh, no, just the people one meets on a train. Now, this young man, what was he like? Well, he was a clean-cut-looking chap with dark hair, a good build, nice smile. Mm, I'm not a bit surprised. And the young lady? Oh, quite attractive. As a matter of fact, the young man seemed rather taken with her. Well, Mr. Stevens, I don't think you have to worry about your star of the Nile. I might even say the situation is well in hand. Matthew should be here any moment now with the man we're looking for. Here he is, Chief. Welcome, Boston Blackie. Welcome home. <laughs> Your new home. As a matter of fact, I've prepared a special escort to take you there. Well, now, how thoughtful, Inspector. But uh, <laughs> where's the brass band? All right, come off it, Blackie. Where's the emerald? This is a great shock to me, young man. Well, it's no shock to me, sir. I, I know my Faraday. He never fails. He never fails to be dead wrong. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Blackie. But we, you were in the diner with Mr. Stevens when the emerald disappeared. Mr. Stevens? I didn't even know that was his name. Oh, now, Blackie, as if you didn't know that Mr. Stevens was vice president of Godet's and that he was carrying the Star of the Nile to New York, as if you didn't read the papers. Of course I read the papers, Inspector, but I, I was a little more interested in the fact that we'd just taken Can and Saipan. Okay, okay. Now you can tell me all about that at headquarters. Come on, Blackie. Now, look, Faraday, do you mind if I talk this over with Mr. Stevens? Whatever you have to say, you stay at headquarters. Come on. I'll be in touch with you, Inspector. Thanks mm-hmm. again. Now, about that brass band, Blackie, I'll arrange to have one when we send you up the river. Oh, are you leaving, Mr. Blackie? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, my Uncle Faraday always brings the town car to meet me. Uncle Faraday, my aunt. Well, your Uncle Faraday must have a lot of influence. I wonder when the police are going to let the rest of us off the train. Well, Miss Carew, I'll see if I can use my influence. You see, he happens to be the police. Oh, uh, Uncle, meet Miss Carew. How do you do, Mr. Faraday? Please, Tim, meet you. I hope this fellow hasn't taken you in, too. Oh, no, Mr. Faraday. On the contrary, he's been very nice to me. Yeah, yeah, that's Blackie. Well, you might as well know, Miss Carew. He's being charged with the theft of the Star of the Nile. But that's impossible. Impossible? What do you mean, Miss Carew? I was at the table when Mr. Stevens discovered his loss, and I'm sure that Mr. Blackie had nothing whatever to do with it. You haven't known him as long as I have, Miss Carew. You mean to tell me that Boston Blackie didn't do it? That's exactly what I mean. Well, thanks, Miss Carew, for telling the inspector something that he should have known. He usually goes the long way around. You helped him find the shortcut. <sighs> oh, you haven't gone yet, Inspector. No, I'm afraid we'll have to begin all over again, Mr. Stevens. What do you mean? Well, Miss Carew here has a strong alibi for Blackie, and I'm still looking for a loophole, but... Under the circumstances, I'm afraid I can't hold him. But you're going to do something about it, aren't you, Inspector? Well, after all, you were sure that the emerald must still be on the train. Well, that's right, Mr. Stevens, it is. That's what I tried to tell you before the inspector shut me up. Oh, so you know. Well, come on, Blackie, where is it? I didn't say I knew where. Uh, Mr. Stevens, you're rather absent-minded, aren't you? Absent-minded? Why, no. Well, perhaps uh... I'm jumping to conclusions, but... uh... Of course, if you'll remember, you left the diner without paying your bill. I did? Oh, not that I minded buying your dinner, Mr. Stevens, but... It occurred to me that if you were absent-minded enough to forget your dinner check, you, uh, you also might have forgotten something else. How could I forget the Star of the Nile? I put it in my vest pocket just before I went into the diner. <laughs> oh. Oh, I, are you sure you put it in your vest pocket, Mr. Stevens? Yes, yes. Well, then the whole thing's solved. Oh. You know, all during dinner, I was envying you, Mr. Stevens. I really was. You looked so cool and comfortable in that sports jacket you were wearing, and... And you weren't wearing a vest, Mr. Stevens. I wasn't? Oh, well, that's absurd. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, what's going on here? Vests, sports jackets. Come on, Blackie. Don't you remember, Mr. Stevens? Uh, let me think. I, I, I lay down to take a nap just before dinner. Yeah. I got up and dressed and... By George, you're right. Oh. The emerald must be in the vest that I packed in my suitcase. <laughs> oh, Inspector, I'm terribly sorry to have caused you all this trouble. And you, young man and, and young lady. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Good day. <sighs> well, how do you like that? You seem to be disappointed, Inspector. Yeah. You know, if Boston Blackie can sit next to a guy in a train that's got something worth 200 grand and not do something about it, I guess it's time I turned in my bag. <laughs> well, you should have thought of that before, Inspector. Uh... Just think. By now, you could have had a cottage, a couple of cows, a victory garden, instead of that pet ulcer of yours. Uh, by the way, what do you call it? Boston Blackie. What else? Why, Inspector, how sweet of you. Naming your first one after me. Oh. <laughs> Miss Carew, I, I've been looking for you. Here's a cab coming up now. May I drop you someplace? Oh, thanks. Uh, where to, Miss Carew? Uh, the Middleton, please. Okay, driver, 48th Street off Lexington. <laughs> you don't miss a thing, do you, Mr. Black? Well, I, uh, I have a great appreciation for beautiful things. Oh, then you must have seen the Star of the Nile. Star of the Nile? Mm-hmm. I was talking about beautiful things, uh, such as 
Well, the dessert I had for dinner last night. Oh. <laughs> I was just marveling at how clever you were, helping Mr. Stevens to find his emerald. Well, it isn't hard to find something that was never lost, Miss Guru. And, uh, incidentally, thanks for putting in a good word for me with the inspector. Oh, don't mention it. By the way, hmm? I'll, uh, I'll bet there's another thing your mother forgot to warn you about. Oh? Accepting dinner invitations from a young man in a taxi cab. <laughs> I told you not to disturb me, Miss Everett. I'm too busy to see... Oh, who are you? Louis. Louis? Yeah. Miller said you wanted to see me. Oh, uh, oh yes, Mr. Louis. Uh, won't you sit down? Now, look, let's get this straight, Mr. Stevens. I don't know you, but Miller said you had a job for a guy with uh, fingers. Well, I wouldn't exactly put it that way, Mr. And Louis. And another thing, Mr. Stevens. This is strictly business. Miller says you want me to open up a safe down at Godet's and lift the hunk of jewelry. Well, now... Uh... And what's more, Mr. Stevens? I know you're vice president of Godet's. That's your business, but it ain't mine. And if you're worrying about what might happen, you're in a swell spot. After all, who'd the judge believe? Me or you? Well, I'm glad we understand each other, Mr. Louis. The emerald has already been deposited in the Godet vault, and since the exhibit will open tomorrow, there's no reason for any further delay. <laughs> Hey, Blackie, did you hear me calling you? Well, vaguely. To be honest with you, Shorty, I had my mind on somebody else. Well, boss, I just heard something I thought you'd be interested in. Yeah? You know, you were telling me about that emerald mixed up on the train? Yeah. Well, I just got a tip, see? Somebody's going to crack the Godet safe for that emerald. When? Midnight. How straight was this tip, Shorty? A very reliable tip, boss. Uh, a fingers told me. Fingers? Oh, that's too big a job for him. He's only got ten. Well, that's what the man said. He said that. That small time safe cracker. I guess I'd better go down and help him out. But uh, before business, pleasure. Well, for once, Miss Carew, I can't blame Faraday. After all, he, he brought us together. Brought us together? Yes. What do you mean? Well, if he hadn't accused me, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to vouch for me. And, well, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to show you my appreciation. Oh, I see. Well, the whole thing was a little silly anyway. Oh, well, not altogether. Faraday has the memory of an elephant and the persistence of a little beaver. And looks like both of them. <laughs> if anything happens, it's got to be Boston Blackie. Oh, that's a nuisance, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Faraday hounds me, but it's good to have him around at the wind-up. Blackie, I don't quite make you out, but I like you. Thanks. I, uh, I hope that's an understatement. Well, I'm surprised the police are so suspicious of you. Oh, that's the story of my life. You see, Faraday has good instincts, only he picks the wrong person. If he knew, for instance, that tonight I may have something to do with robbing a vault... He'd become suspicious right away. But of course you haven't anything to do with that. But of course I have. Only it's not as bad as it sounds. Oh, now I'm really puzzled. Well, the only puzzle is, uh, why don't I spend the rest of the evening with you? Meaning that you have to leave? Meaning that I have an important conference about something green and something Egyptian. Oh, I see. But like the Sphinx, you won't talk. Perhaps I'll have something to tell you later. <laughs> I'll get your coat. Oh, thanks. I have to phone. But don't make any dates for the next month. <laughs> I want to put in my bed first. <laughs> Hello? Operator, give me Madison 72772. Hello? Inspector, this is Helen Carew. I just had dinner with Boston Blackie. We're leaving now. He's dropping me off at my hotel. He's going down to go days. He's off to the Emerald. And, Inspector, if you should happen to catch him, please don't mention me. <laughs> The flowers that bloom in the summer have nothing on your pretty cotton washable dresses, ladies. Not when it comes to eye-filling loveliness. And say, you were particular to pick out just the dresses you wanted, weren't you? Well, then you ought to be just as particular about your soap. That's when you want Rinso. Wash after wash, Rinso leaves your clothes bright and new-looking. Because those power-packed suds get out more dirt. Yes, you'll be proud of your Rinso wash. I bet you'll join our chorus of women who have learned to sing their way through wash day like this. Rinso white, rinso white, happy little wash day song. Rinso white, rinso white, pretty sing it all day long. Your fine feathered friend has a message to send, so listen, you can't go wrong. Rinso white, rinso white, happy little wash day song. So get rinso tomorrow. And now back to Chester Morris 
and the adventures of Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie, unaware that Helen Carew has tipped off Inspector Faraday as to his destination, is en route to Godet's Jewelers to try to prevent the robbery of the vault there and to discover who is back of the attempt to steal the famous Star of the Nile emerald. It is midnight at the Godet Vault. It's no use, Louis. It's one of them new style vaults. I can't make it out. Well, we got dynamite. I'll have to use it. I don't like a noisy job, but where is it? I left it out in the alley, folks. Now go get it. Okay, I'm going. Try again, Fingers. Stevens is paying off plenty. Well, I'm nervous. This is a big job, boss. <laughs> Too big for you, what? Fingers. Okay, stay where you are. Boston Black. That's right. <laughs> what were you saying about a certain Mr. Stevens? <laughs> now, look, Blackie, let's be sensible about this. You know? We're having a little trouble cracking this crib. Yeah. I'll make a bet. Yeah, I bet you can't open it. Are you kidding, thing is? I'll make a good bet. All right. So it'll pay you to try. Well, I'll make a bet with you. Not the kind of a bet that'll pay you in money, but it might save a few years of your life. Yeah? Yeah. All you have to do is talk. Yeah, we'll talk, Blackie. And drop your rod first. Oh, so you got a little playmate. Okay. Take your gun away from my back. Get it, Louie. I get it. You know, Blackie, this is a happy coincidence. As I said before, we can use you. Only now the bet's off. You're just gonna do it. Come on, get those fingers working. And, uh, and suppose these fingers can't open the vault. And the next time you go to buy gloves, you better look for mittens. <laughs> Come on, take a good look at the crib. Oh, a beautiful job. <laughs> mm. You know, Faraday should see me now. <laughs> okay. Stand back and keep quiet. Yeah, we'll be quiet, all right, but it's up to you, Blackie. This gun can make a lot of noise. Shh. Wait a minute. It feels like, uh... Ah, there's one. Now, let's try this. Uh-huh, next one. Oh, now that's two. Now... Hold it up. Hold it up, Louie. Break this door down. Come on, it's the long. It's the cops. Yeah, yeah, Miller. Is the alley door open? Yeah, and Joe's coming out there. Okay, let's beat it. Now, what about Blackie? Ah, forget about Blackie. Come on. Okay, okay. Hey, there you go, Chief. Stop, Blackie, or we'll shoot. I warned you, Blackie. Hey, this isn't Blackie. Hey, who are these other two? Oh, Louie, huh? Yeah, Fingers and Miller. Hey, what is this, a national convention? Where's Blackie? How'd you know Blackie was going to be down there, Faraday? A little bird told me, but where is he? Well, now, I don't expect you to believe this, Inspector, but so help me. We were passing by the alley, and we heard a noise, and we come in. Naturally curious, you understand? Yeah. And who do you suppose was starting to crack that vault? Don't tell me, Boston Blackie? Yeah. Well, then, what are we doing out here in the alley? He couldn't have gotten away. Yeah, Chief, there's only two doors to that room. We came through this one. Hey, so Eddie. he better be back in that vault room. That's right. Eddie, watch these mugs here. Right. Come on, Matthews, let's have a look. Yeah, he ain't in here, Chief. Ain't in here. Oh, I can see for myself, Matthews. I can see for myself. You must have slipped through the door before we came in. Matthews, you're fired. Me, Chief? I ain't done nothing. That's the trouble. You never do anything. Now, see if the vault's open, Matthews. Okay, Chief. Now, lock tight in the drum. There ain't a mark on it. Looks like we saved the emerald for go days, huh, Inspector? Yeah, but I wish somebody had saved Blackie for me. Matthews, I hate to say it, but we gave Blackie a break. We came in just in time to save him from getting into trouble. I just wanted to thank you, Inspector, for preventing the robbery last night and catching the thieves. Don't mention it, Mr. Stevens. Uh, tell me, did they have a chance to open the vault? Nope. We were Johnny on the spot. They never even got started. Well, Inspector, I can't thank you enough for the fine job you've done. Mm, fine job. Nothing ever happens. Nobody steals anything. Listen, Mr. Stevens, if somebody should steal that emerald and I catch him, then you can thank me. <laughs> what burns me up is that Boston Blackie was down there, too, but he got away. Boston Blackie, he got away? Are yeah. you sure the vault wasn't opened? Sure, we tried it. It was locked tight. Well, that's fine, but uh, to be on the safe side, I'd better check up. I'll go right down to the vault myself. Mm. But I tell you, Faraday, it's gone. The emerald's gone. I just searched the vault. It's gone. That's great. I've really got Boston Blackie now. Don't worry, Mr. Stevens. Calm down. You'll get your star, and I'll get Boston Blackie. So that's what happened, Helen. Faraday collected three mugs, and he didn't seem pleased about it. Blackie, how did you get out? Well, while Faraday was rounding up the other mugs, I got the last number of the vault's combination, you see. Mm -hmm. I opened the door and stepped in and then closed it. But you might have been locked in. I was locked in, fortunately, because somebody tried the handle of the vault later. Hmm. You see, Helen, modern vaults have an anti-hold-up device. What's that? Oh, it's a sort of gimmick that locks the door from the inside. Mm -hmm. Well, I just pushed the lever. 
After they left, I slipped out through the alley door. What were you after, Blackie? I told you before. Something green and something Egyptian. The star of the Nile Emerald, of course. Did you find it in the vault? Yes. Oh. But I didn't take it. I just wanted to make sure it was there. You didn't take it. Blackie, I don't understand you. Now, look, somebody's after the star of the Nile, and if he gets it, somebody's going to take the rap for it. Could be me, but that's not the point. Nobody's going to take a rap for somebody else while I'm around. You're talking about somebody. Who? I'll find that out. But first, I want to have a talk with Mr. Stevens at his hotel. Perhaps he has an idea. Goodbye, Helen. Next time, I promise you, we won't have any outside interference. Operator, give me Madison 72772. Hello? Helen Carew speaking. Oh, the inspector isn't there? Well, then I want to leave a message. Tell him that Boston Blackie is on his way to the Cavanaugh Hotel to see Mr. Stevens. I can't wait for the inspector to call back, so tell him I'm going to see Stevens, too, right now. But try to get the inspector there as quickly as you can. Slow down, Blackie. Slow down there. Okay, you can march in step with me and Matthews now. Oh. You're taking your afternoon constitutional, gentlemen? What were you doing back there at the Middleton apartment, Blackie? Now, Inspector, you're privileged to know anything about my public life. Mm -hmm. But I insist that you don't interfere in my private affairs. Hmm. Well, this is a little private affair that I am interfering in. Oh. You're under arrest for stealing the Star of the Nile. What, again? And no alibi this time, either. You were down at the Good Day vault with Louie and the two other guys. I got them and searched them, but you got away. Now, somebody got that emerald out of the vault. Come on. Shake a leg, Blackie. Hey, I didn't say stop. I said go. Police! Police! I've what? been robbed. You have? Who robbed? Oh, have you gone nuts, Blackie? Let me go, police! Oh, cut it out. What is it? Who what? Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Help! Now listen, you all really give it to you. You're imitating me. Hey, he's gone. Matthews, why don't you help me out of this? Come on. Hey, folks, look, I'm a police inspector. Honest, I am. Matthews, quick, shoot it, Blackie! Hey, listen, all of you, stand back. Lay off that fella. He's a police. That's Matthews. He's police too. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Say, did Blackie get away? Yeah. Matthews. You're fired! But I was sure he was coming here, Mr. Stevens. Miss Carew, why should Mr. Blackie come to see me at my hotel? Besides, I'm confident that by this time, Inspector Faraday has made sure that the young man is no longer a free agent. Perhaps, yes, perhaps you're right. But, well, I'm not sure the inspector is right in what he's doing. Well, now, Miss Carew, it's quite obvious that you have an attachment for Mr. Blackie. And if the police have taken him, I won't have to worry about the start of the Nile any longer. The police haven't taken me, Mr. Stevens. Boston Blackie. And incidentally, if I knew how much the star of the Nile would be worth to you, I, uh... I might listen to reason. Blackie. Hello, Miss Carew. I rather expected you'd be here, too. I wouldn't try to phone, Mr. Stevens. You really don't want the police to come up here. Why not? Because it would be very embarrassing for you. And besides, it would be very embarrassing if I had to use this gun. Blackie, look. Oh, Helen, don't. Helen, why did you knock the gun out of my hand? Because you had me fooled for a while, but I'm finally beginning to understand you, Blackie. All right, the two of you stand still and put your hands up high. Oh, so you have a gun too, Mr. Stevens. Is, uh, is that to guard the emerald you stole from your own vault? Mr. Stevens took the emerald? Yes. Usually when people want to steal something, they just steal it, but Mr. Stevens had to do it the hard way. But you made it much easier for me, Mr. Blackie. You see, you were in the vault, and now everybody will know that Boston Blackie stole the emerald. But just one thing I'd like to know, Mr. Stevens. Why does a vice president of a large firm like Godet's have to steal a piece of jewelry. Well, there's an ugly word for it, embezzlement. I'm awfully oh. sorry, Miss Carew. Sorry that you came here tonight because no one else can know what you two know now. I'm going to have to kill you. Come on, Stevens. Give me that gun. Stay where you are. I want that gun, Stevens. Blackie, don't. I told you to stay where you are. Look, you can't pull that trigger. Get back! Get back! Thanks, Helen, for sending the message. Uh, Inspector, I think Mr. Stevens will go with you now. Oh, Stevens? Yes, Inspector, and thanks for putting Helen on this case. We've got your man. Come on, let's go. No, I won't go. I can't go. I've gone long enough. I can never catch up. For years now, I've been running after myself, running away from something. I couldn't stop. But I've got to stop. You'll never get me, I tell you. I've got to stop. Get it. Get it. Well, we got what we were looking for, but I can't say I'm very happy about it. Well, Faraday, this time I've really got to thank you. <laughs> Don't kid me, Blackie. No, on the level. You saved my life. <laughs> you know, it's the first time in ten years that I've been scared. Really? Well, you know, Stevens might have pulled that trigger. No such luck. Oh, very funny. <laughs> yes, he'd have shot Helen and me if you hadn't knocked on the door. He had only one other way out, Faraday, and because you came in, he took that way. <laughs> Always blaming it on me, huh? <laughs> now, look, Inspector, won't you miss me a teeny little bit? Does a guy miss a headache? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Helen, you really had me fooled. Hmm? But let me give you a tip. The next time you call Madison 72772, you better be inside a telephone booth. What? 
Remember when we were out to dinner the first time? Yeah. Well, I went to get your coat, and as I was leaving, I heard you ask the operator for Madison 72772. My private number. Sure. Only a few people know that number, and I'm proud to be one of them. So you knew I was working for the inspector. Sure, but that didn't matter. You already had your hooks in me, and I couldn't get loose. Well, perhaps now you'd like me to unhook you? Oh, honey, with you, anything goes. By hook or by crook. <laughs> I suppose it's your business if you want to make a big job out of dishwashing, but I'd like to butt in just the same because I feel you don't really like to spend a lot of time at the kitchen sink, and you don't have to if you put Rinso to work for you. Those peppy Rinso suds get your dishes sparkling bright so easily that there's not much point in scraping and scouring with the lazy suds of some soaps. And Rinso's so economical, too. Just a little Rinso goes a long, long way. So better get Rinso tomorrow for dishwashing for all the soap and water jobs around the house, and for a wash that's Rinso White and Rinso Bright. And now a glimpse at next week's adventure of Boston Blackie. Here goes. What a crack-up. Them plainclothes cops in that car, they never going to interrupt another one of our hijack jobs. Plainclothes cops? (laughs) There ain't no cops. The driver of the car that just wrapped around a telephone pole is Boston Blackie. Friends, millions of tons of paper are needed to ship ammunition and blood plasma, so vitally necessary in the winning of this war. Do your share to see that our boys get the material they need. Save paper. The need is terribly urgent. Now, one simple way to help is to take your own shopping bag to the grocer's. Be sure to listen in at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday, music by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying good night for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes. <laughs> And when you get Rinso tomorrow, buy some Life Boy, too. Use Life Boy in your daily bath or shower. You love that rich, purifying lather. You know, of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And besides, it's the only soap especially made to stop... This is the National Broadcasting Company. Ten p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. For supreme accuracy, expert design, and outstanding value, choose a Bulova, masterpiece of fine watchmaking. WEAF, New York. Lever Brothers, makers of Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso, presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. <laughs> Step on it, Steve. I got my foot on the floor now. We gotta do something, then we'll never lose that car that's chasing us. I'll talk, lean out to see if they can hit a tire. Okay. Well? Missed. Hey, hey, what's that curve? I'll take care of the driving. Try it again. Uh, well, try and hold this bus steady, will you? I'm doing the best I can. I've been fighting this wheel for 20 minutes. Now, after I swing around that next curve, I'll slow up. Try and get that tire again. Okay. Here it goes. I got her. I got her, Steve. She's heading right for the telegraph pole. What a crack up. Them plainclothes cops in that car ain't gonna interrupt another one of our hijack jobs. Plainclothes cops? Those ain't no cops. The driver of the car that just wrapped around the telegraph pole is Boston Blackie. <laughs> In a moment, we'll meet Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. But first, a fashion note for summer. The spotlight is certainly on cotton, and that's not just my idea. I was looking through a couple of those fancy fashion magazines, and every page had something about crisp, colorful cotton dresses, cotton evening things, daytime dresses, and so on. Well... 
speaking from the man's point of view, I'm for it. Those printed cottons are certainly mighty pretty. And speaking from the soapy rich Rinso's point of view, it's easy as a breeze to keep them crisp and colorful. Rinso's rich suds are gentle and safe for washable colors. Leave their bright colors gay and sparkling week after week. And it's so easy to do a Rinso wash, a short soaking, a few quick finger rubs on extra soil places, and your clothes are ready to rinse. Really Rinso white and Rinso bright, too. So next wash day, be sure you have Rinso on hand to give you a hand. And now, here is Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. Tell me, Blackie, uh, how does your wrist feel, huh? Oh, just a slight sprain, Shorty. But we're lucky. We might have been killed when those thugs got our front tire last night. <laughs> I thought for a moment we were killed. Hey, Blanky, let's stay up here in your apartment and mind our own business for a while, huh? huh? At least until I get over that shaken up I got well, you. Well, we know? weren't looking for trouble. We were just driving along and... Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. Always that and. <laughs> That's what gets us into more jams. All right, so we went for a drive. Nothing unusual in that? No, but why'd you have to notice that big sedan was parked right in front of a truck and two guys were holding up the driver? Well, I always feel sorry for the guy on the other end of a gun. Yeah, but listen, boy. If you want to listen to... Uh, you too, shorty. Up high, way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I cover, Mike. Okay. So the crack-up didn't kill you guys, huh? The boss sent us to find out. You have more lives than a cat, Blackie. Yes, I've got ten. And that means you rats better look out. <laughs> hey, hey, that's good, isn't it, Blackie? <laughs> it's a wonderful shorty. Uh, say, what are you mugs doing here? The boss didn't like the idea of you interfering with that hijack job last night. Oh, well, I don't like the idea of having my car wrecked either, Stooge. We well, ain't interested in what you like. We got a pretty good setup, Blackie. Well, I'm so glad. That's fine. Yeah, we got a lot of meat tied up, and we're getting good prices for it. Well, what do you want me to see me about? What? Uh, what's the catch? The boss wants to know if you want in on the racket. What? Yeah. See, he don't want no more interference from you. That's the catch. Oh, black market, huh? Well, if I say no, what does the boss say? He says we should give you a little treatment. Oh, and by the way, who is your boss? Hmm. Never mind. Well, how do I know your boss is a reasonable guy? Hey, where are you going? Now, don't be scared, Stooge. You know, I always talk when I'm thinking. After all, you're the one that's got the gun. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, boys, I've finished thinking. I guess I have no choice, huh? Well, tell the boss I'll go along with him. <laughs> uh, now you're talking sense. Yeah, well, I guess that makes us partners, huh, boys? Uh, say, how about a little drink on that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take a snort. Fine. I, I'm sorry. All I've got is bourbon. That's up there with me. Uh-huh. With, uh, with soda? Yeah, yeah. Well, come on, boys. I'll build you a couple. Say when, Steve. When? Look, uh, I gotta hold this gun on you, Blackie. It ain't that I'm uh, impolite, it's uh, just that I'm careful. <laughs> you flatter me. How much soda? Gee, I never had it with soda before. Really? You haven't? Well, you're going to get it. Well, all right, give it to yes, All right, Shorty, I'll take care of this one. <laughs> okay, boss. Okay, I got his gun. Why, you... Why, take it easy, Steve. Now, cut out the nonsense. I've got your gun. Now, be a good boy. You wanted an answer for your boss, huh? Well, you have it. Now, get out of here. And in the future, boys, remember, never drink during business hours. Say, boss, did you know that it was 103 in needles yesterday? That's an enlightening breakfast conversation, Shorty. Thanks. Never mind, I'll get it. Boston Blackie? That's right. Sorry to disturb you so early in the morning. Well, uh, won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, Shorty, another cup of coffee for Miss, uh, uh... Parker. June Parker. Well, Miss Parker, you're a charming eye-opener for so early in the morning. Boston Blackie, I need your help. And I'm glad to know you, too. As a matter of fact, you've already helped me. I have? Mm Mm-hmm. My driver tells me you helped one of my trucks get through the other night. One of your trucks? Yes. Well, uh, I, I don't quite understand. Well, this may sound a little strange to you, but I have a ranch and I raise stock. Yes? Yeah. I've sold a lot of cattle, only I can't deliver it to my customers. Oh, I see. And, and your trucks are being hijacked by that black market gang, huh? Yes. That's why I came to you. 
Will you help me get them through? <laughs> you know, that's the second offer to go in the meat business that I've had in the last 24 hours. Why don't you go to the police, Miss Parker? I'm sure Inspector Faraday would be glad to give you protection. I've gone to the police, but my trucks still aren't getting through. Oh, mm, you're really in a jam. Uh, those black market thugs are worse than any racketeers we've ever had in this country. I've been offered any amount if I'd sell to the black market. But I won't, not for anything. Of course you won't. Then you'll help me? Now, look, Miss Parker, it isn't only helping you. It's helping me. It's helping everybody. The black market is one of the biggest things we've ever been up against. And you're fighting that black market. You know, you're the kind of a girl who's helping win this war. Uh, coffee's ready, boss. Forget the coffee, shorty. We've got a job to do. The biggest job we've ever done. <laughs> See you, Matthews? Yes, Inspector. Yeah, I'll be with you in a minute. Got to finish writing this letter. Hey, Matthews, how do you spell stupidity? Um, F-A-R-A-D-A-Y. F-A-R-A... Hey, oh, it's you, Blackie. <laughs> I should have known. Matthews can't spell. All right, what do you want here? Well, I don't know. What have you got here? One of these days, we're going to have you here, in a cell. Oh, Faraday, you're nothing but an idealist. Oh. You know, I've been lonely. Uh. You haven't been bothering me lately. <laughs> What's the matter? Don't you love me anymore? I uh, love you anymore. I love you like <laughs> poison ivy. What do you want, Blackie? Well, Faraday, my life has been threatened. Oh. I want police protection. <laughs> you're wonderful. <laughs> you want police protection, Blackie. Stop now, it. wait a minute, Faraday. I'm <laughs> serious. There's a gang after me, and they're not fooling. Oh, poor little Blackie. I'd like to see the gang that you couldn't handle. What is this, a gag? No, 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 wait a minute. I'm on the level. Oh, Blackie, you're breaking my heart. You've never been on the level with me in your life, so why should I start believing you now? Oh. Oh, so you won't give me police protection, huh? Don't make me laugh. Okay, Faraday. That's all I wanted to know. Blackie wants protection. <laughs> Got him, Mike. I better get him into the car. Come on. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Boston Blackie's going for a long trip. Well, it looks as though Boston Blackie's in a pretty tight spot. But Blackie is also a pretty resourceful individual, so just wait and see what happens. You know, we used to have a nice hand-embroidered motto hung up on our wall that said, True friends are like diamonds, precious and rare. How well that applies in wartime to the washing machine. Yes, ma'am, if you're lucky enough to have a washer, keep in mind that it's your true friend and take care of it. One way is to follow the advice of the makers of 33 leading washers and use Rinso. You see, Soapy Rich Rinso gets out more dirt. And with such a short run, it's easy not only on your clothes, but on your washer. And Rinso results are something to see. All your white clothes gleaming, sparkling. Sure, Rinso white. And colors washable, Rinso bright. So be sure to put Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, right on top of tomorrow's shopping list. And now, back to Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. <laughs> Well, Boston Blackie, intent on breaking up a black market meat ring, was waylaid by thugs as he was leaving police headquarters where Inspector Faraday had just refused him police protection. Blackie has been thrown into a car. Hey, Steve, he's coming too. Must be this country here. Stop the car. Okay. Let's get this over with. Yeah, I'll take the gag out of his mouth. Yeah. Nobody can hear him out here. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I want to get my necktie back anyway. The best one I got. My girl gave it to me. She's a redhead. <laughs> Says it matches her hair. <laughs> you know, it's too bad she ain't a brunette. Yeah, uh, you just don't like redheads. Hey, never mind putting on your tie now. Leave it there in the seat and let's get this job over with. Come on, Blackie. Can you talk? Well, what is this? The end of the line? No. This is where we transfer. Okay, boys. What's the score? Two to nothing and you're the nothing. <laughs> Blackie, can you stand up? Well, I'm not so sure. Well, you better stand up while you can, Blackie. You're going to be laying down for a long time. You have a charming sense of humor. You had a chance to join up with us, Blackie. You nixed it, and now you're getting rubbed out. Oh, boss's orders, huh? Yeah, and besides, it gives us a chance to get even for that soda trick yesterday. I see. Get over that fence, Blackie. 
<laughs> Say, what is this? An obstacle course? Yeah. And you're the obstacle. Hey, yeah. Steve. Hey, what's that over there? Huh? Uh, nothing. It's just a cow. <laughs> that happens to be the cow's husband, gentlemen. Gee, a bull. Hey, if a bull sees red, he goes crazy. <laughs> What's the matter? You scared, Mike? Ma, we gotta finish our job. Okay, Blackie? Anything you wanna say? Any, uh, last request? Well, um, uh, well, I'd like to start running, gentlemen, if you don't mind, and I'm sure you would, too. What? Uh, that bull's coming this way, and fast. Hey, uh, hey, he's after me! Hey, hey, he's after me! <laughs> Thanks for the gun, Steve. Hey, let's get out of here, will you? Don't worry, Steve. The bull's after Mike. You see, I stuck his own red necktie in his back pocket. Who's that? Uh, it's me, June. Boston Blackie. Oh, Blackie, just a minute. Well... Please come in. I'm glad to see you, Blackie. <laughs> Thanks. I'd like some information, June. These gents we're up against are playing a little rough. Oh, Blackie, what happened? Well, I went to Faraday for protection. He didn't believe I needed it. Next thing I knew, I was tapped on the head and ended up in a cow pasture playing matador. Blackie. Now, look, June, all I want to know is just one thing. You told me that somebody tried to get you to sell your cattle to the black market ring. I want to know who that somebody is. Well, uh, I can't tell you. I, I don't know. Oh, if you're being afraid, don't be. I'll see that nothing happens to you. And it's also a little bit important that nothing happens to me, too. Now, look, all I want to know is, who approached you on that black market deal? Well, some men who said they represented a Mr. George Williams. Williams? Well, who's he? I don't know him. He has a wholesale meat plant on Johnson Street. Yes. But, Blackie, I, I, I've i never seen him. Quiet, June. What's the matter? The doorknob. It's turning. Oh. Now, I'll be in back of the door when it opens, but you keep on talking. Okay. Uh, but, Blackie, I... Oh, I don't know whether I can go to dinner with you or not. I, uh... Oh. Okay, drop those guns. Now, drop them fast. I'm right here in back of you. Better drop your gun, too, Steve. Well, you two matadors again, huh? <laughs> this is getting a little monotonous. How far did that bull chase you this morning? Uh, I'm a little fed up with you two guys. Uh, June. Yes, Blackie? Take the cord off those drapes. I want to tie up these two bullfighters. Then I've got to go over and see a man by the name of George Williams. Blackie, I, I'm afraid well, you I... You don't have to be afraid, you. Oh, when Blackie ties them up, they stay tied. And when I get through with this, you'd better call the police and have them pick up these mugs. Um... And i got to work fast. Hey, Miss Parker. You ain't going to call no police. Oh, what? What do you mean? And besides, you're going to untie us right now. Or else the boss won't like it. You, you mean Mr. Williams? No, Miss Park. You see, uh, Williams ain't his name. His real name is Parker. <gasps> Parker, yeah. George Parker, your brother. Now, will you untie our hands? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Blackie. I operate a legitimate business here. I sell only at ceiling prices. I came up here to tell you I'm tired of being kicked around by those two mugs of yours. And also that you're going to lay off June Parker. June Parker? Who's she? Well, she's the girl you've been threatening. You know, the one that owns the trucks you've been hijacking. But you won't do it anymore. You see, I'm taking you with me. You're taking me with you? That's right. You're going to be my insurance that from now on, this black market gang of yours is unemployed. What are you going to do with me? What's he going to do with you? He ain't going to do anything with Faraday, you. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'll bet you are. Inspector, my secretary had the good sense to call you. And I'm glad you got here so fast. Mm -hmm. What's Boston Blackie been up to now? He held me here in my office at the point of a gun, oh. Inspector. <laughs> He was going to force me to go with him unless... Unless uh, what? Unless I stopped selling meat at ceiling prices and went into the black market. Now, wait a minute, Faraday. That's ridiculous. You know that can't be right. I don't know nothing. Oh, you know a thing or two. You're oh. just being modest. I'm a reputable merchant, Inspector. Huh. I've been in business for years. This blackie person wanted me to make this plant his headquarters for illegal meat sales. Now, Faraday, listen. He claims I pulled a gun on him. I don't even have a gun. It was in his hand when you came in that door, Inspector. With Blackie, that don't make any difference. He can make anything disappear. Thanks. 
Someday I hope he goes to work on himself. This Williams is head of a black market ring. Oh, that's not true. Not only that, but he's got a couple of thugs that have an obsession about my collecting old age pensions. That's ridiculous. Oh, Please take Blackie with you, Inspector. I'll prefer charges. Now, wait a minute, Inspector. <laughs> I know I've tricked you, and we've been playing hide-and-go-seek for years. Go on. But I've never gone back on my word, now have I? That's right. And I'm not going to try any tricks. <laughs> I just want you to come with me to a young lady's apartment. Oh, now, No, Black... really, I, I want you to meet two friends of Mr. Williams. Hmm. And if I can't prove that my story is true, well, I'll... I'll go downtown with you. Now, nothing could be fairer than that. Mm, eh, sounds all right. But then you can make anything sound okay. You want me to see a gal who'll set me right on this whole thing? That's right. Okay, Blackie. I'll give you a chance to square yourself, but remember, this better not be a runaround. This is the apartment, Inspector. Come on in. Who is it? Oh, it's me, June. It's his Blackie. I'm here with Inspector Faraday. Hmm? Who? Inspector Faraday. Wait a minute. I'm coming. Well, hello. Hello, mm -hmm. June. Uh, would you mind telling the Inspector about that black market ring that threatened you? What black market ring? Well, you know that the... <laughs> June. I'm Miss Parker. And who are you? That's all, Blackie. I've heard enough. June. Now, what happened to those two men I left tied up here at your apartment? Inspector, who is this man? Don't oh. you know? He says he's a very dear friend of yours. Oh, why, I've never seen him before in my life. <laughs> and now, will you excuse me, please? Okay, oh. Blackie. We made a deal. This gal who was supposed to explain everything claims she never saw you before. Come on, let's go. No, I can't go with you, Inspector. Uh, I've, I've got to find out what this is all about. Sorry, Blackie. Figure it out while you're waiting trial. Faraday, will you listen? Uh, this girl is lying, and I can prove it. If you give me time. Give you, I'll give you time, Blackie. You're coming with me. And keep your hands where I can see them. Now, come on over here to the telephone. I'm going to get you an escort downtown. Okay, Inspector, but you're making a great mistake. According to you, I always make them. So what's the difference? Remember, Blackie, I'm keeping my eye and my gun on you. Get me police headquarters. Blackie, stop playing with that telephone cord. You make me nervous. I'm not playing with it, Inspector. Look, get, get that wire off my gun, Blackie. Hey, stop the twisting that gun. You're breaking my wrist. I'm sorry, Inspector. Now let go of the gun. You're going back yeah, on your word, Blackie. That's You're better. going back on your word now. You never did that before. Well, I'm sorry, but I've got to be free to get the head of that black market ring. And put a ring right through his nose. <laughs> Shorty? Hey, open up, will you, boss? Wait a minute. Come in, Shorty. Well, I... Oh. Oh, what are you doing here? Uh, she made me bring her down here to your waterfront hideout, boss. Well, that's fine. What do you mean she made you? She came to the apartment and she was crying. Oh. Boss, you know I can't stand to see a poor dame cry. Blackie, you've got to listen to me. Yeah. Yeah, I listened to you once. I know. I lied to Inspector Faraday, but I had to. Well, that's fine. Why don't you tell it to Faraday? I can't tell Inspector Faraday I lied. I can't. You can't do this. You can't do that. You sound like the Summer Sisters. Uh, why did you make Shorty bring you down here? So that I could beg you to please forget all about me and the black market ring. Oh, well, forgetting about you will be a pleasure. I don't blame you for feeling that way. But believe me, it's for the good of everyone for you to forget about all this. Believe you? <laughs> Are you kidding? You almost did once. Yeah, I almost died once, too. And I've no desire to try that again, either. You wanted to help me when I was in trouble, Blackie. I'm still in trouble. But the only way you can help me now is to drop this whole black market case. Mm -hmm. And you're the girl I thought was going to help win the war. Oh, Blackie, please. <laughs> June, there's no point in your coming here to see me. But, George, I didn't even know you were here in the city. And then to find out what you're doing. How in the world did you ever get started on Just this? Just why should I explain that to you, June? I can't understand you. And Dad couldn't either. When you ran away from the ranch five years ago, you broke Dad's heart. And not, not hearing from you after that didn't help any. I don't see why you should complain. Dad left the ranch to you, didn't he? Yes, but what else could he do? But it's worked out all right anyway. You've done a good job, Joan, raising good cattle. That's helped me in my business. But black market, George. 
You call that a business? I don't go for those names. All I know is I'm making money. And incidentally, Joan, it wasn't in my plans that you should know who I am. And it's your own fault that you do. You got mixed up with this Boston Blackie and I had something to do about it. Well, well, this is convenient, finding the two of you here together. Boston Blackie. Blackie. Well, now who wants to talk first? You, Williams? I got nothing to say to you, Boston Blackie. Oh, I see. How about you, June? I, I can't tell you anything. Well, let me tell you then. Williams, you ought to pick smarter stooges. Or I might say you ought to pick a dumb stooge, one who can't talk. You see, uh, Steve talked. With a little persuasion, of course, but he talked. So, Williams, I know that you're really Parker, June's brother. But, Blackie, I... Now, I June, didn't... that explains a great deal, too. Of course, you made Faraday very happy by pretending not to know me, but you didn't make me very happy. Oh, please, Blackie, you've got to listen to me. Look, I didn't know that my brother was going under the name of Williams. And when I found out, I was so stunned, I, I didn't know what to do. Except I knew I couldn't turn him over to the police. Now I know he deserves to be. Well, sister, I got it, huh? Yes, I think so. Blackie... You said it was very convenient having two of us here. Well, I think it's very convenient having the two of you here. And this gun is very convenient, too. Put them up, both of you. Georgie. Georgie, did anyone ever tell you what happens to little boys who play with fire? Both of you stuck your noses into my business. June always did, and I'm used to that. In any way, she's my sister, but I don't have to take it from you, Boston Blackie. Well, you have something there, Georgie. Not to mention the gun. Uh, June, would you please leave the room? Uh, if I'm right in supposing what your charming brother intends to do with me, it, uh, well, it won't be very pretty. George, you wouldn't. Now, please, June, do as I say. But, Blackie... Please, I... June. Oh, it's all my fault. I got you into this. I, I didn't know that... Oh, my own brother. Blackie! Oh, oh, Blackie, I, I thought... You know, June... For a man raised on a ranch, your brother isn't very quick on the trigger. Oh, Personally, I'm very glad because it gave me a chance to show him his mistake. Blackie, what did you do to George? Can I see him? Well, a little later. He, he's busy right now, you see. He's got a thousand pounds of steaks hanging in his wholesale plant, and he's looking for one little piece of beef to put on his eye. Blackie, I guess I'll forget about you going back on your word. Ha <laughs> ha, good old inspector. <laughs> I had a pretty good reason, you know. Yeah, I know. Anyway, you broke up this black market ring and I got the credit. Thanks. You know, sometimes I find it kind of hard to hate you. Well, keep trying, inspector. You know, you're much prettier with a worried look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, kind of, this thing kind of calls for a celebration, Blackie. Yeah? You and I break up a black market gang and a million people can buy beef at reasonable prices. What do you think we ought to do? Well, let's see, Inspector. Um, how about coming up to the apartment for a home-cooked steak dinner? Shall I bring anything? Yes. Points. <laughs> Boston Blackie will be back in just a moment with an interesting preview of next week's program. Meanwhile, let's see now. Uh, there are the dishes, the floors, the woodwork, the tiles, sink, windows... Hey, I could keep this up for hours. Listing the jobs at Rinso will make easier for you. Yes, those same soapy rich suds that are such a help when it comes to washing clothes are great for all the soap and water jobs around the house. So be sure to get Rinso tomorrow, ladies, for dishes, housework, and to keep you singing through wash day like this. Rinso white, Rinso white, happy little wash day song. Rinso white, Rinso white. Birdie sing it all day long. Your fine feather friend has a message to send, so listen, you can't go wrong. Rinse so white, rinse so white, happy little wash day song. Yeah, Matthews, yeah, I know the guy's dead. You said that. Now listen, did you find the gun? Sure, we found it. It was hooked up inside the radio. When the guy turned the set on, it fired the gun. I get it. Hey. Hey, hey, was the telephone receiver off the hook? Sure, when we broke down the door... Hey, Inspector, how could you know that? Just so happens, that's the way a guy was killed in a play I've been watching. Somebody lifted the idea, and I've got an idea who that somebody was. Yeah? Who, Inspector? The man who's backing this play, a fellow by the name of Boston Blackie. <laughs> Tough luck, ladies. I mean, about choice cuts of lamb going back on rationing. Means you've got to be smarter than ever at figuring ways to fix the meals your families want. Especially since you don't have as many points as you used to. 
Well, the smartest thing to do is to get extra points by turning in waste fats. You know, your meat dealer will give you cash and two red points for every pound you turn in. So get going. You'll be doing yourself a favor and your country an important service. For used fats are urgently needed for military medicines, armaments, and a host of things so necessary to win this war. Strain every drop into any tin can, no glass containers, please, and turn them in as soon as you have a pound. Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday. Music by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying goodnight for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes... And don't forget, tomorrow, when you ask your grocer for the new Rinso, buy a cake of Life Boy at the same time. Life Boy's rich, purifying lather goes right after dirt and perspiration, leaves you feeling extra clean. So use Life Boy daily in your bath or shower. Remember, it's the only soap especially made to stop... This is the National Broadcasting Company. p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. For supreme accuracy, expert design, and outstanding value, choose a Bulova. Watch of a lifetime. W-E-A-F, New York. Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. <laughs> Check here, please. Check your hats and coat. May I have my coat, miss? Uh, here's the check. Thank you. Number 503? Yes, a camel's hair coat. Oh, yes, I remember. It's right over here. Here you are, sir. Help you on with it? No, thanks. I'll carry it. Here you are, miss. Thank you, sir. Check here, please. Check your hat and coat. Oh, taxi. Taxi. What's your hurry, Blackie? Oh, <laughs> well, Faraday, my favorite cop. Don't be so happy to see me, Blackie. You're going with me. Oh, goody. <laughs> what are we celebrating tonight? Your birthday? No celebration for you, Blackie. I want you for the murder of Andrew Lawrence. Oh, you do, do you? Who's he? You know. The caretaker of the Devon Estate. Now, look, Inspector, I don't know any caretakers, and I never even heard of the Devon Estate. Aye, 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 I know, Blackie. What about those stains on that coat you're carrying there? They look like blood. Stains? Yeah, stains. Hey, wait a minute. This isn't my coat. Oh, let me see. Well, now, what's this on the label? It says here, Boston Blackie. Yes, that's my label, all right, but this isn't my coat. Uh Oh, I suppose somebody sewed that label in another coat. Well, that's not bad for you, Inspector. Could be. Well, all I know is you're going down to headquarters and the coat is going to the lab. And I hope those stains prove to be blood. Well, I hope you don't get your hope. Once again, Boston Blackie and Inspector Faraday have tangled. Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Is there anything prettier these hot summer days than a nice-looking girl in a crisp, bright-colored cotton dress? Well, to us men, those dresses always look fresh and cool as peppermint ice cream. And it's almost as easy as snapping your fingers to keep those pretty printed washables bright and gay with Rinso helping out. Yes, indeed, those hard-working Rinso suds make dirt disappear in a jiffy, whether you're using a tub or a washing machine. Rinso's mighty easy on your pretty washable colors, too. They stay fresh and bright even after dozens of washings. So take a tip from Bob White for easier wash days and brighter, cleaner clothes. That's Rinso White and Rinso Bright for your colored clothes. If you value them, better use Rinso every time you wash them. (laughs) 
And now, back to Chester Morris as Boston Blackie, who is in Inspector Faraday's office, waiting word on the laboratory tests of the blood stains found on the coat he was wearing. Blackie, for a smart guy, you get into more scrapes. Uh, look, Inspector, can't you think without pacing the floor? Uh, I've got a little proposition to make you. Oh, but how about the blood stains on the coat, Inspector? Remember, you wanted me for murder. Well, now, just in case those blood stains turn out not to be blood stains. Oh, you don't need to apologize, Inspector. Who's apologizing? <laughs> uh, what are you laughing at? Well, your shoelaces are untied. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you tie them? Me? Yeah. <laughs> now, wait a minute. This is going to be fun. Yes. Yeah. All right, you tie them, Blackie. What? Now, really, Inspector, yes, this you. is quite humiliating. I, I never fancied myself as a gentleman's gentleman. Gentleman's gentleman? Cut out the double talk and come on, tie my shoelaces, Blackie. Oh, oh, well, all right. <laughs> you know, I'm enjoying this. Boston Blackie, finally on his knees. Yes, but not begging, Inspector. Uh, By the way, don't you ever get your shoes shined? What for? Oh, well, there you are. <laughs> I hope you realize it's a privilege to be tied by Boston Black. Wonderful. Here's the report, Inspector. Okay, let's have it. That'll be all, Matthews. All right, Inspector. Goodbye, Matthews. You ain't going anywhere, Blackie. What? <laughs> well, come on, Inspector. What's the verdict? I'll read it to you, Blackie. It says, quote, Stains taken from the coat of Boston Blackie analyzed. Yes. Tests show them to be human blood matching that of Andrew Lawrence, murdered caretaker of Devon Estate, signed Murphy Police Laboratory, unquote. Well, that's it, Blackie. I'm locking you up right now. Oh. And I'm not taking any chances on you getting out of here first. Hold out your hands. Oh, now, Inspector Cuffs, for me? Yeah. Oh, you've got a very bad memory. Okay, maybe you can get out of handcuffs, but my gun doesn't miss. What, a gun again, Inspector? Again. Say, so, look, why don't you try a bow and arrow for a change? All right, let's get going. And just to make sure, I'm going to escort you personally to your cell. That'll be nice. All right, down the hall, and don't try anything funny. Well, will you sit with me a while and hold my hand? Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to tie your shoelaces together, Faraday. And thanks for the gun. <laughs> you know, you look very funny. Generally, you're only flat on your feet. But now you're flat on your face. Got the answer yet, Planky? Not yet, Shorty. Hello? Oh, oh, hello. Savoy Cafe? Yes. This is the manager speaking. Well, my name is Jones. Yes? My niece works in your check room. I just arrived in town, and I'd like to talk to her, please. You mean Marion Macy? Yes. Well, she's not here. I'm sorry. She's gone home. Had a headache, she said. Left here about an hour ago. Oh, she did. Too bad. Uh, by the way, could you give me her address? Why, yes. The Lincoln apartment. The Lincoln, huh? Well, thank you very much. Goodbye. You know, I still can't figure out, Blackie, why that hat check girl would take the label out of your coat and then sew it in another one. Well, she was probably following orders. That's what we're going to find out. Uh, we're going to leave this hot out, Parsi? Yes. We're going to the Lincoln Apartments. Here's the apartment, Shorty. That's funny. Probably asleep. But I've got to talk to her. Can you, can you open that door, boss? Are you kidding? I've got it, Shorty. There it is. Come on. I'm getting a creepy feeling, boss, like I always do. Oh, before. Shorty, will you relax? Hey, hey what's this? What? Holy mackerel, the dame. Boss, that feeling of mine was right. Yes, it's the check room girl, girl all right, Shorty. She's dead. Come on over here and take a look. Oh, no, no, no. I'll take your word for it. Poor kid. Stabbed to death. Somebody's playing for keeps, Shorty. Somebody wanted to make sure I didn't find out who told her to switch coats. If Faraday walks in now, he'll try to pin us on you, sure. Come on, we better get out of here. Come on, boy. Yeah, that's Let's... right. There's nothing around here will help us. Shorty. Yeah? That caretaker was murdered out at the Devon Estate. Yeah. So that's where I'm going. I beg your pardon, miss. I, I didn't see you. What I was... are you doing here on my grounds? Well, this is the Devon Estate, isn't it? Yes, and you're trespassing. Well, I hope that means looking for a job, because that's what I'm doing. It doesn't. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter. There's no job open here. Well, you know, I'm a pretty handy fellow. I can do a lot of things. I'm I... really not interested. There's a policeman on the grounds. If you don't leave immediately, I'll call him and have you thrown off. Oh, please don't do that. 
I understood there was a job open here, a, a caretaker's job. Your caretaker was... Uh... Was murdered. Yes, he was. Now, please leave. I already have a new caretaker. Jerry! Uh, yes, Miss Morrison, coming. <laughs> Miss Morrison, huh? Awful pretty name. Over here, Jerry. Will you go now, please, Mr... Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Morrison. My name is Jones, John J. Jones. I'm a detective. Oh, please don't give me away. Oh, here I am, Miss Morrison. Oh, I, uh... I, I don't need you, Jerry. I, I just wanted to know you were around. Oh, okay, ma'am. If you want me, just sing out. Well, where did you get him? I hired him a little while ago. So you're a detective, Mr. Jones. Have you credentials? Well, uh, you see, I never carry them when I'm on a case. Things can happen, you know. That's what I'm afraid of. Oh, Miss Morrison, please believe me. <laughs> well, I believe you, but I'll never know why. <laughs> Thanks. The house is up this way. What can I tell you that might help you, Mr. Jones? Well, uh, for one thing, I'm puzzled. Now, your name is Morrison, and this is the Devon Estate. Well, I bought it six months ago. Oh. It was formerly owned by a man named John Devon. And when he died, this place was sold for taxes. I see. Well, why are you still living here, Miss Morrison? I mean, aren't you a little frightened after what happened? Yes. Yes, I am a little. But where could I go? Besides, I'm anxious to know the answer to a lot of things. For instance? Well, right after I bought this estate, strange things began to happen. One morning, the chimney was torn apart. A few days later, I found the cellar ransacked. Then one night, the whole living room was turned upside down. I see. Well, where was your old caretaker during all this? He was down the road, sleeping in his own cottage. Oh. But after the living room was ransacked, he slept in the house on a couch. That is, until last night. Or, rather, early this morning, when we found him murdered... Here we are. Oh. Please come in. Thank you. You're pretty calm about all this, Miss Morrison. It, uh, it must be rather annoying. It's more than annoying. My nerves are beginning to jump. Yes, I'm sure. Anything else you can tell me that might help? Well, possibly. I've had two offers to sell recently. The agent who negotiated the sale of this house made me an offer the day before yesterday to buy it back. Oh, and what's the agent's name? Arthur Moran. I see. Go on. Well... When I refused, he said his client, in any case, would like to buy the gun collection that was here when I took possession. Oh. Well, are you interested in guns? Yes, and it's a wonderful collection. It came with the house. Well, it's obvious somebody is looking for something in this house. When he couldn't find it, he wanted to buy the house. When he couldn't do that, he wanted to buy your gun collection. And, of course, he was looking for... The gun collection. I'll bet your caretaker surprised him while he was searching for it. Uh, how long had the caretaker been here? A long time... I sort of inherited him with the place. I see. You mentioned there was a policeman on the grounds. Where is he? Well, he's around somewhere. He's staying with Jerry in the caretaker's cottage. Uh, Miss Morrison, could you arrange for the policeman and your new caretaker to sleep downstairs here and for me to take over the cottage for the night? Certainly, I can do that. Oh, fine. And can you reach me in a hurry if you need me? Yes. There's an extension phone between here and the caretaker's place. Good. I'll call Jerry and tell him he's sleeping down here tonight. Thanks. Oh, uh, Miss Morrison... Uh, what do your best friends call you? Polly. Good night, Polly. <laughs> you see, I'm one of your best friends. Good morning. Hey, what's this? Hey, wait, Jerry. Jerry, I'll have you untied in a minute. Oh, even my Aunt Hattie couldn't talk with that gag on. I better take it off. There. There. Now, what happened? I I don't know. I I went to sleep last night on the couch here, and, and during the night, somebody tapped me on the bean. And when I woke up a little while ago, I was I was tied up and, and gagged. Yeah. Oh, there you, you're not tied up anymore. Now, where's the cop that was with you? I don't know. Uh-oh. There he is, over in the corner. He's tied up, too. Get him loose, Jerry. Oh, take a look at this place. It's a mess. Everything's turned upside down. Well, never mind that. I want to find out about Miss Morrison. Polly. Polly. <sighs> Polly. Polly, what's happened? Uh, Wake up, Polly. Wake up. What? Get up. Come on now. Up. That's a girl. Come on, now. Now, walk around the room with me. Here, put your arm on my shoulder. That's right. Now, tell me what happened. Well, I don't know. You've been drugged, Polly. Now, come on, try and think. I don't know. I'm tired. 
tired. I want to lie down again. Now, look, Polly, you've got to keep walking. Come on. We'll go downstairs, and then you'll feel better in a minute. Hey! Hey, you upstairs. Yes, what is it? Miss Morrison okay? Yes, how's the policeman? Oh, he's hurt pretty bad. I'm taking him to the doctor's down the road. Okay, Jerry. I'll see you when you get back. Now, Polly, come on. Walk. Come on now, down the stairs. That's right. I... I'm beginning to remember now. Good. I put a glass of milk on my night table. And then I went downstairs for a book. When I came back, I drank the milk. And then I got terribly drowsy. Mm. Well, that explains the drug. But you're getting over it all right. What's happened down here? Well, the whole place has turned inside out. Well, I don't know what happened yet. I can't stand this any longer. I can't. Oh, now, Polly, take it easy, please. Here, sit down for a minute. Come on. There, that's better. Well, now, isn't that a pretty picture? Well, Inspector Faraday. Yes, Inspector Faraday. So I caught up with you again, eh, Blackie? Blackie? Certainly, Miss Morrison. Boston Blackie. You've heard of him. But he said his name was Jones, <laughs> that he was a detective. I can tell you why, Polly, if you'll only give me a chance. Not a chance, uh, Blackie. I figured you'd come up here after we found the hat check girl murdered. Yeah. You've got a killing complex lately. Faraday, will you take it easy? I'm really getting close to the murderer. Yeah, me too. I'm practically standing in front of him. Right. Get your gun. Drop on the floor, Faraday. Drop it. Hey, who are you? Let the gun go or I'll let a bullet go, copper. Come on. Uh, mm-hmm. That's being smart. Hey, Danny. Get Blackie's rod. Step on it. Okay, Eddie. All right. What is all this fuss about Blackie? Hero stuff? You're going to knock out these two guys and show off for the gal here? Well, I'd like to, Faraday. Only a bullet moves faster than I can. <laughs> hey, you mugs. I don't mean to be inquisitive, but uh, what's all this about? You'll know soon enough. How about it, Johnny? I got Blackie's rod and the inspectors. Okay. Put the straight jackets on him, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> See, I didn't think we'd get the inspector, too. You better go call the boss. Yeah, he said to follow orders to the letter. Where's the phone, lady? Well, I... Yeah, you better tell him, Polly. Well, it, it's just outside the door. Thanks, lady. Keep them all under the gun muzzle, Danny. Okay. Watch that Blackie, especially. Yeah. I'll be right back. And watch that Blackie especially. What is the guy, a gunman or a press agent? <laughs> what a build-up he's giving you, Blackie. Well, after all, I haven't established a reputation for nothing. <laughs> Even you appreciate me sometimes, uh, Faraday. Uh... Okay, Danny. I talked to the boss. Stick the straight jackets on him. What size straight jacket you take, Blackie? I always have my straight jackets made to order. Yeah, after we get through searching the house, we'll stick their feet in concrete and toss them in the river. Feet in concrete? Now, you wouldn't dare to do that. Oh, don't yeah. worry, Faraday. At least we won't get our feet wet. Very funny, Blackie. Very funny. Don't do it the hard way, ladies. Take it easy. What am I talking about? Why, dishwashing, of course. And the way to take it easy is to let Soapy Rich Rinso take over. Because those lively, hard-working Rinso suds get right after every little bit of clinging grease and all those sticky food particles and chase them away quick as a wink. Just try it. And by all means, have Rinso handy for wash day. This hot weather, you certainly don't want to knock yourself out doing your wash the hard way either. Well, remember, Rinso not only makes wash day a cinch, it helps you turn out a wash you're really proud of. I'll bet you'll be singing your way through wash day like this. Rinse all right, rinse all right, happy little wash day song. Rinse all right, rinse all right, pretty sing it all day long. Your fine feather friend has a message to send, so listen, you can't go wrong. Rinse all right, rinse all right, happy little wash day song. So get rinse all tomorrow. And now, back to Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. <laughs> Boston Blackie, Polly Morrison, and Inspector Faraday have been put in straitjackets by two thugs after Blackie has been accused of the murder of the caretaker of the Devon estate. One of the gunmen is on guard while the other is searching the Devon house. What are you twisting around for, Blackie? <laughs> straitjackets were made to hold people. Yes, handy little things, aren't they? Yeah. I hear you can get out of ropes and handcuffs and things. Oh. Yeah, well, why don't you try to get out of that canvas coat you're wearing? You're due to get a bath, you know. <laughs> All three of you. That's the boss's orders. Well, that's charming. Uh, by the way, Danny, who is the boss? What's his name? Uh, didn't he give you his card? No. Well, I guess he must have forgot. Huh? <laughs> 
Archie, you look funny down there lying on the floor. You know, if I felt like it, I could step all over you. How'd you like to have your face stepped on, Blackie? Like this. Hey, let go of my feet. I don't want to step on anybody, Stooge. Hey, this will make sure you stay on the floor till I leave. <laughs> well, how in the world did you get out of that straitjacket, Blackie? Never mind that. Get us out of out of ours. How did you get out, Blackie? Well, it's simple. I had my pocket knife in my hand, and while they were putting this jacket on me, I... Well, I just sliced right through the canvas. Hey, hurry up, Blackie. That other guy will be back in a minute. I'll let you out, Inspector, if you'll give me a ten-minute start after I do. What for? Well, I think I can find the man responsible for the two murders, but I've got to have time to do it. Mm-hmm. Now, I want ten minutes, Faraday. Come on, what about it? Ten minutes? Okay, you've got it. Thanks. Polly. Yes, Blackie? Uh, tell me, what was the agent's name again? You know, the one who sold you the house and later wanted to buy your gun collection for a client. Arthur Moran. Why? Arthur Moran, huh? Okay. He's due for a phone call. Hello? Mr. Moran? Yes? This is John J. Jones. I'm working with the police department, and I'd like some information. Yes? Uh, who instructed you to try to buy the Devon estate back, and who wanted to get the gun collection? A client of mine in South America. I see. Well, what's his name? Parker Adams. Why, uh, what's this all about? Oh, just checking, Mr. Moran. Who is Adams? Well, uh, he was involved in a scrape here five years ago and went to South America to live. Well, why did he want to buy the Devon estate and the gun collection? Well, I haven't the slightest idea. All I know is that he sent a check every week to Mr. Devon from Brazil. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I believe he owned a coffee plantation or something. Well, thank you, Mr. Moran. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> Did, uh, did you get all that dope I wanted, Shorty? Yeah, yeah, sure, boss. It was a cinch. Look, I go into the files at the Daily Globe, and I pulled out this stuff about this uh, Parker Adams. Huh. No trouble at all. And say, no wonder this guy Adams had to go to South America. Just put your peepers on this clipping, will you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Come on, Shorty. We're going up to the Devon Estate. <laughs> It's me, Polly. Blackie. I'm over here in the bushes. Is the coast clear? Well, there there are two policemen in the house and one outside. Okay. Polly, I think I found out something. I know who the murderer is and I know why he's ransacking your house. But, Blackie, how did you find that out? Well, I checked the newspaper files on a man named Parker Adams who asked Moran to buy this house from you and then wanted to buy your gun collection. He's in South America now, but he was a suspect in a murder case five years ago. But... What has that to do with what's happened at my house? Well, you see, this Adams wasn't convicted because the police couldn't prove him guilty. They couldn't find the gun. And you think the gun is in my house? Yes. And the Devon was blackmailing Adams with it. Polly, I've got to get by those two policemen and get into the house and find that gun. But, Blackie, how? Oh, let's see. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll climb that tree by your window and then drop to the first floor roof. Yes, I know, but the policemen outside... Yeah, I know. I'll throw a rock in the pool. That'll keep him busy while I get in the house. Uh, where is the gun collection, Polly? In the library. Fine. I'll meet you there. Blackie, be careful. Oh, sure. Well, here goes. Is that you, Blackie? Yes, Polly. Oh, I'm so glad. Where's the library? Over here. The gun collection's in this room. Come in, Blackie. Good. Now, we've got to work fast. Now, where are they? In a box in this desk. I'll show them to you. There's a drawer here, but you'd never find it unless you knew it was there. Here they are. Take a look at them. Ooh. Say, this is a fine collection, Polly. All old-timers, too. You know, I was pretty sure that one of them was the gun that Parker Adams killed a man with five years ago. But I can see now that I was wrong. But you said you knew who the murderer was. Oh, sure I do. And I know why he did it, but I can't prove it. Uh, I'm just a dummy. I'm... Dummy. Hey, wait a minute. That gives me an idea. Look at this. 
This isn't a real gun at all. What? No. No, it's a dummy. It's hollow. Oh, and look what's inside. A Colt 25 pistol. Why, this must be the one Parker Adams used. And we can easily prove that by the serial number on it. Polly? Polly, I think this is our ace in the hole. You don't mind if I trump that ace, do you, Blackie? I'll take that gun. Jerry! I'm not surprised, Polly. I had a pretty good idea it was this fellow who was in back of these murders. No, you did, eh? Smart guy, huh? How did you know? Well, when one of your thugs went to call the boss before he put us in straitjackets, he, uh, he just casually picked up the telephone and didn't bother to dial. Mm. There's a direct connection between the house and the caretaker's cottage, and that's where you were, Jerry. You were the boss. You only took this job so you could search for this gun. Hmm, nice figuring, pal. Well, as long as compliments are being handed out, that was pretty clever of you to get yourself tied up here this morning. But not clever enough. <laughs> Why, any good boy scout could tell you tied yourself up, Mr. Parker Adams. Adams? Yes. Hmm. He went down to South America and planted somebody to take his phone calls and pretend to be him. It was simple, but effective. Listen, I've spent a lot of time and money trying to get that gun back, Blackie. Yes, and killed two people trying. And now it's going to be four. And, Miss Morrison, don't keep looking over my shoulder for your cops. My boys are taking care of them. Okay, Blackie, give me the gun. Now, just a minute. Uh, let me get this straight. Uh, the caretaker recognized you when you were ransacking the house, and you had to kill it, right? Well? And you had to get rid of the blood-stained camel's hair coat you were wearing. And then after you had the hat check girl switch coats and sew in my own label... You had to kill her to keep her mouth shut. Oh, she didn't pick your coat on purpose. It could have been any camel's hair coat. Oh, well, I know the rest. Devin was blackmailing you because he had this gun. When you found out he died, you tried to buy this house, but Miss Morrison got it first. So you came to the States and began operations to get the only evidence that could convict you of murder. Oh, you've said enough. You're stalling. Hey, Eddie. Eddie! Yeah, boss? Oh, you got these two, huh? Get the gun Black has got in his hand, Eddie. It's not loaded. Okay, boss. Come on, Blackie, give. Sure. Here. Oh. Holly, hey, she's fainting, boss. Catch her. Hey, stand up. Stop leaning on me, will you? Get off of me, will you? I'll get her, boss. <clears throat> go to sleep, Eddie. Hey, you let go of my hand, will I'm you? I'm holding Jerry's gun hand, Blackie. Yeah, Hurry. I can let go now. Oh. Oh, 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 thanks, Polly. You know, that was mighty nice fainting. Uh, thank you, Blackie. But I think I feel a real one coming on. Oh, you're wonderful. Do you want to be more wonderful? <laughs> How? Call Faraday and tell him what you've heard. That will be enough to clear me. Of course I will. Oh. What, oh. What's the matter, Blackie? Hold me. Hold me. I think I'm going to faint. Faint? A big, strong man like you? Well, it seems to be the only way I can get your arms around me. <laughs> Boston Blackie will be back in just a moment with an interesting preview of next week's program. Now, uh, you've heard about the language of music, ladies. Do you know what this means? That's right, Rinso White. And it means the cleanest, freshest, whitest wash you could ask to see. But you can't get clothes that clean with lazy, old-fashioned soaps. You need a hard-working, lively soap like Rinso. Because Rinso actually gets out more dirt. Why, Rinso just soaks clothes clean, often in as little as ten minutes. And a few quick finger rubs on extra dirty places, and there's your Rinso White Rinso Bright Wash. Yes, for a wash that you'll be really proud to hang up on your line, get Soapy Rich Rinso. And now, a brief glimpse of next week's adventure. Hello? Hello. Say, uh, I'm supposed to meet a young lady in your lobby there, and I've been delayed. Would, uh, would you mind having a page, please? Why, sure, sure. What's the young lady's name? Her name is Alice Manletter. Miss Manletter? That's right. Why, she left here just a minute ago. She met someone she was expecting and left with him. Well, that's impossible. Miss Manletter didn't know a soul in New York. Oh, I wouldn't know about that. But she told me she had an appointment with a Mr. Boston Blackie. And that's the man she left here with. Well, but that can't be possible. And why not? Because I'm Boston Blackie. <laughs> We'd like to take a moment here to congratulate the women of the United States Navy, the Waves, who are presently celebrating two years of service to their country. In two years, approximately 70,000 of America's finest young women have volunteered for the most important jobs of their lives, serving in the Navy. Waves work hard at important war tasks, but they keep their individuality, have plenty of fun and enjoyment with good companions, and have great pride and satisfaction for a job well done. 
If you'd like to help get this war over and bring your loved one home sooner, here's your chance. Join the waves. <laughs> Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday, music by Charles Connell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying good night for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes... <laughs> Summertime means warm weather, and that means more perspiration. Use Life Boy in your daily bath or shower to protect yourself. You'll love its rich, purifying lather. Remember, too, that of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And besides, it's the only soap especially made to stop... The... This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Lever Brothers, makers of Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso, present Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. Front boy, did you sign the register, please, sir? Right here. Yes, Miss Manletter. Is there some trouble with your room? Oh, no, it's fine, thank you. I was just wondering, do you know a Mr. Boston Blackie when you see him? No, I don't know him. I'm sorry, Miss Manletter. Well, thanks, just the same. I was supposed to meet him here in the lobby, but I have no idea what he looks like. My uncle arranged the appointment before I left San Francisco. Oh, there's a man standing over by the newsstand who looks as if he were waiting for someone. Oh? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sure that must be Mr. Blackie. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Hello there. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Wasn't I supposed to meet you here? Uh, uh, you're you, aren't you? Yes. At least Uncle should have had you wear a white carnation. According to Uncle, white carnations don't stay white long in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Uncle told me that you were very witty. Uh, but they do in San Francisco, you know. <laughs> well, shall we go? Where to? Oh, no, don't uh, tell me. I'd rather be surprised. All right, let's go. Oh, clerk, I found the man I was looking for. Thank you for your trouble. Uh, no trouble at all. Hello? Room clerk speaking. Hello. Uh, would you do me a favor, please? I'm supposed to meet a young lady in your lobby, and I've been delayed. Would you have a page, please? Her name is Alice Manletter. Miss Manletter? Yes. Why, she just left here a minute ago. She met someone she was expecting, and she left with him. Well, that's impossible. Miss Manletter doesn't know anyone in New York. Well, she told me she had an appointment with a Mr. Boston Blackie, and that's the man she left here with. But that can't be possible. And why not? Because I'm Boston Blackie. In a few moments, we will meet Boston Blackie, but uh, right now, a thought about the weather. I'll bet it sometimes doesn't seem fair to you ladies. Here it is, summer, blistering hot days, days when you ought to be taking it easy. And what happens? You've got a bigger wash than ever to worry about. More towels, more of the kids' play, play clothes, more of your own wash dresses, more shirts of dad's, more everything. Well, you couldn't pick a more ideal time than now to switch to Soapy Rich Rinso. With Rinso, even the biggest, grimiest wash goes like a breeze. As little as five minutes per load with Rinso in your washer, and your clothes are sparkling Rinso white, clean as a whistle. <laughs> and Rinso is safe for washable colors, too. Leaves them Rinso bright after dozens of dozens of washings. You'll be mighty proud of your Rinso wash, and proud, too, that you bought the big green and yellow package that made it so easy to do. Better get Rinso before next wash day. <laughs> And now, meet Boston Blackie, radio's newest adventure star. Meet Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. 
Uh, listen, clerk, try to think. What did the man look like? I mean, the one Miss Manlet had left with. I don't know, Mr. Blackie. You're rather good-looking yes. about your height and build. But Miss Manletter didn't know anybody in New York. Her uncle told me that when he asked me to meet her. Well, I'm sorry I can't help you. Well, thanks just the same. Oh, uh, here's my card. Mm -hmm. If Miss Manletter returns, have a call this number, will you? Yes, I will. Taxi, sir? No, no, thanks. Uh, look, Dorman, did you happen to notice a man and a girl leaving here about ten minutes ago? A, a pretty girl and a man about my height? Uh, yes, sir. Come to think of it, I did call a taxi for a couple of that, that answers that description. Well, do you remember which cab it was? Uh, yes, it was the one uh, Mike O'Hara drives. Oh, oh uh, that's O'Hara just pulling up to the end of the line now. Well, thanks a lot. Here, buy your wife some flowers. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, O'Hara? Yes, sir? You just drove a man and a young lady somewhere. I want to go where they went. Oh, you want to follow someone? <laughs> You're a bright lad, O'Hara. I don't want to get into any trouble. Maybe you'd better get another cab. Oh, you won't get into any trouble. You see, I'm Inspector Faraday of the Homicide Department. Oh, Inspector Faraday. That's right. Okay, step on it. Oh, sure, Inspector. I'll go as fast as I can. <laughs> This is it. This is the place I left them off. Right in front of this store. Oh, thanks. Uh, here, buy yourself a couple of cigars. Oh, thank you, sir. Gee, I'll buy you a box. No. <laughs> well, how do you do? I, uh, I'm looking for a young couple who came here a few minutes ago. You're looking for a couple. I'm looking for a couple. I'll take a single yet. Nobody comes here. Only Pop and me. Even Pop ain't here now. They have nobody else. See for yourself. Well, thanks. Uh, may I use your telephone, please? Certainly. That'll be ten cents. Oh, um. You wouldn't be interested in buying anything, would you, mister? No, no thanks. No. Well, nobody ever buys anything. Hello, Ashley Hotel. I'd like to speak to the room clerk, please. Uh, say, Mom, have you got any chewing gum? Chewing gum he asked for. Is he kidding? Room clerk speaking. Uh, this is Boston Blackie. Have you had any word from Miss Alice Manletter? Oh, Mr. Blackie, Miss Manletter's been trying to reach you. She wants you to come down here to see her right away. She's in room 305. Well, thank you very much. I'll be right over. Three, please. Third floor. Oh, thank you. 301, 303. Oh, here we are, 305. Come in. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So you're Boston Blackie. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to see you, Miss Manletter. You know, your uncle asked me to look out for you, and then you disappear. Well, you didn't even give me a chance. Oh, you mean this morning? Yes. No, I, I just met a friend, that's all. He followed me from San Francisco. Well, I, I don't blame him. I'd have followed you, too. Uh, how was your trip? Oh, wonderful. This is my first time in New York, you know. I, I practically lived in a dream all the way here. <laughs> well, how do you like what you've seen of it? <laughs> Wonderful. You know, uh, I'd like to show you the real town. Oh, uh, well, I'd like to, only I, I have sort of an engagement tonight. Oh, the same fellow? Uh -huh. You haven't wasted much, much, much time before I came here, have you? <laughs> only the 18 years since I, before I came here. Isn't that enough? Well, that's enough for me to be running along, Alice. Oh, here's my phone number, and uh, if you want anything, you just call. How about lunch tomorrow, huh? Oh, I'd love it. Thanks, Mr. Blackie, for everything. Oh, everything is nothing. Good night, Alice. Twenty-five, boss. Nice shooting. Oh, Shorty, she's a beautiful girl. Look, why don't you forget Danes for a minute? Give me a good reason. Fifteen. Just like I'm telling you, boss, your hand ain't steady. You need some more practice. Well, this Maxim silencer doesn't fit this gun too well. Oh, how come the new gun, Blackie? Where's your old one? Well, uh, well, you see, Shorty, I, um... You what? Well, I, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but, uh, I guess I was robbed. Boston Blackie robbed? Yeah. <laughs> hey, boss, you ain't in any trouble. I don't know. Gee, bullseye, boss. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this new gun will do until I get my old one back. 
Well, there's nothing like a workout with a target to keep your aim in shape, Shorty. You know, I got a funny idea about that, boss. Yeah? I don't care if my aim ain't so good as long as the other guys ain't either. <laughs> I'll get it, Shorty. All right. Hello? Blackie? Well, 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 Inspector Faraday, my favorite cop. Mm-hmm. How'd you guess? Oh, how could I miss those low, dulcet tones, Inspector? I want you down here in ten minutes, Blackie, or I'll send for you. Well, that's fine, but where's down here? The Ashley Hotel, room 305. You won't have to send for me, Inspector. I'll be right down. Mm-hmm. Say, boss, uh, Faraday hasn't got you jumping through a rope, has he? Mm, room 305, Ashley Hotel. Shorty, that's Alice Manletter's room. <laughs> Third floor, please. Watch your step getting out. Thank you. Come on. How are you, Inspector? Holy Mac. Yeah, Blackie, she's dead. Dead? As if you didn't know. Now, wait a minute. How did you know about this, Faraday? O'Hara, the taxi driver, got suspicious, so reported to headquarters. Oh. From his description, I knew it was you, and then I got suspicious. So you're going around impersonating me now, eh, Blackie? Well, you should be flattered. Why did you kill her? Wait a minute, Faraday. Okay, boys, cover him. Now, don't be a dope. I promised to look after this girl. She was all right when I left her a little while ago. Yeah, maybe. After we discovered the body, the boys and I waited for you to make an appearance. We knew you'd be back. Now, Faraday, listen. This girl was Arthur Manletter's niece. Mm -hmm. And I'll take care of whoever was responsible for her murder. No, no, I'll do that, Blackie. You killed her. Now, that's your gun in her hand. My gun? But I don't see how that... We checked the serial numbers, Blackie. I don't care what you checked. Mm -hmm. You can't take me in for this. I didn't kill her, I tell you. Okay, maybe not. Maybe the serial number on this gun is wrong. You know what a paraffin test is, Blackie? Oh, sure, I know. All right. Well, we'll go down to headquarters and cover your hand with paraffin. Fine. Then we'll be able to tell whether you fired a gun in the last couple of hours now, or not. Inspector, will you listen? Yeah. This girl came to New York this morning. Mm -hmm. She wasn't supposed to know anybody in town. Mm -hmm. And then she told me she'd met a friend. Well, what are you trying to prove? I'm trying to prove that somebody killed Alice Manletter, and I've got to be free to find out who did it. Well, you won't be. I'll see to that personally. And now, oh, wait a minute now. What are you doing in that girl's don't, handbag? Don't get scared, Inspector, please. Well, what are you doing? You've got four cops with guns on me. Yeah? This isn't a trick. I might find something here that will help me track down the murderer. Well, we've searched this whole place, Tom Blackie. There's nothing here. Oh. Uh, but, 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 hold up and wait a minute. What are you taking out of that bag? Well, I don't know yet. It's, uh, it's just a piece of paper. Well, I'll take it. Mm, what's this? Boston 5, Zealand, Zealand. Louisiana, 3, Saskatchewan, Tennessee, 2, Nevada. Well, yeah, Nevada, go ahead. Well, what are you doing? I'm just writing down what you've said. Well, this doesn't make sense. Missouri, 1, 3, Denver, 4, France, France. Well, you see, Faraday, that's a code. Well, you are going to have plenty of time to work it out, Blackie. Come on, let's get going. I'm going to give you a hand a paraffin test to find out whether you fired a gun recently. And if you have, take it from me, pal. You'll have to do some talking to keep your head above water. <laughs> well, I'm afraid, Inspector, the only way I can keep my head above water is to duck you. Boston Blackie apparently is in a spot. And, uh, speaking of spots, so was a friend of mine the other day. You see, a lady I know of looked out of her window one morning, and it was such a lovely day, she felt like singing. Dum, da, 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 dee, 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 dee. And all of a sudden, she remembered it was wash day. Oh, shucks. So she got ready to do her wash and found she was out of soap. Well, time was wasting, so she borrowed some from her next-door neighbor. A soap she'd heard a lot about but never tried before. Yes, you guessed it. It was Soapy Ridge Rinso. And when she saw what mountains of suds Rinso made... Well, 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 what do you know? And how quickly those Rinso suds soaked her clothes dazzling white, and how she only had to give the very dirty places a few quick finger rubs because Rinso gets out more dirt, she started singing all over again like this. Rinso white, Rinso white, happy little wash day song. Rinso white, Rinso white, good to sing it all day long. Your fine feather friend has a message you send, so listen, you can't go wrong. Rinso white, Rinso white, happy little wash day song. Sing your way through your next wash day with Rinso. <laughs> Rinso. 
Boston Blackie is in Inspector Faraday's office awaiting the police laboratory report that will show whether he has fired a gun within the past few hours so that Faraday can build a complete case against him for the murder of the girl in the Ashley Hotel. How does it feel, Blackie? To be sitting there just waiting for a report that could send you to the chair? You nervous? Boston Five, Zealand, Zealand. That's the first word. Now, you take the first letters of each word and you get buzz. Great. <laughs> How do you do it, Blackie? Hmm? You get buzz. That's right. Yeah. Now we know everything. Who killed the girl, what her mother's maiden name was, and what town she was born in. That's exactly what I'm trying to find out. <laughs> After the first letter, there's the number five. Hmm. See, that could be the fifth vowel. You know, A-E-I-O-U. That's right. Or do you? Yes. Then the word would spell B-U-Z-Z. Marvelous. Buzz. 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 Inspector, this is a clue to the murder. Oh. Now, using that system of spelling out the first letters of each word, the note reads, Buzz, listen, made, off. Yeah. What does that mean? I wish I knew. Yeah, Faraday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Thanks. Now, that was it, Blackie. The test showed you fired a gun, all right. And the gun we found next to the girl's body was yours. Now, Inspector, I lost my gun, and it's true I fired another. But I was just practicing. Sure, sure, on a live target. Oh. You don't expect me to believe that, do you, Blackie? Well, frankly, no. You killed her, and then you put her gun, your gun, in her hand. After wiping off your fingerprints, of oh. course. Oh. oh, that's an old trick, Blackie, an old one. I'm surprised at you. Hey, Matthews? Inspector? Take Blackie down to the cell floor and lock him up. We'll book him later. Right, Chief. Come on, Blackie. Okay, okay. Well, you look very nice today, Matthews. New uniform? Who's your tailor? You won't be able to go to him for a long time. <laughs> you know, good old Matthews. Snappy clothes and padded a match. Say, Inspector, may I wash my hands? Well, they're covered with ink from that fingerprint pad. Is it okay? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. But keep an eye on him, Matthews. I'll beat it, both of you. I'm thinking. Thinking, huh? I'd love to watch. Oh, come on, Matthews. Lock me up. So long, Inspector. Faraday said I could wash my hands, Matthew. Remember? Go ahead, but no tricks. Here's the washroom. But remember, I'll be right back here with my gun in my hand. Oh, goody. I'll let you in on a little secret, Blackie. What's that? The inspector brought in a half a dozen extra cops from another precinct. Just to make sure you didn't break out of here. No. Only half a dozen? Well, I'm flattered. Uh, by the way, Matthews, did you take a shower this morning? No. Last night. Well, you need another one. Now. Hey, quit splashing water all over me. I can't see. Hey, give me my gun. Me... Uh, not a chance. I'm going to gag you, Matthews, and lock you in here. Come on, turn around. There. Now try and yell. And I want to borrow your uniform. If there are strange cops here, they'll think I'm one of them. You see, I'm leaving in your uniform. Come on, Matthews. Come on, take it off. <laughs> Blackie, if Faraday ever finds this waterfront hideout of ours, you know we're sunk. Oh, Faraday couldn't find a skunk in a perfume shop. Will you stop worrying? Okay, okay. What do we do next, boss? Well, nothing until I get that long-distance call through to Arthur Manletter. The operator's trying to reach him in San Francisco now. So after we reach him, so what? Well, I won't know, Shorty, till I talk to him. You see, the only thing I've been able to do since I walked out of headquarters an hour ago was to break the code we found in that girl's bag. It read, buzz, listen, made, off. Yeah, 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 you told me that before. Yes, yes, I know, but those words don't make sense. However, suppose we try an association. You mean we're going to join a club? Oh, cut it out, Shorty, please. Now, for instance, what does the word buzz make you think of? A B. That's right. Now, let's say the first word is B. Yeah. Now, the second word in the code message is listen. Uh Uh-huh. What does that make you think of? Listen, I don't know. Hey, wait a minute, boss. Yeah? Don't tell me, don't tell me now. I'll get it. Listen, listen, the word is here. Oh, so the message starts, be here. Mm-hmm. Then the last two words are made and off. Oh, by the way, Shorty, what's the maid's day off? Thursday, if anybody still has got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thursday's right. So the message reads, be here Thursday. Oh, that's it. Yesterday was Thursday, the day the gal came to town. Sure. Oh, that's the code, all right. Only what good... There's my call now. Right. Hello? Blackie, this is Manletter in San Francisco. Oh, hello, Arthur. Blackie, what's happened? I just heard the radio. It said that Alice has been murdered. The police were searching for you. It's not true, is it, Blackie? Yes, yes, I'm afraid it's true, Arthur. But you know I didn't do it. Well, of course you didn't. I don't know how it happened, but I'm going to find out. Blackie, look, I feel terrible. Oh, this shit. is her 20th birthday. The trip was a present from me. 20th birthday? Oh, uh, oh, wait a minute, Arthur. Is, uh, 
Is she a brunette? Oh, no. She had the most beautiful blonde hair you ever saw. Oh, oh that's wonderful. Arthur, your niece wasn't murdered. What? It wasn't Alice. Now, take my word for the, it. The radio... Never said... mind the radio. Your niece wasn't murdered, and I'm going to find her, Arthur. You'll hear from me. Oh, thanks, Blackie. Thanks. Call me as soon as you know anything, will you? I will. Goodbye. Now, why did you tell him that for Blackie? Because it's true, Shorty. You see, I never saw the real Alice Manletter. I took it for granted she was the girl in the hotel room. Oh. But that girl said she was 18 and Manletter's niece is 20. And the color of her hair settles it. Okay, but what happens now? Well, the real Alice Manletter left the hotel this morning with a man. Uh -huh. The cab driver gave me the address, but she wasn't there, of uh -huh. course. They, they haven't got off there, but must have walked down the street to another house. Well, what do we do first? Well, let's see. First, we've got to get a couple of messenger uniforms. Yeah. Then you'll take one side of the street, and I'll take the other, and we'll ring every doorbell and say we have a wire for Alice Manletter. Well, what good will that do? Whoever is holding Alice will know it's a trick and will try to grab us. That's what I'll be waiting for. Uh, telegram for Alice Manletter. Ain't nobody here by that name. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. There ain't nobody in this block for that name either. I don't know. I've lived here for 40 years. Gee, this reminds me of Alan's Alley. Uh, should I try the next block? Well, we'll try it together, but I got two more houses to go. Wait for me. Okay. I've got to find that girl, Shorty. Okay, boss. If it's a girl, you'll find her. What do you want? Telegram for Alice Manletter. Did you come in? Well, is, uh, is Miss Manletter here? She, uh, she's she got a sign for this person. Yeah. Ah, nice place you have here. I, uh, I noticed a sign outside saying this was a doctor's uh, home. In here, please. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Hey, what's this? See if he is armed, Otto. Yeah, I'll see. Keep your gun on him, Joe. Yeah, well. hey, here's his gun here, Doctor. Here, in his card case. Boston Blackie. We were hoping you would come. It took you a little longer than we thought. Oh, you knew I'd be here, huh? The girl said she was supposed to meet you in the hotel lobby. Uh -huh. And Otto here made a mistake and thought she was one of us. I see. So that's what happened. Otto was supposed to meet one girl, he met another. He thought she was someone else and she thought he was someone else. Simple blunder. Oh, oh, oh. you mean the super race has made a simple blunder? But everything has been taken care of. This girl knows no one else in the city and very soon... She will know nothing at all. Oh, I see. And that goes for me, too, I suppose. Yeah, boy. Ouch, you believe me. You take it easy with my hands back there, boy. <laughs> I am tight, Otto. Mm. You see, too? Easy. Good, good. <clears throat> we have only a few moments. Yeah, that's right. You just listen to the newscast. You better work fast, boys. You have only a few moments. Warsaw, Paris, Berlin. American <laughs> kid. Take him in the other room. Better carry him. Yeah. Help me, Joe. Yeah. I open the door for you. Just throw him in. The lens on his neck. It's too bad. Ready, Joe? Uh, throw him! Yeah. Who is that? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's me, Boston Blackie. Oh. You're, uh, you're Alice Manletter, of course. Oh, Boston Blackie, I'm so glad you're here. Thanks. So much has happened to me. Yes, I think I know most of it. You think we'll get out of here? Oh, we're certainly going to try. Let's do something about these ropes. Uh, you're tied up, too, aren't you? Yes. Well, they weren't nice enough to leave some lights on so I could see what it was doing. Well, there's the first one off. Now for my legs. Say, I just thought of something. That girl accomplice must have lifted my gun when I was up there, figuring that if I found out she was a spy, she could take care of me. Oh, well, the legs are free. Now I'll untie you. Thank you. What's that? They're going to send a message. We'll be able to hear what they say. The microphone's right up against the wall. Now, your hands are free. Work on your ankles. And I'll listen. All right. Yes, catch you on. Hand over four, two. Yes, catch you on. S-H-O-E-S. -E shoes. One, Nevada, ten bucks. A-N-D. And shoes and... Uh... Yes, catch you on. Two, one, Louisiana, three, Nevada, Georgia, Wisconsin, one, then tipping... Ceiling wax. Shoes and ceiling wax. One, five, M-S-E, five, Missouri, Nevada. A-U-T-U-M-N. Autumn. Shoes and ceiling wax, autumn. That, that's uh, the message so far. Geneva 1, Louisiana 1. Hanover 1, Denmark. Louisiana 1, Nevada, Chicago 2, Louisiana 4, Tennessee. That spells Galahad and Lancelot. 
They've stopped sending. Yeah. What did they say? Do you know? Now, keep working on those ropes, Alice. Yeah. Here's the message. Shoes and sealing wax. That's from Alice in Wonderland. The word missing is ships. Well, that could be the first word in the message. That's the way it works? Sure. Now, let's see. The next next thing was autumn. Autumn, autumn, autumn. Uh, what's that make you think of, Alice? I don't know. Autumn leaves, perhaps? That's it. That's it. And then they said Galahad and Launcelot. They were two knights at the round table. Two knights. That's it. Ships leave to night. That's the message. We've got to get out and stop that convoy from sailing. There'll be a U-boat pack waiting, waiting for it, sure. I've worked the knot loose, I think. Good. Now, give me your ropes. I'm going to need them. What are you going to do? Well, they'll be in for us in a minute. Is, um, is there a chair in the room? There's one next to me. I'm leaning against Good. it. Good. I'll put it alongside the door and stand on it. When the Nazis come in, you'll be in back of the door and slam it shut behind them. But they'll see you. Oh, no, no, no. Not a chance. The room is too dark. I'll drop a noose over them, but quick. I think I hear something. Okay. Now, I'll carry this chair over, and you stand behind the door. Already, Blackie. Yeah, me too. We'll do it, Doctor, just like you said. Oh, come in with me, Joe. Yeah. Now, Alice. Your gun. Get out your gun, Otto. I can't get it out. My arms are pinned down. Here's a present, Nazi. Oh. Now, don't be jealous, pal. Here's one for you, too. Oh, you can take it, huh, kid? Okay. Well, I guess that does it, Alice. What is going on in there? Otto, oh, you... wa- Watch this, Alice. <clears throat> Come in here, Doctor. Quick. What is look? This is... Alice. Alice, get on that telephone in the other room quick. Tell the FBI what you know. Then call Inspector Faraday while I keep an eye on these Nazis. Now, when you get him, I hold want it, you... Hold it, Mikey. Hold it. Don't move. I've got you cold this time. Well, hot or cold, you'll hate yourself in the morning, Faraday, but I'm glad you're here. How did you manage it? I managed it, boss. I got worried, and I couldn't bust in here alone, so I called your old friend Faraday. Yeah, and I landed up here with both feet in ten minutes flat. When you do anything with your feet, Faraday, flat is the right word. Oh, thanks, Alice, for clearing me with Faraday. Oh, Blackie, you're wonderful. Oh. You saved my life and broke up a spy ring, and it doesn't bother you a bit. Don't you feel good about it? Oh, I should say I do. So good, I'm going to celebrate. Alone? Oh, no, no. You're coming with me, Alice. But first, we're going to call your Uncle Arthur. What are you going to say? Well, I'm going to tell him I've spent a lot of time looking for you. But from now on, I'm looking after you. <laughs> We'll be back in just a moment with an interesting preview of next week's program. Now, you know those rich Rinso suds I've been telling you are such a help on wash day? Well, they're just as big a help come dishwashing time. Yes, ma'am. Milder than ever Rinso is easy on your hands, too. Doesn't get them rough and red. So, for dishwashing and for all the soap and water jobs around the house, better get Rinso to help you out. Now, uh, Matthews, you say this is a complete record of the people who came into Gordon's store yesterday? That's right, Inspector. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Van Dyke Smythe, George Ellis, Lady Mary Andrews. Say, hey, quite an exclusive list of customers for a small shop. Yeah, ain't it? Let's see now. Uh, uh, this name here, was he a customer? Yeah, Inspector. Gordon says he was in about noon, but that could have been a coincidence. Matthews, when a string of pearls is missing from a certain store and a certain party was in that certain store and the certain party's name was Boston Blackie, that's no coincidence. Friends, of course you know the tremendous part our Merchant Marine is playing in the war. But did you know that the Merchant Marine is being expanded to meet increasing supply problems on every front? to meet the universal demand for a strong post-war merchant marine? Yes, six ships a day instead of five will soon be coming off the ways of our shipyards, and every one of them must be manned by 40 to 50 men. So, if you have had previous sea experience, or if you want to get into a well-paying job where everything you do will help to win the war and to build your own personal future, then join the United States Merchant Marine. Apply at once by wiring collect to United States Merchant Marine... Washington, D.C. Boy, 
Warm weather's here, and that means greater danger from perspiration. Protect yourself. Use Life Boy in your daily bath. You know, of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And its rich, purifying Life Boy lather agrees with your skin. And don't forget, Life Boy's the only soap especially made to stop... Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday, music by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying good night for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. Lever Brothers, makers of Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso, presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. <laughs> of valuable pearls were stolen sometime today from this shop. Huh? I personally took them out of the safe and put them in the showcase this morning. Mm-hmm. Might be an inside job. How about your employees, Mr. Gordon? Well, just those two women you see behind the counters, that's all. Huh? Mrs. Phillips, the short, gray-haired woman, has been here 20, came with us 18 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I trust both of them implicit bonded delivery service. And nobody came into the shop today except regular customers, eh? Nobody came in just to look around? Well, not today. And we always pay particular attention to strangers. Do you have any kind of a record of people who did come in? Yes, we have a complete list. Mm. You see, when someone comes in to have something repaired, we give him a receipt and keep the duplicate. And when anyone purchases an article, well, naturally, we enter that in our records, too. Good, I'd like to see... Yes, Mr. Gordon. Bring me the day's sales records, please. Yes, sir. That list might give me a lead, but with my luck, I doubt it. Here's the list, Mr. Gordon. I'll take that, Mr. Phillips. Yes, sir. See, Mrs. Van Dyke Smythe, George Ellis, Lady Mary Andrews. Mm, let's see now. Hey, this name here. Is this man a customer of yours? Oh, yes, sir. For many years. Mm. He was in about noon to get suspicious of him. Mr. Gordon, when a string of pearls is missing from a certain store, and a certain party was in that certain store, and that certain party's name is Boston Blackie, I'm suspicious. <laughs> In a few moments, we'll meet Boston Blackie. But right now, I'm told by the best authorities that when you ladies set out to buy a dress, you're mighty particular about the color. And so it stands to reason that once you've got exactly the right color, the one that does the most for you is the expression, I believe, you do your level best to see that it stays that color by the most careful laundering. Yes, you'd pick a soap you know to be reliable, like soapy rich Rinso, for instance. Well, you see, Rinso's peppy studs get out more dirt. But they're safe for washable colors. Leave them crisp and vivid, even after dozens and dozens of washing. And because you don't have to do any hard scrubbing or boiling with Rinso, your clothes will stay new-looking longer. So better get Rinso before next wash day. For an easier wash day, and for a wash that's Rinso bright and <laughs> Rinso white. And now to the latest adventure of Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. <laughs> this will kill Blackie Matthews. <laughs> I'll have him so cold he could refrigerate a warehouse. And I don't know, Inspector. I, I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Of course you don't know. Get this set up. Look from Gordon's jewelry shop today when he left his watch to be repaired. You going to pick him up, Inspector? Oh, uh, no, not now. But tomorrow... Tomorrow he's going to call for his watch, and there's going to be a tray full of very valuable stones, practically under his nose. And nobody will be watching him. Blackie will lift the trinket or two, and when he gets outside the store, we grab him. 
Blackie. How does it sound? I don't Deadly. know, Inspector. I don't know. But if it was, just wasn't Blackie. Oh, Matthews, you're fired. <laughs> Hey, Blackie. Has Fatty been here, Blackie? Has he? Well, not that I can remember. I haven't seen the inspector in a week. You know, I think I'm on his hate parade. Oh, you'll be seeing him, Blackie. Yes? The boys just tipped me off that he's after you for lifting a string of pearls from the Gordon Jewelry shop this afternoon. Well, isn't that nice? I didn't take some shorty. I know. But that ain't going to stop Faraday from trying to pin it on you. Oh, he does that from force of habit. By the way, I left my watch to be fixed at Gordon's this noon. Oh. That's probably what gave Faraday his big idea. Yes, and, uh, and you say a string of pearls is missing, huh? Well, that's what the man said. Shorty, I saw one of the clerks put a string of pearls in her handbag just before she went to lunch. No kidding, Bob? Yes. Yes, it was Mrs. Phillips. Oh, you've seen her, Shorty, a little gray-haired old lady. She's uh, been at Gordon's for years. You think she lifted the pearls? Oh, I didn't at the time. Oh, no, it couldn't be. Mrs. Phillips isn't a thief, but she's a dear, sweet person. She looks like everybody's mother. Okay, boss, okay. I ain't the one who said she snatched them. But the pearls are gone. I'll get it, sure. Okay. Hello, Boston Blackie speaking. Oh, Mr. Blackie, this is Mrs. Phillips from Gordon's Jewelry Shop. Oh, yes. Yes, what can I do for you, Mrs. Phillips? I must see you right away. My address is 722 Alden, apartment 4B. I'm definitely at your service. Be right over. Goodbye. Going before dinner, boss? But something's cooking. You're right, Shorty. And I'm going to find out what it is. Good evening, Mr. Blackie. How do you do, Mrs. Phillips? Won't you come in? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry Mr. Phillips isn't here. Large night, you know. He's been here one night a week with the boys for the last 35 years. Oh, I see. Well, uh, what did you want to see me about, Mrs. Phillips? Uh, Mr. Blackie, I understand you're suspected of taking a string of pearls from the Gordon jewelry shop. I heard Inspector Faraday tell Mr. Gordon. That's right. He thinks I took them, and uh, I think you did. Oh. You see, I saw you put those pearls in your handbag. You saw me? Uh-huh. Oh, Mr. Blackie, please. Please don't say anything to anybody about this, please. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to, Mrs. Phillips, if the police get too annoyed. I'm sorry I've implicated you. Been on my mind all evening. That's why I phoned you. Now, look. Look, suppose you just put those pearls back in the morning, and then there won't be any trouble. Now, how's that? But I can't do that. I haven't got them. Did you sell them? You know, they could be traced to you if you did. Uh, I didn't sell them. Oh, please. I can't tell you anything about them. I'm in terrible trouble. Well, why not let me help you, Mrs. Phillips? Nobody can help me. It's something that happened years ago, but I don't dare tell you about it. Don't dare, huh? No. Sounds as if somebody was blackmailing you. Does your husband know? No. No, he must, mustn't ever know. Good kidding. Well, of course you know your blackmailer won't be satisfied with just the pearls, Mrs. Phillips. Next, he'll want something else. You'll never be rid of him unless he stops. I'm... Afraid to tell you anything, Mr. Blackie. But you're right. He isn't satisfied with just the pearls. He told me when I gave them to him. Oh. Uh huh. I see. He doesn't waste much much time, does he? What is it he wants now, Mrs. Phillips? Come on, please tell me. A ruby. A twenty carat ruby we have in stock. I see. And what would happen if he didn't get the ruby? Something terrible. But I won't let it happen. It mustn't happen. I'll get him what he wants. Well, perhaps what he wants won't be there for you to take tomorrow. You mean you'll take it first? Well. Oh, you couldn't. You mustn't for your own sake as well as mine. For my sake? Yes. This morning, Inspector Faraday told Mr. Gordon that he was going to lay a trap for you tomorrow when you come for your watch. They're going to put some jewels on the counter where you can get them easily, and then they're going to arrest you as you leave the store. Oh, they are, are they? That's very interesting. You won't take that ruby now, will you, Mr. Blackie? I've got to get it to keep someone from talking. Well, I don't know, Mrs. Phillips. I, uh, I've got an idea that from now on, I'm going to do all your talking. For you.
Matthews. You want your cops out of sight? Yes, sir. Hey, there's Blackie's car now. Just coming along the street. You see it? Yeah, almost opposite the store. He's driving pretty slow. Come on, Matthews. Let's get out of sight. Yes. Yeah. Blackie, you're crazy. Here we were yesterday minding our own business. No pearls, no rubies, no trouble. Now where are we? Right in front of Gordon's jewelry store. And we're about to stop, Shorty. And we still have no pearls, no rubies, but plenty of trouble. And I'm afraid we're going to have more. You mean you're going across the street to Gordon's and lift that ruby like you said? Certainly. Mrs. Phillips is in trouble, and I'm going to help her. Uh-huh. I'd like to meet whoever's blackmailing that lovely old lady, Shorty. And that ruby is going to be my introduction. Okay, okay. So you meet him, so you take care of him. That old lady still stole the pearls. That's still a crime. I'll get those pearls back. And give her the ruby to put back, too. Then nobody will be hurt. Except our blackmailing friend. Well, what about the trap fire they set oh, for you? Oh, that? Well, that makes it more interesting, Shorty. You see this cigar? Yeah, yeah, sure, I see it. Well, look. The center is hollowed out. Uh-huh. That's why you're here. You brought me along because the center of the cigar is a hole in it? That's right. Now, when I come out of the store, I'll be smoking a cigar, and when Faraday grabs me, I'm going to be so surprised, I'm going to drop it. And you're going to pick it up. Me, boss? Uh-huh. I'm going to pick up a butt just like the old days? <laughs> That's right, Shorty. And you're going to take very good care of it. Because in that hole in the cigar, there's going to be a 20-carat ruby. So long. Okay, Blackie. Good luck. Thanks. Well, good morning. Uh, hello there, Mr. Gordon. Uh, good morning, Mr. Blackie. Well, I'm busy right now with this young lady. Oh. Uh, Mrs. Phillips has your watch ready for you. Well, good morning, Mrs. Phillips. Uh, Beautiful morning, isn't it? Uh, you have my watch? Why, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, it's this cigar. I'm sorry, Mrs. Phillips. Oh, 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 my, what lovely ruby. Uh, here's your watch, Mr. Blackie. That will be $5. Please, please don't touch the ruby. $5, huh? Well, thank you very much. Uh, here you are. Goodbye, Mrs. Phillips. Mr. Blackie, you shouldn't have... Goodbye, Mr. Gordon. I'll take another step, Blackie. Oh, Inspector Barrett. Oh. Well, you, you startle me. Yeah, I see. Now get back in that store and keep your hands in the air. Matthews? Yeah, Inspector. Now get the boys on all sides of Mr. Boston Blackie. We're going back in the store and searching. Hey, the, the ruby's missing. Yeah, no, no. He took the ruby. Take it easy, take it easy, Mr. Gordon. Of course it doesn't. I told you he would, didn't I? Yes, but when will I get it back? Yes, as soon as we search Blackie. That's we're going to do in the back room right now, Mr. Gordon. Boys, are ready, Inspector. Good. Well, it's nice of you, Inspector, to have provided a police escort back into the store. Don't mention it, Blackie. You make bad bargains. What do you mean? You've only had that ruby 30 seconds, and it's going to cost you 30 years. <laughs> now, let's get back to the other room and start this search. Uh, by the way, Inspector, don't forget to look in my pocket. Well, what did you do with that ruby, Blackie? <laughs> We've searched you from head to foot, and we can't find it. Well, we must have it. I saw it on the tray just a minute before he came in. And after he left, it was gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you arrested him before he could move from the door. He must still have it. Well, uh, 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 you know, maybe I swallowed it. Very clever, Blackie. Yeah, very clever. I've got an idea. Maybe you did swallow it. Are you kidding? Well, we'll soon find out. I'm going to see what you look like behind a fluoroscope. <laughs> I see. You want to get the inside story. <laughs> Seems as though Boston Blackie's plan to steal the ruby might have suffered disaster. However, we'll see about that in a moment. Right now, maybe it's the heat, but I definitely feel a poem coming on. Here goes. There was a young housewife named May, who, if you asked her, would say, My war? A delight. Yes, it's white. Rinso white. For Rinso said, hip, hip, hooray. Yes, many a woman cheers those rich, peppy Rinso suds. Not only because they help her to turn out such a dazzling Rinso white wash, but because they save her so much hard work and time. And these hot August wash days, that's something. Well, I think I'd just give up. If I had to pick up heavy loads of clothes, put them in a steaming boiler, lift them out, scrub the light stop, out of them. Stop, I can't bear the whole idea. It certainly is different than the Rinso way. Heavens, yes. I just chop my dirty clothes into a tub full of rich Rinso suds, let them soak a little while, Give the extra dirty places a few quick finger rubs, and they're ready to rinse. You hear that, ladies? It's a mighty fine prescription for a hot weather wash day or any wash day. 
Better get Rinso tomorrow. <laughs> and now back to Chester Morris as Boston Blanky. In order to deal with the unknown man who is threatening aged Mrs. Mary Phillips, Boston Blanky has stolen a 20 carat ruby from the Gordon jewelry shop and hidden it in a cigar. Inspector Faraday has been unable to find the ruby, but now has an idea that Blackie has swallowed it. I didn't swallow the ruby, Inspector. I'm strictly on a milk diet. You'll see, Blackie. As soon as you stand in back of that machine. Faraday, the fact that the ruby was 20 carats is throwing you a little. You see, a ruby is completely indigestible, believe me. Very funny. Now get back of that machine, Blackie. All right, all right. But supposing the ruby doesn't show up. Am I excused for the rest of the day, teacher? Get back of that bird, go. All right, all right. How's this? Yeah. Now just stand there. All right. Turn on the machine, Doc. Right. Hmm. How do I look, Inspector? It's an improvement. I can't... How does this work, Doc? Bob, mm-hmm. any object such as a ruby will show up clearly if he has swallowed it. You see anything? Now, don't tell me you see a strange man and I'm going on a thing. Me neither. Okay, turn it off. Come on out, Blackie. All right, put your shirt on and then beat it. I can't hold you. Oh, bless you. Bless you, Faraday. Bless you. You know, it takes a big man to know when he's licked. I'm not licked yet. That's what I mean. Good day, gentlemen. (laughs) Just a minute. Did you spread the rumor that I got away with a ruby shorty? Yeah, yeah. I spread the story all over town, just like you said, boss. Then if I'm lucky, this is the fish that swallowed the bait. Coming. How do you do? Wasn't Blakey? Yes, that's right. My name's Tom Elliott, Tom Blakey. Thanks. All right, if I sit down? Certainly. Make yourself at home. You can give me the ruby you took from the Gordon jewelry shop this morning. I know you've got it. Oh, you do, huh? Well, why should I give it to you? I believe you're going to want to give it to me. And just why am I going to want to give you the ruby, Mr. Elliott? You know Mrs. Noah? Ever meet her husband? Wonderful man. They're crazy about each other. Have been for 35 years. Well, what about it? Rather interesting story. You see, before he married her, that's 35 years ago, he escaped from prison. Of course, she didn't know anything about it when she married him. When did she find out? When I told her. Oh. I had to tell her, you see. If I had uh, come to him with the story, I'd have gotten nothing out of him. He'd have committed suicide and given himself up. I see. So, uh, so you want his wife because you, uh, you went to his wife because you knew you'd do anything to protect her husband. Even steal to keep him from going back to jail. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And her long and trustworthy service in the Gordon shop completed the setup. Well, you know, that's just about the way I figured it. Only I didn't know the details. Uh, I told them to you for one reason. Yes? If you don't give me the ruby, I intend to turn John Phillips over to the police. Well, do I get it, Blackie? You get it. Good. And I uh, don't want any interference from now on, either. Let's understand that, too. I understand. All right, here's the stone. Now get out of here before I forget that your scheme is foolproof. Goodbye, Mr. Blackie. You're a very rich... What's up? Tell that man that just left here. Right. I'd like to know why a rat like that lives, and I'd also like to know where. Mr. Blackie? Oh, hello, Mrs. Phillips. Uh, may I come in? Please do, Mr. Blackie. Thanks. The police didn't find the ruby? No, of course not. But your friend, Mr. Elliot, called on me. He told you? Uh-huh, a... everything. Now, look, Mrs. Phillips. I, uh, I guess maybe I'm a sentimental sort of a fella, but I believe anybody who's gone straight for 35 years is entitled to a break. Oh, it sounds so wonderful to hear you say that. Why, there's a story in the papers almost every week about some governor pardoning a man who gives himself up after years of going straight. Oh, providing he hadn't been convicted of a major crime. Well, you see, John had been gambling and signed a trip. Oh. I investigated his case. Now, of course, he doesn't know it. Well, he won't. Now, I think I have a plan that'll work. We have two things to do. Get back the pearls and the ruby and prevent Tom Elliott from talking. The first is easy. Uh, the second, well, <laughs> we've got a slim chance. Is there anything you want me to do? Yes, Definitely. In half an hour, I want you to call Inspector Faraday and tell him that you know a man who escaped from jail 35 years ago. What? Now, please trust me, Mrs. Phillips. It's the only way I know that we can stop Elliot. But I don't see how that will stop him. Well, I I couldn't do that to John. But don't you see you're doing it for John? Now, first of all, you're to tell Faraday that the man who escaped from jail 35 years ago is a man named, oh, 
make up any name, say Fred Mullins. Um, then act a little bewildered. Don't tell him who you are and just say you know Mullins is free, but you don't know where he is. Then what do I do? Then you're to hang up. I don't understand, but if you say so, I'll do it. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Blackie. And that thank you comes from my heart. I was afraid my world had come to an end. Oh, Mrs. Phillips, this is only the beginning. Oh, come on. Let me see you smile. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Bye. Hello? Shorty. Oh, hello, boss. Say, I got that guy's hideout, Peg. It's, uh, 1761 East 13th. Uh, uh, apartment 6B. Good. Now, listen, Shorty. I want you to call Faraday. Yeah? The guy's your Allenby, who happens to be in the city, and who also happens to have escaped from prison 35 years ago. Well, who's this Allenby, boss? Gee, I thought I knew him all. Oh, I just made it up. Oh. Play dumb, Shorty, and we'll have Mr. Faraday good and confused. <laughs> Won't be the first time. Yeah. Okay, Blackie, it's as good as done. Thanks. See you later. Inspector Faraday, I have some information. Yeah, who is it? Oh, that ain't important, but there's something that is. Huh? You know, I know a man who escaped from jail 35 years ago, and his name is Edward Allenby. Yeah? It'd be a feather in your cap if you arrested him. Look, I got enough feathers now to be an Indian chief. Where is this Allenby? I don't know. What jail did he bust out of? I don't know that either. Uh, what is this? April Fool's Day? Goodbye. Faraday talking. I just wanted to tell you, Inspector, that a man named Fred Mullins escaped from jail 35 years ago. Hmm? You can find him if you hurry, but I don't know where you're to hurry to. But... Goodbye. Hey, 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 wait a minute. What is this? An epidemic of crack punch? Hello. Hello. You hung up. <laughs> Yeah, Faraday speaking. This is Blackie, Inspector. Oh. I've got a tip for you. I know a man who escaped... If you're going to tell me about somebody who was supposed to have broken out of jail 35 years ago, Blackie, I'll wring your neck. All right, Inspector, all right, then I won't tell you. Goodbye. Six o'clock. Getting out, please. Thank you. Boston Blackie. Oh, no, you don't, Elliot. No closing doors in people's faces. It isn't polite. You, uh, you mind if I come in? What do you want here? Well, I want that ruby I loaned you. And the pearls Mrs. Phillips gave you yesterday. Oh, you do, eh? Uh-huh. You see, Mrs. Phillips is going to put them back in the store tomorrow morning where Mr. Gordon can find them. You'll think they were just misplaced. Your memory isn't very good, Blackie. You weren't supposed to interfere anymore, remember? And I was supposed to forget about John Phillips cracking out of jail. Yes, right? yes, yes, I know. Only that doesn't matter now. Now, let's have those pearls and that ruby, Elliot. Sorry, Blackie, but they're staying with me. And I'd advise you to stand still. Oh, a gun, huh? Pretty unoriginal. But I'd expect that from a small-time crook that blackmails old women. This gun has killed two men, Blackie. That's all. With me on the trigger. And you know what they say about uh, all things coming in three? <laughs> uh, the expression is all good things. Don't worry, this will be good. I'm going to leave town until I need more money than I'm coming back and put a little pressure on Mrs. Phillips again. I know a fence out west who'll pay a fortune for those pearls and that ruby. My bag is packed and I'm on my way. But I'm, uh, I'm afraid I've got to kill you first. Well, you know that, uh, that 38 is liable to make a lot of noise. Yes, but this silencer will make sure nobody hears it. I see. Hey, keep your hand out of your pocket. Hey, I, I haven't a gun, Elliot. I just wanted to get my cigarette case. Okay? Yes. But it'll be the last cigarette you oh. <laughs> Well, at least this is one way of breaking the habit. Will you have one? Sure. Hey, that's an expensive case. Yes. I'll take it with me when I go. I have a lovely gold inlay you might like also. Now, don't get too close. Just stand where you are and hold that case out as far as you can. I can reach. Oh, you mean like, uh, like this? Yes. Yeah. Thoughtful of you, Blackie. I'll take this. Ow! Sucker! Oh! I don't know when I've enjoyed doing anything so much. Those pretty little fingers of yours are going to hurt tomorrow, Elliot. So you killed two men, huh? Well, I can't wait to tell Faraday. Now, come on, hand over that jewelry, Rat. I'm in a hurry. I can't wait till I see the expression on a lovely little old lady's face. All right. Sarah, 
day you've got me in jail, and I suppose you're sending my fingerprints out west. That's right, Elliot. Blackie finally got around to doing me a favor. You've got a little record in this city, too. You didn't tell Blackie that. I think we've got a priority on you. It doesn't matter where I go to jail. I just want to tell you this, Inspector. Hmm. I've got a little information for you. Oh, yes? Yes. I know a man who escaped from jail 35 years ago. You too? Look, Elliot, if I hear one more word out of anybody about some guy who was supposed to have busted out of jail 35 years ago, I'll bust that guy in half. <laughs> I sent for you, Blackie. On the counter, you've got a right to know. Oh, thanks. I sent this Elliot's fingerprints out west, and he's wanted for two murders, just as you said. Uh huh. And for one right here in this city, too. No. Oh. Thanks for the tip, Blackie. How did you manage to catch up with him? Oh, a little old lady told me. Huh? Yes, yeah, so I put two and two together, to coin a phrase, and I said to myself, Dear old Faraday, <laughs> he's been so nice to me lately. What better way of showing my appreciation than to make him a present of a murderer? Thanks, Blackie. Oh, not at all, old man. But, uh, by the way, now that you've looked inside my heart, certainly my stomach, did you ever recover the pearls and the rubies? Oh, you did. Yeah. Didn't you hear what happened? No. Well, Gordon called to tell me that they were right in the shop all the time. No. Yeah. Can you beat that? Old Mrs. Phillips, who works there, found them in another drawer. Well, 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 well. And they lived happily ever after. What'd you say? Oh, nothing, nothing. I... I just said they lived happily ever after. In just a moment, we'll hear a preview of next week's exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. Meantime, ladies, I have a real piece of advice for you about dishwashing. I've mentioned it before, but if you haven't done it already, I'd suggest that you tote that big green and yellow rinse box up from the laundry and see how much simpler the job can be. Yes, Rinso's rich suds really go to town for you in the dishpan. Get dishes, pots, and pans gleaming in a jiffy. Rinso's kind to your hands, too. So get Rinso tomorrow, and be sure to use it on wash day so you can join in the chorus of women who sing their way through washing clothes like this. Rinso, hey, Rinso, hey, happy little wash day song. Rinso, hey, Rinso, hey. But Inspector, how do you know Boston Blackie's dead? I told you, Matthews. All I know is some guy called me on the phone and said that after I'd come down here to Blackie's apartment, I could pick up the remains. Who called you? I don't know. He hung up on me. You think it's another one of Blackie's tricks? Well, we'll know pretty soon. If it is, I'll break every bone in his body. So well, here we are, sixth floor. He's in six B's here. Hey, Chief. Huh? Look. There's a guy flat on his face right outside the door. Blackie, I don't believe it. Chief. Bumped off right outside his own apartment. Yeah. He's a swell guy, Matthews. One of the best. Sure, he got me sore now and then, and I used to rib him, but when it came right down to cases, he was a swell guy. I'll get the guy who did this if it's the last thing I ever do. Writing my epitaph, Faraday? Huh? I hate to disappoint you, but that body isn't mine. Boston Black. <laughs> Summertime means warm weather, and that means more perspiration. Use Life Boy in your daily bath or shower to protect yourself. You'll love its rich, purifying lather. Remember, too, that of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And besides, it's the only soap especially made to stop... to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday, music by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying goodnight for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes. Rinso White. <laughs>
all taken seats that satisfy you, gentlemen, we will proceed at once with the business at hand. Good. Uh, maps, photographs, and other data, Miss Arden. In your portfolio, Mr. Parker. Thank you, thank you. Gentlemen, we are faced with a crisis. We're in dire need of funds. And we shall acquire said funds from the Wentworth Diamonds. Net profit to us, a half million dollars. Of course, the Wentworth rocks are too hot to handle. Uh, the main stone, yes. We have no interest in that. We shall acquire our revenue from the two dozen smaller stones of the Wentworth collection. Uh, are we going to take it out of Lady Wentworth's home? Lady Wentworth has only a paste copy of the diamonds in her name. The real diamonds are in the National Vault. At 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, the diamonds are to be transferred by armored truck from the National Vault for two weeks' display at the Manchester Museum. It is there that we, uh, appropriate them. They'll be heavily guarded at the museum, won't they? Uh, you will hire a dozen of the city's most capable trigger men. They'll be paid well. Uh, I get it. Rough stuff. Huh? Uh, you will lead the operations, Mr. Adams. Six guards will stand in our way. The two at the front door can be subdued at trigger point. The two at the entrance to the gallery in which the Wentworth collection is being displayed may have to be rendered, uh, unconscious. The other two? The other two will be guarding the Wentworth Diamonds. They are to be killed. When do you plan to do this? I'll inform you of the exact day and time of day. In the meantime, you'll study these maps and photographs at the Manchester Museum. Oh, 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 uh, one more thing. There's more? Yes, yes. We now come to that portion of our plans which involves the person known as Boston Blackie. <laughs> Now meet Richard Colmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Like walking in the rain, Blackie? That's a leading question. Where does it lead? Well, right now, Mary, around the corner to your apartment. Okay. Oh, it's been a wonderful evening. Yeah. I hope the three of us enjoyed it. The three of us? Sure. You and I and the man who's been following us. Someone following us? Why? Never had a man follow you before? Oh. Did you see someone? Yes. What do we do? Keep talking. About what? Oh, anything. Tell me a funny story. A funny story. So when I get through with him, this guy following us will have something to laugh about. All right. After we turn this corner here, I'll stop. But you go ahead. Cut across the grass and keep talking all the time. Here's the corner. Now, keep going. I'll hug the wall and get this fellow as he goes by. But what if he puts up a fight? About the only thing he'll get to put up is a squawk. Now, keep on talking. I stop here. Wish me luck. I do. It was really the funniest thing that's happened to me in weeks, Blackie. The telephone rang about 7 o'clock this morning. And a squeaky little voice asked for Ozzy. All right, you reach. Hey, uh, boss, don't, don't shoot. It's me. Shorty. Well, what? Oh, wait a minute. Hey, Mary. Uh, Come on back. It's all right. It's a friend of mine. Uh, I've been telling you all night, boss. I've got to talk to you. But uh, not with a dame, Blackie. I, I can't. Since one of you turned girl shy? Uh, this is Mary Wesley, Shorty. Mary, this is Shorty, an old pal of mine. Oh, uh, how, how do you do? Boss, i got to talk to you. And where nobody can see well, us. Well, if you two want to talk, you can come up to my apartment. Next, boss. This got to be private conference. Come on, Shorty. It's all right. Mary doesn't talk. And besides, she makes good coffee. <laughs> Oh. Hey, boss. Hey, you're, you're right as a parson. This is sure good coffee. How right are you about this frame? That's what I'd like to know. Well, I, I told you all I know, Blackie. That's all I know. A high-class operator is going to snatch the Wentworth diamonds from the Manchester Museums. And you got it straight from one of the hoods who was hired as a trigger man. Well, from a guy who knew a guy who was hired. But I don't understand how they're going to involve you, Blackie. Well, the uh, plan seems to be this. To dress one of the gunmen to look like me. He'll be called, uh, <laughs> Blackie several times during the holdup. Yeah, and they figure to knock off a couple of guards, see? So Blackie will get wrapped by the cops for murder. And then to cinch it, they're planting the big Wentworth diamond in Blackie's apartment. Is this really true? Probably, but that doesn't mean it's going to work. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know when they're planning the robbery, so I don't know when to make sure to have an alibi. This is cute. Well, why don't you try calling Inspector Faraday? When I want somebody to laugh at me, I'll tell jokes. Oh, please, Blackie, please. It's the smartest thing. Will it make you happy? Very. 
All right. I've always wanted a legitimate excuse to wake Faraday in the middle of the night anyway. Oh, he'll listen to you. I just know it. <laughs> like I listen to opera. Faraday's probably snoring so loud that he would... Hello? Faraday, this is your old pal Blackie. Blackie, what's the idea of calling me up this time of night? <laughs> what's the matter, Sleeping Beauty? Were you dreaming you had the goods on me at last? Did you call me up to make jokes, Blackie? Because if you did, I... No. Listen, Inspector, and listen carefully. I'm not listening to anything from you. Go to bed and let me get some sleep. Wait. Faraday. Faraday. Did he hang up? Well, he didn't exactly invite me over for a midnight snack. Well, gee, boss, now what do we do? I know what you're going to do, Blackie. Leave town. Yeah, yeah, the lady's right, boss. You, you can't have no alibi two weeks long in this town. But if you just lamb out of town for two weeks... I well... don't like to take it on the chin any more than anybody else. But I'm not going to take it on the lamb. Oh, I know what you're thinking, darling. It's running away and you don't want to run away. But please, Blackie, please do it for me. Mm, I must be getting soft. Well, it's the thing you got to do, boss, f for the lady's sake. Now, I'll get your train or plane reservations. You go to your apartment with Shorty and I'll phone you there. I don't know why I'm doing this. I guess those looks of yours sure pack a wallet. Never mind my looks. You just see to it that you pack a bag. Uh, how many shorts you want in a suitcase, boss? Oh, I don't know. Gosh, I wish that Chicago call would come in. Oh, well. Uh, Shorty, is there something that maybe you haven't told me yet? For instance, what time tomorrow are the diamonds being taken from the National Vaults to the museum? Uh, seven o'clock. To be in a museum at eight, see? An armored car is picking them up. No chance they intend to steal them or route. They're too well guarded in an armored car. Gee, boss. How do you know the diamonds would be picked up at the National Vaults instead of Lady Wentworth's house? Lady Wentworth wears only paste copies of the Wentworth diamonds. The real ones have always been in a vault. Gee, you know everything, boss. Well, I know I'm in the clear till those stones get to the museum at 8 tomorrow morning. Hmm. This is probably my Chicago call now. Or the dame with the reservations on a train, lady. Hello? Blackie, this is Barry. I couldn't get a plane reservation at all. I got a train reservation to Chicago just as you wanted... But it's not until Friday. All right. Then I'll leave on Friday. Oh, but Blackie, to be perfectly safe, you have to be out of town before tomorrow morning. Look, honey, don't worry. Uh, I'll play Invisible Man until Friday. But I am worried, darling. What if they rob the museum before Friday? Then I'm in a jam. Well, if having an alibi will help, can't someone be with you all the time? You like the job for yourself? Oh, Blackie. <laughs> oh, Blackie, be serious. You know I can't meet you until 4 o'clock. That has to be a date. All right. Well, be careful, darling. And call me in the morning? I'll give you a ring at ten. See that you do. Night. Good night. Well, Shorty, looks like you and I have a chance to have a little fun. I can't leave town till Friday. Oh, gee, boss. Uh, you better tell your pal Kingston in Chicago. And tell him you're not coming to see him until Friday, huh? Not at all, short one. He's no. going to help me. Oh. But, gosh, what can he do? He's in Chicago. He can give me a hand through one of his branch offices here. If I was... Oh, that's probably Charlie now. Uh. Hello? Mr. Charles Kingston of the Kingston Corporation in Chicago calling Mr. Boston Blackie. I'll take it, operator. Here's your party, Mr. Kingston. Hello, Blackie. Hello, Charlie. How are you, fella? Oh, swell, Charlie. Is the man who does favors in? Sure. He's a right round ticket, Blackie. What is it? Can you hear me clearly? Sure. Go ahead. All right, Charlie. Here's what I want you to do. Hello? Morning, Mary. Oh, Blackie, I've worried all night long. Where are you? In my apartment. Stop worrying. But, Blackie, as long as you're in town and those... Look, Mary, everything's going to be all right. There's nothing to the... Uh... Blackie! Blackie! What's the matter? Blackie! May I see the timetable of the Wentworth Diamond robbery, Hazel? Here you are, Mr. Farthing. Good. Now, um, here on the chart, we can see what progress we will make today. Mm -hmm. It's 1.30. The men are here at this moment, a mile and a half south of the museum. Mm -hmm. In 15 minutes, the first of them will enter the museum and take their places. In 30 minutes, it'll all be over. <laughs> <laughs> You're smiling. Yes. You like the way I plan. Obviously. Ah. My schedule's right. This should be Mr. Boston Blackie. Come in. 
Here he is, Mr. Fanning. Boston Blackie. Oh. Won't you come in, Blackie? Do I have a choice? Not for the present. That'll be all, Tom. Right. I'm Roger Farthing. This is Miss Hazel Arden, my secretary. Hazel, the famous Boston Blackie. How do you do? How are you? <laughs> you uh, know why you're here? Not to play house. When do my teeth start chattering? In uh, exactly 22 minutes, men in my employ are going to steal the Wentworth diamonds from the Manchester Museum and inadvertently kill two of the guards. One of the gunmen will be referred to by the others as uh, Blackie. You begin to see? Seeing is a little habit I picked up some time ago. Splendid. <laughs> as you probably know, the main Wentworth diamond is too distinctive to be of value to anyone other than its rightful owner. So? So, one of my associates is placing it in your apartment shortly after the robbery, then informing the police of its whereabouts. You will be forced to remain here until it is found. You understand? Perfectly. You know something, Blackie? Nothing disturbs you. I'd like to have you on my side. You want me on your side? Believe me, Farthing. You'd be more comfortable with acute appendicitis. This way to the display of the Wentworth diamonds, the Arling yeah, Gallery is to the right. This way I saw a couple of the cars the drive up Wentworth across the street. The Boy should be coming through the front door in a minute, right? There they are. Took care of the guards at the door. Go ahead, do your stuff. All right, everybody, get back. Keep quiet. This isn't any fool. Over this way, Blackie, in here. Come on, gang, Blackie, over this way. Blackie, get those two guards. Cut them down. Cut them down. I got the diamonds. Let's go. I shoot them, Blackie. And I shoot them. Those guards never know what hit them. Faraday. Inspector, this is Mary Wesley. Yeah? You remember me, don't you? Oh, I remember all of Boston Blackie's friends. So I can identify him when we pull him out of the river. What do you want? I talked to Blackie on the phone at 10 o'clock this morning. We were cut off. I haven't heard from him since. Oh, don't let that surprise you. But I had a date with him at 4 o'clock and he didn't show up. I'm worried about him. I think you should be. Has something happened? Plenty. I hope you like music, Miss Wesley. Because you're playing second fiddle to the Wentworth Diamonds. Blackie stole them this afternoon. Now, back to our story. When we left Boston Blackie, he was, to all appearances, hopelessly victimized by Roger Farthing's plan to frame him for the theft of the Wentworth diamonds and the murder of the two museum guards. As provided in Farthing's plan, the police have been notified that the main Wentworth diamond is in Blackie's apartment. And as we continue our story, Inspector Faraday knocks on Blackie's door. Okay, Blackie. Come on, open up in there. Open up! All right, Hi, Black. Inspector. Okay, Shorty. Go on, get back in the apartment. Where's Blackie? Where's the Wentworth Diamond? The Wentworth Diamond, Inspector? Shorty, the only time you look smart is when you're trying to look dumb. Oh, gee, thanks. Sit down over there and behave yourself. I'm going to look around for that diamond. Oh, Inspector, there ain't no jewel around here. In that drawer or anywhere else. He not only stole the entire Wentworth collection, but he killed two guards. And you can't get out of a rap like that with a suspended sentence. Well, nothing in here. Maybe this drawer. Look, Inspector, I can tell you the whole thing from the beginning, if you'll believe me. Yeah? Blackie rehearsal? Look, look, do you remember when so, Blackie was... Oh, the jewel wasn't here, huh? What's this, a kid's marble? Gee, hey, that rock's got more sparkle than a pinwheel. Yeah, this is the Wentworth diamond, all right. Now, what do you do with the smaller ones? You mean, you mean there's more? You know there are more. And all around here is some... Uh-oh. Someone's coming down the hall. It's probably Blackie. Turn out the lights. Oh, Inspector. Turn out I... those lights. Yes, sir. This is going to be wonderful. Wise guy knocking on his own door. Is that a signal to you? It don't mean nothing to me. I, I... I'll open it. Blackie, are you... Oh. Uh, Miss Wesley, it's you. Is Blackie here? Turn on the lights, Shorty. Oh, sure thing. Hi, Miss Wesley. Shorty, where is he? What happened to him? Well, didn't he meet you? No. And when he called me, we were cut off. I don't know what happened. Oh, gee. Okay, you two. Make yourselves comfortable. Because we're going to wait right here for Blackie. 
Oh, gee, Inspector, I think you're way off base. I think so, huh? Well, we're waiting here all night if we have to. Because with Miss Wesley here, I'll guarantee Blackie thinks there's no base like home. Mr. Farthing. Oh. oh. Mr. Farthing. Ah, I must have fallen asleep, Hazel. Sleep well earned. You've released Parson Blackie? Yes, yes. Before very long, we shall hear that he's been picked up for robbery. And murder. <laughs> and tomorrow morning, I shall have in my hands 24 of the most precious diamonds in the world. Tomorrow morning, Mr. Farthing? You mean this morning? Oh, oh it is quite late, isn't it? Nearly mid-morning. I suggest you go to your room and try to sleep, Hazel. And if you are addicted to dreams, my dear, perchance you can dream of the crime so perfect that it costs nothing but the life of Boston Blackie. Gee, Inspector, it's the middle of the morning. Hey, when do we get out of here, huh? When I say you do, not before. So don't keep asking. Uh Uh-oh, there's a key in the door. It's probably Blackie. Quiet. Mary, shut it. Come on, Inspector. Hold it, Blackie. Oh, Inspector, do you have to turn up when I feel refreshed and happy? One look at you and I'm 20 years older. You're not going to live 20 years, Blackie. What they do to you for murder in this state isn't good for your health. What did I do? Kill one of your jokes? You killed two guards at the Manchester Museum yesterday. Don't don't be a fool, Faraday. I wasn't near the Manchester Museum when those guards were killed. Then where did you get this diamond I found in your drawer? At the five and ten? I could get one like that off a chandelier, Inspector. That's a phony. That's the central diamond from the Wentworth collection. And you know it. I don't even know that the diamonds were stolen. What? For all I know, they're still in the Manchester Museum, just where they ought to be. Sometimes I think you ought to have your head examined. There are witnesses who saw you there. I find the diamond in your apartment, and you tell me the Wentworth jewels are still in the museum. Come on, what did you do with the smaller stones? Mary, call the museum, will you? Sure. The phone number is Plaza 39613. That kind of a stall isn't going to get you anywhere, Blackie. Forget about that phone call, Miss Wesley. Make it, Mary. And don't be a dope, Faraday. Wait a minute. Oh, what did I say? Uh, tell the museum you're calling for Inspector Faraday. All right. I'm not going to wait around for any phone call. Uh, where would you like to meet us, uh, Inspector? Uh, at the Ritz or the Roney? Very funny, Blackie. But I don't need a phone call to prove those diamonds were stolen. I got one of them right in my hand. Roll that stone out, Inspector, and it'd make a nice window pane. Hello, Manchester Museum. I'm calling for Inspector Faraday. Yes, of of police headquarters. (laughs) They don't even know you, pal. Uh, Yes, just a minute. He wants to talk to you, Inspector. Yeah? We didn't know who I was, huh? Give me that phone. Blackie said he's been trying to reach the inspector all morning. Hello, this is Faraday talking. Most people don't know when they're well off. What do you want? (laughs) The Wentworth diamonds are in their display case. What? Sure, sure. I'll be right down. I told you the diamonds were right where they belong, Faraday. Have a nice trip down there. Mary and I are going to have some breakfast. You too, Shorty. Come on. Just a minute, Blackie. I don't fall for you any of tricks this easy. I'm going down to have a look at those jewels, all right. But you're going with me. Here are the diamonds, Inspector, just as they were before the robbery. I don't understand it, but here they are. How do I know these aren't phony? I beg your pardon, Inspector, but I'm an expert in such matters. What about this diamond in my hand? It's paste. And what's this gag about the jewels being stolen and two guards killed? Well, it's all very true, Inspector. But this morning when I came into the museum, here were the diamonds just as they were before the unfortunate incident. It's amazing. Happy, Faraday? All the diamonds are here? All but one small stone. But we're so happy to have the other diamond returned, we aren't terribly concerned about... Well, I'm concerned. Especially about those two murdered guards. I'll tell you where you can find that missing stone, Faraday, and the man responsible for the death of the two guards. In your apartment? No, in room 909 in the Winston Hotel. In the handkerchief pocket of a friend of mine. Blackie, you're getting deeper and deeper into this every minute. I'll be in plenty deep if a certain party had a cold last night. A diamond that size is nothing to sneeze at. Here's room 909. Whose room is this? You'll see. Yes? Hello, beautiful. What do you want? In. Come on, Inspector. I'm with you. How dare you force your way in here? I seemed welcome enough here yesterday. Where's Farthing? Who's out there? Don't talk, beautiful. He's in there, Inspector. Come on. Mr. Farthing is the police. What's the meaning of... You two know each other, don't you? Hello, Farthing. I didn't know you were in town. Oh, good morning, Inspector. I was just in town for the day on a buying trip. 
buying diamonds, Inspector. Diamonds? For free. Look in his handkerchief pocket, Faraday. I'm in no mood for practical jokes, gentlemen. I have a business appointment that I... You may have to reach inside for the stone, Faraday. The handkerchief may not pull it out. We'll see. There. What fell on the desk, Inspector? Looks like a diamond to me. Farthing, if this is from the Wentworth collection, I'm arresting you for murder and robbery. It's from the Wentworth collection, all right. From the looks of it, I'd say the same thing. Congratulations, Blackie. Farthing, do you admit this is a Wentworth diamond? Oh, I see no reason why I shouldn't. You'll discover it for yourself in due time. <laughs> I know what I'm beaten, but I don't know how. Hmm, Blackie? Sorry, Farthing. That's a secret of the profession. If we of the same profession were alone... Same profession? Don't flatter yourself, Farthing. Uh, Inspector, would you be so kind? Let us have five minutes alone, Faraday. It's all right. I'm not the type to run away from anything once I run into it. It's entirely safe. Well, with Blackie in here and me outside the door, I guess it's okay. Five minutes, no more. <sighs> Sit down. Thanks. You're a good sport, Farthing. Uh, sit right here. A gambler has to be a good sport. Yes, I guess he does. I'm amazed. How did you do it, Blackie? When? The diamond in your pocket? It wasn't easy. You didn't let me get close to you but once when I was here yesterday. Fortunately, once was enough. Well, that's so utterly impossible. The diamonds were still in the museum when you were here yesterday. That's where you're wrong, Farthing. The diamonds were never in the museum. Only a set of paste. Why? I switched them myself. At the National Vaults, 8 o'clock yesterday morning. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Tell me how. Well, the first thing I did was to borrow Lady Wentworth's paste set. Mm -hmm. That was easy. Lady Wentworth is away. The paste set is not locked up because it's worthless. Then I hired an armored car. That alone is no simple matter. It was simple enough for my friend Charlie Kingston. Of Chicago? Yes. He hired an armored car for me through his local office. Oh, and how did you use this armored car? My friend Shorty and I dressed as bank guards and went to the delivery entrance of the vaults a little before eight with the paste diamonds in a case just like the ones the real diamonds were in. I see you. You stayed just inside the delivery entrance until the armored truck came along, then, then walked out with the paste diamonds and <laughs> gave them to the driver. <laughs> well, that was no problem. We weren't stealing anything, just handing to the driver something he expected to get. So far, brilliant. Brilliant. Then what? Then Shorty and I got our own armored car from around the block, drove it to the delivery entrance of the vault, and picked up the real diamonds from the real bank guards. Ah, that was simple, too, because the bank guards expected to see an armored car outside the delivery entrance. So a set of phonies went to the museum, and I kept the real set. Until after your men robbed the museum. Then I broke into the museum at night and delivered the real diamonds, that is... All except the one small stone which I planted on you. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks. That's a lot coming from you under the circumstances. I am an artist in my way, Blackie, and you're an artist in yours. <laughs> Does one great painter scoff at the work of another because the other's artistry is superior to his own? Maybe you're not the artist you think, Farthing. Why do you say that? The idea of involving me... It seems to me that a good artist concentrates more on the picture and a little less on the frame. Oh, Blackie, look at those lovely diamonds in this window. Aren't those engagement rings beautiful? They sure are. Oh, how I'd love to have that one there. You would? Well, it, um, it might depend on who gave it to me. Oh. I might like you to give me one someday. Except. Except what? Except I'd never be quite sure just how you got it.
back over there on that bench. Love boys. <laughs> What's he expecting in the park, Shorty? Penguins? Well, these love boys can't fly, boy. Neither can penguins. Yeah. Gee, Blackie, I didn't know there was a lake down this part of the park. Well, Shorty, we've never taken this path to Mary's before. Huh? What do we do from here, Swim? <laughs> now we take this footbridge. Ah, oh, gee. <laughs> it sure is a plenty cute lake for such a little one, eh? Well, stay away from that bridge railing, and you'll be telling me it's a plenty wet lake for such a little one. Hey, uh, boss. Now what? Look, oh, lying in the water there. I'd better sure. Uh-oh. Well, is it? It sure is. Is it, uh, dead? If it isn't, it's awful careless. Come on, let's have a look. Gee, boss. Is he dead? You used the wrong pronoun, short one. When a he is dead, he's an it. It's an it? By virtue of a slight case of no breathing. Light a match, will you? Oh, sure, sure. Then, uh, we'd better call a cop, huh? Are you kidding? All I have to do is pronounce the word body and Inspector Faraday dusts out a cell all for me. See, what do you know? Face down in the water with his feet on the shore. A plain case of suicide, boss. It'll be okay to call a cop. It'll be murder to call a cop, Shorty. Because that's what this is. This guy didn't bump himself? Not unless he rode here on the back of a duck. Look at his shoes. Uh, kind of neat looking. And he pulled a neat trick getting here without walking on them. Uh, oh, ha. Matches don't burn well. Uh, what do you mean by that, boss? He's wearing brand new shoes, Shorty. Never walked on. And it's a plenty long hike from here to the edge of the park. See? And I said, let's call a cop. Come on, let's get out of here. Yeah, sure, boss. Hey, you two. What's going on down there? Hey, boss, it's a cop. What's that lying in the water? The body? Uh oh, Shorty. Here we go again. <laughs> Now meet Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. All right, Blackie, come on in. I want to talk to you. Well, look what invites me into the morgue, a body that walks and talks, Inspector Faraday. Blackie, some of these days you're going to underestimate me and be sorry. Don't tell me this case is closed already. Maybe I look dumb, Blackie, but I'm not... We police see things that other people don't. Oh? I'll let you know a little secret, chum. This isn't suicide. It's murder. Murder? Surprise, huh? Plenty. Uh, what makes you think it's murder? I don't think. I know. What a clever stunt this was. Would have gotten by somebody like you. But not me. I saw it the minute they brought the body in. And you, the great Boston Blackie, you thought it was suicide. Well, I'm certainly surprised. I thought you would be, pal. I didn't think you'd notice the shoes. Well, when you know you... What? You mean you... Why, you double-crosser, you... You knew it all the time. <laughs> That's why I hung around. I thought you'd never notice it. Only a dope would fail to see no more than ten steps have been taken in those shoes. I ought to throw you in jail. Don't choke yourself with jealousy, pal. This murdered guy, Walters, could have taken a cab to within 20 feet of the lake. I'm way ahead of you again, Blackie. I checked with every cab company in town. He didn't take a taxi. It's murder, all right. And I know how it was done. You'd speculate on anything, wouldn't you? It's as simple as a nursery rhyme, my dear. Hello? He was picked up outside his apartment house, driven to the lake by his killer, hit over the head and tossed into the lake. I'll buy that. But you'll have to give me a cut rate. I know it's not worth much until we have a suspect for the motive. I've got a suspect with plenty of motive. A guy's wife. She didn't even break up when she identified the body. And guess where she says she was at the time Walters died? At a movie, alone. What did Mrs. Walters say when you told her it was murder? I didn't tell her. I've got Mrs. Walters tagged as a possible suspect. She admits she and her husband never got along. If she thinks I'm convinced it's suicide, she'll drop her guard. I'm even releasing a suicide story to the paper. Faraday, you were down there. Really? Okay, Blackie. You knew this was murder from the start. So maybe you know a whole lot more. Put that gun away, Faraday. Don't you know it's impolite to point? You found the body, Blackie. So I'm holding you as a material witness and locking you up till I've got my case against Mrs. Walters. Faraday, please, please, the gun you have. I know, and it stays in my hand. Now, if you've finished pawing over Walter's shoe, come on. Leave the shoe here. Where do you want me to put it? On this table right here. Hmm. Take hold of size 11, my toe. It's surprising how heavy a shoe can be. Put the shoe down, will you? And come on. Sure, I'll put it down. Right on your hand. Oh, please. Leave your gun on the floor, Faraday. Or I'll have to use mine on you. So help me, Blackie. You run out on this, and I'll throw the book at you. 
How far can you throw a book, Faraday? I'm going a long way. You won't get far. Every cup on the force will guarantee that personally. When you can get another key made for this door, Faraday, maybe someone on the force will let you out. Hey, Hey, officer. Yeah? What is it? Yeah, if you can get into the morgue, you'd better have a look around. Uh, what for? There's a brand new body in there, but it's dead only from the neck up. <laughs> Mrs. John Waters? Yes? I'm from the police department. Uh, may I come in? Oh, yes, of course. Thanks. Are you from Inspector Faraday? Straight from him. I'd like to ask you a few questions. I see. Your late husband carried life insurance? Doesn't almost everybody. That doesn't answer my question. Yes. That does. For how much? I don't know. For how much? Enough. Is that all? No. May I see the policy? I don't have it. Where is it? I'm not sure in my husband's safety deposit box, I suppose. You the sole beneficiary? I suppose I am. I never asked my husband. Do you suppose everything? What company did your husband carry his insurance with, or do you just suppose it was some company? No, it's the, the new Northern Life, I think. Oh, first you suppose, now you think. Well, it's a big improvement. Look here, I don't think you're from the police at all. Some cops still have arches, Mrs. Walters. You're not from the police. Who are you? I'm asking the questions, Mrs. Walters. Well, I'm going to call Inspector Faraday. Your husband's policy is with the new Northern Life, huh? Now, can you remember for how much? I'm not answering any more questions. Police Department. Inspector Faraday, please. Yes, ma'am. Faraday speaking. Inspector, this is Sarah Walters. Oh, yeah? Did you send a man from your department to talk to me? I did not. Well, there's a man here now who claims that he came from your office. Put him on the phone. Of course. Inspector Faraday wants to talk to you. Here. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Hello, sweetheart. How does it feel to be out of the morgue again? Mikey, I might have known it was you. I know. You're going to send up a squad car and then pick me up. You better behave yourself. You're getting in this deeper every minute. I don't know what I'm getting into, Inspector, but I do know I'm getting out of here, so don't bother to send for me. Goodbye. Mikey, so help me when I... Sorry to be leaving, Mrs. Walters, but this place is going to be full of cops in a few minutes, and I hate crowds. Who are you, anyway? The name's Blackie. Boston Blackie? That's right. Then you're the one who found my husband's body. And that isn't all I found, Mrs. Walters. And if Faraday doesn't see me first, I'll see you again. Tom Jenkins, law office. Jenkins speaking. Tom, this is Sarah. Oh, hello. Tom, John's dead. What? He was found in the lake in the park this evening. Oh, Sarah, I, I'm so sorry. How did it happen? He killed himself. Is there anything I can do? I don't know. I'm worried. Worried? Tom, I have a hunch the police suspect it's murder. Murder? What makes you think so? A man by the name of Boston Blackie was here asking terrible questions. Tom, what can I do? What do you mean? If it's murder, I'm afraid. Why? Do you have anything to hide? No. Then what are you worried about? <laughs> I'm just worried. Well, stop it. Who did you say was up there questioning you? Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie? <laughs> well, forget about him. Get him off your mind. I wish somebody would get him off this case. <laughs> I know you're the beauty of the new Northern Life Insurance Company, baby, but uh, are you the brains, too? <laughs> that depends on what you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you see, I, I carry a life insurance policy with your company. My name's John Walters. Yeah? I've forgotten the name of the man who sold me the policy. Uh, you could give it to me, couldn't you? <laughs> well, uh, not for memory, but I should have it in my file. <laughs> I think I should have you in my file. <laughs> Is there room? Sure. <laughs> you probably have a very small name. <laughs> uh, what was your name again? It's still John Wallace. Wally, Wally, Walter, 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 Abel, Walter, Ira, Walter, John. John, here we are. The salesman's name? Uh, here was, um, Fred Singer. I'd like to talk to him. Oh, well, that door right there. Just knock. Thanks. And, uh, who got me this information? Uh, 
Mr. Singer will be glad to do anything he can for you. <laughs> I'll be back. Come in. Fred Singer? That's right. I'd like to ask you a few questions. I don't think I've heard My name's Blackie, uh, Boston Blackie. Oh. You sold an insurance policy to John Walters, didn't you? That's right. When? I'm afraid you'd better explain your reasons for these questions. John Walters is dead. What did you say? When did you sell him this policy? A month ago. For how much? $50,000. Who's the beneficiary? His wife. How well did you know Mrs. Walters? I've never met her. Oh. This is certainly a shock about Walters. How did he die? He was murdered. Oh, uh... The police know who, who killed him? Well, I'll give you a hint. If the police can prove their case, they'll save your company $50,000. Ah, look, Blackie, when we get upstairs to your place, let's stay there. Huh? We're not in this mess. It's, it's got nothing to do with us. Faraday's figuring Mrs. Walters killed her husband, but I don't know, somehow I don't like that. Hmm? Would you like it better if Faraday pinned it on you? <laughs> Well, it would be a lot more natural. Uh, uh, what do we do now? You're going to shadow Mrs. Walters. I've got a hunch if we watch her movements, she'll either prove Faraday is right or clear herself. Well, okay, boss. You're the boss, but I... Hey, hey, Blackie. I don't like to look at this car coming up the street. Uh-oh. Boss, i got a funny feeling. Yeah, really, really quick. Yeah. We ain't going to make it, boss. You better. Hey, boss. Blackie! Hey, Blackie! <laughs> to Boston Blackie. Though he's being sought by Inspector Faraday as a material witness in the murder of John Walters, Boston Blackie has managed to interview Mrs. Walters, Faraday's chief suspect, Fred Singer, who sold the insurance policy to the dead man, and get himself shot at by an unknown assailant. As we return to our story, Blackie is still avoiding Faraday, and is at the apartment of Mary Wesley, where the young nurse is dressing his bullet wound. This will hurt a little, Blackie. You know you're supposed to report this to the police, don't you? Yes. It's the law. Yes, I know. Was Shorty hurt, too? No, on a scratch. Ouch! Sorry. What kind of trouble are you in this time? Up until this bullet autographed my arm, I wasn't in any trouble. I thought. Now we're both in trouble. Oh, don't worry, honey. I'll report this to Faraday myself. Oh. Shall I answer? It's probably for you. Hello. Hello. Hello, Blackie. Like it is shorty here. Are you still trailing Mrs. Walters? Boss, I'm shagging after that dame like she owed me the last ten buck bill in, in town. Hey, you know something, boss? As much as my IQ will allow. I don't know nothing from IQs, but I know I've seen this Walters dame somewhere before. Now, don't tell me she's a waterfront mall in Park Avenue clothing. I don't know about that. I just know that I've seen her before. Well, don't lose her. Where is she now? Well... I tell you, first she went into the bank for us, and then she went into an apartment building across the street from here, see? Do you know what apartment? Yeah, a guy named Singer. That Singer? Yeah. Hey, boss, how did you know that? Never mind that. Singer told me he didn't even know Mrs. Walters. Where are you now? In a drugstore at the corner 86th Street in Elmhoist. I'll be right up. Well, you better step on it, boss. The dame went into that building like she was in a hurry. I have a hunch she's not only in a hurry, short one. I think the lady's also in a jam. <laughs> Who is it? Hello, Singer. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. Ah. Oh, thanks for the pleasant welcome. Well, hello, Mrs. Walters. Again? Well, this is all very cozy. Two people who don't even know each other. Of course we know each other. We have the years. You don't think we'd be foolish enough to tell you or the police? You were foolish enough to let my man trail Mrs. Walters to your apartment. Now, what goes? I don't think we have to answer your questions. You're not from the police. Well, maybe you'd rather answer their questions. What do you want? Let's see that insurance policy. What insurance policy? The one you sold John Walters. Don't be a fool. What would it be doing here? You brought it here, Mrs. Walters. I did not. You didn't stop in at the bank on your way here to get changed for a dollar. Oh, no. Let's see the policy. All right, uh, let him see it, then. Dear, huh? Oh, this is cozy. 
The policy, Mrs. Wallace. I'm getting it out of my purse now. Be sure it doesn't come out with bullets in it. Here it is. Thanks. I don't see what you intend to accomplish with all this praying. For one thing, I intend to find out who hit John Walters on the head. So I can get Faraday off my neck. Let's have that policy. You can see I wasn't lying. It was signed a month ago, and it's for $50,000, just as I said. Mind if I use your phone? Go ahead. If you want anything in that policy... It explains, it explains itself. Who are you calling? Inspector Faraday. To turn you two in for the murder of John Walters. Are you out of your mind? Don't move, either one of you. I've got a good gun and better aim. Faraday, thing. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Okay, Blackie. This has gone far enough. I'm issuing a warrant for your arrest. You... Look, chum, don't make any more mistakes than you've already made. Or I'll make you solve this case by yourself. Oh, yeah? You want Mrs. Walters. And the man who sold John Walters is insurance. I was just checking into the insurance angle on this thing. Well, I've checked for you, sweetheart. Here's the dope. It's as pat as the pan on your face there. Mrs. Walters wanted a divorce. Singer wanted Mrs. Walters. The only thing that stood in the way was Mr. Walters. Ah, uh, that's an old one, my love angle. Yes, but love wasn't enough this time. Money was interesting, too. So, Singer sold Walters a policy for $50,000 payable to Mrs. Walters. I get it. Then Miss Horton knocked off Mr. Walters so they could get married and live happily ever after. Or until the 50000 bucks ran out. You see, Bernie, it's so simple even you can manage to figure it out. And they both happen to be right here in Singer's apartment. Number 2A, northwest corner of 86th and Elmhurst Avenue. Okay, I'll be right up from... But you stay there, too, Blackie. You're not out of this yet. Sorry, pal, I can't wait. I've got work to do. But Shorty will hold him for you. Look, you're way off the beat. You better sit down, Singer, and you too, Mrs. Walters. Faraday won't be here to pick you up for ten minutes. Hey, Shorty. Yeah, boy? Come on up quick. Use the stairs. They're faster. Right away, boy. Well... I guess about all you two need now is a lawyer. I'd like to call mine now, if you don't mind. I do mind. Oh, Fred, what are we going to do? Just sit tight, I guess. That's all we can do for the moment. That's what Tom told me to do, too, and look what's happened. Who's Tom? My lawyer. Please let me call him. Seems to me you've already called him. I did, after you came to see me this afternoon. What's his name? Tom Jenkins. Here I am, boss. Okay, Shorty. Just keep an eye on these two lovebirds till the police come and put them into their cages. Hey, gee, boss, now I know. Now you know what? Now I know where I seen his stand. It was in a place line up in Los Angeles when I was picked up on a phony charge. Why, you crazy. Well, no, this okay. gets more interesting every minute. I even remember what you was up for, boss. It was robbery. And her name was, was Sarah Wolf. That's not true. This could go on forever. See that these two don't run out before the cops get here, Shorty. Right. I'm going to run down Mrs. Walter's lawyer. <laughs> I've been Mrs. Walters' lawyer for many years. But you never knew Mr. Walters? No, I didn't. They didn't get along too well, you know. I was Mrs. Walters' attorney. Hmm. Nice place you have here. No, I like it. I was in a lawyer's office just the other afternoon. He had the same kind of paneling. Really? Well, I'm very busy, Blackie. I have a lot of work to do, so if you just tell me why you Tom come down Jenkins. here... Tom Jenkins. Tom Jenkins. Well, let me see. Uh, are you by any chance related to the Alfred Jenkins on the east side? No, I'm not. Now, now look here. I... Excuse me. Hello. Is Blackie there? Why, yes. In just a minute. For you. Oh, thanks. Hello. Blackie. Yes, Mary. I called Los Angeles just as you told me to. Oh, well, what'd you find out? Is it all right to talk? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Nobody can hear you. Well, you were right. And Sarah Walsh was sent to a California prison for three years for robbery. Uh-huh. She later changed the name to Sarah Burroughs. And she came east where she married John Walsh. Swell. Anything else? Yes. I asked about the name of her attorney on that case. It was a man by the name of Tom Jenkins. He was disbarred several years later for malpractice. Mary, you're the most wonderful girl in the world. Yes, I know. On a telephone. I'll talk to you in person in the best restaurant in town at 8 o'clock tonight. I'll uh, call for you at 7. Well, I won't wait a minute after 9. <laughs> Good girl. Bye-bye. Bye. Now, can we get down to business, or may I go to work? Sorry to hold you up, Jenkins. Gee, I'm really sorry. Uh, one more phone call, and then we can talk. Go ahead. <laughs> Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Hello, Blackie. Say, I guess I really have to thank you this time. What for, pal? I believe in being fair. 
Thanks to you, I've got Mrs. Walters and Fred Singer on the lock and key. And the whole case sewed up in a sack. Faraday, you haven't got anything. Are, are you crazy? Read that insurance policy. What for? Look, Walter's death was supposed to look like suicide, wasn't it? Any fool could have told that. Then only a fool would have wanted Walter's death to look like suicide. If he knew what was in that insurance policy, and both Mrs. Walters and Singer knew it. Knew so what? That a suicide clause voided the policy in the event Walter killed himself inside of two years. And that policy was only one month old. Well, I'll be... Ah, 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 Inspector, mustn't brag. You made a fool out of me, Blackie. You relax, me. relax, Inspector. I thought Singer and Mrs. Walters were the ones we wanted, too, until I read the policy carefully. But now I've got your real killer for you. Where? Right here. From 1051 in the city building. His name is Tom Jenkins. What time? What? receiver, Blackie. Afraid I'll have to put an end to this little conversation, Inspector. I heard what he said. I'll have a squad up there in five minutes. For the last time, put that receiver down. With pleasure. It was getting so heavy anyhow. Very clever. Oh, not very. For that very lovely shot in the dog, you're going to get a shot in the back. Oh, I don't think so. This gun in my hand wasn't filled in a water fountain. Oh, I was referring to what you called my shot in the dark. I wasn't guessing at all. Oh, you looked into your little crystal ball, huh? No, into the court records in Los Angeles. Mrs. Walters went to jail out there a few years ago, and you were her lawyer. Well, you're, you are informed, aren't you? Better than you think. When she came east, she changed the name, married John Walters, had two children, and then you followed her to blackmail her for every dime she could lay her hands on. Your answers don't wait for questions, do they? A little while ago, Mrs. Walters went broke, didn't she? What makes you think so? It had to be like that. You murdered John Wallace to get the $50,000 for which he was insured. Because you knew you could get every penny of it from Mrs. Walters. I don't think you can prove that. You must think so, or you wouldn't be holding that gun at me. Just a precaution. Well, I'll tell you why. Would you kill John Walters, if you'd like to know? The clue is in the insurance policy. And you're the only one of three suspects who didn't see the policy. Oh, if you had read the policy, you wouldn't have made it look like suicide. After all, you did want Mrs. Walters to collect. Well, you're a very clever young man. It's too bad I missed when I shot at you this afternoon. But it isn't too late. Put away that gun, Jenkins. The cops will be here in a few minutes. No, I won't kill you here. We're leaving. You take my car for a drive in the country. Hmm, you dump Walters in the park, and you're going to dump me out in the country. Murder seems to bring out the rural in you. I'll just search you for your gun, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, there's no gun. Let's go, Blackie. Right out that door, the way you came in. Okay. Just remember, this hand in my coat pocket has a gun in it. I wouldn't have to give it a second thought if I had my gun with me. Here's your gun, boss. What do you... Well, shorty. Yep. Here's your gun, boss. Sticking in this guy's back. That was a wonderful dinner, Blackie. <laughs> I like a little food with my conversation. But, Blackie, I had a lot of questions to ask you. Have you run out of them yet? Nope. Just one more. <laughs> All right. Where do we walk? Oh, it's a beautiful night. Well, here's the park. What about through here? Oh, Blackie, do you think we should? Isn't this the path you and Shorty were on when you found that... that body? Remember all the trouble that caused you. Honey, any time I walk through a park with Shorty when you're available, I deserve to have trouble. Sit down, Mary. Make yourself comfortable. This isn't a social call. It isn't an anti-social call, either. Look, John. I came over here for just one reason. To tell you that we're through. And to ask you to please stop calling me. Only one half of us is through, baby. Please try to understand, will you? I'm just not interested in you. But I'm plenty interested in you. Look at me, please. I told you in that letter that we were finished months ago. Um... Who told you to write me a threatening letter? Your pal, Boston Blackie? Blackie knows about it. 
but he had nothing to do with it. So you tossed me over for Boston Blackie, huh? Blackie and I are just good friends. Well, then, in that case, there's still room for me. You better stay where you are. Oh, Mary, all I want is... Don't make me use this. But... Oh. Well, did Boston Blackie teach you to point guns at your old boyfriend's? This happens to be Blackie's gun. He told me I might need it, and I think he was right. But, of course, you won't use it. If you don't stay where you are, I certainly will. Ah, you wouldn't have the nerve. Oh, wouldn't I? Now, Richard Colmer is Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. Inspector Faraday speaking. Uh, Inspector, this is Chief Warren of the fire department. Yeah? We've just put out a fire in the home of John Richards at 571 London Street. What do you want from me? Applause? This is the homicide department. I know, but we found a body in the house, Inspector. It looks like murder. Okay, I'll send some men from the precinct up right away. And I'll be there as soon as I can make it. This has to happen when I was going to take the day off. Oh, that's too bad. The house destroyed? Yeah, burned up. Don't let this go any further. But so am I. Blackie? Oh, I'm sorry I had to wait outside, Mary. Why didn't you get the doorman to let you into my apartment? I didn't want to ask, so I thought I'd wait in the hall. Well, come on in. Uh, no thanks, Doctor. I, I don't feel too well. Richard? Yes, I had a little trouble with him. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. I tried to phone you just after I left his house, but no one answered your phone. I, uh, had to go out on a little business. Well, I... I just want you to know that I'm back, and I don't think he'll bother me again. Well, that's what we wanted, didn't it? Yes. Well, good night, Blackie. I'll, I'll, I'll call you. Uh, say, I, I think you'd better give me back my gun. Oh, oh, yes. I, I'm sorry. That's, that's exactly why I waited for you. I, I have it here in my purse. I, um, had to use the gun, Blackie. Oh? Here it is. Thanks. Hmm. One shell fire, huh? I had to do it, Blackie. I had to keep him away from me. I'm so nervous. I... Oh, I... I wish you'd hold me close to you. Okay, Johnson, get those photographs. No use looking for fingerprints, Wilson. The joint's too badly damaged. All right, Chief. Hey, scout around the rubble for the murder weapon, Rollins. Okay, Smith. Body's right where the fireman found it, Inspector. Shot through the head, huh? Went right through. Hmm. That's going to make it tough to find the bullet. How long has he been dead? Coroner says about ten hours. Ten hours? And the guy was dead a long time before the house caught fire. Any identification? None. Well, his dental work will do. Let's hope this guy saw his dentist twice a year. Uh, a couple next door say they heard a shot here last night. Uh, something that sounded like a shot. Nosy neighbors trying to get into the act, huh? Well, the woman says she saw a girl leave here shortly after the shot. Yeah? They might know something, Inspector. They turned in the alarm when the house caught fire. We'll have to have a talk with them. Uh, she described the girl she saw leaving here. Said she looked like she was in a hurry, too. Okay. That sounds like a good lead. Find out anything else? Yeah. A guy named John Richards owns this place. This is probably Richard's body. John Richards, huh? What else did you find out? Well, we ran across a safe that was open. I took these papers out. Let's have a look at them, huh? Here you are. Hey, Johnson, hurry with those pictures. We haven't got all night. All right. John Richards lived here, all right. These are all letters addressed to him. Anything interesting? No, just the usual stuff. It may help with the identification. I'll take them down. Well... What do you know about this? Can you find something, Inspector? I haven't had such luck since my sister Maggie got married. Read this. Let's see. For the last time, Richards, I'm warning you. Lay off or I'll kill you. And look who signed it. Oh, signed by Boston Blackie. But why the great surprise, Inspector? Didn't you know Blackie could write? <laughs> Hello, Blackie. Why, Faraday. What an unpleasant surprise. Come in. Can't you ever be serious? I'm sorry, Inspector, but you see, I was expecting... I am? 
The weatherman said it was going to be fair and warmer today, but I had a hunch a dark cloud would come along and make a liar out of him. All right, Blackie. I'll come right to the point. And mind if I sit down? And not on the point, of course. Do what you want. Only listen. Go ahead. I haven't been to a dull lecture in years. Blackie, I've been after you for a long time. And I've just been waiting for the day I could get something on you. Only this is the kind of a rap I hate to pin even on you. Now, what have I done, Inspector? Taken candy away from you or some other baby? I'm serious, Blanky. Why did you do it? I like candy. I'm not talking about candy, and you know it. Why did you do it? Why did I do what? Did you write this letter? What's it? Just look at it. I'll hold it. Did you write it? Sure. Sure I did. You certainly are stupid, Blanky. Why, did I misspell a word or something? You did something dumber than that. Wrong punctuation? Dumber than that. Well, what shall I do, teacher? Stay after school? I don't think you ever went to school, or you wouldn't have pulled as dumb a stunt as this. What dumb stunt? You wrote this note to Richards, threatening to kill him. My, my, Inspector, you can read. And I know enough mathematics to put two and two together. You wrote this note to John Richards after he was dead. How do you know John Richards is dead? They found his body, in spite of the fact that you went to a lot of trouble to hide the evidence. Now, what did I do? You set fire to his house. But it's for guys like you that we have a fire department. Richards' house was badly burned? They'll have to sweep it up. But thanks to Dr. Harold Madison in the bar building, we got identification through the dental work. Faraday, you've been reading too many detective books. And you haven't been reading enough, or you wouldn't have written this note to Richards after he was dead, and on Richards' own stationery. Now you've been reading too many Aesop's fables. The paper you wrote this note on is the same as the rest of the writing paper in Richards' house. Well, maybe he sent me a blank sheet of paper with a stamp self-addressed envelope. You didn't send this letter to him through the mail. You wrote it while you were in his house, standing over his dead body. Were you a worm in the woodwork? Oh, arrest me if you know so much. I'm not arresting you, Blanky. I'm not so dumb I fall for as pat a gag as this. This note was too easy to find. You wrote it to cover up for Richard's real killer. That's my boy scout training, Inspector. You wrote this note and set that house afire to cover up for that girl of yours, Mary Wesley. Mary had nothing to do with this. I happen to be sure of my facts this time, Blanky. I've checked on this guy, Richards. He was chasing after Mary plenty. When she couldn't stand it anymore, she wrote him a threatening letter. What if she did? That doesn't mean she killed him. I've done some more checking, chum. Mary was at Richard's house just before he was killed. I found the cab driver who took her out there. A lady next door heard a shot in Richard's house and saw Mary leave his place. What more do I need? You still have that letter I wrote Richard's. I'll tell you about that letter. You knew Mary was going out to see Richard's. You followed her out there. She was gone. But Richard was there, lying on the floor, dead. Is that so? You remembered Mary had written him a threatening letter. Found it, tore it up, and wrote this one to take its place. Then you set fire to Richard's house. Now, how do you like that? I'm positively crazy about it. It's true about the letter, but that's all. Mary didn't kill him. Well, I know she did. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gone to the trouble of covering up for her. What's more... I've got men at her apartment now picking her up for murder. Oh, Faraday, don't be a dope. Now, listen to me, Blanky. I don't blame you for what you've already done to try to hide the facts in this case. Your motives were good. But I'm warning you, keep out of this from now on, or I'll hold you as accessory after the fact. How does a flatfoot pick up such fancy legal terms with his toes? Excuse me. Well, it's probably headquarters looking for me. What's the matter, pal? You lost? Hello. Blanky, this is Mary. Oh, uh... Hello, Shorty. Blackie, can't you hear me? This is Mary. Uh, sure, I can hear you, Shorty. Blackie, what's the matter? Uh, hey, uh, well, if you want to give the gang a laugh, Shorty, uh, tell them Faraday's arresting Mary Wesley for the murder of John Richard. What? No kidding, Shorty. Uh, he sent some men up to her apartment this morning. They have her in jail now, I guess. Oh, Blackie, what'll I do? No, Shorty, I'm not kidding. Faraday's here right now bragging about it. I am... Uh... I guess I'd better not go home then, huh? Uh, where are you going to be, Shorty? I I'll meet you later and tell you all the laughs. I'm in the movie at 39th Street. Well, stay there, Shorty. I'll meet you. Hey, I don't take that Shorty at all. Let me have that phone. Bye, Shorty. Uh, what did you say, Faraday? Well, you double-crosser. That wasn't Shorty at all. That was Mary Wesley. And now I know even you believe she murdered Richards. Why, Inspector, Mary isn't the lady killer. I am. Have you forgotten my reputation? <laughs> Hello. Hello. You? Yeah. You should know better than the call here. I'm calling you from a pay station. The call can't be traced. All right. 
What do you want? I uh, just thought you'd like to know. Everything is okay. It's a perfect job. You sure? The police are going to arrest one or two suspects for the killing of John Richards. Who? Mary Wesley or Boston Blackie. Personally, I don't care which. <laughs> Back to our story. When Boston Blackie found John Richards dead, all evidence pointed to a strong possibility that Mary Wesley, Blackie's closest friend, was the one who committed the crime. Hoping to clear Mary Wesley, Blackie destroyed a threatening letter Mary had written to Richards, and in its place himself wrote a threat to the already dead man. But when Faraday began checking up on Richards' past, he learned that Richards had been bothering Mary and saw right through Blackie's ruse. As we left our story, Blackie had warned Mary over the phone that Faraday's men were in her apartment and had told her to wait for him in a movie. As we continue, Blackie and his friend Shorty walk into the theater lobby to meet Mary. There she is, Shorty, over in the corner. Uh, hey, boss, is it all right if I stand by the door and watch the flicker, huh? Sure, but keep one eye out for the cops. Oh, sure, boss. And give me those sandwiches. Oh, yeah, yeah, boy. Gee, I hear this is a swell picture. Hello, honey. Oh, Blackie. Hey, can't I get out of here? I've seen the show twice and I'm starved. You stick your nose outside while Faraday's men are looking for you and you'll eat your next meal in jail. Oh. I knew you'd be hungry, though. Here's a little something to eat. Oh, Blackie, you're a darling. Can you eat and talk at the same time? I don't, usually. Well, you don't usually duck a murder rap, either. Hope you like the sandwiches I got for you. I'll like them. But you're not going to like this question... Did you kill John Richards? What do you think? Well, until Faraday thought you did, I wasn't sure. That bullet missing from my gun last night didn't look so good. And now? Faraday had an airtight case against you this afternoon. And though that doesn't clear you, that leaves plenty of doubt in my mind. I didn't kill him, Blackie. I just fired the gun into the floor to show I wasn't afraid to use it. Well, this is fine. I cover up for you for something you didn't do, and now I'm in a jam. I suppose you'd rather I had done it. So your efforts wouldn't be for nothing. <laughs> no. But I thought it was a pretty good stunt. And it's too bad I used it when it wasn't necessary. What in the world did you do? When I didn't hear from you for a while last night, I went out to Richard's house to see if everything was all right. You were gone, but Richard's was there, lying on his living room floor, dead, shot through the head. Oh, no. No wonder you thought I killed him. I remember that threatening letter you wrote him, so I looked around until I found it. Oh. It was in a safe, but that was no problem. Then you you destroyed my letter. And wrote a letter of my own to take its place. That was for Faraday, in case he checked up on Richards, mm -hmm. which he did. And found out you and Richards had once been pretty good friends, which he did. Well, Blackie, certainly ballistics would prove it was a bullet from some other gun that killed Richards. They'll probably never find that bullet, Mary. A little while after Richards was killed, his house burned into a pile of honeymoon toast. Oh, no. Well, Faraday was too but... smart to be stopped by that. He had the body positively identified as John Richards through his dental work. Blackie, I suppose I ought to say I'm sorry he's dead. But I'm not. There was something repellent about the leer on his freckled face that I will never forget. Well, look, Mary. All kidding aside, you and I, uh, well, we've got, we've got to chase down this guy. If Faraday will put it on us, we've got to find who did kill Richards. Now, who were his friends? I don't know. Well, uh, what do you know about him? He had a business partner. I met him once or twice. Remember his name? Mm-hmm. It was, uh, Emery, William Emery. Well, maybe I'd better talk to this guy Emery before Faraday gets to him and questions him into insensibility. Shall I go with you? Not unless you want to be Miss Police Lineup of 1945. You mean I have to sit through this movie again? Cheer up. The picture changes a week from tomorrow. Oh, bless. <laughs> yeah, I guess Shorty and I are going up to see this Bill Emery. You will be careful, won't you, Blackie? From here on in, it's Richard's killer. We'd better be careful. All right, Shorty. Yeah. This is where we came in. All right. Oh, gee, boss, this picture's great. Boy, is it great. Maybe the first two times. Huh? <laughs> All right, Shorty, come on. We've got work to do. Oh, Blackie, the, the picture was just coming to the most exciting part. So is this case. Let's go, Shorty. <laughs> Look, boss, 
If this Bill Emery guy ain't home and ain't been seen in the building in two days, how are we going to get in? Are you kidding? Oh, gee, boss. <laughs> One day you're going to find a lock that you can't open. Sure. The day I leave my fingers home. Yeah, yeah that was easy. <laughs> gee, boss, uh, could you teach me to do that, huh? Sure. Just let me know when you have a hundred years to spend learning. Huh? Skip it, short one. Oh, oh, that's all right, boss. You're entitled not to make sense sometimes. Well, nice apartment, huh? Look, uh, boss, if the doorman was leveling when he said Emery hasn't shown for two days, what are we hanging around here for? I can't think of a better place to pick up the trail of a killer than in the killer's own apartment. Gee, Emery killed this guy? All I know is that Mary didn't. Well, it looks as if Emery skipped town. Why? Maybe because he killed Richards. Gee, boss, <laughs> you're smart. I have to prove that before I'm smart. We'd better look around. See what's in that room there. Oh, sure, Blackie. Gee, this, this sure is one elegant shirt. Uh, this is a bedroom, boss. Have a look in his closet. Yeah, sure thing. Huh. Pretty nice-looking library. Emery had either an appetite for literature or... Good eye for decoration. Hey, 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 boss. Find something, Shorty? Yeah, I don't know. But if, if Emery took it on a lamb, he ought to be coming back for something he forgot. Look here. A suitcase. Fully packed. Yeah. Well, he was planning to leave and had to pull out sooner than he thought, I guess. Yeah, this sure looks funny, don't it? Interesting is a better word. Look at this, Shorty. A cigarette that was never put out. It just went out. Well, that's a kind of a dumb thing for anybody to do. He might have bought the journ up. For a man who planned the murder, Bill Emery sure was haphazard about his getaway. It doesn't seem to me as if he planned to leave here at all. And if that's the case, maybe he didn't murder that freckled face. Which... Hey. Hey, what? Mary told me in the movie that John Richards was freckle-faced. The man I found dead before the fire didn't have any freckles. He didn't have any more freckles than you do. He, he didn't? I've got a hunch John Richards isn't even dead. Look, if we can get just a, a, a picture of Emery around yeah. here somewhere, try those drawers. I'll root around these. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, none, none in here. We'll look until we find something. Uh, nothing in this drawer at all, Frank. Right? Keep looking. Yeah. Uh-oh, a wallet. Oh. We might have something here. Uh, money, baby, huh? <laughs> no, definitely. But here's something that may be worth a million dollars to Mary... Here's Bill Emery's picture and a hunting license. Well, what do you know? Hey, boss, he, he ain't got no freckles. He doesn't have anything anymore. This is the guy I found on the floor in Richard's apartment. But, boss, this is crazy. Th this is nuts. The dentist proved the body was Richard's by the dental work. Shorty, if you needed dental work and you were on the lam, who'd do the job for you? Well, let's see. Well, there are two tooth doctors known for not coining away a dishonest dollar. Then we'll go see both of them. Who are they? Let's see, there's a doc by the name of Foster and another one by the name of Lindell. Wait a minute. I looked him up in the phone book. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Foster, Foster. Here he is. Uh, 747 Angel Building. Remember that. Oh, sure. Uh, who's the other one? Lindell? Lindell, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lindell, Lindell. Joe Lindell? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. 1010 Bar Building. Remember that, too. 1010, sure thing. Hey, wait a minute. Faraday mentioned the bar building when he told me about the doctor who identified the dead man's dental work. He saw Doc Lindell? No, Faraday went to see a dentist by the name of Madison. Let's have a look at Madison's office number. Yeah. You, uh, you think maybe it's the same doctor? Yeah, I don't know. Could be. Madison, Madison. Madison. Here it is. 1010 hmm? Bar Building. Th same office as Lindell. We're going there. Why? You you want him to yank out a tooth? No, Shorty. I want to yank out the truth. <laughs> Dr. Madison? Come in, gentlemen. Thank you. I'm Boston Blackie. How do you do? My receptionist says you want to see me about an identification I made for the police yesterday. That's right. Uh, John Richards. Uh, the dental work check with my record. Would you like me to show it to you? No, thanks. That wouldn't mean anything to me. Uh, I want to ask you about a Dr. Joe Lindell. Who's he? Oh, Dr. Lindell is my assistant. But uh, I'm the one who made the identification. But Lindell might have made something else. Huh? I don't understand. He might have made a mistake, for one thing. Is he in? Yes. 
I'd like to talk to him. This way. Thank you. Uh, boss, I think I'll wait here. This, this place makes my feet hurt. Stay close by. I may need you. Oh, in here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be right here, boss. Oh, Joe, uh, there's someone here to see you. Uh, yes? Boston Blackie, this is Dr. Lindell. Oh, uh, how do you do? How are you? I'd like to ask you a few questions, Lindell. Well, uh... Dr. Madison here is the uh, senior consultant. If uh, I... He uh, seems to want to talk to you, Joe. Oh? Uh, about what? Where's John Richards? John Richards? I don't understand, Blackie. John Richards is dead. In name only, Dr. Madison. But I identified the dental work that proved John Richards was dead. You identify dental work from the mouth of a murdered man made to look like the dental work you'd done for John Richards. What? Would it be possible for Lindell here to match the dental work you've done for Richards? Why, uh, of course, using my materials, my drills, my records, my technique. Possible, yes, but hardly probable. I think it is. He helped John Richards kill William Emery, fixed Emery's teeth to look like Richards, took the body to Richards' house and set fire to the place so that the body would have to be identified by the dental work. How could I have brought a dead body into this office without being seen? You're a fool. I know. Does this office have such a thing as a portable drill? Oh, we do. Uh, it's broken. Not that I know of. You'd better tell what you know, Lindell. Where's John Richards? I don't know. Look, maybe you're not as deep in this as I think. If Richards alone killed Emery... You can get off easy if you talk. I tell you, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Good heavens, Joey. If you didn't kill anyone, say so. I didn't kill him. Believe me, Richards did. All All I did was to go out to Richards' house and fix Emery's dental work. Oh, Joe. I, I had to do it. I had to, but Emery was dead when I, I got to Richards' house, you see. Where's Richards now? Well, he left town. That's all I know. Believe me, but he, he, he changed his name to Robert Carlton. He thought he'd be safe as long as the police thought he was dead. A pretty slick stunt. I'll say he'd have been safe. When the police cleared Mary Wesley and me, they'd have suspected Emery and spent the rest of their lives looking for a dead man. I'll call the police. Ask for Inspector Faraday, Dr. Madison, and tell him that from now on, never to look a gift corpse in the mouth. <laughs> Well, it certainly is a relief to be out of that movie and in the first year. Of <laughs> Faraday called and wanted to apologize to you. Oh, did he? Yeah. He picked up John Richards in Chicago a couple of hours ago and got his confession. Thanks to you. Thanks to Joe Lindell for thinking he could beat his rap because he had nothing to do with killing Emery. Why did Richards kill Emery in the first place, though? Emery caught Richards juggling their company books, I think. He was going to turn him in. Richards had threatened him. That's why Emery was leaving town. Well, I'm glad it's all over. Now I can relax again. Where would you like to relax this beautiful evening? My apartment. Well, let's take a walk instead. Becky, give me your gun. Huh? Oh, Mary, not again. Give it to me. Okay. There you are. Now, what's the idea of taking it and pointing it at me? A darn good idea. I just want to make sure we go to my apartment. That's all. <laughs>
Bill. You have all three of us here. If there's any point to this, get to it, will you? Uh, none of you has ever been subtle in his dislike for me, anyhow. Well, I'm sure you don't think much more of us than we think of you. We understand each other perfectly, don't we? I think we do. Look, Uncle Bill, if you have anything to say to us, say it, will you? I have a date. I apparently have a date, too, with someone who wants to kill me. As you all have been very pleased to know, I have received several anonymous telephone calls threatening my life. So what? I can imagine how you three must feel, since my death means that you will inherit my entire estate. It is still in the millions, isn't it, Uncle? More millions than you can imagine. And it is still left entirely to us. Merely because I have no choice in the matter. The condition under which I inherited it from my father stipulates that I must leave it all to you. Well, when you see your father, which should be soon... Say thanks for us. Uh, I have taken it upon myself to add something to my will. John, will you stop playing with that toy? It's not a toy. It's a magic trick. Uh, Now you see the card. Now you don't. Put your magic tricks away while I'm talking. I've stated in my will that in the event that I'm murdered, not one cent will be given to any of you until my murder is solved. Really? Yes. All of you not only hate me, but you hate each other. Two of you would profit immensely if one of you were convicted of killing me. It amuses me to picture each of you scrambling madly to blame my death on one of the others. If you really think someone's trying to kill you, why don't you notify the police? I'm going even beyond the police, my dear family. I'm going to Boston Blackie. And now meet Richard Calmer as Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy... Friend to those who have no friends. You know what I like about you, Blackie? The quaint places you take me to eat. Like this. Well, you know what I like about you. Nope. Me. Oh, I mean, what? There is a telephone call for you, Mr. Blackie. Thanks. One thing I don't like about you, you always want it on the phone. Excuse me. I'll just be a moment. I'll be back in time for dessert, will you? I'll be back for soup. Excuse me, dear. Right over in your boots, sir. Right there. Thank you. Hello? Mr. Boston Blackie? Yeah? I'm William Blaine. Yes? I've received several telephone calls in the past week threatening my life. So? So I'm hiring you to protect me. Oh, that's very nice of you, but I'm not interested. You don't seem to know who I am. Sure I do. You're William Blaine. Well, I expect you to accept the job. Oh, you do? I'm not accustomed to being refused. Well, let's say I'm breaking you in. I insist that you take the job. If you want protection, call the police. You'll become my bodyguard for the next few days or I'll ruin you, Blackie. I don't ruin easily, Blaine. And besides, I have a job entertaining a lovely lady at lunch. Goodbye. Now, you listen. Hi there, honey. Miss me? How could I? It's such an interesting menu to read. How's the plot? Good? Mm-hmm. Especially the chapter called Roast Ribs of Beef and Potatoes Any Style. <laughs> Important phone call? Oh, just a fellow named Bill Blaine. Who's he? Well, right now, he's a guy who's still looking for a bodyguard. All right, Blackie, this minute. Hi, Miss Wesley. I gotta see Blackie. Oh, come in, Jordy. Oh, gee, thanks. Where, where's Blackie? I gotta see him, but kind of. Well, he'll be here in a minute. Sit down. Oh, gee, thanks. Anything the matter? Oh, plenty. Oh, he should be here any minute. Oh, gee, Miss Wesley, you sure are a beautiful day. Oh, Shorty, you're wonderful. Oh, gosh, Miss Wesley, do you think so? I most certainly do. Oh, oh here's Blackie now. Gee, I hope so, because I ain't got a minute to lose. Hi, honey. All set to... Thank you. Shorty put into words what you seem to be saying in that restaurant. Shorty, do I have a rival? Hiya, boss. Boss, look, I, I, got, I got troubles. I can fix them up between now and dinner time? I don't know, boss. It's pretty bad. Oh, will it still be bad tomorrow morning? It'll be worse. All right. Let's have it. Boss, look, do you remember the rap that you got me out of six years ago? That's dead, Shorty. But that's it. It ain't dead enough. Sam Daniels all of a sudden's going to send me up for those sports checks. You fixed it with him way back when I did it. He promised he wouldn't do nothing to me if I went straight. How do you know Daniels is going to prosecute? He called me up and told me so. Hmm. Well, don't worry about it, short one. I'll go out and have a talk with Daniels. I'll be back, Mary. What comes first with you, Blackie? Business or pleasure? If this means what I think it does, honey, this business is going to be a pleasure. (laughs) 
Sit down, Blackie. Sit down. I can stand, Blaine, but not for what you're doing. I just left Sam Daniels. How did you find out he could send Shorty to jail for forgery? And a man has unlimited funds, he can find out a great many things. All right. What's the deal? I want you to accept the job I offered you on the telephone this noon. Or what? Or your friend Shorty goes to jail. What do I have to do? I've received several telephone calls from someone threatening to kill me. I want you to protect me. And what about Shorty? If you do as I say, I'll not force Daniels to prosecute your friend. Now, I get what I want, don't I? You're getting the wrong man for a bodyguard, Mr. Blaine, because, frankly, I'd just as soon see you dead. Well, then you and my family should get along famously here. They feel the same way. Oh, I'm to move in? I expect to occupy your full time. Uh huh. <laughs> Wait till Mary hears about this. I'll call my family to come down. I'd like you to meet them. You're the boss. But introduce me as, uh, old John Jones, if you don't mind. I don't mind. Oh, excuse me. Oh? You're going to kill tonight. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Was that another threat on your life? Yes, obviously the last one. The voice just said you're going to be killed tonight. I seem to have arrived just in time for the fun. Uh, Did you recognize the voice? No, it was disguised. Oh, that's fine. It wasn't one of your family, was it? That's impossible. They're here in the house. We have only one outside line. Better call them down so we can be sure. Well, I'm here. Oh, Martha. Now, this is uh, John Jones, my bodyguard. Mr. Jones, this is my niece, Martha. Well, how do you do? How are you? Uh, tell your brothers to come here at once. Bodyguard, huh? Oh, this should be very amusing. Robert? John? I am. John's upstairs, I think. Oh, John? Yeah. Come on down for a laugh. Uncle Bill's gone and bought himself a bodyguard. Tell me. Pleasant family you have, Mr. Blaine. Yes, don't I? Now, this is Robert, my nephew. Robert, Mr. John Jones. How do you do, Mr. Jones? How do you do? I hope you're getting a high fee, Mr. Jones, because you might have to ask. <laughs> hey, hey, let's see this bodyguard. Is he tough? Well, he's, uh, he's handsome. And Mr. Jones, you've now met my entire family. Uh, uh, this is John. John, this is Mr. Jones. Oh, how are you, Mr. Jones? Hello. I think you'd better guard Uncle Bill from us, too. We don't love him. Or has he told you? If he hasn't, I know it by now. Your uncle just received another of those telephone calls. Your being here is the only thing that keeps me from thinking one of you made the call just now. But I think we should call the police. So do I. Uh, it'll mean nothing but nasty publicity. I, I don't think the police are necessary. I do. I say let's get a lot of them and make absolutely sure. Well, I know the police commissioner. He'll send us all the policemen we want. Well, Mr. Blaine, at least two-thirds of your family show concern for your life. Don't let them fool you, Mr. Jones. They don't want me to live. They're daring me to. <laughs> Have a little organization here. You're gonna stay in this room, Mr. Blaine. Oh, will I be safe here? I don't know why not. You have two policemen in here with you. Now that's what I call protection. What are you doing over there, Mr. Jones? It's just trying the windows. They're locked good and tight. Oh, I was just checking. They don't need checking. Take them out, Ron. Okay, bud. Come on outside. Well, looks like I'll have to charge you from a distance, Mr. Blaine. Okay, everybody out. You too, sister. You're sure we shouldn't all stay in here? There is orders. Everybody outside. <laughs> all right. Here, Rollins. Lock the door. Yes, sir. Now what, officer? You're behind locked doors and windows, Mr. Blaine. You got two cops right beside you, sir. There's nothing to worry about. Uh, wish I were as sure as you are. Don't worry. You won't let anybody touch a hair on your head. Not even if all he wants to do is comb it. Why don't you go to sleep, Mr. Blaine? How can I do anything when I feel like an animal in a cage? Can't we open a window just to crack for air? Nothing doing. The windows stay locked tight. The door's locked. That's where everything stays, because that's the only way you're safe. And you're plenty safe in here. Uh, it should be. I'm uncomfortable enough. Hey, how about a game of gin, Smith? Yeah. Got cards? Uh, lower your voices, will you? I, I think I'll try to read. Yeah, okay. I don't suppose either of you should... Mr. Blaine! Mr. Blaine! What happened to him? 
What do you think happened to him? That noise wasn't a backfire. Look at him. It was a shot, huh? Did you get him? Yeah. Is he, is he dead? Yeah. Shot. In the sealed room, too, with us practically sitting beside him. Call Faraday quick. How will I tell him? Tell him it couldn't happen, but it did. Now, back to our story. When the wealthy Bill Blaine received strange telephone calls threatening with death, he forced Boston Blackie to become his bodyguard by digging up some old evidence against Shorty, Blackie's friend. When Blaine heard that he was to be killed last night, Blackie called in the help of the police, who put Blaine in a locked room and stood guard over him. Then the police insisted that Blackie leave, and shortly thereafter, Bill Blaine was shot and killed. As we return to our story, Inspector Faraday is at the scene of the crime. What do you mean, no glass is broken? If the shot didn't come from inside the room, it came from outside. We've gone over every pane of glass, Inspector. There isn't even a crack anywhere. Uh, and the windows are still locked. This is crazy. This is impossible. Oh, we know it. Uh, all right. The shot came from inside the room, then. You've gone over all the pictures, the molding, the fireplace? Everything, We've inspect. inspected every inch of floorboard, too, and we haven't found a thing. It's crazy. It's impossible. You said that. A fine couple of cops you are. Where's the dead guy's family? Upstairs, all right, both of you. Go up there and get him. Yes, yes. Okay. Hello, boys. How's everything? Not so good as you see. Who's that out there? Who's that in there? Blackie. Well, Inspector Faraday. The danger must be over. You've arrived. What are you doing here? I live here. Live here? Sure. I'm Bill Blaine's bodyguard. Well, get over there and guard the body. Say, he looks a little bit dead. He's been dead for 45 minutes. Then I don't suppose he'll recover. Uh, who shot him? One of your men? I not only don't know who shot him, I don't even know how he was shot. Don't know how? Nothing inside this room fired a bullet. And there's not a, a pane of glass broken in any of the windows, which were locked. What? Where were you 45 minutes ago? Well, that's hard to say. I didn't look at my watch. Where have you been? Sorry, pal. That's a secret. Where? As long as you keep your secret, I'll keep you. Come on, Blackie. Oh, Inspector, put away that gun. I will. After I put you where you belong, in jail. Now, you know I didn't kill this guy. I don't say you did, but you're plenty mixed up in this. You live here in this house. You're this guy's bodyguard, and yet you aren't guarding And on top of it all, you disappear when the guy gets killed. And you won't tell me where you were. I can. Well, I'm holding you as a material witness. I won't be very good material. And besides, I know how Blaine was killed. Uh, put away that gun, and I'll show you. I'll hold the gun, and you'll still show me. All right. Okay. Now, uh, do you mind if I open one of the windows? Why? To show you how it was done. Go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. No tricks now. And make it snappy. I don't have all day. I'll, uh, I'll have to climb out on the flagstone walk. That's where the killer stood. Blanky, if this is a... a what are you a... worrying about? You've got a gun on me. Yeah, and I can shoot straight, too. Okay, okay. I'm all set. Now, how is it done? Now, I'm the killer. Yeah? Now, uh, come over here and, and put your arm across the window sill. Okay. But no tricks. I've got my gun right in your face. You wouldn't shoot a pal, would you? A pal, no. Come on, come on. How was it done? Well, like this. The killer stood here. Yeah, wise this... guy. The window wasn't open. It was closed. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Then maybe I'd better close it. Oh! 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 You're breaking my arm. And you're breaking my heart. Oh! Drop that gun, Barry. Oh! Drop it. Oh! Thanks, pal. Blackie, I'll show the book at you for this. Well, make it a good book, will you, Inspector? Because while you're trying to catch up with me, I'd like to catch up on my reading. Yeah? Yeah, I can you. I'll say you can come in. I want to talk to you, Miss Wesley. Well, I want to talk to you, too. What about? About this story in the newspaper. What about it? It says that you're looking for Boston Blackie as a material witness to the murder of William Blaine. So? So... Maybe you'll change your mind when I tell you where Blackie was when Mr. Blaine was killed. Where? With me. That's no alibi in my book. Where were you? The newspaper says Mr. Blaine was killed at 9.45 last night. At 9.45, I was in Sam Daniels' office, helping Boston Blackie crack a safe. Blackie, 
It's me, Shorty. Come here, will you? Okay, kid. I raided your icebox, Shorty. Hope you don't mind. Ah, oh, boss, you can have anything I got. You know that. Uh, did you get the information I wanted on Blaine's family? Yeah, sure. Here it is, boss. All writ down nice and neat. But, uh, boss, Mary's in jail. What? Yeah. Faraday checked Daniels when she said that you and her robbed a safe last night at 945. Daniels said it wasn't robbed. So Faraday's holding Mary. Oh, gee, that's worked fast. Uh, what dope have you got on the Blaine family? Uh, just the usual stuff. Not a bombard of much except that Robert Blaine. He got rich. It's all writ down there. Eh? You read it okay? Well, let's see. Hmm. John worked in a drugstore, a shoe yeah. store, but never for long. I, uh, I've got a lot of dope on this Robert. Yeah, I can see that. Member of the stock exchange on the board of directors of the local Red Cross, president of the Margo Country Club. He does all right. And what about Martha, the sister? Eh, she's just the dame, boss. You know. She worked three different times. Stuck a long time to each job, too. First as a secretary, then for the telephone company, then as a buyer in a department store. Married twice, too. That's right, yeah. Could be that this is going to be very helpful, Shorty. Oh, gee, swell. I'm glad. And now, here's something for you. Chief, boss, these are the checks I forged on Mr. Daniels. That's right. They're yours now. You, you mean he gave them to you? Mary and I took them last night. But Daniels wouldn't tell Faraday that. Well, I've got to go, Shorty. Well, where to, boss? To the Blaine house. That's the first step in getting Mary out of jail and putting a murderer in. <laughs> surprised if you killed Uncle Bill. <laughs> oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? It'd be very profitable for two of us if one of us did. Do you care which one? As long as I'm not the one. Maybe you should have thought about that, too. You uh, think the police will find out who killed Uncle Bill? They have to find out first. How? Are you afraid they will? We get no money until they do. Don't look at me. <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm going to bed. Good pleasant dreams. Don't be so generous. I should be rich enough to be very generous. Matter if I can help it, sister, dear. What dumb jerk turned out the lights? This dumb jerk. Who's there? The dumb jerk who turned out the lights. Wait, I'll turn them on again. Joe. Mm-hmm. What are you doing in my room? Looking for a clue. To what? Your uncle's murder. Well, you won't find it here. No, not now, because I already have. Look, I didn't do it. I didn't say you did. What have you found in here? Evidence. Of what? That uh, you're somewhat of a magician. Well, what if I am? It's a hobby of mine. I'm just an amateur. Well, your amateur standing as a magician may solve a semi-professional murder. How? Mind if I use your phone? I'll go right ahead. Thanks. Who are you calling? The police. Well, there are three policemen downstairs. But I want the top man. Faraday speaking. Inspector, this is Blackie. Blackie, you're going to... Look, Inspector, tell your cops to come home. All is forgiven. Because I've not only found out how Blaine was killed, I know who killed him. I don't fall for the same gag twice, Blackie. You turn yourself over to the nearest policeman, or Mary stays in jail for the rest of her life. In that case, I guess I'll just go downstairs. Where are you? In Blaine's house. And your cops downstairs have got me right where I want them. Come on up, Inspector. The party's on me. All right, Blackie. Here we all are in Blaine's bedroom. Now, no tricks. I'm not the only one with a gun. Keep him covered, Rollins. Do that, Rollins. I'll keep you busy. If you have anything to say before I run you in, say it now, Blackie. Will you listen? For some dumb reason or other, I always do. But no tricks. I'm oh, sorry, Inspector, but this time there has to be a trick. Uh, a magic trick. Huh? Uh, see this little gadget I have here in my hand? Yeah, what is it? A pane of what seems to be ordinary plate glass in a wooden frame. The glass is solid, isn't it? Sure it is. So what? So I place this metal ball on top of the glass, thus. Yeah. Now, you don't think it's possible for the metal ball to fall through the glass and hit the top of the table below, do you? Of course not. You are so wrong, Inspector. Watch. Hey, it 
did go right through the glass. Without breaking it, Inspector. Of uh, course, if you wish to inspect. But uh, how did you do it? I pressed on the side of the wooden frame, and the glass moved to one side, far enough for the metal ball to drop through. Look at this. Yeah, I saw it. Give the windows in this room another going over, and you'll find a pane of glass constructed to do exactly the same thing. Rollins, Smith, start looking. Right. So that's how it was done. A trick pane of glass, huh? You catch on quick, Faraday. Where'd you get that trick? In John Blaine's room? Yes, in my room, but that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't it? I don't know about that. If we find well, a... It is pit... like you're a pane of glass in the window that's lying. Just like the glass in that gadget, too. Oh, so it doesn't mean anything, huh? All right, I admit that magic stick belongs to me. It was in my room, but that's no proof I killed Uncle Bill. Well, uh, maybe this is. Hey, Blackie, where'd you get that gun? John Blaine's room. And if you check, I think you'll find us the gun that killed Uncle Bill. Okay. Come on, you're down to headquarters. But I tell you, no, I didn't... No, 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 no. Wait a minute, Inspector. What for? I've got this case wrapped up in pink and blue ribbon. Better not tie the end yet, Faraday, because John didn't kill his uncle. Look, when you face the evidence, you've got to come then to the... Then con- do an about face, Inspector. There's a little item of the telephone calls. Blaine got a call from the murderer when John and Martha and Robert were all in the house. John didn't make that call. Huh. But I know who did. Well, I know who didn't. No member of the family. Those were outside calls. There's only one phone here. When you jump to conclusions like that, Inspector, try not to land on your head. The one thing that had me baffled about this whole thing was, if one of the family killed the uncle, how was that telephone made to ring while all the family were in the house? Or an accomplice outside. Yes, I thought of that and ruled it out as too risky. Some information about John, Robert, and Martha Blaine that Shorty got for me gave me the right answer. Yeah? Martha Blaine is your killer. Oh, why, Mr. Jones, you're so dashing. Oh, is this going to be another fairy story? You worked for the telephone company for several years, didn't you, Mother? So what? When telephone linemen repair out-of-order phones, they dial a certain number that causes the telephone to ring. Well, that's general knowledge. Everyone in this room knows that. But the number the line men dial is a closely guarded secret. You are the only one in this room who could possibly know that number. That, that's... Uh, I... Anytime you wished, you could just go to one of the several extension phones in this house, dial the callback number, and cause every phone in the house to ring. Okay, lady, you're going down to headquarters. What, uh, Grab her, boys. Come on, lady. No, come no, on. you don't. Come You'll on. never get me. I got her, Inspector. Hold on. Go with me. Okay, right. okay. Right. Take her out. Don't get excited. Are you happy now, Inspector? Yeah. But you're not going to be. You're not completely out of this. Did you tell me where you were at the time of the murder? Cracking Sam Daniels safe? That's not so. Because I checked on that, and Daniels said his safe hadn't been touched. Then why did you put Mary in jail? She told me she helped you crack the safe. I had to hold her. Faraday, holding Mary is my exclusive privilege. Let's go get her out. Hiya, Jailbird. Blackie. Oh, Blackie, are you all right? <laughs> sure. And now I'm letting you out. Where did you get those keys? From Faraday. But, but how? <laughs> Don't worry, honey. He gave them to me. Honestly? Of course, Ma. Well, of course, of course, old really. Aren't you coming out? No. You're coming in. But why? Come on in. All right. Here I am. Are you by any chance locking us in? I am. Give me the key. Well, why? Give them to me. Okay. Here you are. Oh, this is much better. Now I know we can't get into trouble. For a
Just what kind of a private detective are you, Whalen? Good, Brewster. The best, or you wouldn't have hired me. I wonder about that. Watch the tone of voice, Brewster. I don't like it. All right, all right. I'm sorry, Whalen. But I want action. You're getting it. But it's too slow. I hired you two months ago to get something on Lester Allen. And what have you done? Nothing. Yet. Nothing. How am I going to win the nomination against a man with a record like Allen? Uh... He's pure, Mr. Brewster, sure, but he's not hermetically sealed. I know that. He was involved in something illegal once, but he's covered it up. I hired you to uncover it. Now, why haven't you? Look, Brewster, when you hired me, you hired a detective, not a P-38. I worked slowly, but I get there just the same. You made any progress at all? <laughs> You'd be surprised. Surprise me, then. Boston Blackie knows what Alan did wrong a few years back. But I told you, Boston Blackie knew about Alan's illegal jaunt. Blackie was the one who caught him at it, but he won't talk. Don't worry, Mr. Brewster. I found somebody else who knows about Alan and will talk. Who? A dame who came into my office this morning. What does she know about Alan? Everything Boston Blackie knows. What makes you think so? She's uh, Mrs. Boston Blackie. <laughs> And now meet Richard Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. I'm awfully glad you had a moment to see me, Mr. Allen. Blackie's told me so much about you. Oh, you're Mrs. Boston Blackie. Well, this is certainly a surprise when we married. Three weeks ago in Springfield, Ohio. Uh-huh. Oh, Mr. Alan Blackie speaks of you so often. <laughs> he doesn't tell the whole truth, I hope. <laughs> oh, but he does. Even about that uh, scandal you were mixed up in a few years ago. Uh, you uh, mention that for any particular reason? Oh, yes. I don't think I understand. <laughs> you will. You don't really have to continue in the campaign, do you? I'm beginning to understand now. You'd have a difficult time being elected to any office if you were exposed, wouldn't you? Now, look here. I was innocently involved in that scandal. That's why Blackie pledged himself never to mention it to anyone. Oh, but he mentioned it to me, his wife. And I'm not bound by any foolish pledge to keep it secret. Now, look, are you trying I'm to... I'm more than trying, Mr. Allen. I'm doing it. I want you to drop out of the campaign. What if I don't? Is there any other choice? Maybe. Money? <laughs> Maybe. How much? You name it. Five hundred. You did say ten thousand, didn't you? Ten thousand? Oh, that's better. But how do I know once I pay you... You'll what... just have to trust me. And of course, you can be trusted. I don't like sarcasm, Mr. Allen. <laughs> Just money. Uh-huh. How do you want it? In cash and in small bills. You did say you were Mrs. Boston Blackie, didn't you? Well, of course I'm Mrs. Boston Blackie. Why? Why? Because you sound to me more like Mrs. Boston Black Mail. <laughs> eating. I was just thinking, Blackie. What? That you don't like your own cooking? Nope. I was just thinking, are you ever going to get married? Maybe, if I ever get to thinking, too. Some people do marry, you know. Some people jump out of windows, too. Oh. I'll answer it. But it's probably your building superintendent telling you he's finished moving your stuff into the new apartment. I hope so. Hello. Blackie, this is Lester Allen. Not Lester J. Allen. <laughs> How are you, Les? Where have you been hiding? Now, don't give me that old pal stuff, Blackie. Hey, what's the matter? You know very well what's the matter. I thought you realized I was innocently involved in that highway property scandal and that what you knew was to stay strictly between the two of us. Well, that's a fine reason to be sore. Well, I wouldn't be if you'd kept your word. Your wife is here with me now. My wife? You married her in Springfield, Ohio, three weeks ago. My wife is in your office? Uh, wait a minute, Mary. Now, wait, will you? Look. 
Blackie, what was the idea? Just a minute, Les. Mary, wait. I will not wait. I'm getting my hat and coat. Blackie, are you still there? Now, listen, Les, I can't talk to you right now. Uh, keep my wife there. Huh? Don't let her leave. I'll see you in a minute. Mary. No wonder you didn't want to talk about getting married someday. You're already married. Now, look, Mary. I'm going to look all right. And I'm going to keep looking until I get where you can't find me. She's still here, Les? In my den, Blackie. And you have a lot of explaining to do. She knows about that construction scam. Oh, does she? Well, she implied as much. You have a guilty conscience, that's all. I put in a call to Springfield. It'll come here, if you don't mind. Hey, where is your den? Uh, this way. I didn't tell her you were coming. I managed to slip away while she was waiting for the money and phones. Good. Come on in. Lucky. But, darling, what are you doing here? You said you weren't coming. I couldn't stay away from you another moment, sugar. <laughs> oh, you sweet thing. <laughs> You're the most wonderful husband in the world. No, I wouldn't say... Huh? Blackie. Then she is your wife. Well, of course I'm his wife, Mr. Allen. Oh, yeah, uh, tell the bewildered man all about it, darling. You mean how we met at the Martin Inn in New Hampshire last August? Mm-hmm, if you wish. Blackie, you did spend last August at the Mountain Inn? Of course I did. Darling, why aren't you wearing your lovely brown suit? The one with the thin white stripe. You look so nice in that. Oh, you don't love me just for my clothes, do you, darling? Well, Blackie, this convinces me. I was with you when you bought that suit. I knew I Must should we never... stay here any longer, darling? Let's go to Martin's for dinner. That's your favorite place. No, dear, let's go I over... i enough from both of you. This girl is your wife, Blackie, or she wouldn't know so much about you. Let's go, darling. Uh, you go ahead. I'll meet you later. All right. I have an appointment at the hairdressers anyway. I'll meet you afterwards. Bye, darling. I think you'd better leave too, Blackie. I've had enough of you. Les, and your... I've never seen that girl before in my life. Huh? Th then how did she know enough about me and that that construction scandal to blackmail me? That girl blackmailed you? Ten thousand dollars. Well, look, Les. As soon as this call from Springfield comes through and straightens you out about the girl, I'll straighten out this blackmail business myself. It'll take a lot to convince me that girl's not your wife. She knows too much about you. She's probably been studying for this act for months. Well, oh, that's my call. Hello? Hello, this is the marriage bureau in Springfield, Ohio. Oh, yes, I called you. Uh, I'd like to know if you have any record of a Boston blackie being married in your town three weeks ago. Just a moment. Look, Les, uh, this will straighten you out about the girl. Now, don't worry. Then what about my 10000 You shouldn't have paid it until you got in touch with me. That girl was so convincing. Yeah, I can believe Hello? that. Hello? Uh, yes? You want to know of a man by the name of Boston Blackie got married here? You have no record of any such marriage? Who wants to know? I do. I'm Boston Blackie. What's the matter with you, young man? What have you got besides a wife, a case of amnesia? Boston Blackie... Was married in your town? Sure he was, to Joan Blake, just three weeks ago. Well, look, the must be... look. If this is your idea of a joke, I don't like it. I don't have time to waste. Goodbye. Hello? 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 Well? A man by the name of Boston Blackie was married to Joan Blake in Springfield, all right. Blackie, why are you doing this to me? I trusted you. Don't you understand, Les? This whole thing is faked. Nobody knows anything about you except me. And I haven't talked, and I'm not married to that girl. I'd like to think you wouldn't like me, but who would, and why? I don't know, but I'll find out. I can find out where my uh, wife is living. And she told me when she first came in that she was living at the Walton House. Until you could find a larger apartment. The Walton House, huh? Yeah. I'll go down there and see her. Yeah, and oh, by the way, a young lady seemed interested in going to see Mrs. Boston Blackie, too. Phoned here just after I spoke to you on the phone. Her uh, name was uh, uh, Mary Westwood. Mary called here? Yeah. I gave her the Waltham House address. Did I do anything wrong? You're batting 100% today, Les. So far, you haven't done anything right. Hey, hey, is this the Waltham House or the morgue? I'm right with you, sir. Oh, now I feel better. I'm getting lonesome out here. Yes, sir. Is there a Mrs. Boston Blackie registered here? Oh, yes, in room 1107. Thanks. Oh, oh, just a minute, sir. I made a mistake. Mrs. Boston Blackie is not in room 1107. Where is she? She moved to room 1109 this morning. Well, I'm going up to see her now. All an ordinary woman does is change her mind. My wife has to change her room, too. I 
I'd like to speak to... Well, Inspector Faraday, I would not like to speak to you. All right, Blakey. I thought you'd have better sense than to come back. Get in here. Sure, sure, sure. And stop waving that gun in my face. Look, Faraday, uh, be as stupid as you want to on your own time, but not on mine. I came here to talk... Wow. I don't act surprised, Blanky. She's not sleeping. She's been shot. She's dead. And you killed her. I killed her. I only saw her once in my life. So, it was love at first sight. You married her. I have this certificate to prove it. Listen. Bride Joan Blake. Groom Boston Blackie. Married Springfield, Ohio. Now, try to talk your way out of that. Faraday, don't be a dope, will you? Why would I kill this girl, this, this Joan Blake? First of all, for money. She had $10,000. Here's a note she was writing, sending it to somebody. Who? It doesn't say who. And there isn't even car fare in this room. And look at this, a handkerchief. I don't use ladies' handkerchiefs. No, but Mary Wesley does. Look, her name's on this one. Uh-oh. And maybe you didn't kill her, Blackie. Maybe Mary Wesley did. The handkerchief was in the corner of that sofa by the window. Come on, Blackie. All right, Inspector. And mind if I smoke on the way? Smoke, smoke, who cares? Join me? No, thanks. Hurry up, let's go. Oh, where'll I get a light, will you? Blackie, if this is one of your smart tricks, I'll... Since when is lighting a cigarette a smart trick, Inspector? Even you can do it. <laughs> Good night. Say, I wonder what's in this cigarette. Tobacco, wise guy. Something has been added that should have been subtracted. <coughs> uh, where will I have a look? Blackie, so help me, you can waste more time. Where will I put it out? Yeah. Tastes as if it was soaked in pickle juice. Let's see what's in it. There's nothing in it but tobacco. Come on. Look, I have a cigarette split open now. I told you there was something in it besides tobacco. I don't see it. We'll take a closer look. See those white specks? What white specks? Where? There. Oh, Blackie, my eyes. My eyes. <coughs> Let go of my eyes. Drop that gun, Faraday. Drop it. Blackie, sir, help me out. Thanks. Thanks very much, Faraday. And leave your gun on the floor. Mine's in my hand. Blackie, someday you'll be sorry for this. Maybe. But right now, I'm awful glad. So long, Inspector. <coughs> Now back to Boston Blackie. Lester Allen is running for political office against a rival with a doubtful record. Allen at one time was innocently involved in a property scandal, which is something only Blackie knows. But when a woman who called herself Mrs. Boston Blackie came to Allen and threatened to expose him, Allen paid her $10,000 to keep her quiet. When Blackie went to see the girl posing as his wife, she was dead. Mm-hmm. Inspector Faraday found not only evidence proving the dead girl was Blackie's wife, but discovered Mary Wesley's handkerchief near the body. As usual, Blackie escaped from Faraday, and as we return to our story, is paying a midnight call to Mary Wesley's apartment. Hey, Mary, open up! Who is this? Blackie! Blackie, I told you I never wanted to see you again. Now, go away. Mary, open the door, please. I said I wanted no part of you. There won't be much of me left if you don't open the door. All right. Now, what do you want? In. Oh, no. The chain stays on the door. Look, Faraday's scouring the town for me. Let me in. No. Mr. Boston Blackie. Why the mister? Because there was a missus. You mean there was. Oh, I suppose you got a divorce. Not even I can divorce a dead wife. Yes. And you might as well go to Faraday's office and sign a confession, Mary. He found your handkerchief near the body. Oh, no, I... What were you doing there? Well, I, uh, I... I wanted to see for myself what kind of a fool would be fool enough to marry you. I'm not married to that girl or anybody. Oh, Blackie, she showed me proof. Give me 24 hours and I could uh, prove to you that, that we were married in 1863. Blackie... You, you, you're sure you're not married to that girl? I'm not and never was. But Blackie, are you telling me the truth? Well, what do you want me to do to prove it? To chew on this door chain? <laughs> All right, I'm sorry, darling. I'll unhook you. <laughs> never mind. All I wanted you to know is that, that you left your handkerchief in that girl's room. Oh, golly. What am I going to do? You're going to stay here. Faraday doesn't know that you've moved to this new apartment. I'm going over to see Les Allen. I think he can tell me more, or I don't know less. Well, 
you must want something important, Blackie, to barge in on me in the middle of the night. I found the late Mrs. Boston Blackie, Les. Late Mrs. Boston Blackie? Someone got to her before I did and killed her. Who? I thought maybe you'd have some idea. I? Why? The $10,000 you paid her was missing. Look, I'll admit $10,000 is a lot of money to me, Blackie, but I wouldn't kill for it. You wouldn't like to have to add to that 10000 What do you mean? You want to sap, Alan? You paid that girl money to keep her mouth shut. But it didn't buy what you thought she knew about you. I was contemplating what to do about that. I have a mild suspicion you contemplated with a bang. I didn't shoot the girl. How did you know she was shot? Uh, well, I... Didn't you say so? I merely said she was killed. I didn't say how. Well, I took it for granted. It just so happens that she was shot. Blackie, I didn't kill her. I, I'll admit I was worried about how to keep her from blackmailing me again, but I thought I'd wait until she tried it. Then you admit you thought she would. No, no, I, I made a bargain with her. I trusted her to keep it. Failing mine, I guess, trusting people. The loss of money could change you. Blackie, listen, don't drag me into this. I can't afford a scandal right now. This election means a lot to me. If you want to stay out of this, you'll have to help me. Help you? How? What do you know about this girl? Who could have sent her? Well, Leonard Brewster might have. Oh, that's ridiculous. What would Leonard Brewster, the political lion, want with blackmail money? He could buy and sell you 50 times. Brewster is a political lion, all right, but he could have sent that girl to me trying to force me out of the race. Well, I'd better go see Brewster at his house. And if anybody calls while I'm there, they'll find the lion is busy. <laughs> What do you want? If you're Leonard Brewster, I want you. I'm Brewster. Who are you? Boston Blackie. And of course, you'll invite me in. Thanks. Look here, I won't stand for being disturbed this time of the morning. Then I'll make it brief. Did you know a girl posing as Mrs. Boston Blackie? What's it to you? She was murdered yesterday. Murdered? And I happen to know you sent her to Lester Allen trying to force him out of the campaign. What if I did? The last I saw her was in her hotel room Tuesday. She was very cordial. We sat on the sofa by the window and talked over my business proposition. She accepted, of course. No, she didn't. She suddenly turned cold as ice. She said she'd do the job for $10,000 or else. Or else what? Or else she'd tell Lester Allen that I sent her to him. And that's all Allen would need for me to force me out of the campaign. So you paid? I did not. That was blackmail. I got up and left. That's the last I saw. How did you happen to go to her in the first place? Well, Jim Whalen, a private detective, set me up to her. She said she was your wife. I sure would have liked to talk to her, even on the telephone, before she was murdered. Too bad I didn't have time to give my wife a ring. Walton House, good morning. What's good about it, chum? It's 4 a.m. Ah, yes, sir. This is Inspector Faraday of the police. I want to ask you something. Oh, yes, Inspector. Uh, Mrs. Boston Blackie checked in to one room on Tuesday in your hotel and later changed her room. Why? Well, it, it's so small, sir. All we can get in it is a bed, bureau, and chair. Oh, I see. Everybody who has that room asks for a bigger one. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, how long was she in the small room? Well, oh, just Tuesday. We moved it to the room she was killed in Wednesday morning. Uh, there's no sofa in the room she was in on Tuesday, huh? Well, the room isn't much bigger than the sofa, sir. Was there a sofa in the room where she was killed? Uh, oh, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, that solves this case. Yes? How? Uh, what you said about the sofa, chum. Sofas are made to lie on, not about. Okay, Blanky, wake up. Get out of that bed of yours. It's the middle of the afternoon. Uh, come on, come on, snap out of it. This is your old pal, Faraday. Oh, oh well, Inspector Faraday. Have you run my bath water yet? I'll run you ragged first. Now, is that a nice way to talk on such a beautiful afternoon? Am I ashamed of you? Yes, I know. My sleep is showing. I know who murdered your wife, Blanky. If you didn't kill her, Mary Wesley did. You said that yesterday. Mary is in her apartment. Get her if you like. I've been to her apartment. Mary doesn't live there anymore. All right, Faraday. I've let you make a dope out of yourself long enough. 
Wait till I get dressed and I'll take you to your killer. I've got my killer. You or Mary. The dead girl was your wife. She was probably breaking up your romance with Mary. That's reason enough for either of you to kill her. It's a good reason, all right, Faraday. Only it's a wrong one. I suppose Mary Wesley didn't even go to see her. That, that that handkerchief of hers just flew into the murder room. No. Mary went to see her. Is this the beginning of a confession? Somebody else went to her hotel room, too. Yeah, you. Yes, but she, um, uh, shall I say, uh, checked out before I got there. Who else came up to see her? Her killer. Look, quit stalling. Get dressed. Give me 30 minutes, Faraday. To get dressed? To get dressed, pay a call and hand you your killer. <laughs> Sorry to bother you again after this morning, Mr. Brewster. Oh, that's perfectly all right, Blackie. You found out more about that girl who was killed? No, uh, nobody seems to know anything about her. That's why I've come back to you. Oh. I thought perhaps if you retold me the story of how you went to see her and what happened, I might get some clue as to her real identity. I see. Sort of character reference, you might say. The character is the word, all right. Uh, could you tell me the story just as you told it to me when I called before? Of course. I went up to her room at the Waltham house to talk about her going to see Lester Allen. Uh, what day was this? Uh, Tuesday in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Go on. Well, as I told you, she was very friendly. She made me a drink. We sat on the sofa. Uh, the sofa was where? Why, uh, by the window. Oh, that's right. Uh, you talked about the view? Yes. Then we talked business. When I discovered her business was blackmail, I got up and left. And that was the last I saw of her. You never saw her after Tuesday? Definitely not. Leaving so soon? No, I'm not leaving. I just want someone else to join us. Come on in, Faraday. All right, Brewster, don't move. What is the reason for all this? You heard this little Tuesday afternoon story, Faraday, about the sofa? Every word. I'm arresting you, Brewster, for the murder of Mrs. Boston Blackie. How can you say I killed anyone? I don't have to say it, Brewster. You said it yourself when you said you sat on a sofa in the murder room on Tuesday. Well, what does that prove? The room the murdered woman was in on Tuesday had no sofa in it, which proved that you lied. You didn't see her on Tuesday. You went to her room on Wednesday when she was in the room with the sofa and killed her. Really? For what reason? I have your reason, Brewster. On Wednesday, when you saw the girl, you had already been to see Alan. And instead of forcing him to withdraw from the campaign, which is what you paid her to do... She merely blackmailed him, which didn't serve your purpose. Is that so? Yes, that's so. When you got sore, she threatened to blackmail you, too. And with your record, she had plenty to blackmail you for. So, like the nice little boy that you are, you killed her. Come on, Brewster. I'm taking you down to headquarters. Hey, Brewster, I just had a thought. Isn't it ironic that a sofa is going to send you to the chair? Blackie. Does it matter, Mary? Mm-mm. You're voting tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I understand Leonard Brewster withdrew from the race. Yes. <laughs> he withdrew to the seclusion of one of Faraday's special cells with Jim Whalen, that detective of his. Well put. Faraday found Whalen in St. Louis with Alan's $10,000. Oh. Um, Mrs. Boston Blackie wasn't married at all, was she? Mrs. Boston Blackie was married to Jim Whalen. Well, Faraday figured that out, and Whale ad- admitted he was married under the name of Boston Blackie. Well, why did he run away with the money the girl got from Mr. Allen? She double-crossed him when she blackmailed Allen. So he double-crossed her by taking the money and scramming. <laughs> and then the girl had to turn around and try to blackmail Brewster to make up for the money her lovely husband had taken from her. Lovely people. Lovely night. And look at that lovely sign over there. It says, get married in five minutes, five dollars. <clears throat> I uh, think we'd better keep moving. What's the matter? Haven't you got $5? No, the smallest I have is 50 Oh, but I'm sure the minister would be willing to make the change. I don't doubt that the minister is willing to make the change, Mary, but I don't think I am.
Bring him right up, will you? Sure will. Oh, Tom. Tom, quick, come in. Holy mackerel. No, 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 jump, 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 please. Well, see, Miss Wesley, grab her quick. I'm coming. Get away from that. Get away from that. Let go of me. Let go of me. Let me go. Much longer. Now meet Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. Oh, Blackie, I'm glad you're here. I couldn't do a thing with this. That's all right, Mary. Maybe I can do something. I was worth it. Hello, Shorty. Anything I can do? Hey, be a nice boy, Shorty. Nice and quiet. Oh, sure, boy. Mary, what's this girl's name? I don't know. She won't tell me. Oh, look, Miss, uh, whatever your name is. Oh, please, please, I want to die. Can't you let me alone? Look, nothing can be as bad as all that. Please let me go. When you're all right, we'll let you go. I'm all right now. Jump out the window again? Oh, no. Please, I want to die. I have to die. Won't you tell us your name? No. Look in a purse, Mary, and see if you can find a name and address. All right. You don't understand either one of you. We understand perfectly. That's why we want to help you. No one can help me. My, it's a beautiful purse. Ooh, no wonder. It's a hazel. What about identification? Oh, well, well, there doesn't seem to be much of anything in it. Uh, this card. Let's see it. There's a name written on it in pencil. Oscar Wolf. Uh, Here. Hey. Hi. Look, uh, Miss, uh, what's your name? Uh, are you Mrs. Oscar Wolf? No. If you must know my name, it's Larson. Mrs. Janice Larson. Hey, boss, boy. Just a minute, Shorty. Look, Mrs. Larson, what's your connection with Oscar Wolf? He's the reason that I... that I... <laughs> In words, then, he's making trouble for you. That guy Wolf makes trouble for everybody, boss. You know him, Shorty? That's what I've been trying to tell you. Please let me go, will you? Uh, not yet. Uh, try to keep it quiet, will you, Mary? Come Shorty, how do you happen to know Oscar Wolf? Well, I guess I shouldn't have said nothing, Blackie, but me and my pals are going to take care of Wolf our own way. Now, wait a minute, Shorty. You know better than to get in trouble again. Yeah. What me and my pals are figuring out doing to this Wolf ain't no trouble, boss. That's a pleasure. You let me handle Wolf for you. No, no, no. Thanks, boss. Where can I see him, Shorty? Now, look, please, boss, stay away from him, look, will you? Uh, Mrs. Lawson, maybe you'll be able to tell me where I can get in touch with Mr. Wolf. I can't tell you. All right, Shorty. You. Oh, Blackie, do I have to? What's his address? Well, all right. Got an office in a hollow building, number 2121. But that's just the front. Thanks, Shorty. And Mrs. Lawson, cheer up. When I find out what's behind that front, I'll be back. <laughs> Take the phone, take a letter to, uh, Mr. Robert Hyman. Uh, dear Mr. Hyman, how are you? I am fine. Um, I am fine, period, semicolon. <laughs> it's an irregular profession. Now, let's see how it comes back. So you push the text phone needle back. So... Uh, 
I've been buzzing you on the inner office phone for a whole minute. Couldn't you hear me? Was that what the buzzing was, Mr. Wolf? I'm sorry. Listen, we're having a visitor in a few minutes. Yeah? Boston Blackie. Yeah? He phoned from downstairs. He's on his way up. Yeah? Do you have to answer yeah, yeah to everything I say? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Listen, I don't know why Boston Blackie suddenly wants to see me, but I have a good idea. Probably found out what we're up to. Yeah. All right. Maybe Blackie knows nothing, so no rough stuff unless it's necessary. So when you say the word, Mr. Wolf, I'm going to let you decide when and if this Blackie needs your attention. When he comes in, send him right into my office. You sit here at your desk and listen in through the inter-office telephone. Understand? Sure. And don't take time off to play with that dictaphone. No, nah, listen in on you will be just as much fun. All right. If what Blackie talks to me about hits too close to home, you come into my office and get rid of him. Rough stuff, maybe, huh? Only if necessary. Understand? Yeah. That's probably Blackie on the hall now. Wait a minute and then send him into my office. Yeah, Mr. Wolf. Da-dum, da-da-da-dum, dum, Come in. Is that the Wolf's office? Yeah. I'm Boston Blackie. I just phoned and made an appointment with Mr. Wolf. Yeah, go right in. He's waiting for you. Thanks. His door right there. Thank you. Miss Wolf? Come in, come in. I'm Boston Blackie. And to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? It may not be a pleasure, Wolf. You know, you look very familiar to me. I get out and around. I think you mean in and out, Wolf. In and out of jail. I've never been in jail. Not under the name of Oscar Wolf. What do you mean? I came here with the idea that I was going to talk to a semi-legitimate businessman about some clients of his. I didn't know I was going to talk to you. You don't have clients. You have victims. Well, go ahead. Look, Wolf. I don't know what your racket is, but that's only because I haven't bothered to check into it yet. Is this the beginning of a threat? That depends on you. It might only be a warning. But leave certain friends of mine alone, or I'll not only break your racket, but your neck along with it. I don't know what you're talking about. But you know what I mean, don't you? You propose violence to put an end to my business. And to you too, Wolf. Are you suggesting, Blackie, that you'll go so far as to... to kill me? Why not? Nobody miss you except the people your death would make happy. You entertain rather morbid thoughts. I'm the entertaining type. But don't let these friends of mine have any more trouble with you, Wolf. That's all I've got to say. I still don't know what... Yes, Peter? Is I annoying you, Mr. Wolf? Yes, he is. But I think he's leaving. Yes, I guess I am. Goodbye, Blackie. If I were you, I'd keep hoping this is goodbye. Well, Peter, I'm glad you didn't forget to listen in on the inner office phone. did more than that, Mr. Wolf. And not only listen, I took down everything he said on a dictaphone. Won't you ever stop playing with that dictaphone? Of oh, course, it was fun. Now I got something else to listen to besides the dictaphone coming back to me. <laughs> All right, where's the guy who calls himself Jada? Uh, here, Inspector Barty, here. You want to talk to me, huh? Yeah. When you came into this office this morning, you find your boss's body, huh? Yeah. Did you know Oscar Wolf was really Teddy Pascal? It was Mr. Wolf. Hmm. You look dumb enough to believe that. Who's been gunning for him lately? Nobody. Come on, come on. A guy like Wolf has guys waiting for him in every corner. Who could have come in here and let Wolf have it? Oh. A man came in here yesterday and said he would like to kill Mr. Wolf. Know the man's name? Boston Black. Bo- no. No, I don't believe it. This is one time I won't be talked into thinking Blackie killed a guy. I have a dictaphone record that talks back Blackie and Mr. Wolf. You better talk sense. You won't believe me? Listen. Play it, please. Now, listen. Are you suggesting, Blackie, that you'll go so far as to kill me? Why not? Nobody can you except the people your death would make happy. You had a pain with the morbid thoughts. Stop that thing. Good, Victor. That was Blackie talking, all right. And this is one time Blackie's talked himself into a charge of murder.
I don't think Wolf will bother you again, Shorty. Oh, me and the boys are seeing to that, Blackie. In fact, we uh, might have seen to it already. Huh? What does that mean? Oh, nothing, nothing, boy. Shorty, if you're up to anything, no. I'll... I'll get it. Probably the laundry. Uh, see if my fountain pen's in the bedroom, will you, Shorty? I've been missing it. Oh, sure, boy. All right, all right, all right. Now, what do you... Hello, Blackie. Well, Inspector Faraday. I suppose I have to invite you in. I'll come in anyhow. I'm sure of that. I was just thinking about you. Oh, rather, I was thinking about absolutely nothing, and that's the same thing. Don't try any tricks now, Blackie. This time I've got you on a murder app, you'll never be. You're coming with me. Oh, no, not again. Put that gun away. Blackie, come back here. I'll shoot. Then go ahead and shoot. I'm going into the bedroom and lie down. I'm tired and mostly of you. Blackie, so help me open that door. I'll let you have it. Unlock that door, Blackie. I can hardly wait. Who did I kill this time, Inspector? Teddy Pascal. Alias Oscar Wolf. Teddy Pascal, huh? I knew I'd seen that face somewhere before. Oh, then you admit you went to see him. Sure I saw him. What did I do? Uh, forget to pay admission? You threatened to kill him, Blackie. And you did. Did that puff brain sidekick of his hear anything I said to Wolf? He not only heard it, wise guy, he made a recording of it every word. That's why I'm taking you in for the murder of Oscar Wolf. Sorry, Inspector, but I have other plans. The only thing you'll be able to plan from now on is a jailbreak, chum. Because I've got the goods on you this time. Oh, I... All right, Blackie. I gave you the warning to open that door. Blackie. Blackie! Yeah? Oh, what's the idea of scaring me like that? You know I missed on purpose. But next time I won't. And on purpose. Open up. Okay. That's better. Come out with your hands up. Well, I ain't done nothing. Back on it, thank Sure, do you mean to tell me I've been talking to you? Yeah, me. Where's Blackie? Well, a minute ago, he all of a sudden got tired of conversing with you, and I tailed it out the back way. Now back to Boston Blackie. When a woman who later identified herself as Janice Larson tried to commit suicide... She was stopped by Mary Wesley, Boston Blackie's girlfriend. Blackie discovered that a man named Oscar Wolf was the cause of the woman's difficulties. Wolf, it seems, had also been making trouble for Shorty, Blackie's longtime friend. So Blackie saw Wolf, threatened him, and left. Later, Wolf was found dead. And when Inspector Faraday began to investigate, he found that Wolf's assistant had made a recording of the conversation between Wolf and Blackie. Faraday went to Blackie's apartment to make an arrest, but Blackie escaped. It is late the same afternoon, and Blackie is sitting on a park bench with Mary. What are you thinking about, Blackie? <laughs> Not what I ought to be thinking about at a time like this, in a place like this. You'll forgive me, won't you, Mary? Well, uh, all the same, we aren't just going to sit here and count ages, are we? No, no, no. I've been doing some thinking. About what? About what saps we were to fall for that loss in woman's story. On account of it, I, I, I've had to duck Faraday's cops for hours. But, Blackie, it seems so real. If the story she told was real, why isn't the woman real, too? There's no such person as Janice Lawson, the telephone book or city director. Well, then she just gave a false name under the circumstances. I don't blame her. She's tied up with Wolf's death. In fact, I have two theories about Wolf's murder. Two? Shorty and his underworld pals were considering some kind of action against Wolf. Oh, you don't think Shorty and his friends might have killed him? Well, I hope I'm wrong. But until I find Shorty, I have to think so. Yes, but you said you had two theories. My other guess is that Janice Lawson's attempt at suicide was a phony. And the beginning of a plot to frame me for Wolf's murder. Oh, darling, what makes you think so? Isn't it just a little more than coincidence that Oscar Wolf was killed a few hours after I threatened him? Well, yes. And isn't it peculiar that... Wolf's dumb assistant makes a recording of everything I said. But you said he was just like an overgrown kid with a new toy. Well, all I know is Faraday's going to hunt through this town until he finds me if he has to start using a vacuum cleaner. And I have to find Mrs. Larson before he finds me. Blackie, Mrs. Larson had a Hazelton purse. Oh, that certainly helps. Well, of course it does, silly. Hazelton purses are custom made by the B.J. Hazelton Company. I don't think they make more than 40 or 50 a year. Say... If we can describe Mrs. Lawson's purse, the Hazelton Company might tell us where we can get a hold of her. I should think so. Well, come on. Now, let's get down to Hazelton's. You may have the answer there, Oh, Mary. Blackie, you think so? If we can get some information on the bag, this thing may be in the bag. Hello, 
Fourth floor, please. So far, so bad, huh, Blackie? Well, we found out from Hazelton that just two people bought a bag like the one we described, not 20. Yes, but the first woman we went to see wasn't our Mrs. Larson. Then this has got to be. What if it isn't? Well, let's not even think about that. Here we are, apartment 411. Cross your fingers, Mary. This had better be it. They cross the hard they ache. Ring the buzzer. What a wonderful way to spend a beautiful Wednesday evening. Yes? We'd like to speak to the lady of the house. She isn't in. Hey, don't close the door just yet. We'll come in and wait. She's out of town. She won't be back for a month. Thanks. In that case, we won't wait. Oh, Blackie, what are we going to do? I don't know. Well, come on. Maybe we'd better go back and ask to see a picture of that woman. Say, Mary, did it seem to you that that maid at the door was nervous? Yes, I noticed that. She should be. She is the woman we're looking for. She's Janice Lawson. Blackie, you're right. Of course you are. I wondered why she almost closed the door as soon as she saw us. But I got a good look at her before she did. And I see now how she got her expensive clothes in that Hazelton purse. She borrowed them from the woman who lives in that apartment. And she picked your building and your floor to stage a suicide. She was hired by someone planning to kill Wolf. The whole thing is a frame. But then Shorty didn't kill Mr. Wolf. Shorty may still be mixed up in this some way. Hey, let's go back and talk to that maid. Oh, no. No, no. I'm leaving her alone until tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? Thursday? Thursday, my sweet. That's maid night out. Hi, Blackie. Get in the car, Mary. Too bad you didn't get back sooner. I was just listening to the police on the radio. Guess what? After two days, they're still looking for me. I'm so surprised. Move over. Convenient instruments, auto radios. Oh, the maid is in that drugstore, and she's doing just what you thought, Blackie. She's telephoning. She knows that we've been following her. Close the door. She may come out in a minute and drive off. Okay. I got close enough to the telephone booth to hear part of what she was saying. She's going out to meet a friend, and she has told them that you were following her. Well, this is working out better than I thought. Oh, Blackie, no, it isn't. They apparently told her to let you follow her. I'll set a trap for you. Perfect. I'll ride right into it. Oh, no, Blackie, no, you can't. No, I'm pretty sure I can. Don't you see, Mary, if that maid is leading me into a trap, she also is leading me to Oscar Wolfe's killer. And also to an early grave. Maybe, but cemeteries are so pretty this time of year. Oh, Blackie, they'll be waiting for you. You don't know when or where. And now that they know you suspect them, there's no telling what they'll do to you. Look, Mary, I- I'm glad you're worried about me. I-, I wouldn't like it any other way. But unless I follow this girl, I'll have Faraday following me the rest of my life. Now, that's a repulsive thought. Well, if you must trail this girl, then call the inspector and have him go with you. Mary, if I called Faraday, I'd have to go with him. But you're right about the danger. Honey, I think I'd better solo from here on. But Blackie, please, please, will you get Faraday? Why do you think I left my own car at home and rented this cream-colored jalopy? I don't want Faraday near me. Please don't do this, darling. Honey, I have to. Now be a good girl and go home. I'll call you as soon as I have this thing cleared up. Oh, Blackie, you're, you're such a fool. Go ahead, Mary. Please a fool then, huh? Out. I'll say I'm getting out. Oh, oh, my goodness. My, my purse, I dropped it. Oh, you dropped your purse? Wait a minute, I'll come around and pick it up I for you. I can pick up my own purse, thank you. Well, better do it quickly, then. Our girlfriend, the maid, is coming out of the drugstore. Blackie, please, will you change your mind and, and call Faraday? Not a chance. I won't call him, and he has no way of finding me. No? If I were you, Blackie, I wouldn't be quite so sure. <laughs> Brother, another red light. Give me a lift, bud. Sorry, I'm a... Don't yell for no cops that this gun will go off in your middle. Well, you came along sooner than I thought you would. You got to go, light. Get going. Sure. Okay, where to? Just keep following that car. With pleasure. And with me. Crossroads. I got a gun on you, see? I'd rather watch the road than the rod. Jokes. Glad you told me. And it's a cop car in back of it. He can't warn us, but don't give him no signals when he passes. Signals? You mean like dropping my handkerchief? Hey, step on a break that cop and cut the door. How unfortunate. Hey, what is this? That we have company. Okay, Blackie. Don't try any tricks. 
I got a gun on you. Inspector Faraday. Why, everybody has a gun on me, even my little playmate here. Grab him on the other side, Monahan. Got him. Let you go with me. I got a permit. Sure, sure. Come on, Blanky. You and your partner are going down to headquarters. Not till I finish what I started. You were finished when you killed Oscar Wolf. I didn't kill Wolf, and thanks to you, my one clue to Wolf's real killer got away. Oh, Starling. Come on. Look, Faraday. Give me 60 seconds alone in this car with my pal here, and I'll find out who Wolf's killer really is. And have you drive away? Nothing doing. All right, here. Here are the keys to this car. Ignition and everything. Oh, I don't know why I listen to you, Blanky. Because if you don't, you won't know anything. Let me out of here. Oh, no, pal. <laughs> oh, no. You and I are going to sit here and play patty cake. Uh, Faraday, you and Monahan take a little walk, will you? What are you going to do? Give my pal here 20 seconds to tell me where I can find Wolf's killer. What if he won't talk? He'll talk, Faraday. Or it'll be a week before he can move his jaw again. <laughs> That mug said Wolf's Killer was at 47 Willow Street, and this is 47 Willow Street. All right. Let's open the door. How did you do that? It was extremely difficult. I turned the knob. Wait a minute. The adhesive tape is coming off my knuckles. <laughs> my pal's jaw was a little hard. Look, if that door was unlocked, we're not on the trail of any killer. A killer doesn't hide out in an unlocked house. He may have been expecting someone, you know. You? Yes. He expected me to be following a girl named Janice Lawson. Who is she? The girl I was following. And not for the reason you think. She probably screamed when she heard the siren on your car. Janice! Shh, shh. What did I tell you? The voice came from that room there. Let's go. Not so fast. Janice! Unless he thinks it's Janice, he may duck out the back way. Come on. Up to the door, quick. Who's there? It's Janice! That's the very end. Okay, Faraday, let's go. All right, don't move. Hey, what is this? Hey, Faraday, look who's here. It's Jeter, Oscar Wolf's secretary. Oh. Hey, Inspector Faraday. Well, aren't you going to say hello to me? Or did you expect me to arrive with less official company? What's this guy got to do with killing Wolf? Check on Wolf and you'll find he was the boss of a very high-paying racket. I've already checked. He was hijacking drugstore supplies and selling them to anybody who'd take a chance. And this guy, Jeter, wanted to boss the racket himself. He's too dumb for that. I wouldn't hurt Mr. Wolf. It was nice to him. Don't start putting on that act again, Jeter. No dope could have planned to frame me into Wolf's killing as well as you did. First, you sent that Lawson girl up to Mary's apartment house to pretend suicide. Then to tell me a phony story so I'd come down to see Wolf. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I do. When I felt for your trick, you made a recording of everything I said to Wolf. It was just about cinched the case against me. When what you had on that record sounded like condemning evidence against me, you shot and killed Wolf. You don't make any sense. It seemed kind of funny to me that you'd have a record of Blackie's voice. It was too pat. I don't say this proves you killed Wolf, but you're coming to headquarters for questioning. Don't yell, Jeter. Just say, come in. Let's get behind the door, Inspector. Quick. Uh, come in. Peter, something awful has happened. Blackie stopped following me and I had a duck in the Who house. are you? What do you mean, who am I? You owe me $500. I've never seen you before in my life. You never saw me before. You hired me to put on an act in that apartment building for you so you could get Boston Blackie into your boss's office. That's it, Bernie. You fool, why didn't you keep your mask shut? All right, lady. You too, Jeter. You're coming down to headquarters. Still only for questioning, Inspector? For answering, Blackie, to a charge of murder. I know when I've found my man. My congratulations, Inspector, for the brilliant way you found him. You seem very happy tonight, Blackie. I'm a little puzzled, though, Mary, and worried. Worried? About uh, Shorty? No, 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 I found Shorty. He and his friends had nothing to do with Wolf's death. And the reason I couldn't find Shorty before is that he was looking for me. Well, then what are you worried about? The way Faraday managed to find me when I was trailing the maid's car. He, he's getting too smart. Oh, um... Oh, oh, Blackie, I'm afraid I have a confession to make. A confession? Uh-huh. You remember when I accidentally dropped my purse? Accidentally? Well, it wasn't accidentally. I dropped it so that I could use my lipstick to write the word Blackie on that nice cream-colored car of yours. You mean I drove down the street with the word Blackie written on the side of my car in lipstick? Sure. Don't you like Blackie in lipstick? Well, <laughs> maybe, Mary. But that's getting it the hard way.
20, 30, and a bullseye of 100. 150 points. Let's see you do better than that with three dots, Monahan. Go ahead, go ahead, toss them. 50, 30, on the line, almost a bullseye, but it's only 75. What's 75, Inspector Faraday? Twice your IQ. Who said you could commit a police headquarters, Blanky? Get out of here. Faraday, you've tried to escort me in here yourself a dozen times. What about it? Get out of here now, I'm warning you. One of these darts will go wild. How many points does it count if I catch it between the teeth? What do you want, Blanky? You, which shows how easy I am to satisfy. Okay. One hand, get lost. We'll go on with our game a little later. I better be alone with this guy. Sort of guy, that Monahan. What do you want, Blackie? Come on, I'm busy. I've come down here to make you a very happy person, Inspector. Well, leave now, and you got what you came for. Now get away from that target. Thirty <clears throat> on the line, Faraday. It's only ten. Ever hear of a guy named Bellows? No. <clears throat> ah, fifty. Lucky shot. Sam Bellows, a cripple. I never heard of him. Is that all you came down here for? <clears throat> Seventy-five. Ah, that's better. That's awful. I suppose you can do better. Then you? The answer is yes, no matter what you might be referring to. Give me the dot. A three is all you get. Then you get moving, you hear? I think you'd better go down and see the Sam Bellows, Inspector. Oh, you do. And that's nice of you. Why? Because he's dead. <coughs> Bull died. That's a hundred. So he's dead. So what? So he probably died of natural causes. That's true enough. There's nothing unnatural about dying when you've been murdered. <coughs> Bullseye. hundred points more. Bellows has been murdered? How do you know that? Come on, come on, talk. Sure, Inspector. You see, I killed him. <coughs> Bullseye. Now back to Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. <laughs> How many more times do I have to tell you, Faraday? I killed the guy. You expect me to fall for a story like that? I'm beginning to see why I have to solve so many cases for you. You won't even believe a confession. All right, Blackie. What's the trick? Faraday, someday you'll be arrested for impersonating a police officer. It's no trick. I tell you, I killed Sam Bellows. Where's the body? Now you're getting smart, Inspector. In an old brownstone house at the corner of West Boulevard and 110th Street. All right. I'll go have a look. You mean we'll go have a look? I'll go have a look. You'll go get lost. You're wanting to go with me as some kind of a gag, and I'm not falling for it. My, how times have changed. You're usually trying to catch me for doing something I didn't do. This time I confess to a murder, and you want to get rid of me. If you don't get out of here, Blanky, I'll arrest you for... I'll think of something. After you found Sam Bellow's body, Inspector, maybe a reason to arrest me will occur to you. Mary... That's probably Charlie Kingston. Let him in, will you? Oh, of course, Dr. Sure. Come on, come on, Happy. Hey, hey. I, I suppose he's happy, but uh, what is he? Down, Happy, down, down, down. Where did you get your sidekick, Charlie? Oh, look. At a kennel or a stable? <laughs> look out, Blackie. Now he's going to jump all over you. Nice boy, nice boy. Down, Look out. <laughs> You can have my right arm just as soon as I'm through. Down, Happy. Down, 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 down. Oh. oh, Charlie, what is that? A dog. If that's a dog, what's a horse? <laughs> I'll admit he's a little large, Blackie, but he's harmless. Harmless? He tried to devour us before we were even introduced. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Mary. He was just making love to you. Happy's a very strange animal. <laughs> Pays no attention to me or to anyone else he knows well. He only likes strangers. Well, introduce us to him quick before we stampede it. Maybe I'd better put it in the kitchen. Good idea. Oh, close the hall door, will you, Blackie? Sure. Oh, come on, come on, happy nice boy. Nice boy. Oh, wait a minute, Charlie. The kitchen door opens out. Will you pull it towards you? Okay. <laughs> I hope you don't mind this happy place in here, Mary. Of course she doesn't, Charlie. She wants a new kitchen anyway. Go on in. Go on. <laughs> What oh. kind of a dog is that, Charlie, besides Big? We'll talk about Happy later. I want to know if you saw Sam Bellow. His house is impossible to break into, and he wouldn't see me in any normal way, so I went to Inspector Faraday and told him I had killed Bellows. What? Blackie. Don't worry, he didn't believe me. He wanted to investigate, but he wouldn't take me with him, so that idea is wasted. Maybe you went too far. Um, can't we talk about something besides murder just before dinner? I'm sorry, Mary. Oh, well, it's, uh... This is just before dinner, isn't it? 
Uh, forgive the delay, Mary. You can have anything your heart desires at any restaurant you name. Oh, wonderful. What are we waiting for? Charlie, isn't the girl in love supposed to lose her appetite? Well, that's the way I always heard it. Mary, how you must hate me. <laughs> Come on, come on, Arlen. Haven't you cut through that door yet? Come on, let's hold you up. This is just an acetylene torch, Inspector Faraday, not a 20-millimeter tank gun. And this is a steel door. Yeah. Now I know why Blanky gave me that cock and bull story about killing this guy, Bellows. Why? There's probably no such guy as Bellows. We rang every bell we could find, and nobody answered. And why did Blanky say he killed him? There's something in this house Blanky wants. And he figured he could steal it right under my nose. Once he got inside. What made him think you'd get him in? He knows I chipped my way barehanded through a brick wall to pin something on him. Maybe nobody answers the door on account of everybody inside is dead. Maybe Blackie wasn't lying. All right, that'll be enough out of you, Roland. Keep busy with that blowtorch. I want to... There she is, Inspector. Now we can walk in. Whew. Door hasn't been open for a while. Well, somebody lives here, all right. There's a light at the end of the hall. Spooky, John. Ah, you've been to too many movies. Hey, look, that's somebody. Hey, you! Sit here. Hey, you! Guys, you're deaf as death. I told you, you saw too many movies. Hey, you! Just keep walking down the hall. Well, he's not dead, anyhow. Maybe he's a zombie. You've been to the movies once or twice yourself, Inspector. Come on, let's go after him. Hey, you! What's the matter? Can't you hear? Hey, wait a minute, you. Grab Marlin. I got him. What are you looking so startled for? We called you. Hey, Inspector, I was right. Guy's dead. Yes, you're right. Hey, you. Can't you talk? Look, look like this. I move my mouth. Talk. 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 Deaf and dumb, Inspector. I got it. Give me a pad and pencil. Sure. I'll write notes to this guy, and he can write back to me. Here. What if he can't write? Then I'll make him your boss. Get lost, will you, Rollins? Have a look around and see what's in the rest of the house. Sure. All right. You and I are going to have a little spelling bee. Can you write? No, oh, never mind. I'll just write out a question and see if you can write the answer. Does Sam Bellows live here? Now take a look at this. Well, I hope a nod means yes. You'll have to write this answer, though. Who are you? Here, now you write. I am the maintenance man, but I know nothing. You want to see Frank Lewis, Mr. Bellows' financial advisor, or... Larry Addington, his nephew. Okay, I can remember that. Don't look so pained. I'll pick the paper up off the floor before I leave. Hey, back. Inspector Faraday! What's the matter, Rollins? Come here, quick! Okay. I don't leave here, you. <laughs> As if you could hear me. What's up, Rollins? There's something that ought to be sort of interesting, Inspector. Well, Blackie's confession was the truth, huh? Sam Bellis, sitting in his big red wheelchair with a knife in his chest. Sort of dead, too. Sure is. And I've got Blanky sort of dead, too. Right. <laughs> well, thanks, Mary, for a wonderful evening. You're sure you don't mind if I leave Happy here in your apartment overnight? Oh, of course not, Charlie. He's a lovely dog. And he seems to like it there in my kitchen. Well, thanks, Mary. And thanks for the wonderful evening, too. And thank you for the wonderful dinner. And thank me for just tagging along, I suppose. Oh. Now, I am not expecting anyone. Well, let's see who you're not expecting. Ah, last, It is my secret lover. Oh. I confess all. Oh, come <laughs> in, come in. Yes? Hello, Miss Presley. Inspector Faraday. Some secret lover. Thank you, him. Yes, yes, come in. He was just leaving. Well, the pleasant part of the evening is over. You're here, Inspector. What do you want? You, Blackie. Mary's got a priority. Thank you, sir. Uh, Faraday, this is Charlie King. How are you? How do you, Inspector? I think we met on the phone several weeks ago. Oh, that's right. So you did. I hope you enjoyed yourself this evening, Blackie. 
Because it's the last fun you're going to have for a long time. Why? Are you resigning from the force? I'm arresting you for murder, Blackie. Now, who did I kill? Sam Bellows. What? I... Blackie, you said you didn't see him. I didn't. Oh, no, of course not. And how'd you know he'd be found dead? Was he? He was. Come on, Blackie. I'll take you down to headquarters. Sorry, they don't be stupid. And put that gun I'll away. I'll put it away when you're tucked away. In jail. Come on. All right, Inspector, you win. But let me get my raincoat, will you, from the kitchen? Oh, no, you don't. But all I want to do Go is... Go into just... the kitchen and duck out the back way. But, huh? Inspector, I promise I'll you... I'll get don't... your raincoat for you. Which is the kitchen door? Blackie, happy as you know. Yes, I'm happy about the whole thing, too. <laughs> uh, don't worry, Charlie. Oh, so everybody's happy, huh? That's fine. Now, which is the kitchen door? That one. Now, don't move, Blackie. I still have a gun on you. Yes, teacher. So long, Faraday. I'm leaving. Get me out from under this face licking pony. What? So you're going to arrest me for murder, huh? Nothing doing. I'm leaving, Faraday. But I've got an idea, though. Bite him. At least that's news. <laughs> And now back to Boston Blackie. For a reason he chose to keep to himself, Charlie Kingston, Blackie's millionaire friend, asked Blackie to do anything in his power to see and talk to a man named Sam Bellows. Unable to break into Bellows' home, Blackie came to Inspector Faraday with a story that he had killed Bellows in his home and should be taken to the scene of the crime. But Faraday suspected Blackie's confession was a trick and went to Bellows' home alone. There he found Bellows, murdered. Faraday then tried to arrest Blackie for murder, but Blackie, as usual, escaped. It is early the next morning. As we return to our story, Blackie and Charlie Kingston, dressed as policemen, are climbing the steps of Sam Bellows' house. Are you sure we'll get by the policeman at the top of the stairs? Look at your clothes. We're policemen, too, remember? Mm-hmm. Won't this police guard recognize you? Come with a visor and my cap pulled down. Good morning, boys. Expect to send you to relieve us? Uh, the relief men are coming up in a few minutes. Uh, Faraday sent up a uh, special detail, okay? Sure, sure. Go on in. Come on, Charlie. All right. Hey, wait. I'll open the door first. Thanks. Uh, who else is here? Only Thompson. He's upstairs. Okay, thanks. Well... That wasn't hard, was it? No, but I'm not used to this sort of thing. You'll live longer if you don't try to get used to it, Charlie. Let's have a look around. What do you expect to find? Something that will lead us to Bella's murder and take me off the spot. Well, let's hope we find it. Say, hey, Charlie, look at this crumpled paper on the floor. Yeah. Seems to be a note of some kind. Well, let's have a look at it. There seems to be two different kinds of handwriting on it. As... As if one person were asking questions and the other answering them. Faraday wrote the questions. I know that scrawl of his anywhere. Who wrote the answers? Someone who calls himself a maintenance man. He says he knows nothing but mentions a financial advisor named Frank Lewis and a nephew, Larry Addington. I see. Faraday obviously met someone here in this house who could neither hear nor talk and had to write everything down. Uh, I suppose his information is useless, sir. Not at all. A nephew and a financial advisor might be a perfect combination for a murder. I think I'll go up and see that advisor as soon as we're through here. Mm-mm. Someone's coming in the front door. Probably the relief gun. Now that special detail you sent in the house now, Inspector Faraday. Oh. Special detail? What are you talking about? Oh, this is fine. Come on, Charlie, out the back door. What if there isn't a back exit? Well, in that case, we'll get up speed, put our heads down, and make one. Yes? Frank Lewis? Yes. I'm Special Police Investigator John Jones. You were Sam Bellows' financial advisor, weren't you? Yes. I've had one visit from the police this morning, and Inspector Faraday. I told him everything I could. Faraday sent me back to ask a few more questions, if you don't mind. Well, I mind because I'm busy, but I suppose there's nothing I can do. What else do you want to know? More about the will. I told Inspector Faraday everything I know... The night before last, Bellows changed his will. 
Formerly, the entire estate was to be left to Larry Addington, his nephew, with the exception of 5000 to Ben Atkins, the deaf and dumb handyman in Bellows' home. Who did the new will benefit? Atkins again for $5,000, but instead of the remainder of the estate, about $100,000 being left to the nephew, Bellows chose to leave it to some charity, a dog and cat hospital. Any reason for doing this? Just so his nephew wouldn't get it. Cigarette? No, thanks. Don't mind if I smoke? Of course not. You say the will was changed the night before last and Larry Addington, the nephew, was cut out. Did Addington know this? I don't see how it was possible. Bellows and his nephew seldom spoke to each other. Then it's possible, isn't it, that Addington killed his uncle thinking he'd get his money? Possibly. He's in constant trouble living above his means. He needs money. Say, you smoke more of a cigarette than I thought. Why do you say that? These cigarettes in this ashtray here. I doubt if they've been puffed more than two or three times. Oh, they were left there by a client of mine who was here just a few minutes ago. Nervous, huh? Very. Look what he does to paper matches. Takes the ends and rips them up the middle. Anything else I can tell you about the Sam Bellows matter? Yes. Where can I get in touch with Larry Addington? Larry lives at the Baker house. Thanks. You think Larry might have killed his uncle, believing he was still mentioned in the will? Yes, I do. And I have an idea that you're a little leery of Larry yourself. You have to stand still, Mr. Addington. Well, hurry up, will you, Martin? I'm trying to hurry, Mr. Addington, but I can't face the coat. You don't stand still. I don't like to stand still. Oh, we're going to be interrupted again. Come in. Tom, I told you not Larry to... Larry Addington in here? I'm Larry Addington. Good. I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, some other time. I'm busy having a fitting. Did my man let you come in here? Please, Mr. Addington, stand still. Uh, where do you intend going in that tweet, Addington? To a racetrack? Uh, your opinion is uncalled for, and so is your presence. Yeah, Mr. Addington, how do you like the way the coat hangs now? Uh, well, I guess so. Why all the new clothes, Addington? Anything wrong with a few new suits? Since my uncle was killed, I'm rich. Are you? Yes, yes, I, uh... <laughs> Want to look the part of a man who's just come into a fortune. Well, look the part if you want to, Addington, but you haven't come into a dime. <laughs> Wait till you read the paper. <laughs> Wait till you read the will. My uncle left his money to me. Uh, Mr. Martin. Yes? Don't just stand there. I don't have all day. Oh, I was interested in this man's remark about your uncle's will. What remark? Well, uh, forgive me, but uh, he said... I said uh, Addington here was completely cut out of his uncle's will. What? That's not true. I saw my uncle's will last week. Well, you should have seen it last night or the night before last, just before he was killed. He changed it? He made a slight amendment, Addington. He cut me off? Without a cent. How do you know? I just talked with Frank Lewis. He was your uncle's financial advisor. Why would he tell you anything? Uh, I have what you might call a slight interest in your uncle's murder. You aren't suggesting that If I... someone had suggested to you that your uncle was going to change his will... You might have killed him before he had had a chance to change it. I didn't know his will was going to be changed. That'll be hard to prove. Uh, well, just try to prove I killed him. You know something, pal? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Charlie, this is Blackie. Yes, Blackie. Mary said you were going to see Bellows' financial advisor and the nephew, Addington. How have things worked out? All right so far. I just left the nephew. Is he a man? I don't know. He thought he was going to get his uncle's money, so he might have killed him. The person we've overlooked is the deaf and dumb handyman Faraday found in the Bellows' house when he discovered the body. How could he be involved? He was left $5,000 in every will Bellows wrote. He might have discovered that Bellows had cut the nephew off and... Killed his employer, thinking maybe suspicion would be all on the angry nephew. Well, I suppose a man of his means would kill for 5000 wouldn't he? Charlie, there have been murders for five cents. I think I'm going to get some more dope on that handyman. Uh, Blackie, you can get back into Bellow's house. Faraday will have his policeman checking everyone who comes within a block of the place. I know it. I've been ducking Faraday so much today, I'm getting stoop-shouldered. <laughs> Is Mary there? No, no, she isn't. I thought I could send her into Bellow's house as a, oh, well, a, say, a newspaper reporter. She could get by Faraday's men with, with dark glasses and a new hairdo. I know where you can reach her. She just left here to take Happy down to the Mayfair Dog Hospital for a general checkup. Oh, thanks, Charlie. I'll go down there and meet her. 
Maybe I even belong with the dogs after the way Faraday's been hounding me. Something I can do for you, sir? Uh, yes. Is there a young lady here with a rather large dog? She brought him in for a checkup, I think. No, there isn't. This is the Mayfair Animal Hospital, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, I guess I got here too soon. Mind if I wait? No, not at all. Um, is there a, a chair or a, a bench around Perhaps here? Perhaps you'd like to wait in my office. Oh, thanks. Oh, this way. I think that chair will be comfortable. Thank you. No, I think I've seen your picture in the paper. Strange what papers will do for news sometimes. Yes, you certainly look familiar. Uh, I'm Seth Peters. Cigarette? No, thanks. Mind if I smoke? None at all. Uh, there isn't by any chance another Mayfair Animal Hospital in town, is there? Not that I know of. Hmm. Mary and Happy must have been delayed on the way down here. Hmm? What did you say? Uh, but nothing. Nothing. Oh. Do you, um, always do that? Huh? Uh, take, do what? The, take those matches and tear them. <laughs> Nervous habit. I try to break it, but I can't. Oh, I see. Would well, you mind pushing the ashtray over this way? Of course not. I'll put this cigarette out. How's your friend, Frank Lewis? Who? Frank Lewis, the financial advisor. I don't know any Frank Lewis. Why do you ask? That cigarette of yours makes me ask. My cigarette? Nothing wrong with it? Why, no. You put it out rather suddenly. Oh, <laughs> I never take more than three or four drags. And you don't know Frank Lewis? Oh, no. Does he have the same habit? No, but you're lying when you say you don't know him. He has a client who does the same thing with matches and cigarettes. You. Well, now, here. Lewis said Sam Bellows left his money to a dog and cat hospital. I think if I looked at Bellows' will, I'd find that it was, uh, this place of yours. I don't know about that. You said you didn't know Frank Lewis. Yet you were up in his office this morning. It's not true. The ashtray in his desk was filled with torn matches and cigarettes barely smoked. You own this place? Yes, I do. That doesn't mean a thing. It means plenty. It means you killed Bellows for his money and then went to Lewis to collect. The fact that he denied you'd been there makes him part of the scheme. Just because I own this place, you think I killed Bellows, huh? It'd be worth your while. Well, I don't own this place. I merely front for the man who does. All right, who's the real owner? Frank Lewis, he's the man you want. Didn't even know Bellows was dead until Lewis called me to his office this morning. Come on, Peters. You're going down to police headquarters. But I tell you, I didn't kill anyone. Lewis did. He forced Bellows to change his will night before last, then killed him. Set that story to music, Peters, because when we get to police headquarters, you're going to sing. Well, I guess that's about all there is to tell, Mary. When Peters got through talking, Faraday had Lewis in jail. That clears up everything, Blackie, except why you wanted to get in to see Bellows in the first place. Because Charlie here asked me to. Oh. I didn't know it was going to get you into such trouble, Blackie. Oh, I don't mind trouble, Charlie. But I do like to know why I'm getting into it. You never did tell me why you wanted me to see Bellows. Well, Bellows was an engineer in one of my plants a few years ago. He disappeared with some important blueprints. For business reasons, I had to find Bellows and recover the prints quietly. I thought it would be best to come to you. Well, we certainly had a quiet time of it, didn't we? <laughs> Hey, let's not forget that Charlie's dog helped solve this case. Yes, I suppose Happy did have a share in this, didn't he? Sure. I think Inspector Faraday should give Happy a medal. Or make him a member of the force. Oh, Blackie, don't be silly. How could Happy be a police dog? He doesn't even begin to look like one. Secret Service. Ooh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs>
on this side. What did you think of the game last night? Didn't see it. That was some game. So what? So nothing, I guess. How about some service? What do have? Coffee, Blake. Right on, on the rack. Hi, Larry. Not so loud. Remember, you don't know me. Relax. Everything's going to be okay. It's easy for you to say. You do what I ask you. Think I'd be nuts enough not to? I'm your pal. Yeah, yeah, but a bunch of guys aren't... Who just came in? Relax, will you, Larry? It's nobody, just a guy. Is he looking at me? Nah. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. It's harmless. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the guy after me looks harmless, too. I tell you, I'm going nuts waiting. Relax, will you? He'll never find you. Maybe he's already found me. I don't know what he looks like. Well, he doesn't know what you look like, so you're even. Why don't you make that call? Yeah, I... I guess I might as well. Where's the phone? Hey, you. Where's the telephone? In the back, on the left. Thanks. Watch the door, will you? Hello? I I want to talk to Boston Black. This is Boston Blackie. Oh, this is Larry Brown. Remember me? Sure, a hundred dollars worth. <laughs> you always worry quick with a joke, Blackie. But you aren't quick with paying your debts. Well, I, I got the whole hundred dollars for you now, Blackie. In an envelope in my name at the Williams Hotel. The whole hundred. What am I supposed to do about it? Well, pick it up any time you want. All right, Larry, we're square. But what's the reason for the sudden payoff? Well, I'm leaving town, Blackie. And uh, uh, now that you mention it, it's the kind of payoff I like. Now meet Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. <laughs> hey, Monahan, if the commissioner calls, tell him I'm on my way to his office now. Who's come out in the sunlight? Gee, I hoped you'd remember me, Inspector. You know what I mean? Okay, Wilson, what do you want? A little information, Inspector. It's funny, in return for the information I gave you about the Johnson mob last year. Sure, day. sure. What is it? I'm in a hurry. Well, it's kind of important, Inspector. I've been, I've been waiting out here a couple hours. You know what I mean? Sure, I know what you mean. What do you want? Well, where can I get in touch with Boston Blackie? Where does he live now? What do you want him for? Personal reasons. Nothing, you know what I mean. Nothing you'd be interested in. Okay, it better not be. Maggie lives at 51 Sunset Parkway. The doorman will give you the apartment number. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the information, Inspector Faraday. I'll do the same for you someday, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Fine thing. I give information to the underworld. All of a sudden, I'm a stool pigeon to a stool pigeon. <laughs> You look slick. Look, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if it's not so wrong, boss. Anything wrong? Oh, no, 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 not, not exactly, boss. Did you go to the bank for me? Oh, sure, Blackie. I, I got to the bank all right, but uh, not exactly soon enough. And by not exactly soon enough, you mean too late. Well, uh, sort of. And by sort of, you mean yes. Shorty, can't I trust you? With as simple a thing as going to the bank for me, you left two hours ago. I went straight to the bank, boss. How straight? Well, straight down Sunset Parkway to River Boulevard and... What do I bump into but Pete Matthews? So you went somewhere with Matthews, huh? Yeah, but that was all right, boy, because Pete said if I walk over the east side with him, he'd get his brother Barney to drive me there on his motorcycle. And I figured riding on Barney's cycle was faster than walking. Then you didn't go straight to the bank. Well, sure I did, boy. Straight to the east side and then straight to the bank on Barney's motorcycle. All the time it was straight to the bank. Only, uh, something happened when Barney and me was riding a motorcycle. Don't tell me. I know. You took a shortcut. Gee, how'd you know, boy? Never mind. Because you didn't get to the bank in time, I have a date with Mary in one hour, and all I have in my pocket is 98 cents and a paper clip. Oh, boss, there's that hundred Larry Brown left for you in the envelope at the Williams Hotel. No, that's way uptown. It'll take an hour to get there, and Mary's in no mood to wait. Oh, boss, I sure am sorry, but if Bonnie and me hadn't have bumped into Joey Hatch... Never we... mind, never mind. I'll get a check at Martin's tonight, which is probably what I should have done. Oh, that, that's Flatchy Thomas. On the way to the bank, I bumped into him, too, and told him to meet me here. Fine, fine. Let him in. Oh, thanks, boss. Come on in, let's. 
I'm looking for Boston Blackie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come on in. Hey, boss, it ain't Blackie. Who is it, Tony? Some guy to see you. Yeah, it's me, Blackie. Oh, wow. Oh, man, that boy's slick, you know what I mean? Yeah, a little over-ambitious waxing. Careful, especially on the scatter rugs. Yeah. Well, what is it this time, Wilson? Well, you, you gotta do me a favor, Blackie. How much favor? Well, now, I, I ain't such one to ask this kind of thing from anybody, Blackie, but then I'm so up against it, you know what I mean? All I have in my pocket is 98 cents. I'll split it with you. Oh, gee. Thanks, Blackie, but that ain't enough, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm sorry, Wilson. I just don't happen to have... Say, I can let you have $100 if you'll go to the trouble to get it. Oh, no trouble at all, Blackie. All right. Go to the Williams Hotel uptown. Ask for the desk, uh, at the desk, rather, for an envelope in Larry Brown's name. Yeah. Brown left it for me. It's a hundred dollars in it. I go to the Williams Hotel uptown, huh? And ask for an envelope for Larry Brown, huh? And I'll have a hundred bucks, huh? Yeah, huh? Gee, I'll be there right up there. And thanks, Blackie, thanks a million, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean, Wilson. You mean thanks a hundred. Okay, you. Duck, Keep huh? walking. Ain't no water pistol in your bag. Hey, you, you got the wrong guy, bud. The wrong guy, you know what I mean? I ain't done nothing. Walk. Yeah, sure, sure. But, but look, I, I didn't rat in the Johnson mob on purpose. I had it. Get in the car here. But, but, but it was what I had to do about the Johnson mob. I was framed in the dumb of the cops, you know what I mean? Get in the car. Now, look, look, put, put that gun away. Let's talk this over first, you know what I mean? Oh, well, get in. All right. Don't, don't push. All right. But look, you, you got me all wrong, Mr. Shut just... up. Stop moving to the shack on the riverfront, Joe. Hey, now, wait a minute. And don't but... go through any red lights. Yeah, but hey, we I... don't want this guy picked up by the cops too soon. Keep that air pump going. That diver down there is no salmon. What makes you think we'll find the body in this section of the river, Captain? Well, Inspector Faraday, your witness said they saw the body dumped in off 86th Street. So we start looking from there. Oh, in case the body was planted in concrete, huh? Right. Chances are the current wouldn't affect it then. Hey, that light's flashing on and off. What well, does that mean? My divers found something. Give me the phone, Tom. Yeah, found something, huh? All right, down there. Go ahead. Found huh? the body, Captain. Good work, Jake. Did you bring it up yourself? No, the feet are in a block of cement. Send down the gravel. Come right down, Jake. Stand by. Okay. We found your body for you, Inspector Faraday. Good, good. Uh, how long before you get it up? In a minute. Okay, men. Over the side with the gravel. Let it go. Stand by, Inspector Faraday. We'll have your body for you in no time. Stop calling it my body, will you? <laughs> Sorry. Jake, you hear me? Go ahead. The grapple's on its way down. Yeah, I see it. Lower it another fathom. Lower one fathom. Hold it. Take it. How's it now, Jake? Bring it to stop at eight feet. Eight feet to starboard. Hold it. Check it. Got it, Jake? Okay, Captain. She took down, hold her up. Draw her in, boys. Draw her in. Hey, fish me top right out of this mud hole, will you, Captain? I ain't nobody. Okay. Stand by. Right. Here comes your body, Inspector Faraday. Will you stop calling it my body? Oh, it isn't mine. Bring it over the deck, boys. Come on, hoist it clearly, Gunnel. Bring it over to the deck. Lower it to the deck. Come on, lower it. Well, that witness knew what he was talking about. It's the body of a man, all right. A little lower. A little lower. Okay, let her rest. Hmm. I'll look for identification, Inspector. Yeah, I might as well start now. Look at that block of cement he's wearing for shoes. Yeah, it's murder. Inspector, you look like you know him. Know him? Sure I know him. That's Pete Wilson of stool pigeon. And this morning he asked me for the address of Boston Blackie. You think Boston Blackie killed him? How do I know? All I know is as soon as he found out where Blackie lived, he died. <laughs> You were going to Barney's. No, I was, but, but on the way I met Skinny Atkins and me and him decided to go to Barney's by way of Joe's. Then why aren't you at Joe's? Well, on the way to Joe's, we stopped at Skeet. 
Uh, will you tell that? <laughs> I'll tell him. All right, thanks, boss. Right. Bye, Shorty. Come in. Uh, hello, Frankie. What a spectacle Faraday. What an unpleasant surprise. Too bad you can't stay. Yeah? Don't try to slam that door. Don't move another step, Blackie. So I say so. Faraday. Your gun is showing. Blackie, I said don't move. All right, Inspector. What have I done this time? Hit a home run through a grocery store window? It's murder, Blackie. You are so right, Inspector. It's murder. I know the time, the place, the motive, everything. Don't tell me you even know the victim. Pete Wilson. Pete Wilson? He came up here to see you this morning. I know that because I gave him your address. Oh, thanks so much, Inspector. That little controversy, or uh, rather that little cursy courtesy of yours, cost me $100. And it cost Pete Wilson his life. He came up here to make a deal with you. You went in with him and killed him for his share of the take. The take yesterday was $100. My $100. Well, the take right now is you, down to headquarters. And I'm the guy who can do it, Miss Faraday. Did it ever occur to you that... I said, come on. And no tricks. You did say, come on, but you didn't say no tricks. Well, I'm saying it now. No tricks. Come on. Just a minute, Inspector. You're coming right now. As soon as I tie my shoe, do you mind? Leave it untied. Maybe you'll trip and break your neck. I wouldn't give you that day to tie my shoelace. All right, tie it. Thanks. Say, what's this on the rug? Never mind what's on the rug. I do mind. You're on the rug. So maybe if I... Oh, oh, Frankie! Frankie, stop! When you drop, you drop everything, Faraday. Even your gun. Help me, Frankie. So help right. yourself, Inspector. Oh, and Faraday, I mustn't forget my manners. Please don't get up. I was just leaving anyhow. <laughs> Now, back to Boston Blackie. Our story began when Larry Brown telephoned Blackie to inform him that the $100 Brown owed Blackie was waiting for Blackie in an envelope in the Williams Hotel in Larry Brown's name. When Pete Wilson, underworld character, came to Blackie to borrow money, Blackie sent him to the Williams Hotel to pick up the envelope. Wilson is not seen again until he's fished out of the river, murdered. Inspector Faraday of the police was convinced Blackie killed Wilson because earlier that day he himself had given Wilson Blackie's address. When Faraday attempts to arrest Blackie, Blackie, as usual, escapes. To continue our story, we return to the waterfront restaurant as Sam, Larry Brown's one-time gangster, walks in and takes a seat at the counter. Afternoon. Hey, what do you have? Two eggs, scrambled coffee, and give me a couple of rolls. Number two, beat up. Rocks on the side. What did you think of the game this afternoon? Didn't see it. Well, that was some game. So what? Well, nothing, I guess. How about some service? What do you have? Coffee, Blake. Go on, in the dark. Hi, Larry. Uh-huh. Don't let this kind of man see you talking to me. Relax, will you? I can't. I'm not off the spot yet. How do you know? Well, I don't know. I'm sure I'm mixed up. Wouldn't you be mixed up, too? Every time you took a step, it might be your last one. Turning yellow? One more crack like that, Sam, and I'm... I'm sorry, Larry. I didn't mean anything. You better not. Where have you been? Out driving around. I didn't see you drive up. I parked up the street a little. Drive up by the Williams Hotel? Yeah. Go in. You think I'm crazy? Relax. If your plan works out, you don't have nothing to worry about. Read your paper. I'll see you there. Okay. It's polite to read when you have company, Larry. What? What's the matter? Nervous? No. No, nothing's, uh, nothing's the matter, Blackie. Now, how are you? I don't know. What are you doing down here? I'm just looking. Oh, Shorty. Yeah, boss? Watch down the street as well as up. I saw one of Faraday's cars in the neighborhood. Yeah, but it didn't spot it, boss. Just the same. Be on the lookout. Okay. You went in trouble with the cops, Blackie? No more than usual. It's the hideout you want. I haven't... I just it. want some information. I don't know anything. Do you know Pete Wilson? Wilson? Pete Wilson? No. Do you know he's been murdered? No. I've been making it my business not to know much of anything these days. Reason? Knowing things is no it's healthy. Look, Larry, I'm not trying to involve you in anything. Yeah? Why should I? You mean everything between us is okay? In a manner of speaking. You got that envelope I left for you and everything? No, Larry, I didn't. But now that you mention it, Pete Wilson got it. Oh, Wilson got the letter. And he got everything, too. You sure this guy Wilson picked up that envelope? According to the clerk at the hotel, as far as I can find out, that's the last time he was seen alive. 
You making that crack for a reason? No, except that, well, I thought maybe you could tell me whether or not there's a possible connection between that envelope and Wilson's death. How should I know? I'll see you around, Blackie. Uh, wait a minute, I'm not through. Oh, but I am. I got an appointment. Well, look, uh, where can I get in touch with you? Who knows? I don't. I'll be moving around here and there. So long. Come on, Shirley. You might as well go, too. Okay, if you say so. Come on. Blackie, you know... We ain't no better off than we was before we punished that round. We may be, Shorty. It's possible that Brown engineered Wilson's killing. You think so, boss? I'm not as well think so. I haven't any other ideas. Come on, there's Brown getting into his car up the street. Let's get mine and follow him. Sure, sure, boss. It's only a long shot, but I have an idea. Hey! Look, Shorty! Brown's car! It's a wreck! A wreck? Looks like it went blind! It was, Shorty, when Brown stepped on the starter. Come on, let's have a look. Yeah, come on. What? There ain't much left of anything. Nobody will ever be able to prove that a guy by the name of Larry Brown was in this car. Gosh, no. I think I know why this happened, too. Excuse me an idea. Shorty, give me a wallet. Oh, sure, sure, boss. Yeah. Okay. Hey, boss, well, what's the idea of throwing my wallet in the wreck? I'll tell you later. Let's go. Uh, gosh, boss, when Faraday gets here and finds my wallet, he'll think I was knocked off in the floor. Yeah, Shorty, I imagine Inspector Faraday will think you've gone all to pieces. Come on, we're going to your place. <laughs> Why are we using my place as a hideout? The inspector figures I'm dead or he'll come running down here for sure. That's what I want him to do, Shorty. Of course, either you're too smart or I'm too dumb for this kind of thing. And I don't know which. Look, Shorty, I think I know why Larry Brown was killed. And it was no accident. You mean that explosion was supposed to bump? Mm-hmm. And I want his killer to think he escaped. That's why I threw your wallet into Brown's car. The police will identify the body. He's yours. Gee, uh, sure glad my poor old mother can't read. She'd feel awful bad about me getting blown up. Don't worry, Shorty. If she even hears about it, we'll go down and clear things up right away. All I want is for Faraday to release a story to the newspapers that you and not Brown was killed in that explosion. Look, I, I don't mind playing dead for us as long as it ain't for keeps, but why don't you want nobody to know Brown got it? Very simple, Shorty. When... It... Here's Inspector Faraday. Anybody in there? Sure, anybody out there? Inspector Faraday of the police. Who's in there? Uh, let's play this guessing game a little longer, Faraday. It's fun. Blackie, it's you. Let me in or I'll break down the door. Don't go to the trouble of bruising your baby skin, sweetheart. I'll let you in. Shorty, uh, stand with me. They can't see you, by the way. I'm just giving a little surprise. Oh, sure, boy. Get back in there, Blackie. Faraday, you're a good bloodhound. You don't get away from me for long, do you? Oh, I wasn't talking about your ability to find me, Faraday. I, I was looking at your ears. Hello, Monahan. All right, don't talk. You do enough talking for the whole force, don't you, Faraday? Okay, you've been funny long enough. Now you're coming quietly or am I... Shorty, I thought you were dead. Hi, Inspector Faraday. Nice afternoon, huh? What are you doing here? I get right here. This is my job. But you're supposed to be dead. Killed in that automobile explosion of town. That wasn't Shorty's body, in fact. No, no. Only my wallet. I, uh, hope you brung it. Well, if that wasn't your body in that car, what was your wallet doing there? I put it there, Inspector. You did, Blackie. Why? I didn't want you or anybody else to know the name of the real victim until I talked to you. Well, if you were at the scene of the explosion, you probably had something to do with it. Who'd you kill this time? The man's name was Larry Brown. Oh, uh, I didn't kill him, Inspector. Well, if you didn't kill him, how do you know his name? I know the name of lots of dead people. Look, I don't want any wise cracks. I just want you. Faraday, this is so sudden, really. I... And also boring. Put that gun away, will you? After I put you away. You're way ahead of yourself. How can you arrest me for the murder of Larry Brown when you haven't even found out who killed Pete Wilson? Wilson was killed because somebody thought he was Larry Brown. So what? Listen. Larry Brown was being shadowed by an out-of-town trigger man hired to kill him. Unfortunately, the trigger man didn't know what Brown looked like. Brown knew that. And was a very clever scheme to duck his assassin. Yeah, this better be good now, I'm sure. It is. Brown knew his only hope of getting away from the killer for good was to have the killer shoot someone else. Brown owed me money. So he put it in an envelope in his name at his hotel and phoned me to come to the hotel and ask for it. Well, if that's so, why aren't you dead? Because I sent Pete Wilson for that envelope. He went into the hotel, asked for an envelope for Larry Brown. The killer picked him up, took him for a little joyride, and uh, you know what. Okay. 
But then why was Brown killed? The killer realized his mistake. Or the man who hired him noticed it. So as not to make a mistake again, they wired Brown's car for sound. Well, that's the best one you've ever told, Blackie. But it doesn't get me my killer. Do me a favor, Faraday. I wouldn't do anything for you. Then do it for yourself. Did you release a story to the newspapers that Shorty was killed in the explosion? Yeah, but I can stop it. No, no, don't stop it. Let it go through. Add to it a story that Larry Brown was the intended victim, but escaped and has returned to his room at the Williams Hotel. Are you crazy? I'm crazy enough to get out from under a murder rap. Release that story to the newspapers, and then give me six hours. I wouldn't give you six seconds if I had any sense. Oh, don't feel so badly about it, Faraday. We can't all be smart. I ought to lock you up and never listen to you again. Go ahead, get out of here. Thanks, Faraday. Come on, Joey. Sure, boss. Remember now, Faraday, for six hours, leave me alone. Get that, Monahan. I'm supposed to leave him alone six hours. I'm not letting him out of my sight six seconds. Come on. This is room 511, sir. Thanks. You're expecting luggage, sir? Yeah, later. Bring it up, will you? Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? No, that'll be all. No too trouble. Thank you, sir. Come in. Hi, Blackie. Well, what took you so long this time, Shorty? Oh, look, boss, you gave me a tough job. I've been all over town. Did you do what I asked? You did, boss. My pals call every mug and trigger man. Yep. And now everyone in town thinks that Larry Brown got out of that explosion okay. And he's right here in room 511 of the Williams Hotel alone. Good work, Shorty. That's grand. I've got to wait for a guy who's coming up here to kill me. You have to make so much noise. Four o'clock in the morning. Down south here in Texas. Yeah, but somebody in the hall might be awake. You can... Well, I felt like... All right, open the door. Let's go in. I'm getting excited. What a nice one. I'm doing most of the talking. You got a right to see there's someone in the bed. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to make sure you know I'm right there. Okay. Come on over to the bed. A nice light goes in the eyes if it's so blind it'll miss. I'm going to go out of the light. Maybe I'd better turn on the light. Huh? Stop, Stop, boss. I'll get him. No, you don't. Well, pick up your gun, pal. I think Inspector Faraday would like to do that himself. Hey, Faraday, come on in. You've been in the next room for hours. I know it. Okay, Blackie. So I didn't leave you alone. So you knew it. If you hadn't outshot this guy, maybe you'd have been glad. I'm glad anyhow, Faraday. You heard this guy here say he wasn't going to make a mistake. He killed the wrong guy again. I heard everything. I've been in the next room for hours. Well, um, incidentally, on your way down to headquarters, we practically had to sleep together, Faraday, suppose you stop and pay the bill. Hello? Oh, Blackie, this is Shorty. Say, Shorty, where are you? Lassie has been here twice looking for you. Oh, gosh, boss. Did you tell him I was at, uh, Skeet's? No. No, I didn't. You said you were going straight to Skeet, so I thought I'd play it safe and send him to Joe's. Oh, I, I see. Where are you? Well, boss, uh, let me tell you. I was going straight to Skeeter's when a funny thing happened. You went to Harry's? No, 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 boss. I went straight to Skeeter's. <laughs> Here I am. And am I surprised.
seen you, Blackie. Where have you been for the last two weeks? Who oh, I am, Mary. Oh, I, uh, I was afraid you were ill. I called your apartment several times, but no one answered. I've been busy. But it, it's so unlike you not to phone me or drop me a line. You, uh, you aren't in trouble, are you? No. Well, let's, uh, let's go sit down and you can tell me what you've been doing. I dropped in just for a minute, Mary. That doesn't mean you can't sit down a minute. I don't have the time. Blackie, what's the matter? I haven't seen you for the last two weeks, Mary, because I haven't wanted to see you. Blackie. I thought you'd take the hint, and I wouldn't have to do this. Oh. But you saw Shorty yesterday and asked for me, and so I thought I'd better end this once and for all. But, but why? What have I done? I, I... Nothing. I, well, I suppose you're a great girl, Mary. For somebody else, so I... Blackie. Blackie, what is this? It's this. Open the window, Mary. What do you get? Why, I... I get air. That's just what I'm giving you, kid. And you don't have to bother about any window. And now meet Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Blackie, I... Oh, oh, hello, Shorty. Oh, hi, Miss Wesley. Uh, Blackie ain't home. Oh, well, uh, may I come in? Oh, sure, sure, Miss Wesley. Thank you. Gee, Miss Wesley, you sure are one beautiful thing. Am I? <laughs> What's the matter? You down about something? Shorty, maybe you can help me. Oh, Miss Wesley, for you, I'd jump off the Brooklyn Bridge in my Sunday suit. Oh, well, thanks, Shorty, but I don't want you to do anything like that. I just want you to tell me something. Well, if I know what to tell, I sure will. What's the matter with Blackie? Oh, well, that. Then you do know about it? Well, not not exactly, Miss Wesley. You see, I don't ask Blackie no questions about nothing. But you do know that he's broken off with me? Well, sure. You see, Blackie's a funny guy. He treats all the dames the same as he treats you. Nice and friendly like one minute and then like a... You're like an old pair of shoes the next. Oh, Shorty, that, that's just not true. No? Huh. Don't bet. Look, I know how he treats his things. Blackie just gave you the same air he gives them all, Miss Wesley. I see. Well, that's it then, huh? Well, I I sure wish it wasn't. Thanks, Shorty, thanks. You, uh, you needn't tell Blackie I was here. I. No. No, please do tell him. If there is anything behind all this that I ought to know, maybe he'll tell you. Oh, certainly, I'll tell him. No, better still, Shorty, I'll write him a note. Maybe that's the way. I'll use the telephone pad, is that all right? Sure. Oh, oh wait a minute. What's this address on the pad, 11 Bailey Street? Oh, that, that's some place that Blackie wrote down to go to this afternoon. That's a strange part of town for Blackie, Bailey Street. Well, he said he was going out on business. Look, Miss Wesley, uh, I don't know what this is all about, only I, I kind of hope you ain't sore at him. Don't, don't mind him, huh, Miss Wesley? He needs somebody to mind him, Shorty. And right now, I'm going to mind his business. Hey, Leeds, will you quit shuffling those cards so much? You're giving the king of spades a shave. Let's play. When I'm ready, I'm thinking. What about? What you ought to be thinking about, too, Bernie. Blasting our way into that vault downstairs. Cut. Well, we got to think about Blackie first. Is your cut deal him. I'm thinking about Blackie. Look, Leech, if he stands in the way of our little job, why don't we just knock him off? Why don't we just go out and commit suicide? Same thing, it'll be much quicker. Much quicker. Well, we got to stop him somehow. He knows what we're up to. Let's just be glad Blackie isn't chums with the cops and we'd have more to worry about. You want that card? Uh, no. Gee, if you only had a thing he was sweet on, we could grab her and Blackie would hop on his head if we said the word. That's very smart, Bernie. Only Blackie doesn't have any girl. I, uh, took that car and check it down. Yeah, okay. He had a dame, but he doesn't have one. Get that through your noggin. I knocked with eight points. Eight. Hey, you're lucky enough to do this for a living. Yeah, you get 27. <laughs> you do. Yeah. Hey, what's that? Hold it, hold it, hold it. Come in. Hello, boys. Well, Boston Blackie. I felt like slumming a little, so I thought I'd drop in and see how you boys are getting along. Mighty white of you. Let me lay one on this guy, Leach. Sit down. 
Ah. What's the matter, Bernie? Impatient to get at that bank vault downstairs? Yeah. <laughs> What's stopping you? Nothing. When we got you out of the way. And just how are you going to get me out of the way? We'll figure something. Nothing that I can't figure first. Make one more move to crack open that vault and I'll crack down on you. Okay, okay. We know you're smart. How about cutting you in, Blackie? No, thanks. Hmm, I see you have the floorboards removed. Are you sure you're directly over the vault? We didn't move into this rat trap in an apartment because we like Bailey Street. Uh-huh. Cold water flat with plenty of cold cash on the floor below. Well, I hope you don't die of old age before you get what you moved in for. Huh? Hey, Leach, I'm going in the kitchen. This guy gets me down. Go ahead. Well, Leach, you give up? No. You might as well. Why don't you go home and be a nice boy? I don't pretend to be a nice boy. You know you don't dare break into that vault downstairs as long as I'm around? Look, we got an old plan. Right there in that hole in the floor is where we're going down into the bank. We come through right on top of the vault. A little well-placed nitro. Bingo, we're in. You're in, too, if you say so. Not a very subtle way to open a vault. Vaults don't care if we're obvious. <laughs> Leech, you're an amateur. You don't have any more... I hope that poking ahead killed him. Bernie, what'd you do that for? I just couldn't help it. I don't like anybody calling us names. Knocking them out doesn't help us any... I'm sorry, Leech. I just had a conk. Oh. Anyway, he's coming, too. Wait. Mm. Hey, wait, I got an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Tie him up quick. What? Tie him up. Get that rope there. Yeah, sure. Let's sure. Don't look so happy, Bernie. I'm not going to let you kill him. Uh, what are we tying him up for, then? I don't know why we didn't think of this before. Uh. The best place for Blackie while we knock off this bank is in jail. Ja- How are we going to get him in jail? Tie him up good and tight. I got him so tight if you pluck him, I'll twang. I was just going to get him in jail. We're going to plan him when the cops can grab him. Go out and tell Joe to bring the car around back. Oh, uh, hello, boys. Or am I supposed to say, where am I? Try to get out of those ropes, Blackie, and you'll cut yourself in the head. Uh, thanks for the warning, but maybe I'll like being twins. Go tell Joe to bring the car around back. Yeah, sure, Lich. What's this going to be, a little joyride? No, Blackie, we're going to a little candy store to buy a lollipop for an all-day sucker. And I do mean you. Turn left to the next traffic light. The candy store is down the Jefferson Pike about a mile. Lovely day for an automobile ride, isn't it? Shut up, Blackie. Hey, Leach, what are we going to do at the candy store when we get there? This uh, guy who owns the candy store is a belligerent gent. He doesn't take things lying down. You and I are going into a store, stick him up. You're going to let him swing on you. You fall like he's knocked you out. Yeah. Then I'm going to let him have it with a blackjack. What about Blackie here? As soon as I've knocked out the man in the candy store, I'm calling the cops. You're going out to the car, slap Blackie with your blackjack, untie him, drag him into the store, knocked out. Then we're going to beat it. Oh, hey, Leach, you're great. I get it. When the cops get there, they'll find Blackie knocked out, and the storekeeper will say he knocked him out. You boys are brilliant. Remind me not to like the whole setup, will you? Got a Bernie got a match? Yeah, yeah, sure, somewhere. And here, let me light your cigarette for you. Draw in. Oh, thanks. Hey, Leach, look, Blackie's out of the ropes. Don't move, Blackie. I got a gun on you. So I see. How'd you get out of those ropes? I'll write your letter and tell you about it. Yeah? Well, what kind of tricks do you know how to get away from guns? I've got one on you, too. Well, that will take some thought, I'm afraid, but it can be done. Better tap him with your blackjack again, Bernie. He talks too much. With pleasure, Lee. Hey, now, wait a minute. I don't mind if... <coughs> hey. He sure passes out pretty, don't he, Lee? Yeah, hit him again in a few minutes. And uh, hit him once more before we dump him in the candy store. I don't want this guy to wake up again until he's in jail. <laughs> Oh, at least I gotta hand it to you. Now, the cop sure made a rush go to that candy store when you phoned it and said for us that Blackie was in on a deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How <laughs> oh, did you see? Inspector Faraday was there himself. It's only an hour since Blackie came to call him. <laughs> yeah, how long do you think Faraday will keep Blackie in jail? Well, well, from what I hear, Inspector Faraday would give Blackie a life sentence for breaking his shoe lace. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, he'll keep him there long enough to suit us. Sam said he'd be up with our nitro this afternoon. Oh, good. Go, we'll be, we'll be set the blast into the top of the vault tomorrow night then, huh? Oh, easy. Yeah. And I thought Blackie was going to be trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody at the door, Leach. Want me to go around the other door and see who it is? No, no. What are you worrying about? It's Sam with a nitro. I'll let him in. Now, always on time, Sam. You're a good... Hey, Leach, it's a thing. 
Hello, I'm Mary Wesley. Is Boston Blackie here? No, no, Blackie. Shut up, Bernie. Come in, uh, Miss Wesley. Well, I... What do you want with Blackie? I, um, I just want to talk to him. Hey, Leach, this is the dame Blackie said wasn't his Shut name. up, Bernie. Sit down, Miss Wesley. Uh, no, no, thank you. I just came to see Blackie. What about him? Oh, I, uh... I... Why are you looking at me like that? I just got an idea, that's all. Maybe you and Blackie haven't busted, like he said. How do you know about that? Because I think maybe the bust-up is phony, and for my benefit. Well, I, I I, don't understand you at all. Sit down, Miss Wesley. No, thanks. Sit down. I'd rather not. I... I'd sit down. Yes, yes, of course. As long as you insist. That's better. Hey, Leach, you thinking the same about this dame as I am? Shut up. Yeah, sure. Miss Wesley, when did you last see Blackie? Early this morning. Where? He came to my apartment. What for? To tell me that he didn't want to see me again. Before that, when did you last see him? Two weeks ago. Why are you so interested? It's my business. I came here to see Blackie. If he isn't here, I'll go, if you don't mind. But I do mind. Bernie? Yes? Yeah. Tired of the chair. Oh, hey, I have to take it loose. Don't oh, worry. It's the same thing for some Blackie. You're hitting my... Go on. that loose there. Gagger, gagger. Go. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> That's well, well, this is perfect. Blackie said we couldn't crack that vault downstairs as long as he was around to stop us, and he was right. But now where's Blackie? <laughs> In jail. And if he gets out of jail, we got his girlfriend. Now what can Blackie do to stop us? And maybe he can talk Faraday into letting him go. <laughs> oh, I doubt that. Even if he does and then tries to stop us, we'll do what we told him two weeks ago. We'll deliver his girlfriend to him, uh, slightly dead. <laughs> We're glad to have you with us, Miss Wesley. We're very glad indeed. And now, back to Boston Blackie. For some reason, then unknown to Mary, Blackie has told her that their friendship is at an end. Trying to find the answer to Blackie's strange actions, Mary has fallen into the hands of two men planning to rob the Daly Street Bank and is now being held prisoner in an apartment just above the bank vault. Blackie, at the same time, is being held at police headquarters for a robbery into which the bank thieves have framed him in order to get him out of the way. As we return to our story, it's the next morning, and Shorty, who has heard through the underworld grapevine that Blackie is in jail, comes to see his friend. Hiya, Blackie. Good morning. Shorty, how'd you find out Faraday was holding me? I get his, boss. And my friends talk a lot. I'd have been here last night if I'd known sooner. If you've brought me a loaf of bread with a steel file inside it, I'll never speak to you again. Nah, nah, boss, nah. Yeah, I'll bring you some bad news, boss. Then go over there to the desk and give it to Faraday. Look, this is real bad news, boss. Two mugs in Bentley Street have got Miss West. Mary? Yeah. Well, how did they get hold of her, and why? Oh, I don't know, Black. I, I guess it's all my fault. Miss Wesley came up to your apartment to talk to you and found a Bentley Street address she'd gone to. She went down there to see what you were up to. Shorty, Shorty, you shouldn't have let her do that. Now I'll have to get out of here. You wait around the corner for me. I won't be long. Okay, boss. Hey, Faraday. Uh, Faraday. What do you want, Frankie? You. What's the matter, chum? You lonesome in there? Or do you want me to give you my keys? What keys? These in my coat pocket right here. This may be just a temporary cell in my office, but it's hard to get out of unless you have the keys. Well, why didn't you take me straight to the city jail, Faraday? Do you enjoy having me around? When you're behind bars. Listen, I've got to get out of here, Faraday. What are you going to use for keys? Proof I didn't hold up that candy store. If you were as tall as the store you're about to tell, you'd be a giant. Listen, Faraday, that candy store proprietor said he knocked me out by hitting me on the jaw once. Yeah, and you were still out when I got there. Sure, but where was I hit? On the back of the head. And not once, but several times. And not with a fist, but a blackjack. That's your story. What happened was, you got sucked on the chin, hit your head on the floor. Oh, I see how you account for the bumps on the head. I was a bouncing baby, and so when my head hit the floor in the candy store, I bounced. Very funny, Blackie. Faraday, listen to me, will you? I was framed into being picked up at that candy store, framed by Willie Leach and Bernie Bernard, who want me out of the way so they can rob the Bailey Street Bank sometime tonight. Oh, those bad boys. Okay, okay. You won't do anything for my sake. Do it for Mary's. Leach and Bernard are holding her in Bailey Street right now. Well, what's the matter, Captain Over? You jealous? All right, Faraday. Be a sap if you want to. But for heaven's sake, tuck your handkerchief in your breast pocket. You're no doom. Hey, hey, take your hands away from that handkerchief. 
Looks all right the way it is. Okay, Flash, okay. And don't be too unhappy in that detention cell, Blanky. I'm moving you uptown to the city jail as soon as the wagon has a minute to spare. Thanks, pal. And don't let me hear any more complaints from you about anything, as long as you're in jail. That Faraday may not be as long as you think. Thanks for waiting for me, Shorty. Oh, gee, Blackie, you sure got out in a hurry. How'd you do it? I pretended to fix Faraday's handkerchief and lifted the keys out of his pocket and slipped through his office and out the back way. <laughs> Look, I, I guess we better beat out his neighborhood, huh, boss? But being this close to a jail when I don't have to, it makes me nervous. All right, let's go. Boss, look, I'm, I'm sure sorry I, I let Miss Wesley go see them two mugs in Bailey Street. Well, you couldn't help it. That young lady has a mind of her own. Well, what are we going to do? Them guys are holding her there, I bet. You're betting on a favorite, Shorty. That's a cinch. Gee, I, I tried to stop her, too. Yeah, well, they're doing just what they said they do. Home, Miss Wesley, so you would play hands off while they cracked the Bailey Street Bank. What are we going to do, Blackie? What do you think, Shorty? Well... Unless we want him to knock Miss Wesley on the head so hard it's fatal, I, I guess we stay away from him. I think what we ought to do is to keep after those guys. They might kill Mary because she knows too much, even if we lay off. Oh. Well, then what? I don't know. I'm going down to Bailey Street and see those two. Oh, wait a minute, boss. I, I don't think that's so smart. I don't either. But it so happens that it's necessary. Now, here's what I want you to do. Hello, Leach. Well, the bad penny, Boston Blanket. That door was locked. How'd you get out of jail? How did you get in here? That's two more letters I owe you guys. Let me slug him again, Leach. I don't think that'll be necessary. He uh, got his girl. I'd like to see Mary. Oh, you want proof, do you? We don't kid about anything. Where is she? Open the door to the front room, Bernie. Yeah, sure. Don't worry, Blackie. We haven't heard her. That would spoil our plans for the present. Yeah, there she is, tied to a chair, nice and tight. Yeah. Mary, don't worry, honey. I'll get you out of here. Everything's going to be all right. Look, Leach, I'll make a deal with you. Let Mary go, and I'll help you get into the vault. Nah. Leach, you're a fool. You're going to blow the vault with nitro. Nitro makes noise. Oh, it does, really? I'm telling you, you're a sap to use nitro when you can use me. Take me to any vault in the world, and I can open it with my fingers. And you know it. Are you suggesting that you want to come in with us? I'm not suggesting anything. Release Mary and I'll open the safe for you. Uh, sit down, uh, Blackie. Now you're getting some sense. I don't do it. Leach is up to some trick. Maybe. Then again, maybe not. Now you're brilliant, Leach. Let Mary go now, will you? I'll stay here until it's time to open the vault. You'll stay here until then. Your girlfriend stays here, too. But that's the condition of our deal. You have to let Mary go. That's the condition I don't like. The girl stays where she is. How long? Until after you've opened the vault. Then you'll let her go? Maybe. Maybe? What's that? That's our guarantee that you'll open the safe for us at 8 o'clock tonight. Hey, hey Leach, what kind of a vault is this, anyhow? It's in two rooms, Bernie, just like the plan said. The safe is in the second room. We're only in the first room now. Come on, Blackie, I don't want this to take all night. It won't, Leach. Don't worry. Get us through that door to the second room and get to work on that safe. I'd better close this outside door first. What for? Oh, just a superstition. I don't like to work with open doors behind me. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, close the door. Let's get going. Don't be nervous, Leach. I go through doors that lock the way you go through doors that revolve. How, uh, how long is it going to take you to get through the door into the second room where the safe is? No time at all. This is probably just a simple luck. You, uh, won't accidentally trip the burglar alarm, will you? And bring the cops down on my own neck? Faraday still wants me, you know. Yeah, all right. But no tricks. I got a gun up there. any tricks. Now, uh, both of you boys keep quiet while I work on this door. Yeah, that does it. I'm beginning to like you, old Blackie. How nice. Well, the door's open. Yeah, you better try it and see. Shut up. If Blackie says it's open, it's open. Thanks, Leach. 
There you are. Wide open. Now, uh, I want to go the rest of the way alone. Why? Don't let him do it, Leach. It's a trick. Why do you want to be alone, Blackie? Two reasons. First, I'm superstitious about opening safes with somebody looking over my shoulders. Second, I'd rather you didn't know how it was done. Look, Leach, I haven't double-crossed you so far, have I? No. That's a good thing, too. Shut up, Bernie. How can I double-cross you from here on? There are no windows, no doors. You'll be between me and the outside. You both have guns. I haven't. I'd be a dope to try any tricks. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you would. Now, uh, give me five minutes alone to open the safe, and then you can come in and get the money. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, you're making a mistake, Leach. You let me run this. Blackie can't double-cross us now. How you doing, Blackie? All right. In fact, I'm doing fine. Careful you don't trip that burglar alarm. I'll be careful that I do, Leach. What? Hey, what's the idea? Too bad, Leach. You can't get through that door. It's locked. Let's get out of here, Leach. But I'll try it either of you. Shorty is waiting outside with a Tommy gun. I'll get you for this, Blackie. There's still a locked door between us. Come on, Bernie. We'll try the outside door. It's probably lying about Shorty. I know how to work this latch. Okay. Hey, get open it. All right, you guys. Stand right where you are. Hey, Shorty, ain't here but the cut drop. Shorty is here. Please, without no uniform. Keep your gun on him, Shorty. Rollins, turn off that alarm. Good thing, Inspector. Hey, Faraday, is that you? Come on up, Blackie. Okay, Monahan, Rollins, take these two bums out of here. All right. Okay, Blackie, come on. Hi, Faraday. Hello, Blackie. I don't know what brought you down here, Inspector, but I'm certainly glad something did. You did, Blackie. But I thought you didn't believe me when I said the bank was going to be robbed tonight. I believed you, but I didn't want you to think so. I'm not as dumb as you think. I believed your story as soon as you told me you'd been hit on the head, not on the chin, the way the candy store proprietor said. Faraday, you're getting positively brilliant. You mean you're just waking up to the fact that I'm smarter than you are? Yes, Faraday, but when I wake up, I stop dreaming. Hey, boss. Yes, Johnny. Can I put down this Tommy gun now, huh? It makes me nervous. Think how nervous it makes me. You're in back of it. Will you sit still, Mary? Or do I have to tie you to that chair? Mm -mm. But, um, I'm still nervous about last night. You needn't be. It's all over. You know, I was so scared when I heard you coming up those stairs. I thought it was Leech coming up to kill me. I was, um, more afraid only once in my life. When? When you came to my apartment and told me you never wanted to see me again. Do you understand now why I did that? Mm Mm-mm. Not completely. Well... Leach and Bernard heard that you and I were good friends. They figured the only way to keep me away from them while they robbed the Bailey Street Bank was to hold you. Oh, I see. So I told them you didn't mean a thing to me. To go ahead and do whatever they wanted to, will you? I didn't care. Well, I like that. It worked, honey. Until you came looking for me and they realized I'd lied to them. Did you lie to them, Blackie? About me? What do you think? Well, you could tell me. We're right back where we started. Hmm, good even with that. Good friends. Oh. With our troubles over and no more troubles in sight. Oh, Blackie, if you only hadn't said that. Said what? No more troubles in sight. But there isn't any trouble in sight. I know it, but you'll go looking for it. Any objections? Definitely. But, um, where shall we look?
Inspector Faraday. You wanted me here in headquarters for questioning. Here I am, and I know some wonderful answers. Well, Blackie, they better be good. Well, first you answer one question for me. Why am I here? The Worthington pearls have been stolen. That's why you're here. Faraday, really, I'm disappointed in you. Your reason is the same old stuff. I don't say you stole the pearls. I'm just not taking any chances. I'm rounding up every suspect in town. Oh, well, in that case, I- I'm glad you didn't slight me. Well, I'm giving you a good going over. I got men searching your apartment now. And I'm going to have you search, too. Promise you won't tickle? Now, look. Be a nice boy, will you? And behave yourself. Take off your coat. A whistle of waltz. I take off things better that way. Hold it. My coat? You know what I mean. Hello? Inspector, there's a telephone call for Blackie. Can you take it? I suppose so. I'll put him on. Here, Blackie, it's for you. Make it snappy. It's probably Mary Wesley wanting to know what case I'm solving for you now. You never did anything for me but make trouble. Quiet, Faraday. I don't want Mary to know that I'm on speaking terms with you. Hello? Here's your call, Blackie. Thanks. Hello, Blackie? Yeah? Blackie, it's Shorty. Well? Hey, look, boss, I stopped up at your place again today, and, and the joint's full of cops. I know, but I was going to have the place repainted anyhow. Hey, what do you want? Look, boss, well, what's up? What did I got you the job for? There's nothing to worry about, Shorty. Five days after the Worthington Pearls, that's all. What did you say? <laughs> and this will give you a laugh. He's going to search me for the pearls right now. Hey, hey Blackie, you got your raincoat, would you? Of course I have. It's raining out, isn't it? Why do you ask? Why? Because if you look in the left-hand pocket of your raincoat, you'll find the Worthington Pearls there. That's why. Now Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. I'm trying to be patient. What are you so happy about, Blackie? Well, I'm glad to see you do something to earn your salary. You're actually making a job out of searching my clothes. Well, stop looking so smart, wise guy. I never said you had the pearls. But you're searching me for them. Oh, uh, don't forget the uh, trouser linings there. I don't need any help from you. Since when? All right, genius. Put your clothes back on. What? No valet service? Come on, come on. Here's your coat. Uh, help me on with it, will you, Faraday? And don't look so unhappy. I could have told you in the beginning you wouldn't find the Worthington pearls on me. I'm not through yet. You brought a raincoat with you. Where is it? I brought a raincoat? What makes you think so? I saw you, that's what. There it is on the chair. No, I hope I don't find the pearls in this coat. I don't want you around here giving our jail a bad name. I'll be glad to help you find them. I said I didn't need your help. Uh Uh-huh. What's this? In the right-hand pocket of the raincoat? My wristwatch. I was taking it to the jewelers to have it fixed. Open the box. You'll see. Yeah, just a watch. Take a good look at it, Faraday. I've always said you didn't know what time it was. Well, it's time I convinced you you're not so smart, Blackie. I know that. Hurry up and finish searching my raincoat, will you? Nothing in the lining. No. Or in the collar. No. Uh huh. The left hand pocket, huh? What's in it, Faraday? There's nothing in it. Take this moth eaten raincoat and get out of here. <laughs> Thanks. What are you turning up the collar for? To keep the rain off my neck and you to match. Thanks for the lift, George. I'll take you up on something, too, someday. Yeah, I might day off. Oh, hi. Hiya, Blackie. I got here as soon as I could. Just like you told me on the phone. That's fine, Shorty. I sort of got here too soon. I, I couldn't get any apartment. Look, Short, when you have some fast explaining to do, how did those stolen pearls turn up in my raincoat pocket? Oh, gee, boss. They, they were there, huh? Well, you ought to know. You told me. Oh, I hate to hear the answer to this one, boss. What did Inspector Faraday say when he found him? He didn't find him. Yeah, that's what I... Th- huh? He, he didn't but, find him? No. Now, tell me how I happen to have them in the first place. Well, you see, it all goes back to before the first place, boss. You, you remember the morning when it was raining and, and I borrowed your raincoat? Yes. Well, I, I didn't want to get your raincoat too wet, so I ducked in a thatch's rendezvous. And who should shoulder up beside me but two butcher? I don't like that. Oh, no, boss. I like that. Because Duke Butcher ain't looking for me. Then I like that. Uh, no, boss. I don't like that. Because when I get outside and put my hand in your raincoat pocket, what comes up but the white and the which is unloaded on me by Duke Butcher? Well, do you like that or don't you? 
Well, I don't like it, boss, because you ain't there, and when I get back, so I can tell you that you got the pearls in your pocket. But I do like it that Inspector Faraday didn't find them. Well, he hasn't found them yet. You like that, huh? I don't like it, Shorty, because until Faraday finds them, Duke Butcher is going to think that you have them. And let's not worry about it. Let's do something about it. Yeah, that's a good idea, boss, because Duke is sure going to come around to me asking for them pearls. Well, let's go into the apartment. Maybe we can get an idea. Okay. Well, we better work fast, too, boss. Why? Well, Duke is looking to get the pearls from me. Whiny Scan is looking to get the pearls from Duke. And the cops is looking to get them from everybody. Maybe I'll be looking for them myself before we're through. Boss, don't you know where they are? All right, both of you, my great. Blackie, it's Duke. Hello, Duke. Stay where you are, Blackie. I don't mind the sight of blood if it's somebody else's. Boy, the, the, don't don't pull with Duke. He, he ain't very sociable. Well, if he were, Shorty, he'd know it's not polite to point at his host, especially with a gun. Right now, I'm playing host. Bad casting. What do you want? Shorty hasn't told you, huh? Oh, the pearls. Yeah, the pearls. Okay, Shorty. Just a minute, Duke. Shorty doesn't have the pearls. How do you know? He gave them to me. That's safekeeping, huh? So you could hand them back to me. All right, let's have them. Sorry, I don't have them either. Quit stalling. I'm not stalling, Duke. I just don't have the pearls. I got ways of finding out about that. Don't get too close to me, Blackie. I know your tricks. Come on, take off your clothes. Oh, not that again. Come on, toss over your coat, but gently. All right. Stand right where you are. Toss your coat over to me. Easy now. Okay. And it's going to be just too bad for both of you guys if I don't find the pearls. All right, Duke. Here's my coat. Catch it. Hey, I said... Hey! Good shot, boss. You're going to hit him right in the face. All right, wait right. for me. Drop that gun. Stop it. You're breaking my arm. Stop it. Let go of that gun. Well, all right. Pick up his gun, Shorty, and keep it out of his reach. I got it, boy. I need a gun to take care of you, Blackie. No. What do you bet? Hey, you want me to hit him with something, boss? No. Okay, okay. Shorty. I can handle them. Oh. Yeah. Oh, boy, Blackie. Nothing in this room could have hit him any harder than that last punch of yours. He ought to be out for a little while. Yeah. Well, what do we do with him? That depends on how friendly he is after he wakes up. Uh-oh. Oh, gee, boss, I wonder who that is. We might try answering it to find out. Well, what do you say? I say, uh, who's there? It's Faraday. Faraday. Wow. You can say that again. I'm, I'm too scared. Oh, we got Duke in here. I'll call. Hey, just a minute, Faraday. I'll be right with you. Hurry it up. I don't have all day. Listen, Shorty. While Duke's still unconscious, tie him up and gag him. Yeah? And then run over to the garage and get the car. Oh, okay, boss. But what are you going to do with Faraday? I'll keep him outside in the hall. Better still, I'll take him downstairs to the restaurant. Okay. I'll meet you back here in half an hour. Okay, boss. You leave everything to me. I can handle it. Oh, sure, boss. Well, it's about time, Blackie. Uh, you don't want to come into an untidy apartment, Inspector. Hey, I... hey, who are you shoving? You. Listen, I want to talk to you inside. Uh, I want to listen to you outside. What are you hiding in there? Six stolen elephants and a giraffe, and we can't open the windows or the pigeons will fly out. Now, be a nice boy, will you? And, and come back some other time, Faraday, please. Now, listen, Blackie. You be square with me. I'll be square with you. But you have a head start at being square, and I do mean head. Now, look, Blackie, I came up here to... All right, Faraday, all right. I'm sorry. Well, then be sorry enough to tell me what you know about the Worthington pearls. I didn't steal them. I don't have them, period. But you know something about them? Question mark? All right, question mark. You know something about them? <laughs> That's better. Yes, I do. Come on down to the restaurant, and I'll try to forget it's impolite to eat and talk at the same time. <clears throat> For one half hour, you talked down in that restaurant, Blackie. I still don't know what you said. That's because you weren't listening, Faraday. It's because you gave me double talk. Look, now come on out with it, or I go into your apartment and stay till you do. I told you all I know. But you told me nothing. Then I've told you all you know, too. Okay, then. I'm coming into your apartment, and I'm staying. Don't think you're not welcome, Inspector, because you're not. This gets me a lot of places I'm not welcome. Oh, uh, Faraday, put that gun away, please. You'll hurt yourself. Come on. Come on, let's go inside. All right. But one of us is going to be awfully sorry. I don't doubt it. Open up. After you? You first. Faraday, one of these days, I'm really going to be mixed up in something, and you're going to be so stunned from the shock that you'll let me get away with it. You're lucky you're not already in... 
Well, Blackie. Now what the... Wow. You could have been an actor, Blackie. You actually look surprised. What's Duke Butcher doing lying on the floor over there with a knife in his chest? I don't know, and I'm sure he's too dead to tell us, Inspector. All right, Blackie. No wonder you didn't want me in here. I'm taking it down to headquarters. Listen, Let's go. Faraday, listen. Duke is the reason I didn't want you to come in here, but when I left, he was just knocked out, unconscious. Blackie, I'm not listening, which shows you how smart I'm getting. Look, Shorty was going to tie Duke up while I took you downstairs. And then we were going to dump him with his pals, but very much alive. He isn't tied up now, and he isn't alive. He's dead. You're going down to headquarters. All right, Inspector. But let me get my hat. Oh, no, you don't. This time, no tricks. Why, Inspector? This is one time you're not going to blow anything in my face, pull any rugs out from under me, throw anything at me, or make any telephone calls, or anything else. Well. You're not going to get away from me this time, Blackie. I've got you right where I want you, for murder. Well, they say murder will out. And believe me, now that it is out, you're in. Now back to Boston Blackie. Duke Butcher stole the Worthington pearls and was forced to unload them into Boston Blackie's raincoat. Later, Blackie, while wearing his raincoat, was searched by Police Inspector Faraday. But Blackie had been warned that the pearls were in his pocket, and Faraday mysteriously failed to find the stolen goods. Still later, Duke Butcher came to Blackie's apartment demanding the pearls from Shorty. There was a fight, and Butcher was knocked out. Faraday arrived, but Blackie took him downstairs to give Shorty a chance to get rid of Butcher. A half hour later, Faraday and Blackie returned and find Duke Butcher still in Blackie's apartment, but murdered. As we continue our story, Faraday prepares to take Blackie down to headquarters. All right, Blackie. Come on, let's go. Won't you at least let me get my raincoat, Faraday? I said no tricks this time. Well, then you get my raincoat for me. What do you say? I say ha-ha, so you'll get a little wet. Come on. I've got a gun on you now. I'm going to keep it on you, and you're going to get moving. All right, Faraday. But if I go out into the rain without my coat, get wet, and die of pneumonia before you can send me to the electric chair, you'll be sorry. Yeah, I'm practically crying. I'll get your handkerchief. Get going, Blackie. Uh, you first? You first. I've got my gun sticking right in your back. Uh... A little higher, Faraday, and move it up and down a little bit. Oh, I like that. I said move. All right, I'm moving. You're pretty helpless when I don't give you a chance to pull one of your tricks, aren't you? Come on, move. This is one time you're not getting away. I figure this is one time he is. Well. Drop your gun, copper. What's sticking in your bag ain't no tootsie roll. Okay, I dropped it. That's the way to keep living, copper. Well, Blackie, I guess you win. But you had to have help from one of your pals. I've never seen this guy before in my life. What? And I don't want you turning around to look at me, copper. I think you could use some sleep. Look, if you think I'm... Well, I appreciate your motives, pal, but aren't your methods a little rough? The inspector's head isn't as hard as it looks. He'll sleep it off. But when he wakes up, he won't laugh it off. Thanks, though. I didn't slug that copper to do you any favors, Blackie. Let's go. Where to? I figure maybe you'd like a little ride in the country. A ride in the country? Well, it's good for the health, I hear. Yeah, generally. What's going to happen to you is going to make a monkey out of whoever said that. My, my, what a lovely day for a ride in the country. Enjoy yourself while you can. When you find out who I am and why I want you, you won't be so happy. How long do I have to wait for that exciting news? When we get to where we're going. You're sure we're going to get there? Look, Blackie, you might as well know it now. I can look in that rear view mirror, too. I see your pal Shorty following us. Oh, well, in that case, this is getting to be a little serious. I saw Shorty behind us the minute we pulled away from your apartment. He just driven up. I'll take care of him. What now, pal? See that little village up ahead? Yeah. When we get into it, I'm going to stop. Your pal Shorty's going to stop, too, a block behind us. He'll figure he's playing it smart. So? So I was going to pick up a couple of friends of mine in the village. But I'll send them back to ride with your pal Shorty instead. And then? Then we'll have Shorty join us at my place. It's going to be a nice little party. A party, huh? Well, why don't we go back to my apartment first and make this sort of a progressive party? Don't worry, Blackie. I'm making all the progress I need. <laughs> Hey, 
it, Blackie. Blackie, are you all right? I, uh... I think so, Shorty. I, I oh. think so. Hey, hey, boss, where are we? It's all dark. I can't say nothing but nothing. In a room in a, in a farmhouse, Shorty. Hey, boss, that, that pop on the head they gave me must have paralyzed me. I, I can't move nothing. <laughs> You're probably tied up, Shorty. I am. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can feel the ropes. Oh, that's different. Yeah. Boy, I feel bad. Whoever these mugs are, they certainly don't know who I am. I'll have us under these ropes so fast it'll make your hey, head... Hey, boss. The guy would bring you out here. You don't know who he is? I didn't ask him. He's one. He's scamming. No nice guy. Oh, I should have guessed that. He's after the Worthington Pearls. Well, sure he is, Blackie. He knew Duke Butcher stole him. Maybe he knew Butcher loaded him on me and that I gave him to you. That's fine. Gee, Blackie, I'm, I'm sure sorry I let Scanlon's hoods grab me. I was following you, so maybe I could give you some help. Well, we'll get out of here somehow, Shorty. Uh-oh. Here comes Scanlon. Hey, boss, if you can, I think you better get in the pearls. I Why can't give him... Is, is, he's well known by one north, and I can't what he does to a guy. I can't give him the pearls, Shorty. Why not? I'll tell you later. What did you tell him later? A bedtime story, Scanlon. Hope you boys don't mind the dark. Well, what we can see of it isn't bad. Still a wise guy, ain't you, Blanky? Big boys with little guns don't frighten me, Scanlon. Oh, Shorty told you who I am, huh? And I know what you want, too. The Worthington Pearl. You give up quicker than I thought you would. Hand him over, I'll let you go. I can't do it. Look, I know you haven't. And what if I don't? Well, we'll see how your pal Shorty here looks in black and blue. I don't let him scare you with that, boss. I don't bruise so easy. Can I hand over the pearls, Blackie? I don't know. Yeah, maybe if I kick Shorty around a little, it'll help you to find out. I owe you one for that, Scanlon. Believe me, I'll pay you off. But don't kick him again. Uh, that didn't hurt me none, boss. Don't tell him nothing. You better tell me everything, Blackie. The next one will hurt. Okay, Scanlon. I'll tell you where the pearls are, but you will have to worry about how to get them. Where are they? At police headquarters. You're lying. Blackie, you said Inspector Friday didn't find them. He didn't, Shorty. Before he got around to searching my raincoat, I sneaked the pearls into the tobacco jar in Inspector Faraday's desk. Okay, Blackie, you put them in police headquarters, now you get them out. I can't. If I show my face in police headquarters, I'll be looking through bars for the next ten years. Then figure out a way for me to get them out of Faraday's tobacco jar. Before I go to work on Shorty again. I'm kicked, boss. Nothing you can do. Wait a minute. You're from out of town, aren't you, Scanlon? So what? So I don't think Faraday knows you, does he? I'm not known to the cops anywhere. I'm too smart. Good. Yeah? You can walk into Faraday's office and walk out again, can't you? Sure. Then you can go for the pearls yourself. Now, how much sense does that make? I walk into a guy's office, reach into his tobacco jar, walk out again, he doesn't suspect anything. I thought you were smart, Blanky. I'll tell you how you can get into Faraday's tobacco jar without raising suspicion. It's better be good. I think you stole it. Go down to see Faraday and tell him you know where I am. That should make him your buddy. But to prove you know me, mention that I like to smoke his special tobacco in my pipe. And, uh... and that I want to try some, too, huh? Isn't that simple? Yeah. Yeah, that uh, ought to do it. If you play up the angle that I always did smoke his tobacco in my pipe. That sounds good. It's perfect. All you do then is reach inside his tobacco jar, fill your pipe, and palm the pearls. Okay, Blackie, but you better be on the level about this. If I'm not back inside of two hours, my pals have got orders what to do with you. Uh-oh. What kind of orders, Scanlon, old pal? I'll tell you what kind of orders, Shorty. And I'll also tell you all the good jokes I know, so we can die laughing. So, you're the famous Inspector Faraday I heard so much about. I'm glad to know you. I'm glad to know you, Scanlon, especially if you know where I can find Boston Blackie. Well, I don't know exactly, Inspector Faraday, but I have a rough idea. I'll give it to me and I'll smooth it out. I saw Blackie's car turn into a side road off Harrison Pike, ten miles north of the city limit. How do you know it was Blackie's car? Oh, I know Blackie pretty well. How well? I used to be a friend of his. Well, as long as it just used to be, okay. The road Blackie turned into goes dead end into the river, Inspector. I think you might catch it. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, oh. By the way, uh, Blackie told me once how much he liked your pipe tobacco. 
Oh, is that so? Yeah, yeah, I'm a nut on good pipe to back of myself. You mind if I try a pipe for me? No, help yourself. I've laid off smoking my pipe for a couple of weeks. Yeah, the tobacco's in this job. All right, thanks. Oh, great aroma. Hey, Inspector. What's that out in the street there? The beginning of a brawl? Huh? Where? I don't see anything. Those kids there screaming at each other. Oh, they're not doing anything wrong. They're just playing a new game. A new game? Screaming at each other? Yeah. <laughs> they call it Blackie Faraday. <laughs> I never heard of it. You want a light? I have one, thanks. Why do you like it? Oh, that's fine, fine. Blackie certainly knew what he was talking about. Yeah, he usually does. But don't ever tell him I said so. Nah. So long, Inspector. And when you catch Blackie, tell him I kind of like your tobacco, Joe. It had something, uh, different in it. But Blackie, Scala said his hoods were going to bump us if he, if he wasn't back in two hours. Is it, uh... Is it, is it two hours, sir? No, Shorty, I don't think so. Oh. oh, there must be a way out of here. Yeah, but where, boss? There ain't no windows, the door's locked, and Scanlon's hoods are right outside. Oh, I could get through the locked door, all right, but I don't know how to get through Scanlon's men without a gun. Oh, boss, somebody's opened a door. Oh, I hear. Boss, it's Scanlon. Hello, Blackie. Did you get pearls, Scanlon? Yeah, I got the pearls. Thanks a lot. I sure hate to double-cross the guy who was on the level with me, Blackie, but this is business. Don't move, either one of you. I'll have to let you have it right now. Hey, boss, he's got a gun. Don't worry, Charlie. He won't use it. He'll turn us over to his pals. They do all my killing for me. That's how they make a living. Well, I just put him out of business. What? Right, Inspector Mike, Faraday. Hey, Blackie, the joint's full of cops. All right, Scanlon, drop that gun or I'll drop you. Okay, okay. Faraday, for once in my life, I'm glad to see you. And for once in my life, I'm not kidding. Why did you follow me here, copy? You don't have anything on me. You'll get answers from me, Scanlon, when I get through with questions of my own. Take him down to headquarters, Rollins. You can't arrest him. Take him away, Rollins. Come give him a hand, Thompson. Look, I want to be booked right away. Uh, uh, wait a minute, Faraday. Don't you give me orders, Blackie. That's right, Faraday. Don't listen to him. I'm ready to go. Don't take Scanlon away just yet. Hold it a minute, boys. All right. Faraday, why did you follow Scanlon? Well, I'm not so dumb, Blackie. I knew Scanlon was up to something when he said you like my pipe tobacco. You don't smoke a pipe. Now he tells me. Faraday, you're wonderful. Scanlon is the playful little fellow who tapped you on the head when you were taking me to headquarters for the murder of Duke Butcher. Scanlon killed Butcher. You can't prove that. Oh, yes, I can. Duke Butcher was in my apartment looking for the Worthington pearls, which he'd stolen and then planted on Shorty. What? Let me finish before you start making arrests, Inspector. Come on, let me up. Scanlon was trying to hijack the pearls from Butcher. That's why he followed him to my apartment. Blackie, this better be good. This is very bad, Inspector. Because Scanlon found Butcher tied up Don't the way Shorty and I left him and killed him. When Butcher insisted, he didn't know who had the pearls. That's crazy. Just how crazy do you think it is, Inspector? Well, I don't know. If Scanlon killed Butcher because he didn't have the pearls, who has them now? Scanlon. That's huh? Mine. Scanlon has the pearls. Here, I'll show you. I'll search him myself, Blanky. Hold him, boys. Uh, Blanky, if this is another one of your... Well, I'll That's be... That's not a string of popcorn you're pulling out of Scanlon's pocket, Faraday. The Worthington Pearls. If Scanlon didn't get these from Butcher, where did he get them? From the tobacco jar in your office. What? How'd they get there? I put them there, Inspector, just before you searched me. You let me chase all over town for these pearls when all the time they were in the tobacco jar on my desk? That's right, Faraday. Put that in your pipe, but don't smoke it.
Hi. You have a first-class mechanic in this garage? Uh, I admit, mister. Grease monkey is all grease, no monkey. Well, I think this car of mine could stand some monkeying with. Huh. Can you leave it with me a while? Anything you say. Okay. Just leave it where it is. I'll move it. Thanks. Is this your car? Yes. Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. Nice car. Huh? Better give you a claim ticket. What's your name? Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie. Yeah. Now, you just keep this. If there's nothing serious the matter with your buggy, it ought to be ready for you by noon. Okay. I'll be back in three hours. Well, he's Boston Blackie. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to speak to the man in charge. Yes, the man. Inspector Faraday speaking. Uh, Inspector Faraday, this is the West Avenue garage. Well, what do you want me to do? Come down and fix a flat? Look, that car the police told us to look for just turned up here. A black convertible with the left front fender smashed in? Yes, sir. Don't let whoever owns it take it out. Last night, that car killed a woman. Now here's Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Wait here at the entrance, Mary. I'll walk into the garage office and see if the car's ready. I know, Blackie. You're ashamed to take me places. <laughs> Think so? Come on along, then. He's talking into it. Well, the three hours are up. My car ready? Oh, you're a Boston Blackie, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure, it's ready. This way. What was the matter with it? Oh, the engine needed a little tuning, that's all. What do I owe you? Uh, three bucks. Okay. Hey, uh, the rest is for you. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, the keys are right in the ignition switch there. Thanks. Get in, Mary. After you, my pet? <laughs> So long. So long. Hey, mister. Going my way? Depends on which way you're going. Your way. All right, Blackie. Pull over to the curb. Oh, not you. Inspector Faraday, what are you doing in the back of the car? Pull over there, Blackie, and stop. Faraday, stop pointing that gun. It's liable to go off before you go out. What do you want with Blackie, Inspector? You know better than to ask me questions, Miss Wesley. Okay. He has such trouble with the answers, Mary. Now, what's this all about, Faraday? Don't play dumb, Blanky. I caught it from you, only you weren't playing. What is it this time, arson, robbery, or murder? You're taking me down to headquarters, of course. Uh, sorry, Miss Wesley, you'll have to get out. Oh, Inspector Faraday, please, listen to reason. Look. Maybe you'd better do what he says, Mary. Be a good girl. Good for what? Running out on you when you're in trouble? Go on, Miss Wesley, get out. Oh, all right. Uh... Take a taxi home, Mary, and I'll phone you as soon as our non-paying passenger is through with me. Very funny. Yes, Miss Wesley. Will you, you mean don't go through any red lights with a policeman in the car? <laughs> All right. Get going, Blanky. Where to, Master? Get going. Yes, sir. Bye, Mary. Bye. Which route to headquarters shall I take, Master? None. Drive around the corner and stop. Faraday, do you feel all right? I feel fine. Turn here and stop. You're the boss. Now cut your engine. Alone at last, huh? Now, look, this is nothing to make wisecracks about. Sorry. If you want me to get into the proper mood, take the finger you have on me and point out what I've done now. Blanky, last night this car of yours hit and killed Carolyn Forbes. What? It was this car that killed her, Blanky. Witnesses described it perfectly. Faraday, doesn't it occur to you that there are other black convertibles in this town? Yeah, but I don't think you'll find any other with such a peculiar dent on the left front fender. Huh? Get out and take a look. I certainly will. Wait, I'll go out with you. Come on. Well, I suppose you're going to tell me somebody backed into your car last night and smashed this fender. I don't know how it was smashed, Inspector. It hit and killed Carolyn Forbes at 11 o'clock last night. All right, I'll take your word for it. But I wasn't driving my car last night. I know you weren't. Your car was stolen. Sorry, Faraday, my car couldn't have been stolen because I only have one set of car keys and they were in my pocket last night. Well, then the, the, the locks on your car were forced. Sorry for the second time, Faraday. If they had been, I'd have noticed it this morning. Oh, fine. 
As usual, you have to complicate things. Well, then why don't you simplify them your usual way? Just arrest me and close the case. Oh, no, Blackie. This is one time I know you're not guilty. This was a hit-and-run accident. And if there's one thing I know you wouldn't do, it's run away. Well, my car killed this Forbes girl. And by law, I'm responsible. By law, yes. But I'm only one member of the police force. And what strange meaning is behind that peculiar crack? You've managed to get away from me before. Why don't you get away from me now and find out what this is all about? And become a fugitive from justice? Oh, no. I never do a thing as naughty as that. So help me, Blanky. One of these days... All I'll... right, Faraday. It'll make you any happier. I'll go get to the bottom of this. But I don't want to take any more orders from you. Why not? I'm head man in this investigation. When I go to the bottom of things, I start at the top. <laughs> well, it is certainly a surprise turn of events, isn't it, Dan? I suppose there's a certain amount of justice, son. Yeah, yeah, but the justice we're going to get is a funny big amount. We should get an easy million and a half from Sister's Will. It was a lucky uh, accident, of uh, course. Uh, it's getting late. We'll be better get ready. Oh, Dad, I didn't show any respect for Carolyn when she was alive. Why pretend to respect her now? I'm just as unconcerned about her death as you are, but for appearances' sake, we'd better be. With the money we're coming into, why do we care about appearances? The services won't take long. Uh, how uh, long will it take to get the money? A whole lot longer than it'll take to bury Carolyn. Yes, yes, it would. Yes? Oh, you're both in here. Well, Tom, are you leaving today? Yes, right now. I just came in to say goodbye. Well, Mr. Wellington, now that you can't marry my daughter, what are you going to do for money? I'll manage. To do what, Tom? Find some other girl with money and get yourself engaged to her? Nothing wrong in falling in love with a rich girl, is there, Bill? Not if you can find one who has full control of her fortune. <laughs> you hated her for that, didn't you? Both of them. But you uh, loved her for it. A fine family you are. Maybe it's just as well Carolyn's did. Even if I'd married her, you two would have made her life miserable. Anybody home? Who's that? It's not a familiar voice. Is anybody home? Uh, someone must have wanted in the front door. It was open. The service in the back. Uh, Bill, you'd better go see who it is. Uh, uh, never mind. I'll... Uh, hey, you. Looking for someone? Yeah, Carolyn Forbes' family. They're in here. Thanks. What? Sorry to intrude, but it's important. Don't apologize to me. Oh, I care. You can walk in here 20 times a day. Are you Bill Forbes, Carolyn Forbes? No, I'm Bill Forbes. If you've uh, come to see my sister, down to the morgue, she's dead. Yes, I know she's dead. That's why I'm here. What's to you? I'm Boston Blackie. Last we night, don't Mike... know anyone by the name of Boston Blackie, and people we do know are not in the habit of coming into this house unannounced. Good day, sir. You're, uh... Mr. Forbes, aren't you? And I'm ordering you out of my house. He's Mr. Forbes, all right, Blackie. And he's ordering you around to see what it feels like to be able to give orders in his own house. Who are you? I'm Tom Wellington. And he's leaving with you, uh, Blackie. Tom Wellington, huh? You were going to marry Carolyn Forbes, weren't you? We're not in the mood for questions, young man. I don't want to have to ask you to leave again. What right have you to come in here and ask us questions? I'm in the mood for my questions, not yours, Bill. If you want to know anything about my daughter's death, go to the police. I have to know more than the police know about your daughter's death, Mr. Forbes, or I'll go to jail for a murder. Murder? I knew it. I knew it was murder. My sister was a conceited, self-centered, selfish fool. If someone murdered her, I'm not surprised. That's fine talk. Maybe the wrong member of the Forbes family was killed. Just what makes you think my daughter was murdered? The police say it was an accident. I have my reasons. What makes you think you have a right to have reasons? Because it was my car that killed her, and I wasn't driving it. Uh -huh. Is that any worry of ours? It may be. If I can prove that either you or your father borrowed my car last night. Why would we do that? To kill Carolyn Ford. Why would we kill her? For her money. Oh, that's much too simple. We'd be fools to do such an obvious thing. Uh, why not see if there isn't a reason why Tom here might have killed Carolyn? Oh, now, what could I gain? I can't see where you'd gain anything, Mr. Wellington. You're broke, I understand. Just about. You'd stand a profit from Carolyn Forbes only if she lived to marry you. I want to warn you, Mr. Forbes, and your son, too. I'm going to ask the police to investigate both of you. Bill, take Mr. Boston Blackie to the door. Yes, Father. 
Come on, get out. Don't bother to show me the way. I can find the door. I wish it was as simple to find your sister's murderer. Obvious is a bad joke, Mary. Either the father or Bill, the brother, killed Carol Fort. But why, Gracie? For money? Why not? She held the purse string. What about the fiancé? Well, he had to marry her to get her money. That seems to whitewash him. But, um, was she really going to marry him? Of course. Well, well, how do you know something didn't happen to that romance? Maybe he's already married, and she found out about it. Would he kill her for that? Well, no, but... But nothing. He had no motive. When a rich person is murdered, it's generally for money. That's almost a rule. Well, couldn't this be an exception to the rule? Maybe this Tom Wellington had been running up a lot of bills on the strength of the fact that he was marrying into the Forbes Million. Then Carolyn found out about it, became angry, and broke the engagement. Look, Mrs. Sherlock Holmes, you're beginning to make sense. And uh, one more thing, Watson. Elementary? Oh, very, very. In all good murder stories, this is back in my own voice, who always turns out to be the real killer? The one who looks the most innocent. And who looks perfectly innocent in The Murder of the Millionaire? Tom Wellington. But maybe he never read any detective stories. He is it. Yeah. Yes, that may be right, Mary. In fact, I know it's right. Well, see. Wellington was awfully pleased when I accused the elder Forbes and the brother. And what's more, Wellington looked like the weak sister type who'd borrow money from a, from a rich girl with no thought of paying it back. Come on. Where are we going? Back to the Forbes mansion. Wellington may still be there. And I... oh, now what? Oh, shut I'll go see who it is. Hello, Miss Wesley. Blanky here. Inspector Faraday, come in. Faraday, I think I have your killer for you. The fiancé, Tom Wellington. Why? Check into his background, and you'll find out he did something Carolyn Forbes didn't like. Then she broke the engagement, and so he killed her. You know, I helped Blanky solve this case, didn't I, do? Yes, you'll have to thank us both for this one, Faraday. Well, I'll thank you both to crawl under a couple of stones. Or find me a killer I can send to jail. Huh? What's the matter? Carolyn Forbes' little private murder has turned into a free-for-all. I've got myself another body. Who? Tom Wellington. We're... Wellington? Oh, that's not fair, Blackie. He was supposed to be our killer. How do you like that guy? He never read enough detective stories to be a killer, so he winds up a corpse. And now, back to Boston Black. Carolyn Forbes, wealthy heiress, is fatally injured by someone driving Boston Blackie's car. And all evidence points to deliberate murder. But how the murdered managed to get Blackie's car is a mystery. There's only one set of keys, and it was in Blackie's pocket. After a visit to the dead girl's family, Blackie sees conclusive evidence that the murder was committed by Tom Wellington, her fiancé. But just as Blackie's about to tell Faraday that the case is solved, he receives the news that Wellington, too, is dead. A second victim of murder. As our story continues, Inspector Faraday is explaining to Blackie and Mary Wesley the circumstances of Wellington's death. Yes, Blackie, Tom Wellington's dead. We fished his body out of the river just two hours ago. Look, Faraday, are you sure it was Wellington's body? We got positive identification from somebody who ought to know. Who? His sister, Florence Wellington. Florence Wellington, Inspector? Well, that's the name of the switchboard operator in this building. It's the same girl, too, Miss Wesley. That's why I happen to be up here. Oh, she must be off. Oh, yeah. Maybe there's something we can do for her, Mary. Ah, uh, she seems to be okay. She and her brother were anything but palsy wowsy When she uh, identified him in the morgue, it was the first time she'd seen him in two years. Well, but just the same, I think we should be something for her, don't you think so, Mary? Yes, I'll go see her. Nobody especially enjoys having a relative murdered. Say, uh... How was he killed, Harney? Well, I'm waiting for a coroner's report on that now. Uh, there, there were no marks on the body. Well, either old man Forbes or Bill Forbes must know something. And I'm going to find out why. I'll see you later, Mary. Oh, look, Blackie, you will stop by and see Florence, won't you? All right. Where is she, Harney? At headquarters? No, she's at home. I'll see her, but the way she feels about her brother, I don't know whether to offer condolences or uh, congratulations. <laughs> Nice of you to come to see me, Blackie, but, but it wasn't necessary. Is there anything you need, Florence? You've done a lot of little favors for me. 
Maybe I can return them now, all wrapped up in one big favor. No, Blackie. Thanks just the same. What have I ever done for you but see that Miss Wesley got everything you left for? Well, if you do need anything, you know where to get in touch with me or with Mary Wesley. She'll do anything she can. Thanks. You're both very nice. Florence, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Well, of course not. You and your brother weren't close at all. Could you tell me the reason? He wanted things I didn't care about, I guess. Money, social position. He, he was ashamed of me because I worked. He drew away from you, then? Yes. I might have ruined his chances of marrying into the Forbes family. Or any other family that had money. Didn't you ever see your brother? Two years ago, I met him on a train. That was the last time we spoke. Oh, I saw him on the street once in a while, but that was all. Did your brother have any enemies, Florence? Why do you ask that? Answer my question first. Suppose everyone as ambitious as Tom has made enemies. But I didn't know any of them. Or his friends either. Do you think anyone hated your brother enough to murder him? No. No, I don't. Think, Florence. Did he ever get in anybody's way uh, financially, socially? I don't know. Well, Tom may have been cruel and selfish, but he didn't deserve to be killed. Well, don't worry, Florence. Whoever killed him will get what he deserves. Well, Mary, first I saw Florence Wellington, and what she knew you could put inside a small zero. Oh, shucks. But what about Mr. Forbes and his son? Did you see them too, Blackie? Uh-huh. And there I got something. Not one confession, but two. Two? Believe it or not, Mary, they both confessed to the murder of Carolyn Forbes and Tom Wellington. Well, Blackie, which one did it, Bill or the father? I don't know. But one of them is guilty. They confessed to protect each other. Obviously. Yes, but which one did it? If I don't find out soon, I'll be Faraday's suspect. It was my car that killed the Forbes girl. But even Inspector Faraday knows you were right. Say... What Faraday knows is about all a jury would need to convict me. Oh, please, Blackie, be serious, darling. Well, why, this thing is ridiculous. I usually break my neck to find a killer, and the first time I get a voluntary confession, I get two. <laughs> and I don't know which to believe. Oh. If that's Faraday at the door, tell him we don't want any. Okay, but Blackie, we've got to think of something. I know, but what? Hello, Miss Wesley. Oh, Florence. Hello. Come on in. Thanks. Uh, Blackie, it's Florence Wellington. Hello, Florence. Oh, say, you're going somewhere. Yes, yes, I, I am, Blackie. I'm going out to the country for a while. I think you're doing very wise. Well, I thought it was best to get away. I wouldn't go too far away if I were you, Florence. There may be a great deal of police investigation into your brother's death, you know. Yes, I, I know. Maybe you'd better leave us your address in case you're needed. Well, I really don't know where I'm going yet, but I'll come back soon. You better. Who else can I trust to take care of all the candy and the flowers and all the other wonderful presents I bring to Miss Wesley when she's in home? Oh, oh, I wondered why you always brought me things when I wasn't home. <laughs> so you could stop and talk to Florence, wasn't it? Oh, gee, the secret's out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm leaving town in just 20 minutes, so I'd better hurry. Well, now, look, you, you will let us hear from me, won't you? I will. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye, and, and thanks for everything. Hmm. That's strange, wasn't it? Very. Did she say anything about leaving town when you saw her earlier today? That's what's so strange about it. Blackie, you don't think that... I think worse than that. Is she the one? Oh, of course not. But she's in trouble of some kind. Danger, maybe. She may have been threatened because she knows something. Who killed her brother, maybe? You think she knows that? I think she knows something. I'll call you when I know what it is. Blackie, where are you going? Wherever Florence Wellington is going. And if you remember, she didn't know where that might be. Hello, Florence. Blackie. Is going to an old brownstone on 117th Street, what you call going to the country? Go away, Blackie, please. You shouldn't have followed me. Now that I know you were lying about going to the country, I know I should have followed you. But I am leaving for the country from here. Florence. Blackie, come down the street with me and I'll... Oh, no. No, no. You're in trouble. And whatever the trouble is, it is in that house. Blackie, please, let's leave. No. I'm going to lean on this doorbell till someone answers. Blackie, please, you'll only... Come on in, Florence. Tom hey. Wellington. Oh, no, you don't close that door on me. <laughs> you fool, why'd you let this guy come... He didn't let me in. I got this idea myself. There. All right. 
You're in the door, but that's as far as you're going to get. Tom, please, put away that gun. I'll put it away when I put a couple of slugs into your boyfriend here. Oh, this is semi big surprise. Wait till Faraday finds out that body in the river wasn't yours. I'll wait. Tom, please, you've done enough harm already. Sir. I'll say you've done enough harm. Who did you kill and dump in the river for your sister to identify as you? I didn't kill anyone. I stole a body from the moor. <laughs> wait till Faraday hears that. Uh, he's not going to hear it from you. No, uh, you're going to tell him yourself. I'm not telling him anything. Well, uh, will you tell me something? I just do things. I don't talk about it. I'll tell you, Blackie. He killed Carolyn Gorham. Shut up. I suppose you'll say I helped him kill her, Blackie, but I didn't. I he made... Shut up. Maybe you'd better not tell me anything, Barnes. Not just yet. But I want to tell you. I gave Tom the keys to your car. And you left your key for Miss Wesley several times, Mark. and Tom told me you needed a car badly, for, for business reasons. Shut up, Florence. I made a wax impression of the keys to your car one night when you left them for Miss Wesley. And later I had a set of keys made from the impression. Florence, I told you to... Florence, you'd better save the rest of Faraday. There isn't going to be any rest of hell. Because, little sister, you're going to rest in peace. Get out of here. Florence, get out of here and take care of this. Let go of me, Black. You're a king of two. Tom, no! So I admit. It only takes one to... Tom, don't. Keep back, Florence. I'll make him drop his gun. Get away from me, Blackie, or you'll get one of these bullets. Ah! Now try to tell Blackie the whole story. And tell him how it feels to be full of lead. You don't shoot straight, Wellington, but you shoot often enough to make up for it. Is she dead? She is. I killed two girls. In two days, and for two different, different reasons. I know why you killed your sister. Why did you kill Carolyn Forbes? She found out I was running up bills, which I was going to pay when I married her. She was going to call up our engagement and tell her friends why. The phony has found out, huh? I had you tagged from the start. That body you borrowed threw me off the track. Well, you may be on the right track now, but you've come to the end of the line. Yeah, but there's a switch. Oh, I don't think there is. I can do the same to you I did to Florence. Not unless you have another gun. Stay back. I'll shoot you. With what? You saw what this gun did to Florence. I know what it did to Florence. That's why you can't do anything to me with it. Stay back or I'll kill you. Go ahead. Pull the trigger. You think I'm scared? You think I'm scared? I'll show you. What's the matter, Wellington? Uh, What's the matter? Don't uh, you know how to use a gun? It's me. I don't think so. It's empty. It is empty. That's right, Wellington. That's right. You were so anxious to kill your sister, you forgot to save a bullet for me. You dropped that gun, Wellington. I'll you. Well, what do you call it? I hope you have pleasant dreams, Wellington. You'll need them. Because when you wake up, you're going to be looking at Inspector Paradise. Blackie, what did Faraday say when he found that the body identified as Tom Wellington had been dead 72 hours? Well, what he usually says in a spot like that, nothing. Oh, did, um, did Wellington confess to Faraday that he killed Carolyn Ford? He confessed everything, including the fact that his sister made a duplicate of my car keys when I left them here for you. Oh, well, I suppose that will be the end of that. The end of what? You won't let me borrow your car again. And leave the keys with the girl at the desk downstairs. I should say not. Hey, um, let's go for an automobile ride. Now, where did you get that idea? I don't know. Maybe it was Otto's suggestion. Ooh. Oh.
Brewing Company, brewers of R and H beer, the beer with a barrel of quality in every glass, presents Boston Blackie, starring Richard Calmer. Well, Blackie, it's about time. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. I left the apartment without my wallet and had to go back for it. Have you ordered? No, I was afraid I'd have to wash dishes if it didn't show up. All I have with me is 15 cents. But you have your smile. That should pay for the most expensive breakfast in town. I tried it <laughs> once. Did it work? No, I did. Washing dishes. <laughs> Well, let's see. What's good for breakfast on such a cheerful morning? Who's cheerful? I am. Just because I promised to meet you for breakfast. Oh, Blackie, you're sweet. Well, if you must know, Mary, this is why I'm cheerful. What's that? What does it look like? A very lavender envelope. With a very lavender odor about it, too. All right, all right. Who is she? The return address on the envelope says Anne Martin. Old flame of yours? Not even an old ember. <laughs> She's the wife of one of Shorty's old gangster pals, Harry Martin. Well, forgive my woman's curiosity, but why is she writing lavender letters to you? I don't know. I haven't opened it yet. Mind if I do? I'll mind if you don't. Excuse me. I will not. You're going to read that aloud. Maybe I'd better read it in a whisper. Oh, what does she say? Um, dear Boston Blackie. I could have guessed that much, but what does she want? Besides you. Well, let's see. Uh, nothing important, Mary. Just $50,000. It's very nice of you to answer my letter so soon, Blackie. I thought you would. But I didn't expect such a lovely drive in the country, too. Your request this morning for $50,000 sort of uh, stifled me, Anne. I thought the country air would do us good. Well, I guess I'd better explain. That's not a bad idea. I don't want you to give me $50,000. I'm talking about the money my husband put away before he went to jail. You remember my husband, don't you, Blackie? Harry, sure. He liked you, Blackie. I thought he might have told you where he put that 50000 Which 50000 The money he and the gang got in that Berkeley City job. He died in prison last year, you know. Yes, but I don't know what he did with the money, and even if that money is found, the police have a priority on it. Well, you can't blame a girl for trying. I guess we better go back to town. All right. What's on the radio Saturday afternoon? Turn it on, see. Thanks. No, not that one, Ann. Uh, that's my police radio. Two-way at that. Oh, I'm sorry. That's which then. Right. What are you doing with a two-way radio? Playing policeman professionally? Oh, this radio is no joke. I bought it myself, and it comes in handy in a case every now and then. You're becoming a regular Boy Scout, aren't you? Oh, I really never used the thing except the laughs when Faraday's men are looking for me. Then I cut in and answered them back. <laughs> Policeman's little helper, aren't you? Let me tell you something right now, Boston Blackie. If I ever find Harry's money and you go to the cops, I have friends who will take care of you. Tell them not to bother, Ann. I can take care of myself. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Mary, did that come out of you? You just wait, Blackie, till you read what happens to the hazards of Hannah. You, uh, bring me the Sunday papers and then sit over there and read them yourself. That's very nice of you. I can't wait for Sunday. I like my thrills in color. Uh, hey, you want me to read you the hazards of Hannah? No, thanks. I'm not hep to Hannah's hazards. Ignorant, aren't you? Oh, here's something not in the funny papers that may be a joker just the same on page one. What? Jack Winters, Bob Talmadge, and Esther Brown are back in town after spending several years at Uncle Sam's mansion up the river. And who are Jack Winters and, uh, so forth? Well, I don't think you know them socially, Mary. They uh, came from the far side of the wrong side of the tracks. Well, then how do you happen to know them? I've been hopping back and forth over those tracks all my life. They were pals of Harry Martin's. And who is Harry Martin? Before he died in jail last year, he was Ann Martin's husband. 
Oh, oh, and Ann Martin is the girl you saw yesterday who wanted you to tell her where her husband hid his $50,000. Yes. And it's just possible that there's a connection between Ann Martin wanting to find out where her husband's money is hidden and the release of Harry's old pals. How? Well, Harry Martin was a pretty smart guy. He undoubtedly told just one of the three where he hid the 50000 and I think Ann, his wife, knows he did, too. Why do you think that? Ann found out her husband's old pals were going to be released from prison and knew that as soon as they got to town, whichever one knew where the money was would go and get it. Oh, I see. So she thought that maybe through you she could get to the money before the others got out of jail, huh? Well, that's what it looks like to me. That's an angle, anyhow. Read your funnies. I'll be back soon. Where are you going? To see Ann again about this new angle. Ann Martin again, huh? You stay away from her, Blackie. You get a kick out of the hazards of Hannah, don't you? Well, I'm getting interested in the angles of Anne. What are you thinking about, Esther? Mm, it's good to be out of jail, Jack. Eating real food, breathing real air. Good. It's going to be perfect. Maybe. Say, I wonder where Bob is. I don't know. Where'd you go, Esther? None of your business. You were gone a long time. What's that to you? Nothing, I guess. I wasn't gone as long as you think. I came back for a few minutes and you were out. Where were you? Out. Doing a little asking around. About what? Your business is your business. My business is mine. Let's keep it that way, Esther. Maybe we better, huh? Yeah. Jack, look. Look who's walking down the street. Where? Crossing this way, going toward the alley. Hey, that guy looks familiar. Yeah. It's Boston Blackie. What's he doing down in this neighborhood? I don't know. We better find out, huh? Leave the waitress a buck. Let's stuck out the side way and meet him in the alley. Okay, let's go. I've been wanting to meet that guy down here in my territory for a long time. Easy, Esther, easy. Here he comes. Uh, easy, Esther. Don't do anything you'd be sorry for. Shut up. Hello, Blackie. Well, Esther Brown, I just read about you getting out of jail. Don't reach for your gun, Blackie. There are two of us. And Jack Winters. I want fancy meeting you here. What are you doing down here, Blackie? Oh, just looking around. For trouble, maybe? You know I don't have to look for trouble, Jack. Trouble comes to me. What do you mean by that? Nothing. Have you been up to see Ann Martin yet? No. Why should we? He knows why we might, Esther. That means he knows too much. No, not yet. But I'm going up to see Ann and find out what there is to know. I don't think you ought to. I didn't ask for your advice. Then maybe we ought to fix you so you won't need it. You swing fast, Jack, but not hard enough. Well, Jack won't wake up for a while, I guess. I seem to have a lullaby left hand. And now I think I can go and see Anne without interference. Anne. Anne, open up. Hello, Anne. Faraday. Hello, blanky old pal. Come in. Why, thanks, but... Hey, now, wait a minute. What's the gag? Is there a body in there? Why don't you come in and see? What? And, and I have to go through a long routine to get away from you? Oh, no. So long, Faraday. All right, Blanky. Stay where you are. It's that man again with that gun again. And it's you again with a body again. Get in here. And you better make up your story. You're going to need a good one. Awfully quiet in here, Faraday. Is this a murder scene? How could it be with no photographers, fingerprint men, or the coroner? They're gone. And where's the body? It's gone, too. I've missed all the fun, haven't I? How was she killed? How did you know it was a she? A she lived here, didn't she? I found bodies in your apartment that weren't yours. Good point, Inspector. One of these days, maybe it will be my body. Then what are you going to do to keep your job on the force? I'll worry about that happy day when it comes. Faraday, are you really putting your gun away? Yeah, what about it? 
Don't tell me you're going to admit that sometime, somewhere, there's a murder I didn't commit. You listen to me, Blanky. I put my gun away because just once I want to see what kind of a man you are. My gun seems to make you want to try to get away. Try, Inspector? All right, all right. When I pull my gun on you, you always escape. Or maybe this time, with my gun put away, we can talk this thing out and no tricks. I hate to spoil your fun, Inspector, but this is one time I have no intention of running from you. Yeah? Why? Oh, well, I'm just tired of it. What happens when I duck you? I, I not only have to avoid every cop in town, but I have to solve the case for you to clear myself. No, that's too much trouble. Well, at last you're coming to your senses. What are you coming to, Faraday? The reason you killed Ann Martin. Did you find it out all by yourself? Oh, it didn't take much to find out. You saw Ann Martin yesterday afternoon. The whole neighborhood was talking about that car of yours. What should I have done to pick Ann Martin up? Driven down in a coal truck? Then you admit you saw her yesterday afternoon. I admit, Faraday. Yesterday afternoon from 2 o'clock until about 5.30. All right, that's fine. It now, comes under the heading of so what in my book. She was alive then. We've already established the time of death between the hours of 8 p.m. and 12 midnight Saturday. Then I suppose if I tell you exactly what I was doing in that time, you'll let me go and the fun will be over. Oh, no, Blackie. You don't get out of this, not even with a perfect alibi, ten witnesses and 37 affidavits. My, but you sound convincing. But I'm sorry, Faraday, I didn't kill Ann Martin. Who did? I don't know, but give me 24 hours this side of the bars and... I'll not only get your killer for you, but the $50,000 Harry Martin stole before he went to jail. You're still looking for it. I happen to know that. What's the gag, Blanky? Gag? What's the idea of asking for 24 hours? You usually take it. Only when you have a gun on me. Okay, Blanky, get out of here. But I'm holding you to those 24 hours. You won't get one minute more. Now beat it before I change my mind. You mean you don't think I could get away from you if I wanted to? No, I'm letting you go. No, if you'd made one false move while we were talking, I'd have shot you in your tracks. Now, get out of here. You would have shot me, huh? Oh, Faraday, catch. Whatever it is, I don't want it. I think you can use it, Faraday. It's your gun. And Martin wife of a dead gangster arranged a meeting with Blackie to find out from him if he knew the whereabouts of $50,000 hidden by her husband Harry before he went to prison. Blackie didn't know. Next day, Blackie noticed in the newspaper that Harry Martin's gangster pals had just been released from jail and realized that Ann Martin came to him for information about the missing money in hopes that she could get it before Harry's old friends. Following this lead, Blackie went to Ann Martin's apartment to be informed by Inspector Faraday that she had been murdered. Faraday gave Blackie 24 hours to clear himself of implication in Ann Martin's death. And as we return to our story, it's early the next morning, and Faraday's been chasing Blackie in a police car. Blackie, Inspector Faraday's car just turned the corner. Fine guy, that Faraday. He promises to leave me alone for 24 hours, and I have to waste half that time hiding from him in doorways. We better move, Mary. He might come back. Yes, that's right. Where are we going? You're going home. I'm going to follow that lead we got from Shorty. Well, you think you ought to go down in that neighborhood alone? I'd rather go down there alone and have people stare at me than for us to go down there together and have people whistle at you. Well, I'm the one that should mind. Well, the trouble with you is you don't mind. You turn around and say thank you. What's wrong with that? It's part of a woman's job to make yourself attractive to men. Job, huh? I get it. They whistle while you work. <laughs> All right, you go home and be a nice little girl while I run back down to the riverfront and pretend I'm a bad little boy. How's the jaw, Jack? Quit worrying about it, Bob. It's okay. I tell you, Jack, you shouldn't have swung on Blackie like that. He can give us trouble. Hello, boys. Oh, hi, Esther. Hi. Okay. Now that I'm here, let's get down to business. Well... Don't mind me. I, uh, I want to hear this. Hmm. Blackie. Well, Bob Talmadge and Jack Winters, too. Isn't this cozy? What do you want? You remember Harry Martin, don't you, Esther? Sure. But so what? He died in jail a year ago. But he had a wife. You know, our friend Ann Martin. Maybe that's what killed him. Then what killed his wife? Grief, probably. Maybe she's a late mourner. 
Ann Martin's dead? As of last night, Jack. She'll get used to it after a while. Now, which one of you killed her? Ain't any of us seen Ann Martin since we got back. I doubt that. But I'm going to give all three of you a break. Ann Martin was killed Saturday night between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight. Now, let's have your alibis. All right, Jack. Where were you Saturday night between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight? I went to Westfield to see some friends. Bud Thomas and his wife. They weren't home, so I come back. Very convenient of them. All right. You, Wester. Where were you? I was up at 191st Street in the park. Doing what? Ducking squirrels? I was there at 9. It takes a long time to get back and forth. A horse ran away just about the time I got there. That's easily checked. How about you, Bob? I was to the movies at 86th and River Road. What was showing? A double feature. The Call of Africa, and believe me not, there was a newsreel and a cartoon. What was in the newsreel? Well, the usual stuff. A launch and some new styles and hats, new inventions, some pictures of the president. You got our alibis. We weren't near Ann when she got killed. Now beat it, will you? Sure, I'll beat it. But there'll be a murder rap against one of you for killing Ann Martin. And you'll have to beat that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Goodbye. Well, that's the last of the phone calls, Blackie. Bob Talmadge's alibi is solid, too. The movie theater said they showed a double feature and a newsreel last night. Well, all three of our suspects seem to be in the clear, don't they? Blackie, is this going to be one of those murders where you almost begin to think you did it? No, Mary. I think I know who killed Ann Martin. What? But I promised Faraday the $50,000, too. And the killer has to lead me to the money. Well, what are you doing in my office, Blanky? Have you come to admit you killed Ann Martin? No, Inspector Faraday. I wouldn't make you that happy. Well, two hours from now, I'm going to make myself happy. I'm going to lock you up. Ha, ha. You're a regular clock watcher, aren't you, Faraday? No wonder you never accomplish anything. Why, why you could be on a, the, the pot on the trail of a killer and quit at the 5 o'clock whistle. I'm quitting on you at the end of 24 hours. That's all I promised you. And you got just two hours left. I came down here to ask for more time, Faraday. Nothing doing. Oh, but plenty's doing. I know you're a killer. Then why do you need more time? Well, I, I, I want to get that $50,000 for you, too. Two hours is all you get. And if you don't have this thing solved by that time, you'll get the rest of your life. Who is it? Boston Blackie. Oh, for the... Let him in, Jack. Okay. I don't know why we have any truck with this bum, Mister. Shut up, Bob. Come in. Thanks. Now what do you want, Blackie? I want to make a deal. What do you mean, deal? One of you knows where Harry Martin hid his money. Whoever knows that is the one who killed Ann, too. Now, I know who that is. I'd like to share that 50000 I'd like a share of it to keep my mouth shut. Oh, well, now ain't that nice. Is it worth it to the killer to spend 25000 and go free? And, uh... Just so there won't be any double crossing. I'll meet Ann's killer at the old mill on Mill Creek Road at 11 o'clock tonight. Then if the killer will lead me to Harry Martin's 50000 I'll take half the money and forget the whole thing. I hope Ann's killer is smart enough to tell time. I said 11 o'clock and I don't like to wait even for 25000 bucks. Well... Do we have to sit here and stare at each other? He may not know anything. Yeah, yeah, sure, that's what I think. He's bluffing. Look, all we got to do is stick together, and he won't be able to do anything to any of us. That is, if one of us did kill Ann Martin. Hey, uh, I just remembered. I got to go meet some fellas. Funny time to remember, Jack. I'll uh, see you later. So long. Uh, what time is it, Esther? Nine o'clock. Oh. Oh, that reminds me. And hey, where are you going? I got an appointment, too. Well, ain't that pretty? All of a sudden, everybody has to go someplace. I won't be gone long. Uh, stick together, she said. 
They don't wait two minutes before they leave me stuck. You killed Ann Martin. You said you'd meet your killer here. And you'd like to meet him too, wouldn't you, Esther? Sure. Wouldn't you? I want to know where that dough is. Maybe this is your answer coming up the path. It's Jack. He killed Ann. And he knows where the money is. Does he? Hey, Blackie. Guess you just figure this means it. Esther, what are you doing here? She's here for the same reason you are, Jack. To hear the killer tell me where the money is. Bob killed Ann? I didn't say that. It could have been you. I think you're bluffing, Blackie. I know he is. Shakin's Bob. Hey, Blackie. Here, Bob. Okay, Blackie. Prove to me that I... Hello, Bob. We figured to split that money three ways, Bob. What are you two doing here? Everybody wants a piece of that 50000 Bob. I don't know where it is. All right, Bob. Unless you pay your way out of this jam, you'll have to pay for killing Ann Martin. What makes you think I killed her? Your alibi had a hole in it, Bob. I told you what movie I went to. If you check, you'd know those pictures were playing there Saturday night. But you said you saw a cartoon. Yeah, I did. Not Saturday night, Bob. Maybe you've been in jail too long to know this, but on Saturday night, movie houses throw out the cartoon to get in the extra late show. I tell you I was there. I know you killed Ann Martin, Bob. But, uh, my deal still goes. Uh, you want... 25000 of Harry's 50, huh? You want to talk it over with your pals? I want to talk it over plenty. Me too. All right. Go over there. Get in my car. Talk in privacy all you want. I'll wait here till you come to a decision. Come on, Bob. Okay. Get in. Both of you. Okay, yeah. Okay. That one spill to us, Bob. Does Blackie have the right dope on you? Go ahead, Bob. We can beat this rap together. Did you kill her? Yeah. What'd she try to do? Hone in on Harry's dough? Yeah, she said she knew where it was. Unless I'd split it with a 50-50, she'd go to the cops about it. Maybe she was lying, but I couldn't take any chances. And you know all the time where the dough was. You were going to get it without telling us. Shut up, sure. Jack. Bob's the only one of us who knows where the dough is. I'm going to give Blackie half the money to let me go. No, you're not. Going out there and let Blackie have a little lead poisoning. We've all got guns. Now, where's the money, Bob? Where is it? Okay, take your hands off me. Come on, come on, where is it? It's in a box bearing the Alton Cemetery near the first big tree off the road. Okay. Okay is right. We split the dough three ways. We don't cut Blackie in? We cut Blackie down. Come on. And put your guns till you're right on him. He's pretty good with a gun himself. Well, so the conference is over. What goes? You do. Let him have it, boys. Okay, Blackie, you're through. I'm going to play. Hey, where's my gun? I don't have my gun. I don't have mine. Your guns? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I have them. Why, you... There's still three of us against one. Let's get him. Don't move any of you. What are you so tough about? So you have a gun. What good's it going to do you to kill us? I don't want to kill you. I want to preserve you for Faraday. You can't turn us over to the cops either. Maybe you know which one of us killed Ann Martin, but you don't know what you really want to know. You don't know where the money is. Oh, but I do. I listen to you. You got a big mouth, not big ears. I forget what size ears I wear, but I heard every word you said. If you look inside the millhouse doorway here, you'll see my portable radio set. So what? There's a two-way shortwave radio in my car. The microphone was on. I tuned you in on this radio set and heard every word you said. The money is buried in the Alton Cemetery. Pretty smart, aren't you, Blackie? I'll take that compliment slowly, Esla. But I think I'd better take you down to headquarters in a hurry. My 24 hours are more than up, and Faraday's the fretful type. <laughs> Oh, Mary, it's about time. Sorry, Blackie, I missed my bus, and another one didn't come along for 15 minutes. Have you ordered yet? No, I was afraid I'd have to wash dishes if you didn't show up. All I have here is 15 cents. Oh. <laughs> oh, that makes you happy. Oh, 
no, no. This is what makes me happy. Letter from a boyfriend? It's um, from a man, yes. You jealous? No. Aren't you at least a bit jealous? No. Well, aren't you joking? Yes. Oh, that's better. <laughs> What's he want? Oh, nothing much. Just a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Isn't that awful? What kind of men do you know writing you for money? Oh, he's not a bad sort. Not bad. He's criminal. What's the hundred for? Blackmail? No, black suit. The man's my tailor. Oh. <laughs> Lucky luggage. Oh, very well, Porter. Put my luggage at the foot of the bed. Oh, so now I'm a porter. I'll uh, put it uh, where you want it, Lardy. Oh, fine, fine. That will be all, Porter. At the foot of the bed, please. It's very apparent, Lardy, that you've never been to sea. We seafarers call a bed a bunk. Well, it's a lot of bed. It's a lot of bunk. Oh. <laughs> oh. Say, I should have my reservation at the last minute, too. The walls of my cabin are so close together, they practically press my pants. Well, Blackie, that's strange. This looks like a double cabin. Well, strange. It should look like a double cabin when it is a double cabin. But uh, don't think you have to sleep in both bunks just to get your money's worth. I'll admit that. Will this be a long trip? No, just overnight. We get to Westfield in the morning, and then we'll have some fun. I thought you were making this a business trip for Charlie Kingston. It is, but business for Charlie always leaves time fun. So I thought this black suitcase was too heavy to belong to you. Oh, Blackie, that isn't mine. You must have left one of mine in your cabin. Oh, this is Charlie's suitcase full of bonds. Well, I'll take it back to my cabin because you might pull the handle of it. Why shouldn't I? It's tear gas. And then... I'd cry for you. It would take tear gas to make you cry for anything. (laughs) Well, which bunk should I sleep in tonight? The lower or the upper? I don't know. Let's see which one is softer. Hmm, the lower one's lovely. Now let's see about the one on top. Uh, Mary, I think you'd better sleep in the lower bunk regardless. Why? It'll be a little crowded in the upper bunk. You have a cabin mate. But I don't think she'll disturb you much. She's dead. Now here's Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> Well, Blackie, no matter where you go, you find a body, don't you? Isn't it the most annoying habit, Inspector Faraday? Hurry and solve this case, will you? The ship is already 30 minutes late pulling out. So what? So are you going to Westfield with us? No, and this boat isn't going... Faraday, this is a ship. Ship, sloop, raft, canoe, or a kayak. It's not leaving this dock till I found that woman's killer. Who was, uh, that woman, Faraday? I don't know yet. We should have asked her before the coroner took her away. Why did you kill her, Blackie? Inspector, may I say something? No. Well, I will. Blackie had nothing to do with it. I was with him when he found the body. Well, that's no help to Blackie in my book. Oh, golly, Blackie, this is all my fault. If I hadn't wanted to go to Westfield with you, you wouldn't have reserved this stateroom for me. Well, don't feel badly about it, Mary. If you hadn't taken this room, we wouldn't have found the body. Faraday wouldn't be here, and we'd be missing all this Blackie, fun. look, there's a man's face in the porthole. Hey, you, what do you want? He's gone. Come on, let's go out and take and head him off. <laughs> Well, that was certainly a false alarm, Miss Wesley. But, Inspector, how did I know he wasn't snooping? Well, he wasn't. The first mate said he was trying to repair a broken guy wire or something. Or something, Inspector? You should have followed that up. He told me what it was, but I don't understand this sea-going lingo. Well, let's get out of here. Just sit still, you two. The captain will be here in a minute. Oh, Blackie, what's this under the captain's chair? 
something just like it on the wall in my cabin. There's one in every cabin, Mary. It's a life raft. Oh, you trying to kid, Blackie. It looks like a rolled-up inner tube with a tube of toothpaste attached to it. That thing wouldn't float a midget. It'll float a couple of people, Faraday. It's a collapsible life raft. What do you have to do? Unfold it and blow it up? Oh, no, Mary. Press that little button on top of that tube there, and in about two seconds, you have a raft about twice as big as the top of the captain's desk and one half the size of Faraday's head. Let's press it and see what happens. No, no. Uh, now, Mary, please don't. Not oh, now. I never have any fun. Sorry to keep you waiting, Inspector Faraday. That's all right, Captain Randall. Now, who is the dead woman? Could you find out? Yes. She was Charlotte Haken. Oh, I've heard of her. Something about money. Uh, something about two million. Look, when I want information from you two, I'll ask for it. Faraday, before this is over, you'll be begging for it. I'll beg you right now to keep quiet. Say please. Please. I said quiet. <laughs> My Captain Randall, where did Mrs. Aiken board the ship? At Westfield, just before sailing time yesterday afternoon. With Martha Vale, her traveling companion. Where is this Martha Vale? At home. You better get me her address. I'll have to see her. Forgive me, Inspector, but I took the liberty of sending for her myself and asking her to come down here. You captains are used to running everything, aren't you? Aboard ship, yes, Inspector. I've ordered a complete passenger list for you, sir. Thanks, I'd like a copy of it. But I think I have my killer. Meaning me, of course. Why not, Blanky? There are 150 staterooms on this ship, and I find you in the one with a body in it. The one, Faraday? Well, maybe there are other staterooms equipped with bodies. Let's look. Excuse me, Inspector, but it's way past our sailing time. When can I give the order? Don't worry, Captain. In an hour's time, your ship will be at sea. Well, that's where you'll be too, Faraday. At sea and sending out an SOS for me. So help me, Blackie. So I'll help you, Faraday. Martha, wait. Don't go in there. Martha, what are you doing here? Stopping it. Hey, what's going on out there? Let go of me. You're hurting my arm. I'll break your neck if you... Come on, let's go outside and see what this is all about. Careful, Faraday. You may get into trouble. Martha, I'm sure you're a fool. Why do you want to get mixed up in a murder? What should I do, Hyde? It wouldn't do you any good. I'd find you. Oh. If he didn't get lost looking for you. Quiet, Blanky. Who are these people, Captain? This is Martha Vale, Mrs. Aiken's traveling companion. I don't know the man with her. Hello, Captain Randall. This is my brother, Bob. Well, this is Inspector Faraday of the police. Oh. Oh, oh yes. Miss Vale? Were you with Mrs. Hagen on the trip she made from Westfield last night? Yes. How about you, son? No, I never traveled with Mrs. Hagen. If I could have had my way, my sister wouldn't have been traveling with that Hagen woman either. All right. Keep on talking, son. And say something when you do. I'm not so selfish that I want to be the inspector's only suspect in this murder. You? Oh, dear. Don't look so alarmed, Miss Vale. Inspector Faraday accuses me of every murder in town. I think you'd better tell oh, me Oh, no, she to... doesn't, Blackie. She tells me. All right, she tells you, and then I figure it out for you. Quiet, Blackie. Now answer a few questions for me, Miss Vale. Oh, remember, Martha, by law, you needn't say anything. Look, son, am I going to have trouble with you? I want my sister to know her rights. She's mixed up in this. She should see a lawyer before she answers you. And, Faraday, why don't you stop asking all the stock questions and ask the one question that really should have an interesting answer? What are you talking about, Blackie? It seems very strange to me that Miss Vale should be traveling with Mrs. Aiken and get off the ship alone, leaving Mrs. Aiken in her stateroom dead. Excuse me, Inspector Faraday. Mrs. Aiken wasn't found in her own cabin. Hers was number 85. Her body was found in 22. Hmm. That means something. Don't you wish you knew what? Oh, Blackie, darling, be quiet. All right, everybody. Into the captain's quarters for questioning. Oh, must you now? I'm sorry. Okay, everybody, get inside. Oh, now, look what you've done, Martha. You've got us all involved in this thing. Come in, Blackie. The man called Faraday said everybody... Now you stay here, Blanky. Faraday, are you ill? You're not going to question me. I'm going to question you, all right. Blanky, give the inspector nice answers. My very nicest. See you in the captain's quarters in a few minutes, Mary. Right. If I don't have them up in my quarters for a few years... Hey, captain Randall, hold those people in your cabin until I'm ready for them. Of course, inspector. Well? Well? All right, Blanky, what's this all about? You don't know, Inspector? Look, Blackie, I figured you knew something about this the minute I found you with that body. I, uh, if you didn't think so, I'd be awfully disappointed, as a matter of fact. But, uh, why don't you stop calling me names and start calling a few shots on Charlotte Aiken's death? Can you call any? Names or shots? Neither. You really want to know who killed Charlotte Aiken? Well, I didn't come down here to go for a boat ride. All right, Faraday, I'll tell you all I know. 
Well, we went through that well routine already. I'm telling you all I know. You're not saying anything. That's because I don't know anything. About this case, that is. Well, I know something. The time of day, no doubt. Uh Uh-oh. There goes that gun again. And here you go again, too. I know. Down to headquarters. Oh, no, wise guy. You're holding out on me. You know something about this case you're not telling. And until you talk, I'm going to put you in your cabin under guard. Well, at least you think so much of me. You want to give me police protection? Come on. On second thought, Faraday, am I being put under protection for your sake or for mine? Yes? Boston Blackie, sir? Yes. Send you the steward? Uh, yes, I want something to eat. Uh, sandwich, sir? Uh, sure, anything. Yes, sir. Sandwich. Right away. Well, what are you standing there for? I... I know who killed Mrs. Aikens. What? And I know why she was killed. Well, never mind that sandwich. Let's have this instead. Uh, better still, let's get Faraday in here first. No, no, I can't go to the police. I don't dare talk to you now. The cabin is being watched. I'll see you here at midnight. Nice of you to walk around the deck a few times, Faraday. Are you sure it's no bother? I even take my dog for a walk every night. Two to one, he outsmarts you. Very funny, Blackie. I didn't think so. Here's your cabin. Take a good deep breath of air because you're in for the night. Okay, Inspector, good night. Go on, Blackie. Get in there. Alone? No, I'm going in with you. No, I'd rather be alone. I'd be in better company. No way I turn on the light. I just want to make sure you're not hiding something that... Oh, Faraday, stop looking so pleased with yourself. That's not a body in my bunk. It's just a steward. Why is he lying in your bunk? Maybe he's tired. Maybe I am, too. Are those half-wit remarks of yours? Well, he offered to come in here and tell me a little story entitled, Who Done It? You mean he knows who killed Mrs. Aiken? That's what he told me. Let's wake him up and hear his story. Hey, Stuart, wake up. Wake up. Shake him. Before using? Very funny. Hey, Stuart. Wake up. Wake up. I know that booming voice of yours is disturbing, Faraday, but even you can't wake our friend up. Huh? He's dead. What? Hey. Hey, I know that boy. He's done time and plenty of it. Well, he's not going to do any more. I guess I should have expected this. Don't move, Blackie. Oh, Faraday, put away that gun. I've got you for two murders now, Blackie. And I don't put this gun away till I put you away. For keeps. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Blackie and Mary Wesley boarded the night boat to Westfield. The journey was upset when the body of Charlotte Aiken, wealthy widow, was found in the upper bunk of Mary Wesley's stateroom. While Inspector Faraday was questioning Martha Vale, the dead woman's traveling companion, the steward of the ship came to Blackie and promised to tell him at midnight who killed Mrs. Aiken. At midnight, Blackie and Faraday found the steward dead. Faraday charged Blackie with killing him. And as we return to our story, the inspector is about to take Blackie to jail. All right, Blackie, move. Well, when I move, Faraday, I like to take my luggage with me. Okay, take the suitcases along. Thanks. Help me, will you? Okay. But knowing you, I'm going to carry the big suitcase. The little one will be no match for the big one if you start swinging it. I always said you'd make a good red cap. Uh, Boy, pick up the large suitcase, please. I'll carry the small one. And no more wisecracks, wise guy. Come on. Off to you? After you. You're not getting away from me this time. Oh, no? Hey. Hey, what's that hissing noise? Tear gas. Tear gas? I thought you'd try to be a wise guy and want to carry the the big suitcase for your protection. This little one contains a tear gas bomb for mine. What? Why are you carrying tear gas? Because the suitcase you're carrying contains a quarter million dollars worth of negotiable bonds. Hey! Hey! Blackie! Blackie, where are you? I'm right here, Faraday, by the door. Where, where's the door? I can't see a thing. Well, in a few seconds, you won't be able to see me either. I'm leaving. Blackie! Blackie, come back here. 
Come back here or I'll kill you. Go ahead and shoot me, Faraday. I dare you. So, so help me, Blackie. I, I'll put you behind bars for this. Well, before you put me behind bars, Inspector, figure out how you're going to get out from behind this door. I'm locking it. What's the matter? Oh, Mary, where'd you come from? Well, Captain Randall's letting us take a walk on deck. Why are you crying? Faraday just told me the nicest thing. He never wants to see me again. So let's get off the ship and make sure he doesn't. If she isn't on the train, Blackie, then what? Then Martha Vale is smarter than we are. My brother told us she was on this train and... Oh... Here she is. She's alone, too. She looks like the lone wolf type. Hello, Miss Vale. Going somewhere? Oh, I... I didn't kill Mrs. Aiken. She was alive when I left the boat. I... How do you know? Well, I... Well, I guess I don't know. We had separate cabins. I, I left the ship as soon as it docked. I had some shopping to do for Mrs. Aiken. It was very important. Then she could have been dead when you left the boat? Well, I, I, maybe she could have. I didn't go into her stateroom before I went ashore. She sometimes slept late. Well, tell me, did Mrs. Aiken act at all strangely on the trip from Westfield? Oh, not unless there's something strange about taking a walk in the middle of the night because you can't sleep. About what time did she go for this walk? Well, just before midnight. What time did she come back? I don't know. Well, uh... Did anything strange happen last night after Mrs. Aiken went on deck? No. Think now. Oh, well, uh, just before I fell asleep, the ship slowed down a little. But it always did around that time of night on on every trip. I, I tell you, I don't know anything about Mrs. Aiken's death. Now, will you please leave me alone? If you'll tell me just a little bit about your brother. Oh, I see. He didn't like the idea of your being Mrs. Aiken's companion. He wouldn't tell me. What else uh, wouldn't your brother tell you? Where he made all... I mean, nothing. You mean where he made all his money, don't you, Miss Vale? I I didn't mean anything. I I think you meant a lot. I'm getting off at the first stop, and I'm going to see him. Maybe he doesn't know more than you do, but maybe he'll say more. I found out from Robert Vale that his sister inherits Mrs. Aiken's money. Oh. What did you find out? Well, the Westfield night boat leaves Westfield at 7 in the evening and it arrives here at 9 the next morning. Did the steamship company tell you where the ship would be at midnight when it slowed down? Yeah, yeah, the clerk gave me this map. And here he made a mark on it. The boat would be right here where the little X is. Hmm. X marks the spot, huh? But I wonder what else it marks. Well, you're the great Boston Blackie. Why don't you swim out there and see? It's a good idea. Oh, Blackie, will you stop being silly? I'm dead serious. Only I'm not going to swim. We're going to trade water wings for airplane wings and fly out there. Come on. Nice flying, buddy. We're right beside it. Is that chain hanging from the top of the boy fastened to whatever holds it into the water? Yes, I I think we... Say, wait. The chain that holds a boy in place would be underneath it, not on top of it. A chain is hanging loose, Blackie. Why don't you have a look at it? Okay, wait a minute. I'm going to climb out on the wing. Uh, now I can reach it. The... Yeah, now I have it. What is it, Blackie? Just a loose chain? Yeah, with a with a sort of a snap on it, like the one you find on the eh, end of a dog leash. So, uh, so nothing. Okay, pilot, let's go back to the mainland. Oh, are we going up in the air again? Yes, and if I don't get a bright idea pretty soon, we'll be up in the air in more ways than one. <laughs> Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. 
How many people do you are? You're under arrest. <laughs> and you're under delusions again, Inspector. I want some information. And I want you. Nice of you to say so, pal, but listen. You knew the steward who was killed in my cabin. Uh, what did he do time for? None of your business. It's your business, though, Faraday. Tell me and I'll bring in your killer. Nothing doing. Okay, Faraday, if you don't want to solve this case, All I'm... right. But don't forget where you got the information. I don't think you'll let me. What was the steward sent up for? Smuggling. Now, is that any help to you? Probably not. You give such useless information, Faraday. So long. You listen to me, Blakey. Well, Mary, the steward was arrested for smuggling. Any help? No, I don't see it. Smuggling. Smuggling, yes, of course. Of course it helps. How? Oh. The chain on the boy. Smuggled goods from overseas was attached to it, then picked up by someone on the Westfield boat as it passed by. How does that explain Mrs. Aiken's death? She walked the deck of the boat last night and saw something she shouldn't have seen. That's right. The ship passes the boy at midnight, and Martha Vale said that at exactly midnight, Mrs. Aiken went for a walk on deck. Well, if Mrs. Aiken was killed last night because she went for a walk, uh, we're going to solve this murder by a walk, too. <laughs> the way I figure, Captain Randall. You must be good at figures, Blackie, if you can slip past the police guards on this boat and walk right into my quarters. Oh, let's not waste time with my accomplishments, Captain Randall. I'm more interested in the doings of someone on this ship. What do you mean? I think Charlotte Aiken was killed because she couldn't sleep last night. I have good reason to believe that this ship of yours is being used for smuggling small but highly priced articles into this country. That's absolutely fantastic. My ship goes to no foreign port. Why, we never sail a course more than eight miles offshore. But you pass a certain boy about eight miles offshore every night at midnight. When we're on schedule, yes. Well, here's what's been happening on your ship, Captain Randall. When it slows down as it passes that boy, someone on the lower deck reaches out with a hook or something and very neatly catches a chain dangling from the top of the boy. You know there's a chain on the top of that boy? Yes, I looked at it myself. On the end of that chain would be a package or a box or a container of some kind. Once the smuggler has that container aboard, he can bring it into the country. Yes, that's true. We don't have to pass through customs. What makes you think my ship is used for smuggling? Your steward, the one who was found dead in my cabin, was once arrested and convicted for smuggling. Mrs. Aiken was killed because she was on deck at midnight last night and saw the smuggler at work. If she was killed at sea, why wasn't her body tossed overboard? The smuggler didn't have time for that, I suppose. But he put her body where he was sure it wouldn't be found. What do you mean? The killer checked the reservations list for the return trip and found the state from 22 would be empty. He hid Mrs. Aiken's body there, hoping to get rid of it at sea the next night. Oh, yeah. And the reason the steward was killed was that he saw Mrs. Aiken's body being taken into the cabin and was going to tell me. Blackie, you're too smart to live. Everybody pulls a gun on Blackie. What are you smuggling, Captain? Diamonds from Africa. My partners bring them from Africa as far as the boy. I bring them the rest of the way. Just stand where you are. I just want to get a little closer to you so when you shoot, you won't miss. I won't miss. Then I'll dump your body overboard. Well, when you do, will you throw this collapsible life raft in after me? This one under your chair looks like a big one. Don't touch that. I won't touch the raft, Captain. Only the inflation valve. Hey! Hey! Hey. You look awfully silly on the floor, Captain. Kill you for this, Blackie. How are you going to kill me after I get this gun out of your hand? Let go! Let go of me! After you drop that gun. You're breaking my... All right, I drop it. Okay, Randall. Get up. I have a gun of my own. Don't shoot. Don't worry. Say, isn't it funny how a little air in this life raft took the wind out of your sails? Twenty-one, twenty-two. Here's my cabin again, Blackie. Open the door, will you, Mary? I've got my arms full of luggage. Lucky luggage? Oh, I said that before, didn't I? <laughs> I liked it just as much the second time. <laughs> oh, um, very well, Porter. Just put my luggage at the foot of the bed. <laughs> Blackie, will we get to Westfield this time? <laughs> I don't know. I can't guarantee anything. Well, um, do you think we dare look in the upper bed? I mean, uh, the bunk. I don't know. You look. No, maybe you'd better look. I'd rather you look. Well, if you'll remember, uh, last time I looked, we found a body up there. Oh, yes, that's right. All right. I'll look. Blackie! What, Mary? What is it? Believe it or not, there isn't a body up there. (laughs) 
Let's break down the door. Yeah. Harder, Rollins, harder. This should do it. Ah, that did it. Come on, let's go in quick. I don't smell no gas. Where's the light switch? Don't ask me. I'm a stranger here myself. Hey, hold it. Somebody's over there crying. Here's the light switch. Hey, miss. You, uh, Joan Thompson? Joan? Joan Thompson? Joan... Are you Joan Thompson? Are you the cigarette girl on the Boulevard Club? Yes. You wanted for the murder of Henry Brightson? No. You left the no. club with him tonight, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. You took him home in your car, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. Okay, we found Brightson's body on a country road a couple of hours ago. There are blood stains in your car. Explain that. All right. All right, I killed him. I did it. I did it. That's better. What did you do with the gun? I gave it. You gave it to somebody? Who? Look around, see what you can find, Rollins. Yeah, I'm looking, Inspector. What did you do with that gun, Miss Thompson? I don't know, I don't know. Hey, Inspector, there's a telephone number that may mean something. Look, right here on the top of this pad. Let's have a look. Well, uh, I'll say it means something. You know that number, Inspector, hey? Know it. I could dial it in my sleep. That phone number is Boston Blackies. <laughs> Now meet Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> Look, Miss Thompson, crying isn't going to do you any good. You're going to answer my question if it takes forever. I told you everything I know. I killed Henry Bright and I admit it. But where's the gun? <laughs> Alone. I told you Blackie was here. Yeah, but when and for how long? And why was he here? I... Oh, please, leave me alone. Did you give Blackie your gun? I don't remember. Well, start remembering. Did you give your gun to Blackie? Yes. Yes, I gave it to him. Okay, Miss Thompson, that's all I wanted to know. Give me a hand, Rollins. We're taking this girl to headquarters. Okay, lady, let's go. Hey, Inspector, his doll don't look too good, eh? Okay, so maybe she doesn't feel well. Maybe she needs a doctor. And maybe Blackie won't feel well either when he finds out he's going to need a lawyer. Inspector Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Blackie, I've been looking for you. So I hear. That's why I called. Yeah? 
Well, how does it feel to be a murder suspect? Completely natural. Now what have I done? Made a fool out of yourself? Well, I had good material. And besides, I was tired of being so different from you. You won't be able to wisecrack your way out of this one, Frankie. I'm pinning this on you. Faraday, you have trouble pinning your badge on yourself. Okay, be a smart aleck if you want to. But why'd you do it, Frankie? Why did I do it? I don't even know what I've done. You're always so shy about telling me those things. You took John Thompson's gun. Oh, that? Yeah, that. The Thompson girl admits she killed Henry Bryson. Now, why did you have to get mixed up in it by taking her gun? Now you're an accessory after the fact. And you're a cop after the accessory. The cycle's complete. All right, Frankie. I've given you a chance to square yourself. You won't? So I'm coming to get you. Oh, come on. It'll be nice seeing you again. Blackie, listen to me. Stop clowning for once and tell me. Why did you do it? It's so simple. Maybe after a few translations of the baby talk, even you can understand it. This Joan Thompson used to be Mary Wesley's best friend. Since when does knowing Mary Wesley make an angel out of anybody? Mary Wesley's qualities are catching. Uh, wait a minute, Barney. Fold your wings, Mary. They're fluttering. Yeah. When they're unfolded like this, they dust the walls so nicely. <laughs> Frankie, is that Miss Wesley with you now? And you ought to see her, Faraday. She looks lovely. Uh, maybe I will see her. Behind bars with you. She could be mixed up in this, too, you know. Look, Faraday, Mary didn't send me up there to take the gun away from the Thompson girl. I did that on my own. I don't trust your ballistics department. By the way, what caliber bullet killed Henry Brightson? None of your business. Well, I'm going to make it mine to keep you in business. So long, Faraday. When I have your killer, I'll deliver him to you all wrapped up. Blackie, you listen to me, Frank. Well, times certainly haven't changed, Mary. Neither does Faraday. He thinks I had something to do with Henry Brightson's murder. Oh, Blackie, it's all my fault for calling you. But when Joan called me, I didn't know who else to turn to. If you never know who else to turn to, that's fine with me. Yes, but now you're in trouble. Is that unusual? No, but I certainly wish it were. Oh, Blackie, what are we going to do? Prove Joan Thompson didn't kill Henry Brightson. But how? She admits she killed him. I think she's admitting that to cover up somebody. Why, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Because you're, because you're not a genius called Boston Blackie. Oh, well, genius. <laughs> what now? Now I think we'll go out and make a night of it. A night of what? Oh, festivities at the Boulevard Club, where your friend Joan Thompson works. But, but why do we go there? To see if we can pick up a couple of clues before Faraday picks up a couple of us. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Williams is completely in my power. Hypnotized. Blackie, is he a fake? The rest of the Boulevard Club is phony enough, Mary, but I think the floor show is legitimate. Ladies and gentlemen, you will remember that before the subject was hypnotized, he could not correctly add... 27 and 47. Who can? Now, while he's hypnotized, I will give the subject three figures to add. And his subconscious mind will calculate the answers with the speed of machinery. If this works, I should have been hypnotized in school. Weren't you? Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Williams. 257. 349. 581. Add those numbers together and give me the answer. 1,187. Ladies and gentlemen, add those figures yourself and you'll see that the answer is correct. Blackie, is it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm still working on oh, it. Oh, darling, don't write on the now, table. ladies and gentlemen, I think our subject should wake up. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Wake up. Wake up. Mm. Oh. Yeah, sure. Now, Mr. Williams, give me the correct sum of 257, 349, and 581. Quickly. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> this man would get through life better if you were hypnotized. Me too. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Mr. Williams. You've been a good sport. <laughs> oh, shucks. Isn't that the end of the floor show? Seems to be. Blackie, was that metal really on the level? I don't know. Well, um, dear, here comes that Mr. Williams. Let's ask him about it, huh? All right. Say, uh, Williams. You call me? Uh, yes, have you got a minute? Uh... I'm awful sorry. Uh, I've got an awful memory for names and faces. I, I don't think I remember... Oh, you don't know us, Mr. Williams, but uh, uh, we'd like to ask you what it was like to be hypnotized. Were you really hypnotized? I'm afraid I was. Then there's really something to it, huh? Well, I'm not a professional stooge, that you're thinking. I'm just a paying guest, same as you. You added those figures so quickly. 
Uh, aren't you good with numbers normally? Terrible. I took math in high school for three years and just got by. <laughs> I can hardly add two and two. Well, how is it that you could add under hypnosis then? You don't have to ask a psychologist about that. Uh, excuse me, please. I got people waiting at my table. Good night. Well, thanks for coming over. Well, that mentalist is really on the level then, isn't he, Blackie? Yes, I suppose there is a scientific explanation for hypnosis. It's part of the applied psychology course at colleges. Oh, golly, I think we better watch the clock. It's getting late, darling. Oh, all right. There's a waiter. Waiter! I do wait, sir. Oh, um, Blackie, why don't you ask the waiter a few questions about Henry Brightson? What? And get thrown out? Mary, in places like this, the only question you ask is, how much is the check? Oh. Now, if the waiter mentions Brightson first, that's different. Then I could probably... Shh, here he comes. You want something, sir? Uh, the check, please. Yes, sir. Here you are. Thanks. Enjoy the floor show? Very much. Almost had a little unscheduled show here last night. Our cigarette girl killed Henry Bison. You read about it? Yes, we did. Sure was exciting. Police all over the place. Say, uh, <laughs> tell me, uh, yes? did the place, uh, did they ever find the man Brightson came in with last night? I don't know why not. Dr. James Harris does not have to hide from anybody. He left a long time before Brightson did. Why would the police think Dr. Harris killed by? Well, I don't know that they do. Uh, say, uh, how did that cigarette girl, um, uh, what's her name, Joan Thompson, uh, uh, how did she get mixed up with Brightson? Well, when Brightson was about to... Uh, don't ask questions here, sir, because we do not know the answers. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, sir, but we have a policy here never to talk about our customers. Important people come here and it is not right. I'm sorry I asked. That's okay. Here, this should take care of the check. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. Never mind, keep it. Thank you. Blackie. What's the matter, Mary? You look surprised. How did you know Brighton came in with someone else? I didn't. It was just a shot in the dark. Well, let's stay here until they turn out the lights and maybe you can shoot for the answer to everything. Oh, no, we're getting out of here. Why? See that man over there? He's Edwards, the boss of this joint. Oh, he looks like the boss of a chain gang. Why not? He used to be a member of one. Look at those mugs he's talking to. And look at them, look at us. I think they're going to close in for a better look, too. That waiter must have told them that I was asking questions. Oh, Blackie, and those questions didn't do you any good either, did they? I know it. Well, come on. I'm going to see Joan in jail to try and put the pieces of this puzzle together before Edwards and his pals get the notion that we ought to be taken apart. That is the doctor to see you, Miss Thompson. A doctor? I don't want a doctor. A friend of yours asked me to see you, Miss Thompson. Uh, you want me to come in a cell with you, Doc? She's kind of violent, this one. Hey, no, thank you, officer. I'll be all right. Okay, there you are, Doc. Thank you. I'll just lock this door. Just tell me when you're through, and I'll let you out, eh? Uh, thank you, I will, yes. Uh, just sit where you are, Miss Thompson. I tell you, I don't want a doctor. Uh, just sit quietly, Miss Thompson. I don't need a doctor. I hope not, Joan, because I'm no doctor. What? But I'm what the doctor ordered, Boston Blackie. Blackie. Blackie, I gave you the gun. What else do you want? Shh. The police are after me, too. That's the reason for the whiskers in my doctor's kit. I don't understand why are you here? To help you. Nobody can help me. Look, Joan, I've just come from the Boulevard Club. Something's wrong there. Now, before you left last night, did anyone force you to do anything at all? No. So when I got through, I got my hat and my usual cup of coffee and left. You're covering up for somebody, Joan. No. Who? Who killed Henry Bites? I did. Joan, will you stop <laughs> lying? Who's forcing you to say that? I killed Henry Bites and I killed him. I killed him. I killed him. I admit it. Don't leave me alone. Joan, don't do this to me. I've hidden your gun because I thought you were innocent. Now, tell me the truth, will you? Go away. I killed Henry Bryson, I admit it. I killed him with more you want. All right, Joan. If there's nothing more you can say, there's nothing more I can do. <laughs> Thompson, cigarette girl in the Boulevard Club, and friend of Mary Wesley, has confessed to the murder of Henry Brightson. But Blackie and Mary, convinced she is merely covering up for the real killer, 
try to help her, but learn only that Wrightson came to the club with a Dr. Harris, left with Joan Thompson, was later found dead. Blackie's last hope of proving Joan's innocence died later, when in jail, Joan insisted she did kill Wrightson. As we return to our story, Blackie's driving Mary to his apartment to pick up the murder gun. Blackie, what are you thinking? A whole catalog of things, Mary. What's on page one? I've never been faced with anything like this before. I know I'm licked. If Joan killed Bryson, she killed him, and that's that. Page two? I still want to do something for her, but I don't know what. Well, first you're going to do something for yourself. You're going to get that gun out of your apartment. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do now. And send it to Faraday. Then what? Then I don't know what. Well, here's my street. Blackie, is that a police car in front of your apartment house? It's worse than that. It's Faraday's private cruiser. Uh-oh. We're getting out of here. Hey, hey, keep all four wheels on the ground, please. Phew. Sorry, oh. Mary, but that was Faraday himself on the sidewalk, Sorry. and I... I know what he's after. You, of course. First, Joan Thompson's gun in my apartment. His men are probably looking for it right now. Will they find it? I don't think so. But this means we have to find something ourselves. What? Well, remember that waiter at the Boulevard Club said Brightson arrived with a Dr. James Harris. Yes? Dr. Harris is a well-known drug specialist. He could tell me something important. What? Well... The real reason, he left the club before Brightson did. That's one thing he could tell me. And what's another thing? Whether or not Joan Thompson can be under the influence of a drug that makes her believe she committed murder. And if he gives you that information, what will you have? A prescription for murder to be filled at the nearest police station. Why, yes, Blackie, I know Harry Brightson is dead. He had a visit from Inspector Faraday of the police just a little while ago. Well, Faraday's really making an effort to earn his pay these days. But I'm sure there are a couple of questions he didn't ask you, Dr. Harris. Yes? You came to the club with Brightson last night. Why didn't you leave with him? Why, uh, I had an emergency call. I can check on that, you know. Well, well, all right then. Brightson and I went to the Boulevard Club for a little private game with the owner, Jim Edwards. I dropped out. Because you ran out of money? No. I left because that game wasn't on the level. And I knew it. Who was crooked? Brightson. I told him so and left. Then what did you do? I came straight home. Got a gun, went back to the Boulevard Club, waited for Brightson to come out, followed him, then killed him. Now, look here. I I didn't kill Brightson, I tell you. Yes, I know that's what you tell me. You can't drag me into this. You, You can't. All I want to do is drag the truth out of you. But I've told you the whole truth. All right. Let's forget the possibility that you might have killed Brightson for the moment. Aren't you a specialist in drugs? So what? Is there a drug that would make Joan Thompson, the cigarette girl, believe she killed Brightson? No. Drugs don't make people think they've done something they haven't done. Under the influence of drugs, people do forget, though. In other words, drugs don't enter into this at all. Being drugged would not make her confess to something she didn't do. I'll stake my reputation on that. Those are pretty high stakes, Dr. Harris. Let's just hope that before this is over, you don't have to pull them up. Hello? Mary, this is Blackie. I've just seen Dr. Harris and drugs are out. But something else is in, and if my hunch is right, I'm in, too. What do you mean? Question. Why did Brightson leave the club in Joan's car when his own was parked in a lot outside the club? Answer. His car broke down. Oh, Blackie, Joan told us that. Yes, but we're going to have a look at that car of his, because if it didn't break down, it's going to break up this case. Here's Brightson's car in the parking lot, apparently right where he left it. How will you know whether or not there's something wrong with it? You're no mechanic. (laughs) Well, I can try to be one, can't I? Yes, we'll have a look under the hood. That's where mechanics always start. Why aren't you observing? Mm. What do you see in there? Come over and you can look at it, too. It's an engine. You don't say. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Eight cylinders. That bad? <laughs> you're a big help. Well, you're the one who's pretending to be a mechanic. Uh-oh. See something? See those marks on the top of the engine block? Uh, yeah, yeah, the little lines in the grease. Those were made when the contact wires to the spark plugs were removed. Well, yes, but couldn't they have just slipped off? All of them at once? No, Pat. Somebody was kidding around with this engine. Only he wasn't kidding. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, Miss. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, you're the same waiter we had here last night. How nice. I'm glad you liked the Boulevard Club enough to come back the second night. Oh, yes, we enjoyed it last night. Especially the floor show. Oh, I hope you have not come to see the mentally. As a matter of fact, we have. We hoped we might be able to volunteer as subjects. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, sir. He is not here any longer. Oh, we missed him. But we have a new act that is excellent. I'm sure you will like it. Yes, I'm sure we will. Now, what would you like for dinner this evening? We haven't decided yet. Uh, could you give us a few more minutes? Let's go. All the time you want, sir. All the time you want. Well, Blackie, there goes your theory. And here I go to the telephone. What for? To call Faraday. Oh, Blackie, a little setback isn't going to make you give up, is it? No, Mary. A little information is going to make me give out. <laughs> Inspector, this is Blackie. Where are you, Blackie? I've been looking all over town for you. Well, thanks for the flattery, Inspector, but I don't need it right now. I don't need you at any time, Blackie, but I'm coming to get you. Uh, don't bother with me, Faraday. You have another body on your hands if you can find it. I've already found it. And guess who it is? The hypnotist at the Boulevard Club. Oh, so you killed him, too? I didn't kill him, either. Yeah? And how did you know he was dead? I have a sixth sense. And yeah, so does a horse. Then if you had any horse sense, you'd know who killed Wilner and why. Okay, see, Biscuit, who did kill the mentalist? Okay, also ran the same guy who killed Brightson. What kind of an answer is that? The right one. Blackie, you know what I'm going to do? Sure, exactly what I tell you to do. First, get a doctor for Joan Thompson. She's been drugged and hypnotized. Get her out of it, and she'll stop insisting she killed Brightson. Yeah? Now, what are you going to do? What I always do, Faraday. Get you your killer. <laughs> You want to do business with me, Blackie? That's right, Edwards. I have offers from people every day who want to buy into this club of mine. I oh. don't accept it. Oh, I'm not interested in your club, Edwards. Uh, but I am interested in your activities. Meaning what? I think you killed Henry Brightson. I'm not interested in what you think. I also think you killed Wilner, the hypnotist. I'm still not interested. I also think your gun killed them both. Oh, you do? Don't reach for your gun, Edwards. I need only one, and mine's quite handy. You're very fast on the draw. You're very slow on the take. I'm accusing you of two murders, and you don't seem the least bit concerned. Uh, by the way, uh, hand over that gun, will you? I have a permit for this pistol. But the permit doesn't say that you can kill with it. Hand it over. I want to look at it. All right, here. Now you can sit down and make yourself comfortable. Because what I'm going to say to you will make you uncomfortable. That gun of mine did not kill Brightson. It did not kill Wilner. Hasn't been fired in months. I can tell that by looking at it. Are you satisfied? Yeah. Yeah. You can have it now. Now, will you be so kind as to put your gun away? Of course. Well, that bunny? Yes, yeah, much. Now, what would... I'm not going to ask you if you killed Brightson and Wilner... I'm going to tell you you did, and why. Can you? Just listen. Brightson caught you cheating at cards and threatened to go to the police. You couldn't afford that. You fixed his car so it wouldn't run and sent him home in Joan Thompson's car. Then Joan Thompson was the last to see him alive, so she must have killed him. Joan Thompson was drugged when she had her usual cup of coffee before leaving the club. And you went along with her until the drug took effect. Then stopped the car, shot Brightson. Joan Thompson admits she killed Brightson. Of course. Under hypnosis, she would admit anything. After killing Brightson, you brought Joan back here, had Wilna hypnotize her and impress on her subconscious that she had killed Brightson. You, uh, can prove that? You helped prove it yourself by killing Wilna so he could never blackmail you. The final proof will come when a doctor tells the police that Joan Thompson is been both drugged and hypnotized ever since she was found in her room. Don't move, Blackie. 
I wouldn't give orders if I were you, Edward. Then I'll let my gun speak for me. Speak sort of softly, doesn't it? Stay back, Blackie. My gun's just missing when I'll it's... I'll say it's missing, Edwards. It's missing its bullets. What? I took them out when I pretended to look at you again. Why, you dirty... Oh, no, Edwards. Please, don't call me names. It isn't fair. Because from now on, all anybody will be able to call you is a number. <laughs> Everything checked, Mary. The police found out that our friend Joan had been drugged. And Joan was made to believe she killed Bryson because she was hypnotized. I still can't believe it. Look into my eyes. What? You are going to sleep. Oh. Look into my eyes. Yes? Now put your arms around me. Yes? Now lift your face up to mine. Like? This? And now? Now? This. <laughs> Do you think I'm hypnotized? Well, maybe you aren't. But I am. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Boston Blackie. Well, we have something in common. Apparently, you don't know me either. May I come in? If you don't, I'm coming out. Thank you. I'm Evelyn Jones. Miss Evelyn Jones? Is that important? It is me. Blackie, I need help. Well, give me a clue. Uh, what do you want? A safe opened? A bank robbed? A fire started? Or just plain somebody murdered? I'd like you to keep somebody from being murdered. Well, that's a little out of my line, Inspector Faraday keeps telling me. Uh, who do I keep from being knocked off? Me. Say, there are too many ugly people in the world right now for us to lose a beautiful one. What's the story? I have to deliver a package at 2 o'clock tomorrow morning at 484 Willow Street. 
Now, all I want you to do is to go there with me. It'll just take a few minutes. Sorry. I can't do it. Why not? Because of Mary Wesley? More or less. More because Mary has a way of finding out about things, and less because she happens to be on a train going to Wisconsin right now. Mary Wesley isn't on a train going anywhere. I happen to know she is. I happen to know she isn't. Really? Then where do you happen to know she is? Never mind. But if you don't do what I ask you, next time you see Mary Wesley, it'll be just to identify the body. And now meet Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. <laughs> Are you sure this is the right house, Evelyn? 484 Willis Street, Blackie. There's no mistake about that. Let's just hope this whole thing is a mistake. I know what I'm doing. Well, I know why I'm doing this. For Mary, not for you. Then why am I in this thing, boy? Well, Shorty, I'm here to protect Evelyn, and you're here to protect me. Who's going to protect me? Evelyn. Everybody happy now? So, what do we do? I don't want both of you to come inside with me. Just you, Blackie. The short guy stays out here. Maybe we should both wait out here. A lot of good that'll do me. Come on in, Blackie. Keep your eyes and ears open, Shorty, and your mouth closed. Oh, sure, boy. You bet. You bet. We're a little early. Probably not here yet. Mm, nice place. Mm. Guy who owns it has money. Good money? Good taste, too. Want to look around while we're waiting? No, I'm not sightseeing. Who are you meeting here? You neglected to tell me that. Will you be unhappy not knowing? Close to tears, but I get it. Ah, good view from the window here. I can see Shorty in the shadows across the street. Look, Blackie, it's, it's just two o'clock, and it isn't like this guy to be late. I think he's somewhere in the house now. Well, let's go find him. No. He obviously won't meet me unless I'm alone. Now, why don't you go outside? Have you meet this guy and then skip out on me without telling me where Mary is? Oh, no. Do as I say, Blackie, or you'll never see Mary again. Except in the morgue? Mm-hmm. That's about it. Argument over. What do I do? Well, it's exactly two o'clock now. Go across the street with your pal, Shorty. If you hear me yell, or if I'm not out at exactly five after two, come in for me. You get it? Sure, I get it. But let's not, uh... Well, let's just hope that before the five minutes are up, you don't. It's been almost five minutes now, and I ain't seen nobody going to 484 across the street. Evelyn was probably right, Shorty. Whoever she was meeting was already in the house, just waiting for me to leave. Uh Uh-oh. Time's up. Uh, Now what? Evelyn didn't yell for us, so we're going in to uh, call for her. Uh, See, boss, you think maybe she could have yelled and uh, we didn't hear her? Say, it's quite enough out here to hear a chin drop. Come on, we'll both go in. Hey. Door's locked, huh? That won't hold us up for long. Look, I'll, I'll go look in the window and see what goes. Okay. I know, Charlie. There's a gasoline station two blocks down the street. Beat it down there and call Faraday. I don't like the looks of this. Yeah, what'll I tell him? Tell him to send some men up here right away to 484 Willow Street. There's trouble. Oh, Darn it. What's the matter, boy? I'm a little nervous, I guess. The lock, Jimmy, slips and scratch the door. Gosh, boys, can't you get the lock open? Yeah, there, it's open now. Uh, beat it to that phone and call Faraday, quick. Yeah, sure, boy, sure, boy. I'll run all the way, huh? Then get back here as fast as you can. Uh, okay, boy, I'll be right back. Evelyn? Hey, Evelyn? Evelyn? Evelyn, where are you? Evelyn? Tell you, Inspector Friday, it's the honest truth. Blackie's been missing for eight hours now. Look, Shorty, this is police headquarters, not a problem clinic. If Blackie gave you the slip this morning, go somewhere else and try about it. But Inspector Blackie just just disappeared. After I call you, I run right back to 44 Willow Street, and Blackie ain't there, and the girl ain't there. Maybe they went to a movie. It's two o'clock in the morning. So they like late movies. Who cares? Oh, Inspector, please don't, don't kid about this. Miss Wesley's missing, and Blackie had a hunch there was trouble in that house. And I figure he found it. Inspector, hey. What do you want, Reynolds? 
Officer Thompson on the Blanchville Beach says he found a bum sleeping in an alley this morning. What's he want? Applause? Maybe he wants a reward, Friday. Right. Oh, gosh, boy. What happened to you? I don't know, Shorty. Somebody did a job on me, and I went to sleep on it. Okay, Blackie. Take your pal, Shorty, and beat it. Go on, get out of here. I'm not leaving, Faraday. Well, Rollins, you get out of here. Yes, sir, Inspector. Right away. Hey. i got to get somebody to listen to me. Now, I suppose you feel better. Look, I'm a busy man. If you have something to say, say it fast and get out of here. Mary Wesley's missing. Mary Wesley's missing what? Very funny, Faraday. Only this is no time for jokes. A girl named Evelyn Jones is holding Mary somewhere. Evelyn Jones? Yes, huh? Evelyn Jones. Shorty and I took her to her house at 484 Willow Street at 2 o'clock this morning. We went along to see that nothing happened to her. You expect me to believe this? Faraday, don't you understand the Jones girl knows where Mary is? Then why don't you ask the Jones girl to find her? Because I can't find the Jones girl. While she was in the house, Shorty and I waited outside. After a little while, I went in to get her. I was knocked out. and didn't wake up until a little while ago, way out in Branchville. I don't care about the Jones girl or me, but will you please get it into that thick head of yours that Mary's missing? Hold it, Blanky. Yeah? Call for Boston Blanky, Inspector Hayes. Okay, Rollins, put it through. And send out every available man to find Mary Wesley. Okay, Hayes. Eh? After all this, Mary better be missing. Here, Blanky, the call for you. Thanks. And, Inspector, thanks for giving that order to Rollins. I won't forget it. Hello. Hello, Blanky. This is Mary. But, uh, uh, oh, uh, Joe! Joe, how are you, old boy? What do you mean, old boy? This is Mary. Well, I thought uh, you were out of town, Joe. I'm not Joe, I'm Mary, and I'm not out of town because I missed my train, sent the night at a friend's house, and now I'm home. Well, Joe, uh, uh, stay where you are. Hey, that's not any Joe. Give me that phone. All right, let's go with that. Hello! Hello! Who is this? Hello, Inspector Faraday. This is Mary Wesley. Mary Wesley? Where are you? In my apartment. Inspector Blackie isn't in your office because he's in trouble, is he? I'll say he's in trouble. Here, let me speak to her, will you? Yeah, I'm not Give talking to anybody. Inspector, what's the matter? Read about it in the papers, Miss Wesley. I'm going to put your boyfriend in jail. Now, listen, Faraday. I'm as surprised as you are about this thing. I'm not a bit surprised. This is just what I expected, a gag. Mary Wesley was in trouble. You took a girl to a house. She disappeared. You got hit on the head. Da, 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 da. That same old phony story. Okay, Faraday, I'm sorry. Mary's not in trouble, and that's all I care about. See you around. Stay where you are, Blackie. What was all this talk about Evelyn Jones? Skip it, Faraday. It isn't important anymore. And about a house at 484 Willow Street. I tell you, now that Mary's all right, Evelyn Jones and 484 Willow Street aren't important. Well, we're going down and have a look in this house at 484. You look, Faraday. I'm not interested. So long. So long, huh? You're going with me to Willow Street. And if there's anything phony up there... You're going to jail for so long. This is the house, Friday, just as I described it to you. Yeah, on the outside, Blackie. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a house we come to with a door stand, Inspector Friday. Nobody asked you, Shorty. They didn't? Oh. Come on, let's go in. Hey, Rollins, what's the idea of blocking that door? Yes, I was looking for a scratch on the door Blackie said he made when he... They made the lock, eh? Did you find it? Eh. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Will that prove I was here this morning, Friday? Yeah, yeah. Will, will that prove it, Inspector? Nobody's talking to you, Shorty. Hey, all right. Oh. Oh. You're attacking. Come on, let's go inside. <laughs> now, as you go into the house, the living room is to the right, Inspector. And to the left of the foyer, there's a large sofa. Now, if you... Now, if I what? Hey, boss. But you're happy. Hey, what is this? This is an empty house. A five-year-old kid could see that. Well, let's go get a five-year-old kid. Hey, Inspector Faraday, hey. This place ain't been lived in for months. The dust is an inch thick, hey? Okay, Blackie. Explain your way out of this. Why, I don't understand it. The house was completely furnished when I was here at 2 o'clock this morning. Not this house. But of course it was this house. That scratch on the door out there proves it. It was made with a lock, Jimmy, Inspector Hayes. I could tell that. At 2 o'clock this morning, I was standing right here. And Evelyn Jones was sitting on a sofa right over there. This house is empty. Uh, excuse me, Inspector Friday, but it ain't exactly empty. Yeah? Why not? Well, it's got a dame in it that's lying over there in the corner. She's uh, a little bit dead. Uh-oh. Don't move, Blackie. Who is it? Well, you wouldn't want me to tell you a lie, would you, Inspector? She's Evelyn Jones. The girl I told you about. 
So you eliminate first and identify him later, don't you, Blanky? Okay, maybe we'll go easy with you on account of that. Maybe we'll put a pillow on the back of your electric chair. Now back to Boston Blackie. Forced to act as bodyguard for Evelyn Jones because he believes his friend Mary Wesley is being held prisoner, Blackie loses track of the Jones girl and is himself knocked unconscious. Hours later, while he's pleading with Faraday to help him find either Evelyn Jones or Mary Wesley, Mary phones that she's all right. Then Blackie and Faraday go to the house where Blackie says he was knocked out. And though Blackie claims it was completely furnished, the house is now empty and dust filled. Then they find Evelyn Jones dead. As we return to our story, Faraday is getting ready to take Blackie to headquarters. Don't you see what happened here, Faraday? The house next door to this is identical. That's the house I was in. But you said 484 was the number, and this is 484, and the scratch is on this door. How do you explain that? I don't know. The house I went into was, was furnished. I know that. It wasn't empty. The floors were clean, not covered with dust. Then why did we find the Jones girl in here? Because whoever she was meeting killed her in the house next door and brought her body over here. Hey, you expect the fire to hate? That's you, Rollins? Yeah. Well, what'd you find out next door? Old couple lives over there. Were there all last night, too. They don't know nothing. What about the door over there? Not a scratch on it. Uh, Blackie, who are you trying to kid? I don't know, unless maybe it's myself. I don't know. I just don't get it. Well, you're going to get it, and fast. Rollins? Yes, yeah, Inspector Hayes. Run next door and telephone headquarters. Sure. Tell them to send out the coroner, photographers, and fingerprint men right away. Right away, hey. Out of double, hey. Don't you want me to go with him, Inspector? You stay right where you are, Blackie. Don't forget I still have a gun on you. Don't you always? I said stay where you are. Can't I walk around the room a little? Okay. But that's all. Faraday, you're such a kind old master. Isn't he, Shorty? Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you doing over there? Just seeing where the door leads. Looks like a closet door. Let's see how the family skeleton is doing. That nose of yours is going to get you in trouble someday. Sniff. It's sniff. Well, see what I tell you. It's a closet. Faraday, you thought there was only one body in this house. You're only half right. Here's another. Another body? Where? In the closet. Here, right here, look. There's no body in there. You mean there wasn't, Faraday, but there is now, Inspector, yours. Uh, uh, What the fuck? Blackie, Blackie, I like it. Well, I love it, Shorty. Let the inspector out just before Rollins gets back. I don't know yet, except I'm sure it's out of here. Keep off when I let him out of here. The closet, what am I going to tell him? Faraday is always telling everybody to be quiet. Ask him how it feels for him to be shut up. Hello? Mary, this is Blackie. Oh, Blackie. What's the matter? Uh, just the usual. Faraday wants me for murder. Oh, Blackie. Not again. Oh, Mary. Yes, again. <laughs> what are you going to do? Meet you in the lobby at 21 West 18th Street. What for? I want to see an apartment about a clue. <laughs> But, uh, Blackie, what are we looking for? The name of the man Evelyn Jones was meeting in that house and what she was delivering to him. Well, I guess this is the right place to look then, isn't it? Uh, Mary, look around carefully, will you? And help me? Yes, sure. For a book, a, a letter, a newspaper. Even a cigarette butt may be all we need. Okay. Ah, here's a letter on her desk. It's, um, it's only partly written. Let's have a look at it. Or is it just about the weather? No, no, it isn't. It says, Dear Bob, uh-huh. you remember those letters I wrote you about last month? Well, it looks as if I'll be out there with you in a week or two, a very wealthy little girl. That's enough. That, that's all there is, Bob. It sounds to me as if she was blackmailing somebody. Definitely. Well, this explains her meeting somebody in that house at two in the morning and why she was afraid something would happen to her. Of course, she went to that house for the payoff. Only the payoff she got was not negotiable. Yes, but whom was she blackmailing? That? My sweet is a question without an answer. I asked Goodwin, huh? You proud of me? That's the second question without an answer. Keep looking. Oh. Hey, what's this? Oh. 
typewritten note of some kind. Blackie, look what it says. Yeah. That one. Meet me at 484 Willow Street at 2 a.m. Next Monday morning, signed J. Corrigan. That's it. That's the man she met, and that's the man who killed her. Maybe. Mr. Corrigan is quite a character in the blackmail business. I think I'll see him and see about this. All right, Corrigan. Let's have the whole story in straight. I've got nothing to hide from you, Blackie. I was doing business with Evelyn Jones. Were you blackmailing her, or was she blackmailing you? We were doing business together, Evelyn and I. Evelyn had the letters... I had to know how. We were going to share a take of 100000 50 50 Who wrote those letters? A fellow by the name of Gerald Lawson. Has enough dough to buy Fort Knox, Lock, Stock, and Bullion. Oh, I get it. Evelyn didn't want to blackmail Lawson directly, so she hired you to do the job for half the stake. She couldn't have hired a better man. Then you met her at 484 Willow Street at 2 o'clock this morning, where she was to give you the letters. It was 3 o'clock, but she never showed up. 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, it's unimportant. But what is important, Carrigan, is that you're lying. You not only saw her, you took the letters from her, then killed her so you wouldn't have to divide your hundred thousand. So? I have proof you planned to meet Evelyn in that house on Willow Street. A note you wrote to her. I found it in her apartment. I admit I wrote that letter. So what? So that means she was going there to meet you. So she was going there to meet me. I admit that's true. But you can't prove a thing against me, Blackie. Don't you think you ought to admit that? and kill Evelyn Jones? Of course he did, Mary. Well, then let's go to the police. We can't, Mary. I I can't prove anything yet. But I'm going to let Corrigan convict himself. Will he? He has Evelyn's letters. He knows Gerald Lawson will pay him $100,000 for them. Oh, I see. When he goes to Mr. Lawson with the letters, he'll prove that he met Evelyn Jones. And that will prove that he killed her. Mary, you're brilliant. Oh, I'm going places as a detective. Well, I'm going places as a detective, too. The Gerald Lawson's office. That door there, Mr. Blackie. Mr. Lawson will see you. And on my way out, uh, I'll see you. Just go right in. Thank you. Gerald Lawson? Oh, yes. Yes. Sit down. down. Thanks, I will. I I understand you want to see me about some letters? Oh, I don't have them, uh, Mr. Lawson. But I know who does. Oh? A man by the name of Corrigan. Oh, but I... I don't... Uh, could I make a suggestion? Go to the police. Tell them that Corrigan is trying to blackmail you. When they find those letters on him, he'll go to jail for the murder of Evelyn Jones. Oh, no. No, no, I... I, I can't go to the police. Why not? Under those letters, I, I'd have to tell the police about them. Then they'd probably be read and... Uh, I, I'd be ruined. I'd much rather pay any amount to Corrigan to get those letters privately. Well, then, maybe we'll have to do this the hard way. Well, I don't care, but what do we do? We have to make Corrigan show up for those letters. That will prove he saw Evelyn, killed her, and took them from her. Oh, but I, I've already made it clear to him that I'll pay. All right. Let's write him a letter. Have it delivered by a messenger and arrange a meeting for this afternoon. I'll hide nearby, and when he hands you the letters, we'll destroy them and hand Corrigan over to the police as Evelyn Jones' murderer. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Just leave it on my desk. Yes. Uh, uh, Pat, you'd better look at it, Blackie. All right. Here you are. Anything else, sir? Oh, no, no. That'll be all, Miss Walters. Yes. Well, Blackie, will that note do? Will it do? It does wonders. See the smaller piece of paper in my hand? Yes. It's the note which made the appointment for Evelyn Jones to come to 484 Willow Street. Oh, well, which Corrigan wrote, of course. Which you wrote, Lawson. On the same typewriter your girl used to type out the letter you just dictated. You, you can't tell that? I can, because the defective letter L and the numeral Q are identical on each note. That would stand up in a court of law. All right. So what if they were written on the same typewriter? It doesn't mean anything. You went to Evelyn's apartment looking for your letters. You couldn't find them, but in her mailbox you did find a note from Corrigan. Evelyn hadn't seen it yet. This is, this is nothing but theory. Theory can turn out to be the truth, you know. You brought Carrigan's note here to your office, destroyed it, 
then wrote one of your own to her, changing the time of the meeting from 3 o'clock, when Corrigan wanted to see it, to 2 o'clock. But, but Evelyn was found in Corrigan's house. You, you can never prove that I was in it. Glad you mentioned that house, Lawson. That's the one thing I still don't understand. But I'll go to work on that as soon as Faraday goes to work on you. All right, all right, class. Everybody in the lineup room? Yes, Mr. Hayes. All right, keep him standing up there under those lights. Now, where's the old man who lives at 486 Willow Street? Right here, Mr. Faraday. Inspector Faraday. Quiet, Rocky. Yes, Mr. Faraday. All right, you. Which one of those guys in the lineup is Gerald Lawson? Uh, no, no. That one there on the end. Oh, I never saw that old man before. Quiet, Lawson. Quiet, Lawson. Quiet, Lawson. Quiet, Lawson. quiet, Faraday. Yes, I'll be quiet, too. All right, you. How do you know, Mr. Lawson? He came to my house three days ago and offered my wife and me a thousand dollars to get out of our house for two days and not to say a word about it, even to the police. He said it was a joke. All right, Lawson. What do you say to that? Nothing. Look, we know you wrote letters to the Jones girl. We know she was going to blackmail you. We know that message you faked was written on your typewriter. You know a lot, don't you? And Grandpa here has identified you. So talk. What was all this business of switching houses, Lawson? Ignore that question, Lawson. Gladly. But answer this one. What was all this business of switching houses, Lawson? Wonderful question, Inspector. Quiet, Blackie. Go on, Lawson, talk. I... I have nothing to say. He doesn't have to say anything now. He went out to 484 Willow Street after he opened Evelyn's letter... Then he saw the house next to 484 was identical and got an idea. So that gave you an idea, Lawson. It might even have given you one, Faraday. Yes, yes that gave me an idea. I, I was desperate. I, I borrowed the house from the old couple and sent Evelyn the note to, to meet me at 2 o'clock, an hour earlier than she was to meet Corrigan, and then I, I switched the house numbers so that when Evelyn arrived at 484, she came into my house and Corrigan. So you killed him and took the letters? Yes, after I knocked out Blackie's here, I switched the house numbers back to their original position and put Evelyn's body in Corrigan's house. Well, that explains everything. With the exception of a door, Faraday, why did you switch the doors in the two houses, Lawson? I, I had to. You made a scratch on the door when you broke the lock, so I, I had to switch them when I put the house numbers back where they belonged. Thanks, Lawson. Well, Faraday, I've heard of one on the house, but this is the first house I've ever heard of that was one on us.
favorite non-entity, Inspector Faraday. Bad morning, Inspector. You shouldn't have not. I didn't. Frankie, I'm looking for Whitey Barnes, the safe cracker. Do you know him? Barnes? Let's see. Say, I have a picture of a guy called Whitey Barnes, but I don't think he's a safe cracker. Wait, I'll get it for you. Thanks. I'm getting somewhere. As soon as I get you this picture, you're getting somewhere out of here. Grab that phone, will you, Faraday? Phone to wait a minute. Okay. Hello? Hello? I'd like to speak to Boston Blackie, please. It's very important. Who is it, Faraday? Uh, just a minute. Uh, it's uh, it's not for you. Uh, it's headquarters. I told them they could reach me here. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, this is Boston Blackie. Uh, what do you want? I want you to open a safe for me. Uh, now, look, lady. I don't do things like that. If you want your safe open, why don't you go to the police? Oh, dear me, no. The police are lovely. But they aren't clever enough to do a thing like this. Well, now, lady, uh, the police aren't exactly dumb. Oh, dear me, no, not exactly. But this is very difficult, and it's terribly important. I want you to do it. Uh, sorry, lady, nothing doing. Goodbye. Oh, so that was headquarters, wasn't it, Friday? All right, so it was for you. Maybe I shouldn't have done it, but I kept you out of trouble. Why don't you think about that? And maybe you left somebody else in trouble. Why don't you think about that? Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. Coming. Boston Blackie? Yes? I'm Alice Warden Bandevere. May I come in? Oh, of course. Please do. Oh, you're so kind. I hope I'm not imposing on you too much. After all, you did refuse me on the telephone... But I thought that if perhaps I came in person... I didn't refuse you at all, Mrs. Vanderveer. You were talking to Inspector Faraday of the police. <gasps> oh, dear me. And I told him I wanted my safe open. I've spoiled everything. <laughs> I don't think you've spoiled anything. Faraday's a fairly understanding cop. Now, won't you sit down? Then you will consider my proposition? I am sure I will as soon as I find out what it is. Uh, please sit down. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what's this all about, Mrs. Vanderveer? Well, I have a problem. I'm 70 years old, you know. Being 70 is a problem? You make it look very easy. Oh, thank you. It isn't my age I'm thinking about. Blackie, my life has been so useless. I want to do something. Something big. Something helpful to others before I die. Well, you have money. Mm, that's what everyone thinks. Actually, all I have is a very small income and a large diamond tiara. Very valuable, but terribly ugly. It would bring a lovely price if it were sold. Then why don't you sell it? I can't. It's an heirloom, handed down in my family for generations. It can't be either sold or given away. No one in the family likes it, but it's too ugly to wear. So it sits in your safe? Yes. Well, uh, how can I help? Um... Uh, if uh, <clears throat> the tiara was stolen, there's very little I could do about it, is there? <laughs> well, I don't think the insurance company would like that. Oh, I cancel the insurance on it. I brought the papers along to show you. You're really serious about this, aren't you? Oh, dear me, yes. You steal it, break it up, sell the diamonds, and give the money to a charity. I don't want a penny of it. Well, as a matter of fact, I know someone who is very interested in an orphanage. My friend Mary Wesley would, uh, Oh, perhaps... dear me, I, I don't care what charity it goes to. Miss Wesley's would be fine, I'm sure. Will you rob the safe for me tonight? I'll give you the combination. No, don't do that, Miss Vanderveer. I don't want you involved in this any more than necessary. Oh, dear me, yes, that's right. You don't need a combination to get into a safe, do you? <laughs> I haven't needed one yet. Oh, I'm so happy that you'll do this. I was sure you would. Well, let's just hope nothing happens before I get it done. Don't worry, please. Absolutely nothing can go wrong. Oh, Blanky, please hurry. Strange houses make me nervous. A fine safe crack of assistant you are, Mary. Oh, 
Will you hurry and open this safe, darling? Oh, I want to take my time with this one. This is fun. Just like a picnic, I suppose. Not exactly. There aren't any ants. <laughs> hey, darling, why aren't you wearing your gloves? What for? I'm just cracking this box for fun. Oh, come on, Mary. Relax and enjoy yourself. This is supposed to be a party. Well, I like parties better than picnics. I'm an indoor gal. Indorable, I'd say. Oh, Blackie. <laughs> You're silly. <laughs> come on, come on, please. Hurry up. So all we'll right, go. Mary, all right. I think it's open right now. What a noise. I don't think this box has been opened since Mrs. Vanderveer was born. Can you find the tiara? I can't miss it. There it is. Look at it. No wonder Mrs. Vanderveer wants to get rid of the hideous, isn't it? But look at the diamonds in it. Wow. When we break it up, do you know what we'll get for these stones? At least 50000 And if somebody walks in here and catches us, do you know what we'll get then? At least 50 years. <laughs> Inspector Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Alice Warden Vanderveer. You mean you're all three of them? Can't you hear me? I said this is Alice Warden Vanderveer. Oh. Oh, 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 excuse me, Mrs. Vanderveer. How are you, Mrs. Vanderveer? Oh, I'm terrible. My safe was robbed last night. Okay, I'll have fingerprint men up there in five minutes. Don't touch anything, especially that safe. All right. And uh, if you don't mind, Mrs. Vanderveer, I'd like you to come down to my office this morning and give me a description of whatever is missing. Well, I'll certainly be there. You can expect me in a few hours. Thank you, Mrs. Vanderbilt. I think you will thank me more when I tell you who robbed my face. Hello. Blackie, this is Mary. Good morning, Mary. How did you feel giving $50,000 to charity this morning? Never mind about that. Have you heard the radio today? Mrs. Alice Warden Vanderveer is a double-crosser. What? She's told the police that safe of hers was robbed. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And, Blackie, you know whose fingerprints are on that safe? Oh, somebody named me. Yes, darling, somebody named you. Mary, this is one time Faraday really has me behind his own personal hate ball. I've got to keep away from him. Now, Blackie, don't you be stubborn. You go see the inspector and you tell him the whole story, please. I get it. I'm to give in, give up, and give out. Hello, Faraday. Stay out of here, Blackie. I'm busy. Well, I'm going to make things easy for you. Mr. Scram, I'm working on an important case. Alice Warden Vanderbilt's safe was robbed last night, and I'm out to get the thief. You know who robbed that safe, Inspector? No, but I will. I did. I heard about the robbery only two hours ago. How did... What did you say? I said, I robbed the safe. Nah. Yes. You didn't. I did. You'll find my prints on the safe door. Maybe all over it. Oh. You'd wear gloves. I was in a hurry. I forgot them. Your prints are on the safe door, huh? I'll see about that. I want to explain this thing, Faraday. Blackie, if this is one of your tricks... Yes, Inspector Faraday. Williams, you have a report yet on the fingerprints we found on the Vanderbilt safe? Yes, sir. Did they check with any we have in the file? No, sir. What? They don't check with our files, but we made prints of everybody in the Vanderbilt house and found out the prints belonged to the son, Tom Vanderbilt Jr. Well, I'll be... Okay, Williams, thanks. Now, will you believe me, Faraday? Another one of your tricks, huh? I thought so. Tricks? What do you mean? I mean your prints aren't on the Vanderbilt safe. But Faraday... Get I... out of here. Look, Inspector, you I got said to... get out of here and stay out. All right. And just be glad I don't throw you in jail for obstructing justice. You're a policeman, Faraday, but you're the biggest obstruction justice ever had. Yes? Williams, are you sure those fingerprints didn't check with any in our file? They belong to Tom Vanderveer Jr. The fingerprint department guarantees it. Okay. Send out an alarm to have young Vanderveer picked up. Yes, sir. And uh, Inspector Mrs. Alice Warden Vanderveer is here to see you. Send her in. She's coming in now. Good. Inspector Faraday. Hey, uh, come in, Mrs. Vanderveer. I brought you a description of what was stolen from my safe. Here it is, written down on this sheet of paper. Thanks, Mrs. Vanderveer. This will be a great help. Oh, I want to do all I can to make sure you catch the thief. Well, um, tell me, Mrs. Vanderveer, who do you think robbed your safe? Boston Blackie. Boston Black. 
What makes you suspect him? Well, he's been in my house uh, several times on uh, parties there, and he knew the jewels were in the safe. Well, uh, you know whose fingerprints we found on the safe door? Yes. Your son. Tom? No, no, that's impossible. Why would Tom rob the safe? Everything in it would have been here someday. Is that true? Why, of course. He's my only heir. And Markham, that is Mr. Vanderbilt, leaving all he owns to him. Hmm. That's an angle I haven't thought of. Well, don't worry, Mrs. Vanderbilt. We'll have to pick up your son uh, on just a routine charge, of course, but I'm sure that we won't be holding him long. Oh, thank you, Inspector Faraday. You're so kind. Uh, do you want me for anything more? No, thanks, Mrs. Vanderbilt. Well, if I can do any more for you, you can reach me at my home. Uh, thank you. I'll do that. Goodbye, Inspector Faraday. Goodbye, Mr. Vanderbilt. I'll sit for Mr. Vanderbilt. Inspector Faraday send you home in a police car. Oh, how nice. This way, Mr. Vanderbilt. This door here. Thank you. Mark. Yeah? This is Mrs. Vanderveer. The inspector wants you to drive her home. Okay, William. Get in, lady. I'll help you, Mrs. Vanderveer. Uh, I can help myself, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to 2121 Riverside Boulevard, driver. Right, lady. All right, Mrs. Vanderveer. You better do some explaining. Why, it's you. Black and Blackie. And you. Alice Worden Vanderveer, philanthropist, pillar of society, and first-rate double-crosser. I am. You're the one who's uh, what do you call a, a double-crosser. Uh, the diamond tiara isn't the only thing missing from my face. A hundred thousand dollar pearl necklace was stolen, too. What? And you took it when you took the diamond tiara. Uh-huh. I see right through this one. You stole that necklace, then had me steal the tiara... So I'd be blamed for both. I wouldn't do such a thing. I'm a respectable old woman. Yes, and for the first time, I really believe you're 70 years old. Why do you say that? Because no one under 70 could have lived long enough to figure out a gag as tricky as this. And now back to Boston Blackie. Blackie robbed the Vanderveer safe of a diamond tiara. He didn't even wear a glove because he was stealing the jewels at the owner's request. Next morning, though, Mrs. Vanderveer goes to the police to report that not only the tiara, but a valuable necklace is missing. What's more, the fingerprints found on the safe don't belong to Blackie, but to Mrs. Vanderveer's son. Mrs. Vanderveer, however, still accuses Blackie of the theft. As we return to our story, Blackie brings Mrs. Vanderveer to the door of her home. Mrs. Vanderveer, you and I are going inside and have a little talk. That pearl necklace was not in the safe when I robbed it. And just where do you think it was, Becky? Right where it is now, in some pawn shop where you put it. Wait, I'll open the door. I can open it myself, thank you. Pretty clever of you. The pearl necklace was probably insured. You not only get the insurance money for it, but an additional amount for selling it. The pearl necklace isn't even mine. It belongs to my husband, Markham. All the more reason why you sell it. Well, you're very... What's the matter? You have company. I'm not expecting any more. Three. She just sits there. She's asleep, I think. Young lady. Young lady. Maybe you'd better shake it just a little. Yes, she seems to be... Oh, oh, with those marks on her neck. You can't waken her, Mrs. Vanderveer. She's dead. Dead? Oh. Who is she? Uh, uh, I've never seen her before in my life. Maybe something in her purse will tell oh. who she is. Oh, dear Dad, I don't know what to do. Sit down while I go to her purse. No, no. What are you expect to find? Tell her her identification oh. card, calling card or something. Oh, Oh, dear me, I feel safe. Hmm. Oh. Here's something. A ring, a wedding ring. Oh. They have... Yes, it does. It does what? It has initials inside it. Fairly sharp, too. Oh. They say to B.L. from T.V. Jr. T.V. Jr.? Yes, you know what this means, too, don't you, Mrs. Vanderveer? 
this girl was your son's wife. That's impossible. My son isn't married, and he never was married. This proves he was. Oh, it's an amazing coincidence. Where's the telephone? Over there on the desk. Thanks. Well, what are you going to do? Call Inspector Faraday of the police. There's just a chance your son ran out of here and right into the loving arms of the law. <laughs> Blackie, this is Mary. I'm at the marriage bureau, and I have those records. Learn anything? Yes, you were right. Tom Vanderbilt Jr. married Beatrice Lane six months ago. Well, well, that'd be a surprise to Mrs. Vanderbilt. Well, I don't know why it should be. She was a witness to the wedding. What? Sure. Both she and Mr. Malcolm Vanderbilt signed the certificate as witnesses. And she told me she'd never seen the girl before in her life. What does this mean, Blackie? It means our sweet old lady may be not only a very clever jewel thief, but a cold-blooded murderess. That's my guess, anyhow. It's a good guess. But there's a key figure in this thing we haven't talked to yet. Yes, I know. Markham Vanderbilt, the husband. Tom's father. Tom's father was Markham's brother. Markham is Mrs. Vanderbilt's second husband. Oh, is that so? Yes, and I'm going to see him. Because maybe a second husband will give me a second guess. <laughs> find your stepson, this case is closed. I, I think that, I think I can save you a lot of trouble on that score, Inspector Faraday. Well, you can save me more than trouble if you will get rid of that cat you're carrying. Cats worry me. My cat won't harm anyone. I think you better hear what I have to say. You know something? Yes, I do. Well, you're way ahead of all of us, then. Blackie, get out of here. Get out? Oh, no. I seem to arrive just in time. You were the cat. You must be Markham Vanderveer. Yes. All right, Blanky. Now, what do you want to say, Mr. Vanderveer? I'm the one you're looking for. What? Yes. I really didn't intend to kill this girl, but she caught me talking on the phone. Well, I haven't caught talking on the phone a thousand times. I haven't killed anyone for it. I think what Mr. Vanderveer means is that his daughter-in-law caught him talking to a fence about how much he expected for the pearls he stole. That's right. I took the pearls. When? Last night. Why? Well, they were mine, you know, but, well, I needed money. So I knew what Mrs. Vanderbilt had arranged with Boston Blackie here. And at 12 o'clock last night, I came down here, waited until Blackie had gone, and then I slipped in and took the pearls. What time was this? 12 o'clock. Exactly midnight. Ouch! What's the matter? Hey, hey, you always throw that cat around? The cat scratched me. Go away. Go away. Two, two. All right, Markham. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute, Inspector. I've got a confession, Blanky. Now, you stay out of this. Vanderbilt's confession isn't worth the police typist trouble. He's just covering up for Tom. I did it, I tell you. Tom's innocent. Then so are you. You said you took the pearls out of the safe at 12 o'clock. After I had opened the safe. Sorry, Vanderbilt. Nice try, but I didn't have the safe open until after 2 o'clock. Well, all right. All right what? Blackie is right. I wasn't telling the truth, Inspector. I I just wanted to protect Tom. Forgive me, Inspector, but... Well, sure, sure, Vanderveer. I understand. What do you understand, Inspector? But Vanderveer here was just trying to protect his son. You amaze me, Faraday. You're not going to make the mistake of arresting an innocent man. When have I ever arrested a guy who wasn't guilty? Let's not go into that, Inspector. Let's just get out of here. You don't mind stopping by my apartment a minute, Mary? No, no, of course not, Blackie. It may take a little while to get hold of Shorty, but it may be worth it. Sure. Don't move. We're going to... Well, this must be Tom Vanderveer. I've got a gun. I'll kill you if you move either one of you. Got to be careful. Sorry, Mary. Tom, I think you'd better get out of here. Oh, no. You robbed my father's safe. You got me into this. I'm not leaving until you get me out. I robbed your father's safe, sure. The diamond tiara. But you took the pearls. I did not. Your fingerprints were on the safe door. Only because I closed the door. All right. You didn't take the pearls. But you're still wanted for murder. Murder? You killed your wife. Beatrice is dead. 
You ought to know. You killed her. Beatrice is dead. No, she can't be. She can't be. Look, Tom, if I were you, I... Please don't say anymore. I don't think he knew she was dead. May I... May I sit down somewhere, please? Sure, Tom. Here. I'll give you a hand. Take my gun with you. I I don't don't want it. Put it on the table there, Mary. Beatrice is dead. That can't be true. I... How do you know that? How do you know it was my wife? I found her wedding ring in her purse. Beatrice had... In her purse? Her ring was in her purse? That's where I found it. She never carried it with her. We were keeping it a secret from her family. I kept that room... I kept it in my room. It couldn't be Beatrice. I'm sorry, but it was. May, May I go and lie down a moment, and then I want to see Beatrice? Sure. That's the door to the bedroom there. Thank you. I... I won't be long, and then you can take me to Beatrice or to the police or anywhere. I, I don't care. I, I don't care. Oh, Blackie, I feel so sorry for him. And the worst for him isn't over yet. What do you mean? Well, first he's lost his wife. Now I think he's going to lose his mother. Is he the one, Blackie? What do you think? Well, if the old lady didn't do it, who did it? I don't know. How was Tom's wife killed? Maybe that's a clue. She was strangled. Oh. Well, would Mrs. Vanderbilt be strong enough for that? I don't know. Let's try to reenact the crime. It may help. Oh, goody. Just like the movies. All right. I put my hands in your throat like this and press. Now, what do you do? Hey, hey, not so hard. Ouch! What's the idea of scratching my hands? Well, you ask me what I do if you tilt me. That's what I do. Oh. You satisfied? Sure. Yeah, that accomplished a lot, didn't it? Now you know what'll happen to you if you ever do want to strangle me. Hey, wait a minute. We've hit something. Have we? What a clever guy that Markham Vanderveer is. While Markham was faking his confession to Faraday, he was holding a cat. Suddenly, he pretended that the cat had scratched him. Oh, Blackie, that is clever. The police would think that any scratches on his hand were made by the cat. Right. And his confession was clever, too. He, He made that error in time on purpose. Just to make sure I'd know it was a phony. Well, Blackie, they can tell the difference between a cat scratch and a human scratch. We can do it at the hospital. I'm going to call Faraday. And if that girl scratched Mr. Vanderbilt, the coroner can tell by her fingernail. Don't worry, Mary. I know I have this straight this time. Thanks to that cat Vanderbilt was holding. Isn't it strange that it was a cat's claw that put the finger on Markham Vanderveer? <laughs> Faraday, I suppose you're plenty proud of the way you solved this case. I always solve my cases. Now, what was the idea of saying your fingerprints were on that safe? They were, Faraday. Only after I opened the safe, Mrs. Vanderveer cleaned the door just to protect me. Then the son came along a little later and closed it. That's why you found his prints on it, not mine. Later, she denied that she knew her daughter-in-law to try to protect Tom. Probably. But, Blackie, when I make him confess, I do it right. I know Markham Vanderveer's motive now and everything. I can guess his motive for stealing the pearls. He needed the money he got from pawning them plus the insurance money. And he actually told why he killed the girl in the phony confession. She caught him arranging to sell the pearls. Yeah. And to plant the murder on Tom, he got the dead girl's wedding ring and put it in a purse. Mm Mm-hmm. Did the coroner back up our theory that the girl and not the cat scratched Markham's hand? Sure. That was proved in the coroner's investigation. Markham's a cinch for the chair. Yes, we're just about perfect, Faraday. We conduct a little investigation, and the killer conducts a little electricity.
Oh, golly, I'm hungry enough to eat standing up, Mary. <laughs> Good evening. Table for two? Yes, please. Right this way, sir. Sounds as if we're in luck, Mary. We're getting a table. It's probably because they don't know us here. Good point. The thing I put up with on account of your reputation. My reputation? Yes, <laughs> I think the young lady will be comfortable on this side. Oh, thank you. Dinner, sir? Yes, I think so. What do you mean you think so? <laughs> oh, I right, dinner. I always recommend the filet mignon to those who come into my restaurant for the first time. I'm sure you'll like it. I'll have a way to take your order right away. Thank you. I wonder if I have a filet mignon look on my face now. <laughs> when don't you? Oh, you. Hey, Blackie, a man's coming over to our table. You know him? Excuse me, but aren't you Boston, Blackie? Yes, I am. My name is Bill Crane. Do you mind if I sit down just for a moment? Why, uh, uh, sure, yes. Thank you. Blackie, for days I've been trying to get up nerve enough to phone you. When I saw you come in, I knew it was now or never. <laughs> oh, excuse me. This is Mary Wesley. How do you do, Mr. How do you do? You wanted to phone me, Crane? What about? I'm an attorney, Blackie. You look pretty young to be practicing law. Well, I've had only a few cases and lost my only big one. I was defending Jack King. Oh, I remember that case. He was sent to prison for forgery. That's right, Miss Wesley. I was Jack King's lawyer. Oh, that was months ago. You shouldn't feel too badly about losing. King was guilty. That's not true. I don't have any proof. But King is innocent. Well, they all say they're innocent. Blackie, won't you help me? Forget the case, Crane. It's no disgrace to lose. Well, I suppose I don't have a right to ask you for help. In fact, if Charlie Kingston hadn't suggested I talk to you, I wouldn't have bothered you now at all. Oh, oh did Charlie Kingston asked you to see me? Yes, he did. Well, if you're Charlie's friend, I'll do anything I can. Tell me all about Jack King. Not here, Blackie. I don't want anyone to hear what I have to say. And now, meet Richard Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friends. <laughs> Okay, this is as far as visitors go. You'll talk to Jack King in here. Thanks, God. This is it, Frank. I know, Blackie. Are you two guys sit right here in these chairs in front of the screen? Yes, yes, we know. Now, no smoking, and don't try to slip anything through the screen to the prisoner. You'll be what? Hmm, a peak easy. Yeah, okay. There's King. Hey, King, your visitors are right here. You got five minutes with them and no more. Hello, Jack. How are you? Oh, all right, Bill. I'm Sidwin. Jack, this is Boston Blackie. Glad to know you, Blackie. How are you? Now, look, Jack. I've told Blackie everything. I gave him the names of the three witnesses who testified against you. I'm going to start with them. It's obvious they were fixed. Sure they were fixed. One guy identified by I never even seen him before. Now, look, Jack, I, I hope you don't mind, but I thought it would be smart to tell Blackie everything. Even about Iowa City. That's okay. I served time out in Iowa City. I just got out two years ago. That wasn't mentioned at your trial, was it, Jack? No, I served time under another name. There's one thing I haven't told you yet, though, Blackie. The one man in the world who could have cleared Jack was murdered the, the day Jack went to trial. Well, that just about proves you were framed, Jack. Sure, but what can you do about it? All I have to do is find the guy who killed your witness, Jack. Because if he isn't the man who framed you, he's a lead to the man who did. <laughs> Um, this is the beauty parlor you wanted, Blackie. Carson's at 600 Erie Avenue. Well, if Bill Crane gave me the right dope, Mary. King used to manage this place, and the cashier is one of the three witnesses who testified against Well, then suppose we go right in and start asking questions. No. Here's what we're going to do. You go in first and pretend to be making an appointment. I'll come in a few seconds later and talk to her then. Oh, and I pretend I don't know you, huh? That's right. I see. If the cashier was fixed, 
She'll get scared and have to talk to somebody. So after I leave, the first thing she'll do is rush to the telephone. Um, if she does that, should I phone you at your apartment? No. After I leave here, I'm going to the Charles Street Bank to speak to Ralph Lyons. He was the teller that testified against King. I'll call you at your place. All right. Now, go in. And no matter what happens, you don't know me. Now, do you understand? I'll be good, Daddy. And if you have to get a manicure before you find out anything, I'll pay for it. I'll say you will. I may have to get a permit, too. I'm slow at finding out things. <laughs> Oh, uh, good afternoon. Are you uh, Lillian Birch? Why, yes, I am. Well, I'm Boston Blackie. I'd like to ask you a few questions about the Jack King case. Oh, yes. I'll tell you frankly what I'm after. Jack King had a witness who could have cleared him, but that witness was murdered the day King went to trial. I don't know anything about that. Maybe not, but if I can find that murderer, I can find the man who framed King. Now... What was the story you told at the trial, Miss Birch? Well, Mr. King was manager here. We buy all our beauty supplies from Henry Lawrence, the wholesaler. Mm-hmm. Really a big order each month, so every now and then Mr. Lawrence would send Mr. King a check for 50 or $100, a sort of thank you, I guess. Well, uh, what about the check that was forged? Well, one day Mr. King gave me a check for $10,000. It was from Henry Lawrence. Mr. King had me take it to the bank for him, cash it, and bring the money to him at his house. And so you did? Yes. I felt simply awful when the check cleared Mr. Lawrence's bank, and he found out that the original figure, 100, had been changed to 10,000. I I felt as if I were guilty. And you told that story at King's trial? I told exactly what happened. What else could I do? I wish I could help you prove that Mr. King is innocent. I sure could use help like yours, Miss Birch. You certainly did a good job proving King was guilty. Something I can do for you, sir. This is the Charles Kate Bank? Yes. You're the manager? Yes, I am. I'm Boston Blackie. I'd like to speak to one of your tellers, uh, Ralph Lyons. Are you a friend of his? Yes, I am. Well, then, I suppose I can tell you. You suppose you can tell me what? The police just told us that Ralph Lyons was shot on the street ten minutes ago. All right, if I ask the Lyons kid a few questions, nurse. The doctor said only a few questions, Detective Faraday. That's all I need. I'll be back in a moment. Now, please don't excite me. I won't. Don't worry. Tom. Tom, can you hear me? Tom, I'm Inspector Faraday from the police. Who shot you, Ken? Tom, who shot you? Inspector Faraday. Huh? There's a man out here from headquarters who wants to see this boy. From headquarters? Take it easy, son. I'll be right back. Okay, nurse. Where is this guy who says he's from headquarters? This man right here. Blackie, you. Well, Inspector Faraday. So you're from headquarters, huh? I'm sorry, Faraday, but... I wondered how long it would take for you to get mixed up in this. What's your angle, Blackie? A triangle. I'm going to try to find out who shot Lance. Excuse me, but perhaps you'd better go down the hall and talk. Sure, nurse. Come on, Blackie. I want to talk to you. Let me do the talking, Faraday. This is important. I'm looking for evidence that will reopen the Jack King case and prove that King was framed. How does Lyons figure in the King case? Well, he was the bank teller who identified King as the guilty man. There were three witnesses against King. Lyons, Henry Lyons, whose check was forged, and Lillian Birch, a cashier at King's beauty parlor. So what's that got to do with somebody taking a shot at Lyons now? I'm looking for the guy who killed King's only witness, and I'm convinced the same man shot Ralph Lyon. Oh, get lost, will you? Look, Faraday, be a good guy, will you? And maybe I'll tell you who took somebody to have Lyons killed. Yeah? Who? Wait till I make a phone call, and I'll tell you. Hey, look. What do you mean you know who tipped somebody to shoot Lyons? A little while ago, I talked to Lillian Birch, one of the witnesses against Jack King. I told her I was looking for the man who killed his only witness. She looked a little scared when I left. So what? 
So I figured that the minute I was out that door, she'd run to the phone and tell somebody the King case was being investigated. She did, and that somebody got to Lyons with a bullet to shut him up. How can you check whether or not she went to a phone? I left Mary there to watch her. I'm calling her now, Friday. Hmm. Yeah, this one's in the bag. When I figure, I figure right on the nose. Hello? Oh, Mary, this is Blackie. Uh, what happened at the beauty parlor after I left? I happened to get my hair done. And you owe me $20. Oh, never mind the jokes, Mary. What did Lillian Birch do after I left? Nothing. She didn't go to the phone right away? She didn't go near the phone, and I watched it for three hours. Is that bad, Blackie? It's awful. I'll call you back later. Goodbye. Well, go ahead and gloat, Faraday. The cashier didn't make that call. So this was in the bag, huh, wise guy? Okay, so I was wrong. We still got a lead on the guy I'm after. Yeah. But it's our last chance. That kid in there. All we have to do is to find out who shot him. Well, come on. We have to talk to him. But go easy on your questions, Saturday. Remember, if he can't tell us who shot him, nobody can. One moment, please. Oh, nurse, uh, we've got to talk to that kid again. It's important. I'm afraid you're a little too late, gentlemen. The boy is dead. And now, back to Boston Blackie. In an effort to prove that Jack King, in jail for forgery, is an innocent man... Blackie has sought out the three witnesses whose testimony clinched King's conviction. Blackie suspects that the witnesses were six. The first witness, William Birch, tells the story of the forgery. The second, Ralph Lyons, the bank teller, is shot and killed before Blackie can talk to him. As we return to our story, Mary and Blackie are outside the restaurant where, the night before, Jack King's lawyer had interested Blackie in his client's case. Oh, Blackie, don't be upset. Come on, let's go into this restaurant and eat. Oh, I don't feel like eating, Mary. There's one witness I haven't seen yet, Henry Lawrence. It was his check King was supposed to have forged. Well, all right, go see Lawrence. But let's get a bite first. Oh, all right. Where? In here. This is where we had the delicious dinner last night, remember? But look through the window, Mary. There isn't an empty table anywhere. I know, but maybe we'll run into the owner again. He found us a table last Mary, night. Maybe can... take a good look through that window. He was sitting with the owner? Hey, it's the cashier from the Carson Beauty Parlor, Lillian Day. Uh-oh, she's leaving. Come on, we're going in. Blackie, what are you thinking? I'm not, but I've got a hunch I will soon. He's coming. Well, uh, Miss Birch, two meetings in one day just about makes us old friends, doesn't it? Well, Boston Blackie, hello. How's your investigation coming along? Uh, it's not doing very well. Oh, it's too bad. Well, it's nice seeing you again. Uh, here, uh, let me open the door for you. Well, goodbye till the uh, next time, if there is a next time. I'll make sure there is, Miss Birch. Blackie, do you flirt with every single girl you see? Absolutely not, Mary. Some of them are, well, they're a little too far away. Oh. <laughs> Come on, let's find a table. Good evening. Table for... Oh, good evening. Glad to see you again. Table for two? Of course. Right this way. How do you like being remembered? Why shouldn't you remember it? We were here only last night. I think it'll be comfortable at this table here. Thanks. Dinner? I think so. Blackie? Dinner. That is better. Say, it's a nice place you have here. You own it? Yes, I do. Is anything wrong? Oh, no, of course not. Uh, by the way, uh, who is that girl who just went out? Which girl? The tall, rather nice-looking blonde. She left just as we came in. I don't know. I didn't notice her at all. Oh. Oh, my fault. I knocked it off the table. Well, don't bother to pick it up. I'll get you another from this table. Here you are, sir. Enjoy your dinner. Thanks. He lied about that girl, didn't he? I wonder why. Do you think that he... I don't know. And that goes for almost everything about this case. <laughs> Don't give me any phony answers because I didn't give you any phony reasons for my being here. I was the victim of that forgery, Blackie. It cost me $9,900. You got it back, I'm sure of that. Oh, did I? And from who? From the man who paid you to frame Jack King. Sir, you don't know the circumstances of the forgery, do you? I sent him a gift check for $100. 
Went through my bank for 10000 Ralph Lyons was the teller who cashed it, huh? That's right. What's more, King was clever enough not to cash the check himself. He sent Miss Birch, his cashier, to the bank. Had her deliver the money to him and his house. Did King admit he was at home to get the money from Lillian Birch? No, he claimed he wasn't at home. He was out in the country with a man named Walter Lane. That I never got the money. And by a strange coincidence, Walter Lane was killed the morning of King's trial. So? So, the morning of King's trial, the same man who fixed you as a witness, that Lane out of the way. Get out of here. When I'm through? You're through now, Blackie. I'm a respectable businessman. I was the innocent victim of a forgery. I don't intend to let you accuse me of being a poor witness. I think you were, though, Lawrence. Get out of here, or would you rather I had the police call for you? I'll leave. But I'll be back again, and when I do, I'll have something for you. Either an apology or a warrant for your arrest. Oh, Blackie. What if Inspector Faraday catches up here at headquarters looking at his file? Faraday has trouble catching cold. Okay, I hope you're right. Um, are you sure this is the file we want, though? It says Walter Lane, but it might not be the right one. It's the right one, Mary. It was under unsolved cases. Maybe before we're through, we'll change that heading. Hmm. Yeah. It was shot to death. Here it says he was born in Iowa City, and he came to this city, uh, two years before he was killed. Yeah. King came from Iowa City two years ago, too. Maybe it was Lane. They were probably the best of friends, and whoever planned this knew they were together at the time they picked for the frame-up. That's why they had to get rid of Lane. Frankie, I was hoping you'd still be here. Inspector Faraday, well, come right in. What's the idea of telling Matthews I said you could look in my files? The idea was to get a look at your files. I could throw you in jail for this. Yes, I know. Here, take this file folder, will you? I got what I wanted out of it. Yeah? What was that? Information. And it's still there, Inspector. Only it requires a slight process you neglected in your youth. You've got to be able to read. So help me, Blackie, if I... Wait a minute. Hello, Faraday speaking. Inspector Faraday, this is Matthews about those fingerprints you wanted in that restaurant fork. What restaurant fork? Well, the one Blackie gave me. Said you wanted the print on it checked with our files. Blackie? Matthews, don't you know better than that? The inspector, the prints are hot. They belong to Edgar West, and he's wanted out in Denver or something big. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I know. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Matthews. Blackie, I ought to break your neck. But I know you're not going to, Inspector. I've found some important fingerprints for you, haven't I? Now, who'd they belong to? Edgar Weston. Wanted out in Denver. For what? Never mind for what. I want that guy. Where did you find him? What do you want him for? None of your business. Well, in that case, Faraday, where I found him is none of your business. <laughs> Golly, Blackie, how much longer do you have to hold that phone? Why won't the call come through? I don't know, Mary. Denver just said hold the wire. I wish they'd hurry. I wish a lot of things. I wish we could find someone with a previous record as a forger, for one thing. He'd be the man who framed King and engineered the killing of Walter Lane and Ralph Lyons. I'll cross my fingers. That'll help. That'll be the best help I've had from anything so far. Hello? Hello? Oh, the call's coming through. Uh, hello? Uh, hello, Inspector Faraday. Uh, yes, uh, this is Inspector Faraday. Well, this is Higgins of the Denver Police. Hello, Higgins. How are you? Okay. Uh, your telegram said you want some information on Edgar Weston, huh? That's right. What do you want him for? Well, we want him for forgery. <laughs> talking to Ed Weston. He's our man, so no slips. I'll do my best. I- I've dialed the restaurant. Be sure you mimic Lillian Birch the best you can. I didn't talk to her three hours today for nothing. You remember everything you're supposed to tell him? Well, I'll know that better later. Is it ringing? Mm-hmm. Hello? Ed? Yeah? Ed, this is Lillian. Lillian, fool, I told you never to call me here. Have you gone crazy? Just about, Ed. The cops are lied to you. What? I know the whole deal. I can't know anything. You're crazy. I'm not kidding, Ed. I know you're wanted in Denver for four dreams. I know you jacked up that Henry Lawrence press. Happy for you now. I don't know, but it's even worse, Ed. They said that you killed Ralph Lyons. They can't know. They can't have any proof. But they must have. They're after you. And they know you killed Walter Lane, too. Huh? Hey, you're not Lou. 
Uh-oh. Mary, what's the matter? Well, I must have said something wrong. You admitted the forgeries and telling the bank teller. But he knew I wasn't really in the minute I mentioned Walter Lane. So he hung up. Maybe he didn't kill Walter Lane. Nah. Then who did? I don't know, darling. Maybe you killed him. Maybe. All I know is this case is killing me. Faraday, do you mean I'm actually welcome in headquarters this time? Well, I have to hand it to you, Blackie. I had Ed Weston in custody in an hour, and he confessed to the forgery frame-up. What about Jack King? He's my real interest. King is getting a full pardon. His lawyer, that uh, Bill Crane, went up to get him out of prison last night. Weston killed Ralph Lyons, the bank killer, huh? Yeah, sure. And guess who tipped him to knock the guy off? I guess I did, Faraday. Yeah. When Bill Crane came over to me that first night in Weston's restaurant, and got me interested in King's case. Weston must have overheard us and gotten scared. Sure, Weston was the brains. And Ralph Lyons was the weakest link in the chain that had Weston's racket together. Lyons was due to be knocked off the minute somebody got wise to it. Did Weston admit killing Walter Lane? Well, that's the funny thing, Blackie. Weston says he never laid a finger on Lane. Well, I guess he's lying. I don't think so. When King and Bill Crane get back to town, I'll show you Lane's killer, Inspector. <laughs> They come up the ramp now, Blanky. Yep, here they are, Crane and King in person. Well, Blanky, how are you? Hello, Bill. Glad to see you. You know police inspector Faraday, don't you? Hello, how are you? you? I'm Jack. How does it feel to be out of jail again? Uh, well, Blanky, thanks for everything. I'm sorry to break up this little homecoming train, but I came down here on business. Business, Inspector? That's right, Bill. I managed to clear up everything for King but the murder of his alibi, Walter Lane. Didn't Weston confess to that? No, he didn't, Crane. Because you killed Walter Lane. What? Sure. I got it figured out that you get paid to throw the case. So you bunch your clients on the alibi. Come on, I'm taking it on the headquarters. Oh, wait a minute. Come on, oh, okay. Wait a minute, minute Faraday. What for? Look, King, you thanked me for getting you out of jail, didn't you? I sure it's the least I could do, Blackie. Well, I wish I hadn't, because I cleared you of a forgery charge and got you into a more serious one, murder. Uh, King, you killed Walter Lane. Why, you... Grab him, Faraday. Oh, no, you don't. You never catch me. Grab him, Faraday. Yeah, I've got five, Blackie. I've got men at every exit. Blackie King couldn't have killed Lane. Sorry, Bill. But King was out on bail until he went to trial, wasn't he? Yes, but Lane was the only man who could have cleared him. Lane was killed in the morning. King went to trial at noon. He didn't know he'd need Lane as an alibi until he heard the testimony against him at the trial that afternoon. But why, Blackie? Why would he kill Lane? What was his motive? I found the motive in the police records of Lane's death. Iowa City was the clue. Oh... I think even I see it now. Sure. Lane came here from Iowa City at the same time King did. Lane knew King at served time in prison in Iowa. He was going to blackmail him. <laughs> I can almost guess the conversation. Lane came to King the morning of the trial and said for a certain sum of money he'd forget King had a prison record. Too bad. Well, but... looks like everything is under control. My boys grabbed King. Okay, Faraday, you can take over from here, I suppose. You shouldn't have any trouble making King confess he killed Lane to stop a potential blackmail stunt. Do you think you're up to it, Faraday? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Wrong, Inspector. The reason I cracked this case and you didn't is that my guess is a whole lot better than yours. <laughs>
Can you get me my car, Jim? Oh, Blackie, back to Sure. Hey, Tom, get Boston Blackie's car. And tell him to hurry, Jim. Oh, you best, Blackie. And on a double time. And how much do I owe you? Uh, give me your parking check. I'll take the time. Oh, sure, sure. What you nervous about, Blackie? In a hurry, that's all. Here's the check. Thanks. Better stamp the time out before I can figure out what you owe me. There we are. How much do I owe you? And it's 7.45 and out at 8.12. That'll be 50 cents. Hey, uh, you keep the check. All right, here you are. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to drop it. Hey, Blackie, you sure are nervous. What's the matter? Hey, nothing, nothing. Hey, what's that on your sleeve? My sleeve? Yeah, that, that's the red stuff down there by the sleeve buttons. Oh. Blackie, that, that looks like blood. What is that? That, Jim, is none of your business. <laughs> And now we return to Richard Calmer's Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. Oh, uh, just a minute, please. Yes? You're Boston Blackie, aren't you? Yes, but I'm in a hurry. The I've got... switchboard operator said you'd be back. I've been waiting for you for two hours. Two hours? Sorry. I'd have waited two days if necessary. Say, don't I know you? Oh, you might. I'm Carol Williams. Oh, yes. You used to be pretty friendly with a fellow named Fred Allen. Yes. That's why I'm here. Fred got out of jail yesterday. I just wanted to warn you. About what? About Fred. He's going to kill you, Blackie. You mean he's going to try? You were the one that sent him to jail. You know what he promised to do when he got out. They all promised that. Yes, but Fred is different from the others. I ought to know I was his girl for three years. I don't know why you go to the trouble of warning me about Fred. He went to prison with no love for you. Or for his brother John. Or for Bill Andrews either. But you're the first on his list. I'll take care of myself. Don't worry. Look, Fred's getting to town today. I don't know how soon there'll be trouble. Would you take my new name and address? Just in case. New name? Yes, I moved to an apartment in 928 Davis Lane under the name of Leslie Barnes the day I heard Fred was getting out of jail. No one knows my new address or my new name. Well, I know it now. But nobody else. Look, let's stop fooling. What do you really want to talk to me about? Just what I told you. Stay out of Fred's way or he'll kill you. And I don't want him to kill you. And I don't want you to kill him. No? What do you want? Nothing but the pleasure of killing Fred Allen myself. All right, all right. Where do I get inside? All right, I said. I the rings when I'm coming in or going out or taking a shower. Okay, don't overdo it. Hello? Blackie, this is Faraday. It's all right, Inspector. I won't tell anybody. I've been trying to reach you for the last hour. Well, that's swell. If it's your last hour. I don't want any of your wisecracks, Blackie. I'm in room 802 in the Midland Hotel. Oh, and you're lonesome? No, I'm not lonesome. I've got a corpse to keep me company. Bet it outsmart you. Who's dead, Inspector? An old pal of yours, Blackie. A guy who swore to kill you as soon as he got back from a vacation in the big house. Fred Arlen? That's right, Blackie. He's been dead just a little while, and I have a hunch you killed him. You're hunch drunk as usual, Faraday. I didn't murder Arlen. Anybody I can murder for you today? Well, I don't say it was murder, Blackie. It was probably self-defense. But everybody in town knows Arlen was out to get you. Were you at the Midland Hotel a little while ago? When, when you ask me, that means you don't know. So why don't you try to find out? So long, Inspector. Blackie, you missed it. Yes? Suzanne? Yes, Blackie? Suzanne, were you at the lobby switchboard when I was down there talking to that young lady a little while ago? Oh, yes. I've been here since four this afternoon. Well, she said she'd been waiting for me for two hours. Is that right? Oh, no, Blackie. She came in about five minutes before you did. All right, you guys, finish with those pictures and rush those fingerprints down to headquarters. we got to get that body out of here. All right, right away, Inspector. All right, you. You're the dead guy's brother, huh? Yes, Inspector Faraday. I'm John Arlen. 
Uh, this gun in my handkerchief. Never see it before? No, I don't think so. Got any idea who killed your brother? No, but I'd like to shake his hand. What do you mean by a crack like that? Figure it out. Made my life miserable since we were little kids. I'd like to have killed him myself. You live in this hotel, don't you? Sure, you know that. In the room right next to this one. It's kind of convenient, isn't it? Very. Sorry I didn't have a chance to take advantage of it. Now, look. Your brother phoned room service at 816. And a waiter found him dead at 825. So he's killed between 816 and 825. Where were you at that time? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, where were you most of the evening? I'm not sure. A lot of places, I guess. Name one. Well, I was down in the lobby for 45 minutes or an hour, but I don't know just when. Whether it was before or after 816. Who saw you down there? Who'd you talk to? I don't know. I bought a paper. I remember that, but I didn't pay any attention at the time. Okay, I'll check that. I may need you later. Don't go too far away. I can go now? Yeah. But just make sure you're around if I need you. I will. Oh, hello there. I'm from the Globe. Uh, aren't you John Allen, the dead man's brother? Yeah, but I don't want to talk to reporters. Who killed your brother, Mr. Allen? I don't know, but I'm sorry I didn't. I'll print that. Print it. Put in a headline for all I care. That's your room right next to the murder room? That's right. Put that in the headlines, too. Oh, come on, Mr. Allen. Give me a... Pig. Yes? Uh, operator, get me Ingersoll 21561. Yes, sir. One moment, please. Oh, police. Porters. Better leave me alone. Hello? Uh, Bill Andrews? Yes. Bill, this is John Arlen. Oh, oh, yes. Fred's been killed. Uh, yes, I know. I want to talk to you. I'd like to talk to you, too. Well, your house isn't safe. The cops will be after you. You can't come here. I can meet you in my car. Your car? You can drive a car? I can't walk, but I have special braces for driving. I'll meet you at the corner of Oak and Brewster Street so we can talk in my car. Okay. Uh, what do the uh, police know so far? Do they know much about us? Doesn't everybody? I think we'd better frame our alibis together. I'll see you at the corner of Oak and Brewster. <laughs> Amazing, Bill, the way they fixed it so you can drive a car, even though you can't walk a step. The leg braces aren't comfortable, John, but after two years, it's worth anything to get out of that wheelchair once in a while. Oh, someday they'll give you braces you can walk with. I hope so. But, uh, about Fred. I told the cops I was sorry I didn't get to kill him. When they come to me, I'd like to tell them the same thing. You might as well. You have as good a reason as I do. Maybe better. But I don't dare tell him that. Look, Bill. I was in the hotel when Fred was killed. You got to give me an alibi. Oh, that's fine. Only I was in the hotel when it happened, too. You were? Did you kill him? I think, uh... We'd better frame an alibi for the two of us. What do you say we frame one for the three of us? Huh? Who are you? What are you doing back there? Sitting on the floor. It's very uncomfortable, too. Who are you and where did you come from? I came from your garage, Andrews. I was on my way to visit you, and I saw you wheeling yourself out to your car, so I thought I'd ride back here. Who are you? Boston Blackie, John. Another one of your brother Fred's pet peeves, remember? Remember? You're the guy he promised to kill within 24 hours after he got out of jail. Yes, but that's one worry I don't have any longer. Then you're in this as much as we are. That's why I suggested a moment ago that we frame an alibi for the three of us, or perhaps I should have said for the four of us. Four of us? Carol Williams is involved in Fred's death, too. In fact, she mentioned both your names to me. Bill and I were at the hotel when Fred was killed. Were you and Carol there? Not together. I was there, I know. And I have a hunch she was there, too. She lied about having waited for me in my apartment building for two hours. Carol hated Fred as much as I did. She could have killed him. Why did you hate him, Bill? I was his business partner in the better days. When he went crooked, he involved me. I spent a few years in prison myself. Well, that's not going to sound so good when Faraday hears it. Oh, I'd have killed him on general principles. But I didn't have any better reason than the rest of you. No better reason, only a better alibi. You can't walk. Now, look, only one of us killed him. Do you want to take credit, John? I've got troubles enough. What about you? 
I was in the hotel earlier tonight. Does that answer your question? We were all in the hotel. Look, we're not getting anywhere accusing each other. I say we better get hold of Carol. Get our stories straight. We're all suspects. Yes, four of us were in a jam, Andrews. And I think we'd better get alibis that will gel. Coming, coming, coming. Morning, Blackie. Oh, hi, Jim. What did I do? Leave something in my car last night? No, I, um, I want to talk to you, Blackie. Oh, sure. Come in. Thanks. What's the trouble? Well, no trouble. Well, you wanted to talk to me. What about? Remember when you took your car out of my garage last night? There was, uh, something on your sleeve. So? So, I read in the papers today how Fred Arlen was found shot to death in his room at the Midland Hotel. That was blood on your sleeve last night, Blackie. And when a guy gets shot, he bleeds. So? So, you could have killed Fred Arlen. I could tell the police about what I saw in your sleeve last night. Yes? Yeah. But for though, I could forget all about it. Um, I'll take 50 bucks on account. It's uh, 50 bucks, or do I go to the cops? Uh, now, look, Blackie, it's... Hey, now, wait. Now, look, don't, don't get sore. Now, look now, Blackie, I didn't mean anything. No, I didn't. Blackie. Blackie, what are you going to do? Blackie, what are you going to do? What can I do, Jim, except pay you the $50? And now, back to Boston Blackie. Four people could have murdered Fred Arlen. Four people had a good reason to wish him dead. These same four people might have been in the hotel at the time Fred Arlen was killed. And one of these four people is Boston Blackie. As we return to our story, Blackie is in the office of Police Inspector Perry. Well, Blackie, this is once I don't have to waste my time chasing you around town. What are you going to waste your time doing, Inspector? Look, don't get me sore. I know you didn't kill Fred Arlen, but you're not clear of this completely. A girl by the name of Carol Williams came to see you last night, didn't she? Sure, so what? So it's just as I thought. She shot Arlen and came to see you right after. Oh, you think I don't know what I'm talking about, huh? Well, Inspector, I always think that. Okay, wise guy. I had my men check on the pistol we found in Fred Allen's room. It was bought at Rodman's pawn shop. And it was bought by a girl Rodman identified as Carol Williams. And I'm holding her. Where did you say she bought the pistol? At Rodman's pawn shop. Say, maybe she bought the gun for you. I do my own shopping, thank you. Okay, Blakey. But if you know what's good for you, keep your nose out of this. I'll do even better, Faraday. I'll hold my nose in the air. And maybe I may sniff something. Are you Rodman? Yeah. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Now, look, are you a cop? What does it matter? Well, it matters a lot. I don't like cops. They interfere with my business, and I don't like cops' questions. They get me all mixed up. Will it help if I tell you I'm Boston Blackie? Will it help? Oh, look, Blackie, what do you want? The store's yours? <laughs> well, I don't want your store, thanks. Just a little information. Did you identify the girl who bought the gun that killed Fred Allen? Well, I hated to, Blackie, but... Well, yes, I did. But there's something I didn't tell the police. Oh? Uh -huh. Right after this Williams girl left my shop... A fellow walked in and asked me what she bought. So I told him she had bought a pistol. He, uh, walked in here? Well, yeah, of course he walked in. <laughs> That's a natural way for a man to come in here, ain't it? Yes, Rodman, it is. And it makes the identity of Fred Arlen's killer a natural, too. Look, Andrews, I'm sorry to bother you. I know it's tough to get out of bed and into a wheelchair in the middle of the night, but... I think I have Fred Arlen's killer. It's John Arlen. John killed his own brother, Blackie? Carol bought the murder gun. 
but a man followed her into the Ronman pawn shop. This man walked into the shop. That means it wasn't you. Oh, it was John, all right. Well? Well, sometime later on, John stole the gun from Carol's apartment and killed his brother with it. It's that simple. Well, I... What is that I smell? Smoke? Say, I think you're right. It is smoke. Maybe we'd better investigate. I can't move this wheelchair of mine too fast. All right, I'll have it. Say, there it is, Andrews. The smoke's coming from under the door. Good heavens, the only exit from this room is blocked. Except for the window, and I'm getting out of there. Hey, Blackie, wait, help me. Sorry, pal. There's one thing I can't stand. It's fire. I'm getting out of here. Now, wait for me. I'm getting out with you. Okay, Andrews. Thanks. Thanks for what? You've just taken half a dozen very healthy steps. I thought you couldn't walk. The fire, Blackie, that's... There isn't any fire. The smoke's coming from some newspapers. I set on fire before I came in. So you can walk, Anders, eh? All right, I can walk. So what? For two years, you've been confined to a wheelchair, supposedly paralyzed from the waist down. Did you plan on killing Fred Allen that long ago? I didn't kill Fred. You can't prove that I did. Maybe not, Andrews, but I certainly am going to try. Yes? Telegram for John Arlen. All right, just a minute. Hello, John. Frankie. I want to talk to you, Blackie. Beat it. Don't close the door yet. I said beat it. You're not... Getting in? No, I think I am in. Uh, what do you want with me? Well, I I just want to give you some good news. I know who killed your brother. Huh? It was Bill Andrews. You're crazy. Bill can't even walk. I tricked him into getting out of his wheelchair, and he not only walked, he ran. I'm sure he killed your brother. But I have to have proof. Will you help me get it? If I can't. Faraday says your brother was killed between 8.16 and 8.25 last night. Don't you know what you were doing at that time? Of course not. I wasn't paying any particular attention to the time. I had no importance then. Uh, come in. Oh, I didn't know you had company, Alan. Hello, Faraday. Blackie, what are you doing here? Bringing personal condolences to an old friend of mine. Now you stay out of this, Blackie. Uh, what uh, brought you up here again, Inspector? More questions? No, Alan, I just want to tell you, I checked your story about being in the lobby when your brother was killed. You were there, all right? Well, somebody saw me. That's good. Yeah, at 8.17, exactly. You asked the desk clerk about changing your room. Then you bought a paper. And you sat down there for, well, a good half hour. And you'd been in the lobby for some time before 8.17, too. Pretty good checking, Inspector. But uh, how does that prove John didn't kill his brother? Well, at 8.16, Fred called room service and asked for a sandwich. He was alive then. At 8.25, the waiter went into his room and found him dead. So Fred Allen was killed sometime between 8.16 and 8.25 last night. Faraday, you're wonderful. I do all right when you're not around, Blanky. Then I'm clear, Inspector. Oh, I never thought you were, guilty son. In spite of the crazy story Karen Williams has been trying to feed me. What crazy story? Well, she admits she bought the murder gun, all right. But she says you followed her from Rodman's pawn shop and stole the gun out of her apartment. Her apartment? I've never seen it. In fact, I've never been on Davis Lane in, in all my life. Well, never mind, son. I know you're in the clear. Uh, you can come and go as you please now. Well, thank you. Well, John, now that you're cleared, you have only one thing to worry about. Yeah, Blackie? What? Faraday thinks you're innocent. And Faraday invariably bats a thousand percent wrong. <laughs> Jim, get my car for me, will you? Yeah, sure, Blanky. Uh, I don't know why I let you drive me downtown when I can ride in any squad car in town. Maybe it's because you like my company, Faraday. Uh, keep thinking that. At least it's one thing I know you're wrong about. You're improving, Faraday. Hey, Jim, get my car, will you? I want to talk to you a minute, Blanky. Oh, excuse me, Faraday. Well, hurry up, will you? I haven't got all day. What do you want, Jim? That uh, 50 bucks you gave me didn't last very long. I want more. Oh, sure, Jim. But I'd like you to meet a friend of mine first. Oh, Faraday, come over here, will you? Look, will you stop stalling? Let's get out of here. I think we're leaving right now. Uh, Jim, this is Inspector Faraday of the police. Huh? 
Now, would you still like I'll to... I'll just go um... right away, Blackie. Give me your ticket. I'll stand for it. Here. Yeah. The time out shows exactly one hour. That's 75 cents. Here's your ticket, Blackie. Thanks. I'll get the car out right away. What are you putting that ticket in your pocket for, Blackie? I don't know. Have it, I guess. Say, I must have save Here's my parking ticket from my... Holy mackerel! What were you doing down here last night? You'll find out. Hey, Jim. I'm getting your car, Blackie. Never mind. Check it in again. I won't be needing it just yet. Hey, what is this? This is where we go back to the Midland Hotel, Faraday. What for? For you to go down to the room service and for me to go on the phone and show you how a dead man can call for a sandwich. <laughs> Give me a room service, please. Yes, sir. Room service. Is Inspector Faraday down there? Oh, yes, he is. He's right here by the phone. I'll put him on, will you? Yes, sir. Here he is. Hello. Now, this is room 802. I'd like you to send up a roast beef sandwich and a glass of milk, please. Look, Blanky, will you quit playing games? I'm not playing games, Faraday. I'm serious. You say Fred Allen was killed sometime after 816 last night. Because at 8.16, he called room service for a sandwich. Now, is that much right? Yeah, that's right. Can a dead man make a telephone call? No, but somebody else can fake it. You think I'm in room 802, don't you? Oh, aren't you? No. I'm in a booth in the lobby using the house phone. Maybe using the same phone that John used at 8.16 to call room service after he'd killed his brother. Very clever, Blanky. Except for one little point. You have no way of knowing Fred Allen was dead before 816. Mm, nice point, Faraday. But I do know Fred was dead before 816. The parking ticket I got last night when he was killed shows I took my car out of the garage at 812. So what? So I'd just come from Fred Allen's room, and he was dead. And it's a good five minutes' walk from here to that garage. I thought I'd find you were mixed up in this. I'm not the one that's mixed up. You fell for John's story about being down here in the lobby just the way he wanted you to fall for it. I bet Fred was dead, well, a good half hour before John established his alibi. Yeah, but what about the gun? It belongs to the girl. She told you the truth, Faraday. Didn't she say she'd just moved to an apartment on Davis Lane under an assumed name so Fred Allen couldn't find her? Yeah, so what? Remember when John denied he'd stolen the gun from her? He said he'd never been on Davis Lane in his life? Well, that's right, Blackie. He did. That's so right, Inspector. It proves he did steal her gun. Unless he followed her, he couldn't have known where she lived, and I've just proved how he could have been down here in the lobby after his brother was dead and built himself an alibi. Blackie, I think you're right. You think I'm right? Sure, it's as simple as the alphabet. Now. But it wasn't simple when I started. There were three suspects. Carol Williams, John Arlen, and Bill Andrews, a cripple who could walk. So how did he fit into this? He didn't. He hated Fred Arlen, sure, but Faraday, you can get him on another charge. He was temporarily paralyzed after an accident two years ago and has been posing as a cripple ever since to collect a lot of heavy accident insurance compensation. Well, that's not my department, but I'll see that it's investigated. All I'm interested in is this guy, John Arlen. I'm going to grab him, but quick. You better be quick, Faraday. He outsmarted you once. Yeah, uh, but remember, I've got the goods on him this time. Sure you have, but remember, you've got the goods on him only because I supplied the material. Mm -hmm.